What's up guys? It's yo boy Oma Sensei. Welcome, guys, to what if a sociopath was reborn as in Yazuka becoming immortal in Naruto. Part 2. If you enjoy my content, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Time skip two years later MC age 17. While walking around Konoha while reading a paper in my hand, Inuzuka clan members. 60 ninja. 2 elite jounin, 22 jounin, 6 special jounin, 11 chunin, 19 genin, 400 civilians. 100 academy students. The reforms with the Inuzuka clan opening dozens of orphanages all over my clan compound and taking in civilian children has truly boosted my clan members. When the number goes around 1000 members, I will stop accepting any more members into my clan. The clan even had the first political marriage happen. We connected ourselves even more with the Onikuma clan. Of course I wasn't the one getting married, after all, having me married to the trashy clan is like giving a pet a 5 star dinner, completely useless, we just married some talented genins together, and that was that, the 13 year old husband was supplied by us and the 17 year old bride from the Onikuma clan, so she will be coming to the Inuzuka clan compound to live, the husband. Like the average 13 year old is horny, so he will accept anything that moves as a wife, so yeah, also my clan finally has some elite jounin, I made them by using some mosquito sage techniques, they are really useful, like chakra transfer. I forcibly raise their chakra reserves, it can raise it up to B rank, and just to be safe, I put some seals in case of betrayal, and, they were good to go, and the lifespan expected was minimal, compared to my 8th gate puncher technique, that took a lot of lifespan from them, anyway now I am officially the richest person in Kanoha, with a net worth of around 6 billion ryo. The moral life has been treating me very well, can't say the same about Sakumo though, the guy just went up and killed himself, he wasn't exactly useful to me, so I let it happen, plus I didn't want to ruin my relationship with Danzo, that guy is very useful when he wants to be, I just asked him once about S rank jutsu, and the guy literally gave me half of Kanoha's S rank elemental ninjutsu. I owe him two favors now, which I am obviously not gonna keep, then I arrived at my destination, the ninja academy, when I go there I see that the teams are being assigned, and then the jounin sensei are appointed. Every Hokage has a legendary student or students, so I am going to need my first legendary student. When the classroom is all empty, I see my future student just staying there nervous, my guy POV. When the teacher appointed all of the teams I thought that it was weird that only I was left out, damn it, after all of this work and my teacher isn't even here, or maybe there was a mistake, and the teacher doesn't want a student like me anymore, when the teacher said that it was some famous jounin named Yami and Yuzuka, the name sounds familiar, but, I don't remember where I heard it from. Even the teacher was nervous when he said his name, I should have studied on the Jounin of Kanoha before I became a genin, then suddenly from the corner of my eyes, I see someone entering from the window, he had a Kanoha headband black spiky hair, with black eyes, and he was wearing a Jounin uniform, when he looks at me he smiles, and I immediately recognize his face, he is the guy from the books. The ones which teachers won't stop mentioning and is even more famous than the Sanin. Then as he is smiling at me he asks. Are you my guy? I immediately answered him, yes Yamasama. Then his smile became whiter and he said, okay then come here. I immediately jump from my seat and arrive in front of him, then while still smiling Yamasama says, well then we should decide how you will do during the next part of the genin exam. Then I tense up and ask him. What will the next part of the exam be, Yamasama? Then when he heard me ask that Yamasama answers, good, I like your attitude, well then grab my hand. He extended his hand towards me as if asking for a handshake, I then grab his hand, and as soon as I do so, flush for a split second I thought I saw a dark flash. Then I notice that my surroundings have changed, and we are currently in some training ground that I have never been to before, then I looked at Yamasama in surprise, was that teleportation, isn't it impossible for a ninja to be able to teleport I never even heard of this, then Yamasama smiled at me and he said, this will be your final exam before becoming a genin. If you are able to pass my test, you will become officially a genin, and then I will begin teaching you, how to become the strongest jujutsu user. When I hear him say this, I can't help but be surprised, besides my father no one has ever believed in me, then I look Yami Sensei in the eyes and think to myself, I will not let you down, my guy POV. I look at Yamasama and can't help but loudly exclaim Wueya, then Yamasama looked at me with an amused look on his eyes, and he jokingly said to me. Yeah I know what you mean. It is a really convenient technique if you want to travel anywhere really. That does sound convenient. Then Yamasama continued saying. Then let me start explaining the test that you will need to pass to become my student, he made a hand sign, and a clone appeared next to him, then he put his hand on his clone's shoulder and said. You just need to dispel my clone, and as a shadow clone one good hit and he is gone. As soon as he says this he disappears in a dark flash, Yami, MC, POV. Well I was going to use another test to get him into my genin team, but since he is the only student currently he will get this test. Then, I teleported back to my house in the Inuzuka clan compound and went to the kitchen, got some popcorn, and some of my favorite horrible tasting tea, I kind of have started liking it. 
Since now I can't raise my strength anymore at least until the third ninja war starts, so since in this world there is no internet, I started using my clan development as a long game, raising its stats and all that type of stuff, it is very fun, I am bored most of the time, so even this type of shitty entertainment is better than nothing, I also surprisingly got a hobby for gardening. The also isn't that fun, but it is a great excuse to stop listening to Tsum's bullshit accomplishments, I mean come on when I was her age I achieved immortality, and what did she do, well she completed some beer rank mission, I could do those while taking a shit, then I grabbed some iced tea from a box, I homemade this horrible shit, anyway, better go back to guy now. I appear on a tree in the Inuzuka training ground where Guy is still fighting my clone, and my clone is just playing with him. I have also given one giant bat as a summon to every ninja of the Inuzuka clan. Now they have a dog, and a bat, so there is that, in my clan since the second ninja war, only 5 ninja Inuzuka have died. That is a relatively small number compared to the Senju who now only have Tsunade, and then there is the Ichiha, those guys die quite a lot, like since the second ninja war ended there have been 46 Ichiha deaths in the field, that is nothing special after all, in the peacetime between the first and second ninja war, the Ichiha death count was 58, the good news is that now, I have 92 new Sharingan. And some of them even are Manjakyo, though none of them have some amazing abilities. After 5 hours guy finally just fell down from exhaustion without even touching my shadow clone once, so it seems like he still hasn't learned the 8 gates technique, well then. As I get close to and see him, crawling towards my clone while whispering with tears in his eyes, I can't give up yet, I must pass this, when I see that, I just calmly sit to him, guy yo. Then he interrupted me and screamed. I can do this Yamasama, just give me a little more time, then even more tears flow from his eyes, and he says, please Yamasama, just please, give me another chance. I just look at him, this kid, the world doesn't necessarily reward hard work, but I will, guy, you will be a paragraph from my legend, but, you must still be a shining star that others can never even hope to catch up to. Then I smile at him and say with an encouraging voice, guy, you have already passed my test, so might guy, welcome to team Yami, also known as team 3, when he heard this he just screamed in joy, yes I did it, snore, and he fell asleep, I guess no matter how hard of a worker he is, he is still only 7 years old, heh, that was amusing to say the least. Then I put a hand over his chest and started running healing chakra through it, and, his muscles are all healed with no drawbacks to him, actually it just made his muscles stronger, but he is still asleep because of his fatigue, so I pick him up over my shoulder like a sack of potatoes. Then I go to one of my clinics and put him on a bed there to rest, then I call a staff member to me, when he arrived, I could immediately see that the staff member radiated nervousness, but he was still able to say. H how can I help you why Yamasama? I just look at him and say to him with a calm face and calm voice. You, go and notify my guy that his son is okay, and that he also passed my test, he is now my student now. Also his address in the north forests there is a cabin, after telling him the address he went away, that I just left a letter besides guy, and then I went back to my home, today has been productive, at least comparing it to the last months, everything has been so slow lately. I feel like I am getting stagnant, and, I don't like that one bit, I better prepare some side subjects, and maybe start learning some new jutsu unknown POV. I look at the green field around me with a city on the horizon, I can't help but think of how beautiful this world is, when mother is drunk, she says that god doesn't exist, and that even if he did he is an evil god, after all someone who is all powerful, but still allows atrocities to happen all around the world, then, that god is evil. Then I lie down on the grass as a butterfly flies above my head. Then I look as the butterfly flies down, and I extend my hand, and the butterfly rests on my hand, I am sure that god does exist, after all, the proof is all around, this world from its smallest creatures to the giant monsters, everything in a strange way, it works good together, like a mechanism, the world truly is perfect. And even though bad people exist, there are also good people to stop the bad ones, then the butterfly flies off from my hand, then I get up and dust my clothes, I look up at the sun and notice, even though mother drinks in the evenings she always says to me that I must always be back for lunch, or I will be grounded for a week, sigh. Then as I am going back I see my aunt in the market buying some groceries, she has black hair and black eyes. She is wearing a black kimono with a small pig following her. She is transformed as an adult when I know that she really is only a little older than me. As soon as I go close to greet my aunt the pig turns around and, oinky oinks at me, then auntie turns around and says, what is Taunton? When she sees me she just smiles and says, did you have your morning walk Hachi? I just pout at her and say, I was adventuring, not going for a walk, and Shizum, she just keeps smiling while saying. Sure, sure whatever you say Hachi, just go back to the hotel and I will cook us something. I just nod and start going towards the hotel, but before going there I put a hand in my pocket and take out, then I go to a dango shop and buy some dango, then as I am walking towards the hotel, and as I am about to arrive there, I noticed something strange in an alley, so I curiously went there. What I saw there, was reality, a mother who had a baby wrapped in a blanket. As soon as I see that I approach the mother and the baby I extend my dango towards her, then when she looks at me in the eyes, I see that her eyes are devoid of emotion and hollow, she just takes the dango, and starts eating it, and then she cuts some small pieces to give to her baby. 
After I gave her the dango I started walking away, the woman didn't say anything, and neither did I, I am not going to help her, so there is nothing to say from me, and I didn't do this to get some cheap thank you, I will probably forget about this deed tomorrow, when I arrive at the hotel, it is a medium class hotel, when I entered our room I was feeling pretty bummed out. Then I see my mother sleeping on the couch. I decided to take a blanket and cover her. After that I went and took out a leaf from my pocket and did the exercise that Aunt Shizun taught me. I put the leaf on my forehead and used chakra to make it stick in there. I have been training it for a couple of days and I think I finally got the hang of it, then Aunt Shizun comes inside with two bags of groceries and Tonton following behind her, I always wondered why she even keeps the pig around, I just assumed that it was like a food reserve, but I think she likes Tonton a lot. I went to help Aunt Shizun with the grocery bags and she just said in an amused way, aren't you such a nice boy Hachi. I just smile at her then when she looks at my forehead on which I am holding the leaf she just sighs and says, you truly are very talented Hachi, you already learned the leaf sticking exercise and you are only 5 years old. Then aunt, I mean Shizun sensei is teaching me how to walk on walls just by using chakra control, that's so cool. And just like that I was practicing all day, until like usual mother went to drink, and she came home transformed as a child, using her child form to trick another batch of debt collectors, then aunt Shizun came behind mother. And she wasn't drunk, so she just told mother while giving her a bottle of sake. You will continue drinking alone, I'm going to sleep since I have to wake up tomorrow. Then as Shizun went to sleep, I decided to stay with my mother, while she drinks herself to sleep, I know that she cries while she is alone, I don't know how but, I don't want my mother to cry and be sad all of the time. After some hours and mother drinking another bottle of sake she just continued speaking gibberish, Yami and Yazuka, that kid, was, is a monster, he was always too smart, too good, he would be nice and good for one moment, then as soon as you would turn your back on him. You would always feel like a predator was looking at your back. Ah oh yeah Yami and Yazuka, mother doesn't like to talk about him, but Aunt Shizun says that he was mother's student and protege, at a young age, he became an S-ranked ninja. Just like mother, the other Sanon were and, so was my father Dan Kato. Whenever I ask my mother to tell me about my father. She says to go and ask Shizun. Shizun says that I took more from my mother's side with my straight black hair and pupilless black eyes, I kind of look like great grandfather Hashirama Senju, then my mother while looking at me she says, what I did was wrong, you were our mistake, what did mother just say, as soon as I heard what she said, I was shell shocked, no words were even coming out of me, what does she mean by that? Time skip 3 months later Hachi Senju POV I just walk around the new city. Mother chose the city to spend her money on, I hope we stay here for a while. I made a new friend here. Then as I am walking I faintly hear some merchants talking to each other. My hearing and sense of smell has always been surprisingly good. Man I sure love working for Inuzuka Sama the pay is good if you aren't dumb enough to do something stupid. He definitely has the daimyo in the palm of his hand, I mean the guy just got 3 gold mines for himself by literally just paying almost nothing. That is interesting, but I keep walking anyway, and then I arrive at a house. The house looked normal like any other house in this place. When I was outside the door I just called out, Urze come out to play. Then immediately like a flash of red a girl around my age comes out of the house, she has red and brown eyes, when she sees me she just pouts and says, I told you not to call me like that, I just act like I am falsely crying, and with fake tears on my eyes, I tell Urza. S sorry I won't do it again. When she sees me and thinks that I am about to cry she gets uncomfortable and comes close to me. She starts rubbing my back to comfort me while she says, no problem, I was just joking. She really is nice when she is worried like this. Why can't she always be like this? I heard that her grandma is an Uzumaki, a civilian one. So that is cool, pft then my act slipped and I chuckled a little, as soon as Urza heard this, she just said in a cold voice. Hachi, you wouldn't try to fool me would you, then I just look at her with a serious face and say, I guess I will have to use the secret senju technique, her anger slips away, and she just looks at me in confusion and says, what do you even mean by that, then I just clasped my hands together, and loudly screamed, secret senju technique, running away. And I immediately started running away from her. While running away I hear her scream, Hachi, that was lame, as soon as she says that, bang I fall on the ground, why, did she have to be so mean, then she catches up to me and grabs my head with her hand, I just give up, after a couple of minutes of her screaming at me and, me dodging her slaps, but making it seem like they hit me. The Yuzumaki really are cross, I mean wild, that is where mother got it from, great grandmother Mido. And then we start playing, we go around the forest trying to find bugs, we like to crush them, there are some strong ones out there, then as Urza is about to say something, so how? I cover her mouth. She is about to say something rude to me, but when she sees my serious face, I'm even covered in cold sweat, I smell something very dangerous around, and my instincts are running crazy, then suddenly I see a big bear, he is as big as a carriage, there is no way I can defeat that, I don't even know one jutsu, then as I turn around to warn Urza. Crack I notice that she stepped on some leaves way too hard, then the bear turned towards us, I'm going to die, then I look at Urza and can't help but unconsciously think, if I left Urza behind, while the bear eats her, I can run away, roar, then the bear comes running towards us, I'm going to die, then, as if the voice of an angel, headshot boom, the head of the bear is blasted off. 
then I see that my savior is just a kid who is probably a couple years older than me and is wearing a green spandex. As I am still in shock I hear him say in a panicked voice. Ah sensei is going to be mad at me that it took so long to finish this D-rank mission, he will probably make me drink that horrible tea, while he explains to me my mistakes, but wait, this wasn't my fault, when I heard him talk to himself, I wanted to say something, but, no words came out of my mouth, I immediately understood why, I am absolutely terrified. I look at my hands and see that they are shaken, was I just about to die, if it wasn't for this guy, I would have definitely died, I haven't experienced anything, I haven't even seen how the world is, and I was about to die also I was about to leave Urza behind, I read it in a book once that people show their true colors when they are about to die, is that the real me, am I deep inside, a coward? Someone so vile that I am willing to abandon my best friend just like that, I don't even know myself, I get brought out of my thoughts by a hand touching my shoulder, when I turn around to see who it was, oh, it is just Urza, then I see that the body of the bear was gone, and just a bear blood splattered around is there, still fresh. Then Urza looks into my eyes with a nervous look herself and she while shaking says. You were out of it even when that ninja asked us if we were okay, are you okay Hachi? I just look into my still shaking hand and clench it into a fist, yeah I am okay Urza. I never want to feel so out of control again, I should ask Aunt Shizun on how to become stronger, yummy POV. MC, I am just looking at some paperwork that my clones brought me. I am waiting for Guy to return from his dear Ank mission of taking care of some bear that has been terrorizing a village. Then I hear an alarm clock go on inside the house. I just give a mental command and the clock is turned off. Vyunjutsu is the most versatile thing I have learned ever since I came to this world. Anyway at least Guy is not dead or in danger. I have a seal on him that if he is in danger or dead it will notify me, anyway, guy has just been taught the 8 gate technique, and I already copied it, then I force my chakra through the gates. First gate open, second gate open, third gate open, fourth gate open, fifth gate open, sixth gate open, seventh gate open, boom, my body is immediately flooded with chakra continuously destroying and repairing itself, but still I can't use any jutsu, because of the rampant chakra inside of me, I can still heal myself with the jungu. After all the jungu is not really a jutsu in the typical way. It is more like a parasite that I control, then after a couple of minutes I close all of the gates, and, fwash, my body started releasing steam and healing itself, and that is it for my daily training, in about 4 to 5 years my body will be at its best shape, after that I will stop the aging in my body, sigh, in my last world immortality was a dream that I gave up on for my family. Sometimes I really wonder how they are doing, do they have enough money now that I am dead, we already were very poor, I really hope that they are okay, then I feel something wet pull down from my eyes, when I touch it with my hand, I see so I am crying, even though I can suppress my feelings, I have been doing so for 17 years, I really am lonely. Everyone here will kill each other for the village, they will kill their own families like Itachi did just for the village, what the hell is that supposed to even mean, I immediately calm down, sigh, as expected I have started to burst, before I was so worried about surviving in this world, because of that I spent every moment planning and scheming, that my feelings and fun came second. Now that I have immortality I have free time, that means my mind has the time to wander onto things like this, then since, my emotions are getting the better of me, I immediately put a full barrier around my house forbidding anyone or anything from coming in. Then I make a water clone and have him go outside to tell anyone that wants to come in that I am busy doing a critical experiment or something like that. I won't send a shadow clone since he might also be affected by my feelings. Then I also put an anti-spy barrier all around. My face immediately gets a cold look, and I fall into my knees, my breathing gets heavier, cold sweat surrounds my body tears, wouldn't stop coming out of my eyes and falling into the ground, my heart was beating so fast that it almost hurt, I grab my chest and fall into the ground, even while being overwhelmed by emotions there still existed that calculating side, that kept saying that I am just having a panic attack. Damn it, damn it, damn it, why can't I calm down, I need to calm down, I need a release, I just start punching the ground, with my raw strength, after some minutes I just lay down in the crater that I created into my backyard, crying silently, in a more controlled way, damn, I guess I really am lonely. I just point my hand upwards as if to grab the sky, this must never happen again, I need a release state, or I am going to start doing irrational things and letting my emotions lead me, they are a part of me, so I would never get rid of them, but, I need a way to take care of them, after thinking about it for some time, I finally got an idea, my eyes morph into the Sharingan. Since I am calmer now I summon two shadow clones to take care of me just in case. Fwash I look at the world around me, I see that it is my apartment where my family used to live, I know this is a lie, and I know that I am in a Jinjutsu that I could break out of whenever I want, but, I guess I will truly rest, after 17 years of wearing a mask, I can let go. I guess spending some time with the real family is good, I open the door to the kitchen. I see my little brother with his blonde hair and brown eyes just drawing. He was always worthless, he liked comparing himself to me. I was his role model. Though I know and he knows that I know that he is jealous of me. I truly did portray myself as perfect in front of him. I just smile and go forward, he stops drawing and looks towards me. He smiles and says. Hey brother do you want to play D&D &D with me? Unlike that annoyance that I felt in my first life when my little brother used to ask this, I just smile a little while saying. Sure let's play a little then. 
I just go towards the fridge to get some snacks, I open up the fridge and see there are a lot of food in it. Yeah this is not real, our fridge was always almost empty, I grab a couple of drinks as I hear my little brother say. I will be an elf archer named, I never liked playing D&D with him, but now I guess I will get what I can, even while thinking all that, for the first time in a long time, a truly happy smile appeared on my face. After that episode of me panicking I have my mask back on. I am at the best performance possible at the moment. I was truly repressing my feelings too much, I guess, I was overdoing it, sigh, after that little dose of Jinjutsu I am back to normal, it seems like the burst lasted just about an hour. Not really enough time for anyone to even take notice of stuff like this. After all it could have been just an experiment gone wrong. After all, who are they going to question? Then after another hour of me thinking back on the truly happy time I had during the Jinjutsu. I should regulate that so I don't overuse it or get addicted to it. I should only do it once a year during random intervals whenever I feel like I need it. Since making a habit of anything can be used as a weakness in this shitey world. Then I sat on my porch while thinking of my future plans. That is when I sense that guy has entered my sensing range, I see so he finally finished his mission. When guy arrived I noticed that he had a nervous look on his face. Then he came in front of and started scratching the back of his head while nervously saying. H hey yummy sensei how was your day, I just smile at him and say. Ah guy, I see that it took you two whole days to finish a deer rank mission. In difficulty it was seer rank, but the villagers didn't have the money to pay for a seer rank, so I, my clone, just made a deal with them on certain parts of the lands I would own. I will boost the economy on there like I did in many other farming villages. My very basic economic knowledge from the future is really revolutionary here. Then while guy is waiting I take out my original book that I was writing in here, its name is Romeo and Juliet, but I haven't thought of a good pen name yet, maybe I won't even publish it. After all, I am flushed with cash currently, no matter how much the book makes it's still just a book. Anyway guy is still nervously standing waiting for my answer, if I punished him with more training he would instead like it. So I just said to him. Come here guy and tell me how your mission went, guy almost seemed relieved, but then I continued saying. Over a cup of tea. Immediately his face scrunches like he just ate a lemon. Yeah I know he hates my original recipe of gross but healthy tea, guy just reluctantly accepts, not like he had a choice in the matter. He is currently 7 years old but with my training. He can currently beat anyone into jutsu in his group age, if Kakashi wasn't a thing he could beat anyone in his group age at a straight fight, but he hasn't been able to surpass Kakashi's talent with hard work, at least not yet, I predict that at around the age of 12, Guy will be able to beat Kakashi 9 tenths times in a fight. But even though Guy seems like a knucklehead. He is still helping Kakashi cope with his father's recent suicide. Truly a sad thing, it's really a shame for a ninja like Sakumo to die. If only he had more uses to me, I would have bought her to save him. 9 months later MC age 18. I just look at guy moving to attack me. It has already been a year since I started training him. When he gets close to me I can hear him say. Third gate open. Oh so he is now able to open a new gate, and just as his speed increases he comes towards me. I just simply sidestep. Guy then turns around and tries to dropkick me, but I just jump back, and his kick hits the ground. Boom may small crater is created where his kick landed. And I also notice that the leg that he used to kick right now has a couple of very big muscle strains. But guy just winces a little at the pain and still charges towards me like a bull. Okay that is enough now. I just appeared behind him in a blink and just hit the back of his neck, sending a little chakra through his body, and forcefully closing all of his open gate. If there was a competition on who held the most knowledge about the 8 gates, I would be either the first or second, depending on how knowledgeable the creator of the technique was about what he was even doing. Then the 4 guy falls in the ground I just catch him and lay him gently in the ground and start working on his injuries. Then when guy who is still conscious asks. How did I do this time sensei? I just smile and say to him. Better than last time. But your attacks were still predictable, you couldn't strategize while under the pain of opening the gates. But you will eventually get used to it, guy just thinks back on his mistakes that he did during the fight, and nods. After healing him. I just say. Also better get ready. We have an air rank in an hour or so. Guy immediately panicked and said. Wait what, why didn't you say the sensei, and why did you even let me use my gates technique? We also haven't even gone to any B rank missions, aren't we supposed to follow some type of order? I just sigh and say to him. I have gone on a dozen S rank, a rank and even easy B rank missions by myself. So what are you complaining about? Plus I won't let you do all the work like I do during our C rank missions. As soon as guy hears the last part of what I said, he gets up and points a finger at me while saying. Ahhhhhh I knew you were doing that. I always thought that it was weird that you were always sleeping during any type of attack, and now you even admitted it yourself. Guy still isn't the funny guy that he will be when he grows up, I guess I will have to teach him about other things than youth. To be honest I wasn't asleep. I just used a Jinjutsu to make it seem like I was. I usually just watched him fight for entertainment. Then I see that Tai suddenly just falls to his knees and out of breath, after all I didn't heal his stamina. Then I just pat his head and transfer chakra to him, giving him some energy to move. Then I said to him dot you don't really need to pack anything. I have already got all of your things in a storage scroll already. You just get to the front gates and I will meet you there. 
Then I immediately teleported my house, and I just pack a lot of different delicious food. I am not going to eat cardboard food for nothing. This is way better, then I heard the voice of Tsum say. So you are going on another mission. Over the years Tsum's voice is no longer angry or arrogant. She has truly changed a lot, and definitely won't be the same as she was during canon. I just turn around and look at her, I just turn around and look at Tsum, she has finally understood that wild hair doesn't suit her at all. So she has straightened and let it freely flow down. Now she doesn't look like the wild tomboy Tsum. She even has a soft smile on her face and stopped being at Sundir. She has truly changed and matured a lot. She is a Chunin now, which is pretty good for her age group, since not a lot reach Chunin in their teens, not impressive, but it's still better than Jenin, and now she also has a giant bat as her pet that she can summon. She should be able to reach Jounin level in her 20s. She just sighs and then says with a tired voice. Don't worry too much. I will take care of the clan while you are away. I won't let any old man ruin anything that you have worked so hard to build. I just smile at her. She knows some of the stuff that is going on behind the scenes. Since I have been taking any talented orphans into the clan. And well, there is another person who would like those orphans to become his tools in his little secret boy band. This other person is Danzo, since I also haven't delivered anything or shown any progress on the promise that I made him about making a wood style user in a year, in exchange for him giving me access to the Hashirama cells, so he started playing little political shadow games with me. It is true that Danzo is good at politics, for a ninja that is, but for a person like me who comes from the 21st century, my little brother used to be better at them than Danzo, so within the first month of our little games, I economically ruined the Shimura clan. Closed all of its shops and its only source of income being its ninja, which are strangely dying a lot in the conflict. The Hokage has decided to stay neutral during my cold war with Danzo. And he better stay like that if he doesn't want all of the civilians of the Saratobi clan to become beggars. Anyway Danzo, like I predicted, has started to use his little root ninja to try and forcefully destroy my establishments. But he is so confident in his little trained puppets that he has forgotten that they are humans, you can never turn a human into a puppet, or he will be used against you, I have six root members as my spies, what some people like them will do for you, if you show them kindness. I also easily took care of the few injutsu that stops them from talking about root to others. Also me literally having thousands of normal looking mosquitoes spying on his every move, even when he shits, had definitely helped me a lot. I accept that I definitely am an absolute control freak, and when I don't like something I change it not the other way around, I don't like changing myself for others. Definitely terrible in a relationship, he hasn't even noticed that I have started having my clones assassinate his ninja clan members, as soon as they take any mission B rank or above. The way that they die is different every time, though they might start suspecting something, well they have already started suspecting that I am doing something, but they have no proof so there is that. Though it seems like I will need to start moving my plan faster to the elimination of Danzo. I can't allow the third ninja war to start and give Danzo time to counterattack me. He needs to be eliminated now, Danzo is too dangerous to allow him to think of a good counterattack against me. Also I poisoned all of his nephews, of course I made them look like some type of new natural sickness. He no longer has an heir for his clan. I think that he probably noticed what I have done to his nephews, and I must say he has good self-control, if he does even one careless move against me, he would already be dead, but I guess him picking a fight with me is already considered a dumb move made by Danzo. He thought that he could just use his political power as an elder to put me down. Well that is too bad for him, he had tried a couple of times to poison my clan's water supply, but I also already expected that so no one was hurt, and poisoned 97% of his root ninja as a warning to him. So now the root ninja's numbers are around 40, and most of them are a Genin or Chunin level. I mean I just think, what would I do if I was in Danzo's position, and that is why I don't even take showers in my house in case of acidic water. And I have sent all of my ninja clan members in missions, so even if Danzo somehow kills my civilian clan members, I wouldn't suffer any huge losses. Also I have mosquitoes spying on each of my clan members in case of a traitor amongst them, or any of them being in danger while outside of Kanoha. Honestly this is like child's play to me. People say that a cornered animal is more fierce, and some even use it as a metaphor that a cornered enemy is more dangerous, but to me a cornered enemy is already dead, in my eyes Danzo is already dead, really the only thing keeping him and the Shimura clan alive is the Hokage, he might act recklessly if Danzo suddenly dies. Every clan head knows the battle in the dark going on against me and Danzo. Of course there are some unspoken rules about not involving the rest of Kanoha and causing a civil war, but honestly that sounds more like one of Kanoha's problems than mine, so I already recruited most of the clans in Kanoha to my side. I have also already hired some strong rogue ninja to kill any Shimura clan member, and they will be rewarded quite nicely if they do so. If Danzo decides to make the first move and make a move that has the slightest chance of causing a civil war, then he will just give me a reason to kill him. Honestly I am just waiting for the inevitable wrong move that he will make, so I can get rid of him, and then make the Shimura clan a subordinate clan of the Inuzuka, honestly that is their best outcome, well it is their only outcome where they aren't completely obliterated. Danzo really did a bad move, he should have known that I already hold Kanoha's economy by the throat, if I wanted I could put a little pressure in there and start choking Kanoha economically. Monopoly is such a good thing, for me, especially when it's not illegal. 
I would give Danzo and the Shimura clan around a couple more months before they die out. Now I just should look out for any irrational moves from the Hokage. After giving some instructions to Tsum on how to do nothing and just keep the clan going how it is, I even made a couple of clones to be here and notify me if something happens, and I will be whore in a flash, literally, then I arrive at Kanoha's front gates ready to put another air rank mission on my record. I really should start experimenting with the Byakugan when I return from this mission. Hain, noble girl, POV. While waiting for the Jounin that will be escorting us from Kanoha I look at his student, his name was Gay, or Guy, something like that, and he is doing push-ups, that Jenin will be escorting us. I am not sure how effective this protection will be. Plus the important thing is that he dresses really weird, with that green jumpsuit and weird bowl haircut, I hope his Jounin sensei isn't like him, after all, my gaze wandered toward my father who has brown hair and is chubby. The fat bastard, he is trying to sell me to some killer, he says that the other nobles can't see it and that it is too late to do anything about it, but this ninja already has more influence in the land of fire than the daimyo, which I doubt, after all what would a born and bred killer know about politics. But enough about that, I'm sure that I won't even be appealing to the Jounin. I wore a normal white shirt and brown pants that aren't attractive at all, plus my brown eyes and brown hair with my glasses, I'm not very attractive like my sisters, but they have already been sold, married, away to other noble families for alliances. They are all into loveless marriages and just waiting to pop out babies, then they will start having affairs with some of the male servants or guards. Being a noble's daughter is a really terrible existence, never being in control of your own fate or life. As my thoughts wandered into depressing subjects, something strange happened, before I could even look clearly. Flash suddenly a black flash appeared at the Kanoha gate. Then a person appears out of it he seems like a ninja, I wonder who he is, he isn't overly handsome or anything like that, but he has a smile on his face that just seems so pure. From the tattoos on his cheeks I bet that he is an Inuzuka. Then he goes toward my father, wait don't tell me, then the ninja says. Ready to start traveling whenever you are. Father just seems a little nervous and says. Of course in Yuzuka sama I just frown a little when I hear father speak like that. What a coward, the way father said that, it made it seem like we are trying to ask for the ninja's permission, father shouldn't be so nervous. After all ninjas are raised to be killers they aren't exactly as good with money. Probably someone is using this yummy guy as a front while he manages things in the darkness, I bet father never thought of that. Then I get into the fancier carriage with just my maid in there, and, my father goes to the other carriage. After that we start moving, and the ninjas seem to be running alongside the horses, even though I have heard a lot of stories about them during my 18 years of life, it truly is amazing seeing them run at high speeds like that, they don't even seem tired. Then after only a couple of minutes I hear my father say to a running Yami. Inyazuka-sama, I don't want to be rude or anything, but why waste energy needlessly? You can sit in a carriage with my daughter. Your student can come and sit in my carriage just in case of an attack, also I am sure I can teach him or two about nobles and such things. I have complete trust in your ability to protect us no matter what. Can you be any more obvious father? The only thing that you have left unsaid was just go and take my daughter, while I suck you off. But then without any warning whatsoever. The Inuzuka ninja called Yami just, just appears inside the carriage sitting opposite of me, how did he come inside, the window is too small to enter, and I didn't hear the carriage door open, I guess it must be a ninja thing. Since Yami is sitting opposite of me, he is also sitting next to my mate, and she seems very uncomfortable. Then the ninja Yami looks at me and smiles. Then he says. So the journey to 12 days at the speed that we are traveling. So how about some games? Then he pulled something out of his pocket, they were, playing cards, a ninja having playing cards on him just seems kind of strange. Well then I just look at him and ask. Couldn't you just cheat, after all you are a ninja? Then Yami's smile gets even wider and he says. I promise on the name of the sage of the six paths on all that is holy and right I shall never cheat. Well I guess we should play. I look at my maid who seems a little nervous, then I said. She will be playing also. Yami just nods. Sure no problem. I guess I could play games, better than doing nothing, after some time I just stare at the cards. I can't help but think, how was this even possible? After 16 games we even started betting money after the 4th game, I just look at our resident ninja, we have played 16 games, and he has lost every single one of them, his luck is horrible, I don't even play poker, my maid just learned how to play the game, and even she won money, all of Yami's money that he was concurrently carrying all 100,000 Ryo. I just looked towards the maid that has been my friend since I was young, she is 90,000 Ryo richer, I didn't lose money, actually I won 10,000 Ryo, but I was wondering, is my maid some type of gambling genius, I just squint my eyes and look at her body shaking and a happy smile on her face. She did just more than her yearly wage, probably, I am not really sure how much father even pays her. Then I look at Yami, unlike us, he is the only one who lost money. 100,000 Ryo to be exact, then he just looks at me and with an embarrassed face, and scratching the back of his head he says. Can you buy me some food when we go to the next town, I lost all of my money to you guys. The ninja, just lost so much of poker, he really didn't cheat did he, but his luck sure sucks, I just smiled at Yami and said to him with a familiar voice. Sure Yami, it is his money after all, and I guess he isn't such a bad guy. Then suddenly he just hugs me. Bringing his arms around my neck and our bodies touching together, I could feel his body heat. Thank you.
I blushed a little but he couldn't see it. Then when I came to my senses I told him. Okay, okay stop now Yami. Contrary to my plea he just gives me a deeper hug and says with a whispering voice. Nice people like you really do exist. You just rekindled my faith in humanity. When he says that, I can't help but wonder, he really is a good guy. I just, hug him back a little, if I am going to be sold to some noble, it wouldn't be so bad to, Hain POV, continuation, during the seventh day of our journey towards our destination, we haven't reached any city yet. So we stopped by a small lake to let the horses rest. We all set up tents, well more like Yami and his weird students set up our tents, since none of us knows how, then after that we all ate, and when dawn came we went to sleep. The road had been long and tiresome so we all needed our rest. When I woke up in the morning I saw that it was quite early, I put on my clothes and went outside, then I decided to go towards the lake and just walk around. Then as I was walking towards the lake I could feel the chill of the cold morning air, and when I arrived at the lake, I saw Yami, sitting on the grass all alone, when I saw his figure just sitting there alone with an expressionless look on his face, I don't know why but, I just couldn't help but pity him, something about him just sitting at the side of the lake and throwing rocks in it. Not even trying to skip them, even though his face showed nothing, he had that hidden sadness on his pupilless dark eyes, it was as if he was looking for something he can't grasp. As if he will forever be alone, a sense of true pity for him rose in my chest. I instinctively wondered if I could do something about the loneliness that he is experiencing. That is when I decided to take action. I just walked normally. I could hear the animal sounds coming from the forest. Then as I got close to Yami he just turned around he just smiled at me, and then I felt that his whole vibe changed. Like he was just, simply happy. I even wondered if that lonely figure of Yami was a fragment of my own imagination. When I sit down on the grass right next to him. I can see the fog come out of his mouth as he says with a jovial tone. Good morning, Hain, I see that you are up early. When I see how jovial he is I just smile back. Hey Yami, what you doing? I wonder if I was just seeing things and thought he looked sad. He just looked at me and said. Nothing really. I am just bored. Then as I sat next to him as I jokingly said. Well sorry for not being interesting. When I said that in a joking manner he just sighed and gently replied to me. Don't worry, I know being born boring wasn't your fault. I pout and slightly punch his shoulder. Hey don't say that about a lady like me. He just smirked. Oh my lady, where is your dress and your butler who is secretly in love with you? And where is the guy whom you will have to forcibly marry and have a horrible life with? I just look at him grimly, pushing down the hard truth that the joke had hidden behind its funny tone. Your sense of humor is, like your name, very dark. He just laughs a little at the pun and says. And your jokes suck like a lady at a brothel. I just look at him confused by what he said. What is that supposed to mean? I ask Yami out of curiosity, after all he is generally pretty knowledgeable, and he is very blunt in explaining things. He just looked at me surprised when I said that. Then he answers with a weird look on his face. Right you really are a lady. What is up with that look on his face as if he really is shocked by something? What is up with that look on your face? As if you are mocking me. He just smirks in an evil way. Well my joke was an innuendo at how a whore in a brothel sucks a customer's dick to pleasure him, then she could also, wait what, do they really do that, that sounds kind of gross, that is where they pee from, wow, I think I am about to throw up. But Yami still continues the explanation. So my joke was supposed to convey some reason for you to be shocked and I stopped him from continuing anymore by just covering his mouth with both of my hands and said to him with a blush on my face. Okay, okay, I get it, you don't need to explain anymore. As I am about to sigh of relief I feel two arms come around my neck, and they drag me down, on the ground, on top of Yami. I can see his face, jawline and dark eyes that when I look deep into them from this distance, I can feel certain chills come all over me. My father told me to make him fall for me, I don't care about that, but he will fall for me anyway. Because I want him to, he is gentle, loving and wouldn't hurt a fly. I know that if he wasn't born a ninja he would be a kind man, the type of man I wouldn't mind falling in love with, so I lean in and kiss Yami softly on the lips. Yami POV I just look at Hain, her face gets closer to me, and I can already guess where this is going. She just kissed me softly on the lips. When she separates her soft kiss she just looks at me with a blush, she is embarrassed. Then she just whispered in a small voice. I will be honest with you Yami, my father told me I just zone out whatever she tells me. I have been with her for more than a week, I am a control freak. I literally spy on whatever she is doing 24-7, I already know about the situation. After she finished her whole speech then she started crying while saying. I really do love you Yami Inizuka. Thank god she finally got to her point I was about to fall asleep. I already know that too. I am not some anime protagonist who can't notice other people's feelings. I haven't had to seduce a girl in almost two decades. In my first life I was pretty good at seducing, lying to, girls, but I thought that I had lost my touch since I couldn't seduce Tsunade, but I still got it, also this was mostly to get rid of the boredom of the 12 day journey. I must say it was quite entertaining and made this journey less boring, maybe she might even be useful to me later down the road, though I doubt that possibility, she is just a boring girl without that much ambition, and her only above average looks don't do her any favors either. Anyway better start acting now. I make a face that has a complicated look on. Then I force blood to rush to my cheeks to make them blush. 
Then with a slightly, fake, unsure voice I say. I have never had a girlfriend, or done anything so, so I don't know how to deal with this. I'm like expected she blushed a craze amount, okay this just got boring, she is like the easy level girl in a dating game. She is boring and mostly used to get players used to the controls and finish the tutorial. Also my rule with girls worked wonders in this situation. My rule is that, one has to always make the girls think I was pure mindless, nice and a virgin. The last thing is especially important to convey how important this relationship is to you, and that you are a keeper. In my last life I made the mistake of being known as a guy who sleeps with a lot of women. So sometimes I had to go to great lengths to meet strangers that don't know about my secret hobby. Then Hane just blushes and says. I want to be your first and I want you to be my first. I just smile and say. Of course, Hane. Guy POV. As soon as I woke up and opened my eyes. I immediately started doing my youthful exercises of 300 push-ups. Yami Sensei says that hard work never disappoints you, and Yami Sensei is a smart guy, and he has never said something that is untrue or a lesson that is wrong. I could ask him about anything and he would have the right answer. Once I finished my morning training, I went to find Yami Sensei. He had told me about some new technique he will teach me. He calls it Diable Jamb or also known as Devil's Leg, he says that it will suit my fighting style well. He says that if I could use this technique I wouldn't have to use the 8 gates so much. I went to check on his tent, but he wasn't there, he usually is here, then I went to look at the lake, he wasn't, he wasn't there either. After some thinking on where Yami Sensei might be, I went towards Hane's tent, to see if he maybe is playing cards with her. Then as I went there I heard some weird moans coming from it, I get closer and hear Hane's voice come out of the tent, her tone was something I have never heard come out of her. Yes Yami fuck me harder. Oh, so that is what is going on, as soon as I hear that I remember the embarrassing lessons that Yomi sensei taught me about the birds and the bees, he really went into detail, and even gave me lessons on how to theoretically coordinate a threesome, I ran away from there before they noticed me. As I was running away I couldn't help but think. Who knew they were like that, Hane and Yomi sensei I never knew. Then as I was running I arrived at the lake. I kept wondering if Yomi sensei will marry Hane sama or something like that. Then during breakfast I ate my food very fast, I was too embarrassed to be in their presence, but I still saw that both Yami and Hane acted like everything was normal, 3 days later, and just like that we finished this mission. We didn't have any accidents down the road. Well Yami is known as one of the best living ninja. His medical skills are only rivaled by his skill in Fuinjutsu. He is one of the three people who ever learned to use the flying thunder god. It is true that Minato the yellow flash also knows the technique, but Yami is better known and more famous than Kakashi's teacher, Minato. Also Yamasama has a monstrous strength and endurance. Then as we travel a little away from the city where we finished our mission. Yami stops and looks at me, and he extends his fist towards me. I immediately understood what he meant by it, we had already done this dozens of times before. I just nodded and we bumped firsts. Wash immediately. My field of vision changes and we are in a room filled with different seals. There are some robot arms doing something, wait, they seem to be making some type of soup? Don't tell me this is where Yami sensei cooks stuff. But then I noticed a chemical vials, oh, so this is sensei's laboratory. We just go outside and I can't help but feel a little curious. So I asked sensei. Yami sensei are you going to marry Hane? When he heard me say this he stopped on his tracks and looked at me as if analyzing me. Then he sighed and said. Well no I wouldn't be marrying her. We did something that adults do, but that doesn't mean that mine and Hane's fates are tied forever now. It was an adult decision, that is all that there is to it. Then sensei started walking and went towards the kitchens. I was a little surprised at his answer, so I asked him again. Why sensei, don't you love her? Then the next words that he said, felt as if ice was climbing up my spine. For that split second I thought that I truly understood Yami sensei when he said, obviously not. But then maybe that was all a figment of my imagination, as when Yami sensei turned around he had a smile on his face with two bottles of iced tea, the terrible tea that he makes. So to not drink that terrible tea I started sweating a little and with a nervous voice I said to sensei. You um, don't we need to eh, I couldn't think of anything reasonable, so I said the first thought that came to mind. I am going to do 10,000 push-ups sensei, so see you later. And I ran off, Yami, MC, POV I just smirk a little as I see Guy run off. I just look towards one of the corners of the hallway and say. Sum you can come out now. Then as if with an invisibility cloak it is taken off, the space there shivers and Sum appears. I just look at her with a questioning look. Really, hiding. Are you stalking me? She just has a serious look on her face and says. Stop getting around Yami. Danzo has made his move. I just pour myself a glass of iced tea when I see that she has stopped saying anything I just tell her. Oh sorry just was thirsty, do go on. She just sighs a little and continues. Well he made a surprising move. The Shimura clan has fused with the Saratobi clan. Well not really fused, but all of the Shimura clan changed their last names to Saratobi, so the Shimura clan is no more, but now they might collaborate between each other. She just looks at me unnerved as I still have my calm smirk on my face. She knows enough about me to follow my orders, but not really enough to understand me, she isn't smart enough to know that there is no real chance of collaboration between the two clans. She thinks of the Saratobi clan as Hiruzen, those are two different things. 
It is true that Hiruzen probably was behind this. But he will probably not have as much support from the Saratobi clan from now on, after all, he just did something that could potentially destroy the Saratobi clan. They think that Hiruzen has literally put a ticking time bomb on them. After all now I have my sights on the Saratobi clan. I am not going to pursue them, go after them or anything like that, because it would be just a waste of time. After all they will soon go against each other. Also Hiruzen's and Danzo's relationship has most likely deteriorated even more. After all he just literally made Danzo seem like a bitch on the eyes of the clan heads who are watching this, generally it might seem like a good move, but, this is such a bad move on the long run for both of the sides. Plus there are also the kids, when parents can act civil kids can't, so that is where I come in, then I just look at Tsum with a smile on my face and say. Well now, isn't that interesting? I wonder how the kids will act when some of their parents rage at home for the trouble that this will bring them. You just have to look at a child to know the situation at home is. Soon finally understood a very small part of the big scheme that is really going on in here, and her face just scunched up as she said. You really are cruel aren't you, Yami, I just smiled at that. Everyone is cruel in their own way, my little Tsum. Kuranai Yuhi POV I look at my friend sitting next to me, he is a Suma Saratobi. I look around and see all of the others seem excited to finally be able to become true ninjas. Then when the teacher came in. He looked like a pretty plain chunin. Then he said with his usual bored tone. Today we will decide who your Jounin sensei will be. You will all be split into different teams. Anyway here it begins, then he took out a list and started calling the names in there. I mostly dozed out until it came our turn. Asuma Saratobi, Kuranayahi, you will also be in a team with another genin who has already graduated my kai. Your Jounin sensei will be Yami and Yuzuka. As soon as he said this I became excited. I couldn't stop a smile from appearing on my face. After I got Yami and Yuzuka as my teacher. He is the most famous ninja of his generation. His legendary deeds are written in books, and there have been countless books written about his life and the battles he took part in. My classmates all looked at me and Asuma with a little jealousy in their eyes. After all we already know that guy has become quite well known as a skillful ninja, and he couldn't do Jinjutsu, Ninjutsu, and could only do Tujutsu. I have heard from my father who once worked with Guy and Yami and Yuzuka, that he had never seen such power, Guy was able to create craters just by kicking the ground, and of course he said Yami and Yuzuka could literally punch a mountain and break it. I thought that those were just tales of his power, but when I heard my father say that it was true I was quite shocked. Plus Yama-sama is still only 18. Then I hear Asuma say in a quiet voice. I am going to be a great ninja just like Yami and Yuzuka. I just giggle a little at him. I remember that he has been saying this ever since we started the academy. He once asked me what type of guys I like. I of course answered that I like awesome ninjas like Yami and Yuzuka, since then he also says that he will be a ninja like Yami-sama, he is so silly sometimes, then as the Jounin one by one came to pick their students, I completely ignored the others, and my eyes concentrated when one of them came in, I had seen him in numerous pictures and drawings from books. He had an expressionless face, and then he looked towards us. When saw us, he just smiled and waved towards me, and Asuma, but when he did so, I felt my heart beating faster, and it felt like I had butterflies in my stomach, he is quite handsome. Then Yami just says. Team number 3 comes with me. General POV. Yami just takes his students and slowly walks with them towards the roof of the academy. While he was doing so he also asked. So we will meet your other teammate on the roof. I am not sure if you are familiar with him, but his name is Mike Guy. He is quite enthusiastic and fun to be around, he also wears a green jumpsuit, and you might have seen him run around Kanoha with just his hands. Koronai just seems a little too excited. As if she was about to say some but had to stop herself from doing so. She was truly feeling a lot of emotions from her having a crush on Yami, and to her wanting to learn some of the Jinjutsu that he has, in the end, she couldn't even get a single word out of her mouth. But Asuma just asks. So I heard that you know a lot of Junsu is that true? Yami just smiled and ruffled Asuma's hair while saying. Yeah I know quite a bit of Ninjutsu, Tujutsu, Jinjutsu, Fuinjutsu, Kenjutsu, Bakajutsu and some monk techniques that I picked up during some of my missions. I would say that I know around 7000 Jutsu in total. When they heard this both Asuma and Kur and I were shocked. They weren't sure if even the whole Kanoha has that many jutsu. Kuranai even exclaimed. That is amazing. When she said that Yami turned towards her and smiled. She immediately blushed and looked at the ground. Asuma was kind of excited too, after all he will be able to learn so many jutsu from him. Then as they are all walking together, Yami asked another question. Anyway what are you guys best at and do you know any jutsu yourself? Asuma was the first to say. Well I know how to use the D-rank fire bullet jutsu and some E-rank elemental jutsu, together with the transformation, replacement and clone jutsus that we learned in the academy. Yami with a smile nodded towards Asuma and said. That is quite impressive for someone your age. Then he turned towards Kuranai and said. What about you little lady, what are you best at? When Kuranai heard Yami address her and the familiar way he talked to her, she couldn't concentrate and just meekly said. Uh, I know some jinjutsu. Yami patted her head also and said. That is pretty good also. Someone having a talent in Jinjutsu is pretty rare. Kuranai just blushes and she says. I mostly learned it from my father. Then Yami seems to think for a little and as they were climbing the stairs to reach for the roof he said. Ah I remember now. 
Your father is Shinku Yuhi, right? He's an instructor in the Genin and Junin Corps. I also heard that he is also pretty good with the sword. Kurunai felt a sense of excitement when she heard that Yami knew of her father, and him praising her family like this made her happy. When she finally got the courage to finally say something they had already arrived at the rooftop, and her words got stuck in her throat when she saw Guy doing push-ups with one hand while screaming. If I can't do 1001 hand push-ups I will have to drink the gross tea that Sensei makes. Yami just smiled and as he didn't notice what Guy had said a moment ago and he said. Guy come and meet your new teammates Asuma Saratobi and Kurunai Yuhi. Then he immediately jumps up by only using one of his hands. Then he comes in front of them and bows down while saying. A pleasure to meet you my youthful teammates my name is Mike Guy. Both Kurunai and Asuma were in shock at what just happened, while Yami just had a smile on his face. In the academy guy was just a little weird who used to wear a green jumpsuit. Now he is a weirdo with a green jumpsuit that also talks weirdly. After Asuma and Kurunai's shock at Guy's weirdness, Yami with a smile just says. Well then let's sit down and get to know each other. When they heard this they all sat down. With Asuma in the middle with Kurunai to his right and Guy to his left. Then Yami continues. Well as I said let's get to know each other. So let's start with saying our name, hobbies, likes, what you don't like and what are your dreams for the future. I will first show you how it is done. My name is Yami Inuzuka, my hobbies are making tea, reading books and learning new techniques. I like to use the techniques that I learn in original and cool ways. I also like my family and Ninkin Shiro. I don't like boring and dangerous things. My dream for the future is to become Hokage. When they heard the last part they were all surprised, even Guy was surprised he didn't know that his sensei wanted to become Hokage. But it wasn't strange since he believed that his sensei could also become Hokage. Koronai and Asuma were surprised too, since becoming Hokage means that their sensei would be the future village leader, and they would be just like the Sanin. Then next was Guy who said. My name is Mike Kai, my hobbies are repeated sidesteps and hitting focus mitts. I like super spicy curry rice and curry udon, though I find it impossible to dislike food. I don't particularly dislike anything, and my dream for the future is to show the world that I can be a great ninja with just a jutsu, and I also want to be the strongest jutsu users. Then Kurunai and Asuma tell their own hobbies, things they like and dislike. When it came to their dreams Kurunai just blushed, looked at Yami, and just said that she wanted to become a great ninja. Asuma was the same, he just looked at Kurunai, blushed, and said that he also wanted to be a great ninja. Though when they finished and looked at Yami they saw him frown and they became a little nervous, unsure of what they had done wrong. Yami just looked at them as his face relaxed and went back to being expressionless, and now his smile was gone as he said. Guy is expected you want to prove something to the world. I always knew that, and now you also want to become the strongest jujutsu master, that is an amazing dream as expected of my protege. Guy was at first a little worried, but when he heard the praises coming from Yami, he couldn't help as some tears started flowing down from his eyes. He had spent his whole life trying to prove that he could be a great ninja, and Yami saying with such certainty that Guy was his protege made him very happy, he can't wait to go home and tell his father the good news. Then Yami looked towards Kurunai and Asuma with a neutral look on his eyes. I don't mean to be hard on you, or anything like that. But your dreams of becoming only good shinobi, if they are so small I am not sure I can even teach you to. To me talent isn't really the thing I am looking for in my students. What I am looking for is ambition. Guy has a great ambition and as his teacher I will give it my all to help him accomplish that dream of his. I also fully believe in Guy's ability and hard work that he will be able to accomplish his dream. But if you guys don't have the ambition I am not sure you will reach far, a good ninja could be said to be your everyday jounin. I don't plan to put any effort into someone who will be able to achieve only that. I plan to make legends not just some jounin. When Koronai and Asuma hear this they both freeze, shocked hearing their hero that they admired say that. Then Yami continues. I will see you in training ground number 7. In there, I will see if you are really ready to become Genin. Flashing in a black flash Yami disappeared from where he was sitting. Kurunai and Asuma were shocked and a little down. Guy was happy, but when he saw his new, possible, teammates faces he tried to reassure them that Yami didn't really mean it like that. During the same time in the Hokage's tower where the Hokage resides. Harrison is sitting in his room reading some recent reports. He didn't like at all what he was reading. Some reports about some unrest along the borders. He can't help but be afraid of the worst possible scenario, of the third ninja war starting. In the previous war many nations were left unsatisfied since there wasn't any clear winner, and the animosity amongst them was running at a peak high. Skirmishes have already started amongst a border, it seems like it will be inevitable, another ninja war, at this time his office door opened and two elders came in, they were Kaharu and Hamura. Two of his three advisors, Danzo has recently been missing all of these meetings, due to some, personal problems. The first to say anything is Hamura. He immediately just got to the point. I think we should cut all ties with Danzo. As soon as he said that Kaharu also supported Hamura. I agree, with the small rumors that have started spreading around, it wouldn't be wise to associate ourselves with Danzo anymore. As soon as Hiruzen heard this he immediately ordered the Anbu to leave. As they did so he still just looked at them and said. What types of rumors? Kaharu just sat down and with a calmer voice she said. You would have an easier time explaining what type of bad rumors haven't been circulating about Danzo. 
From kidnapping to working against the interests of Konoha and anything in between. Harrison knew that by saying working against the interests of Konoha, she meant betrayal. He knew that Danzo would rather slit his own throat than betray Konoha. But the general population didn't see it like that. Then even though Harrison was pretty sure he knew the answer he still asked. And who has been spreading these rumors? Hamura just answers with a slight fear in his voice. Who do you think, Kaharu answered by saying. Yami and Yazuba obviously. It seems like Danzo bit more than he could chew, you better not make the same mistake Hiruzen. Yami and Yazuka, even though he is young he is very dangerous both power-wise and politically. As soon as Kaharu said that. Hamura as if remembering something said. By the way I am afraid that I will have to be the bearer of more bad news. Hamura took out a letter with the daimyo's seal and read the letter out loud. By the order of the daimyo and the ruling council, it has been decided that due to careless use of power, tax evasion, suspected kidnapping, suspected trafficking, suspected grave robbery, suspected collision with the forces who do not have the best interests of the land of fire. Danzo Shimura is therefore released of his duties as an elder and is not allowed to have any say in the land of fires or its territories. He is also to be kept under supervision nonstop during an investigation on his suspected crimes. And the investigator of the alleged committed crimes will be, Hamura stopped for a second to make sure that he was reading it right. The investigator of the alleged committed crimes will be, Yami and Yazuka. As soon as they all heard they understood what was really going on here. General POV. The next day, Guy, Asuma and Kuranai were at training ground number 7. Then exactly on time for the meeting. Quash in a dark flash, someone arrives in front of them. It was Yami with a serious look on his face. While looking at them he says. Okay now that we have introduced ourselves, I will tell you about your exam to see if you can truly become Genin. Yami takes out one bell and says. I will make a water clone which has only 10% of my strength, and I want you to work as a team and try to take this bell. If you do get the bell you pass. If you don't you fail. You have 24 hours to do this starting now. Then Yami makes a water clone and gives him the bell. Then he himself disappeared in a black flash. But not before leaving a shadow clone behind also. In case of injuries. He himself went to meet with the Hokage. About Danzo's accusations. Which he had no evidence of but medieval law sucks, full of corruption and bribes, power in the hand of the powerful, while the weak are suppressed. Yami isn't going to just change the system, he is going to abuse the hell out of it, then when he has absolute power he might change it, while Yami was going towards the Hokage's tower. Someone else was in a cell, guarded by dozens of Anbu. He was a one-armed old man, he has a bandage around one of his eyes, and he has an X-shaped scar on his chin. He was Danzo Shimura, one of the ex-elders of the Kanoha Council. He has fallen from grace. Yesterday in his capture the last of the root members got killed. His clan doesn't exist anymore, his political power is gone, his physical power was long gone even before this. It all began when he gave Yami and Yazuka the Hashirama cells. Yami made a lot of promises to Danzo, he kept none of them. Even when Danzo asked him about it he just answered, he didn't know what Danzo was going on about. He even added that he never made a promise to Danzo. That was the moment that Danzo decided to teach the kid a lesson that people need to keep true to their word, and now Yami and Yazuka took everything from him. Suddenly outside the cell the sound of bodies hitting the floor could be heard. The door of the cell opened and a cloaked figure came in saying. Well Danzo I must say I didn't expect you to be in here like this, how the mighty have fallen. Danzo looks up and under the cloak he sees yellow eyes with snake-like slits looking at him. Then Danzo says. Why are you here Arachimaru? Arachimaru just looks at Danzo with a cold smile on his face as he says. Why to free you of course. Danzo thinks this through for a little while and his frowns as he says. I know that Yami and Yazuka has been experimenting with the first Hokage's cells, I just need you to find me some evidence of it, Arachimaru. If you do that I can promise you the dead body of Hashirama send you, so you can study it to your heart's content. When Danzo says that Arachimaru's eyes shine a little and he licks his lips in anticipation of this. Suddenly he started laughing. Hehehe <laughs> this is good, come with me. I am sure that Yami knows that you know this. So he won't leave loose ends. He will definitely kill you if you stay in here. Danzo gets up and goes outside. As he does so he starts casually walking with Arachimaru. After all they are in no rush Arachimaru isn't incompetent enough to be unable to stealthily take out some Anbu. As they were walking towards the outside of the T&I department everyone inside was already unconscious. Arachimaru is not an s rank ninja for nothing. His knockout gas and different chemical weapons can be devastating to even the most elite ninja. Then when Danzo saw the light. He had a heavy heart thinking of what he will do after escaping from here and how he will be able to clear his name. But the thing he was mostly thinking about was. Yami and Yazuka has made an enemy out of me. For the sake of Konoha I should never let such a ninja exist. He was willing to come close to causing a civil war during these dire times. As soon as Danzo got outside and into the light of the sun he saw something that shocked him. There were Hiruzen, Hamura, Kaharu and Yami and Yazuka, and many other clan heads looking at Danzo. Then Yami just pointed towards him and with a steely voice he said. As you can all see he accepted the escape when offered. That means that if he was confident in his innocence he wouldn't do that. And I Yami and Yazuka, temporary appointed investigator of this case by the land of fire daimyo. Have come to the conclusion that Danzo Shimura is found guilty, Hiruzen just had a sad look as he saw his old friend just standing there with a shocked face. 
He already understood that this was all over. But then Yami continued and said. I have also considered this very carefully and have decided to sentence you Danzo Shimura to death. Immediately here is and turned around and looked at Yami. He saw that Yami had a cold face, portraying no emotion at all. Hiruzen was about to say something, but he noticed that most of the clan heads were not surprised by the sentencing. Hiruzen immediately confirmed that they had already made the decision and had left him the hokage in the dark. Then, flash in a dark flash with such speed that none of the people present could even follow, Yami decapitated Danzo, and Danzo's head flew in the air, with eyes still wide open in shock. Arachimaru just looked at this and smiled. He had already made a deal with Yami and Yuzuka, and unlike Danzo, he wasn't dumb enough to take anything other than a payment up front. The clan heads who were surprised and weren't in the loop were the Ichiha, Hayuga, Yamanaka, Akimichi and Nara. The other clans were already in on the scheme, had absolute calm faces, they had a secret meeting before this, where Yami had informed them of his decision. But even though they didn't display it, they were surprised that Yami had decided to immediately carry out the execution. None of them even had the slightest thought of betraying him, after all look at what had happened to the Shimura clan. But for the first time they all saw just how scary and terrifying Yami and Yuzuka could be. What the others didn't notice though was Yami and Yuzuka looking at Arachimaru with a cold look that dared him to betray, it was a lesson, no, it was more of a demonstration of the consequences that would happen in case anyone got in his way. Hiruzen, POV. It has been one week since that day. I still can't get the image of my dying friend out of my head. In my own mind I have killed and cursed Yami and Yuzuka countless times, but in reality I didn't dare to act, we are dangerously close to another ninja war. I should try to negotiate with the other great hidden villages. I know that another war wouldn't accomplish anything, only more death than destruction. Weakening us all, during these times there would always be Danzo whispering about going to war and Kanoha making the first move. I would never listen to him, even though he was smart Danzo wasn't too good at strategic battles. He would consider the option of sacrifice way too easily. I knew that letting Danzo pick on Yami would be dangerous. I don't know what was going on between them, but they definitely had a deal going on. It seems like Danzo was onto something and decided like usual to try and use force against Yami by ruining his clan's shop and other establishments owned by him. It seemed like that was the wrong move both from Danzo when he reacted like that and my part where I didn't stop him. Sometimes I even wonder if I have truly been sitting in this chair for too long. Everyone seems unsatisfied, not just the other great villages, even Kanoha is craving for war. Are they all mad? Didn't they learn from the second ninja war that fighting will only lead to our mutual destruction and weakening? And Yami and Yuzuka that boy, doesn't he understand how much he will weaken Kanoha with the last stunt he pulled? He had a mother, sister figure and his whole clan in here. Why can't someone smart like him comprehend something like this? He took such a major risk for such a useless thing. His mind truly doesn't have the maturity needed to understand things like this. He obviously doesn't listen to me, oh he does follow my orders, but he doesn't truly listen to them. He is an S-class ninja, he needs to understand that his actions have consequences. He also has my son Asuma in his team. The Saratobi elders agreed to this, my influence and power as a hokage has been slipping away, and no matter how, even though Yami doesn't say anything, if people look deeper into it, they will understand that he is just simply saying to my face that he will kill Asuma if I do something stupid. Accidents do happen, and if Asuma died he wouldn't even be blamed for it. During these times we need to be united, not squabble amongst ourselves. I only know one person Yami will truly listen, it seems like with the war just seeming around the corner I will need to prepare. I will need Jiraiya back here. Minato also needs to be here, and also, Tsunade will need to come back from her grieving, Kanoha needs her now more than ever. Shizum, POV. I look at young Hachi trying to do the tree walking exercise, he is such a good kid and so cute. I look at his cute little face concentrating. He is so cute, and he is only 6, though technically I am not a lot older than him, but I use transformation jutsu most of the time to seem older. After all if I want to buy something if they see that I am a kid they wouldn't take me seriously, I am 9 and all that, and technically I am older than Hachi by just 3 years, but that doesn't matter. I am still his aunt. I see Hachi just looks at me while saying. By the way Shizum, you aren't really growing a lot recently. I have almost caught up to your height. I just smile because I mustn't be angry at my own nephew, but inside my heart I can't help but curse those abnormal senges. He can already beat me at raw strength, and his chakra reserves were always bigger than mine, and the distance just keeps getting bigger. No wonder the senju were the strongest clan in the clan warring era. Slip Hachi falls down from the tree again, but before landing he does a backflip and lands on his feet. He then turned towards me, smiled and gave me a thumbs up while saying. That was cool when I did that right. I just sigh a little and say to him. You have been trying this for a whole day, and you still haven't got it down, how do you plan to become a medic ninja or learn cool ninjutsu with bad chakra control? Though that is mostly because he has high chakra reserves for someone his age, and he has already gotten up half of the tree. But there is no way I am telling him that. Then Hachi suddenly asks. Has mother woken up yet? I just think a little and say. Don't worry she just drank too much yesterday night, so she will be sleeping a little more. I just look at his face and see the worry in his eyes. He truly is a loving child, even though Tsunade doesn't necessarily pay him attention to Hachi like any other mother would, he still loves her with all of his heart. 
Even though I never expressed it, I am disappointed in Sunate, Hachi is the proof of love between Uncle Dan and her. So why does she ignore him so much? I have noticed that sometimes she even goes out of her way to not look him in the eyes. Hachi doesn't say anything and acts happy all the time, but I know that deep down he is sad and hurting. Then suddenly Hachi's face brightened as he looked towards the site of the forest where our camp is, even though he isn't a natural sensor, Hachi has good hearing, eyesight and especially good smell. I look towards where he is looking and see Tsunade. She still seems a little sleepy. She has a small note in her hands and then she says. There are worries over the rays of skirmishes around the border, and Kanoha has called me back. Then Tsunade has a conflicted look on her face, like she seems unsure of something. Finally she just sighs and says. You will also be coming with me. Hachi just smiled and pumped his fist on the air as he said. Yes I am going to join the ninja academy. I just looked at Hachi's excited face and thought that since I already have the power of a genin, I will just return to Kanoha and immediately graduate. But why is Tsune just looking at Hachi with a worried expression on her face? Is something wrong, Yami POV I am sitting on my chair in my personal office in the clan head's house. I just look at the paper in front of me. It was all of the reports that the mosquitoes have relayed to me, it was written by the mosquito sage. Those little intelligent guys truly are great spies, and they are literally spread all around the five great nations capitals and hidden villages. I have the best spy network, I will soon spread them in major cities and all that. Soon I will have information that no other spy networks could hope to achieve, I will have everything under control. Time until the third ninja war starts, in 8 months, General POV. In his lab under his own house, the lab is well lit, and it has different human bodies in glass containers full of some strange green liquid, but Yami was just looking through a small glass canister as big as his hand, which had two pupilless white eyes, the Byakugan. He has got it, but he is planning on how to incorporate it into his body, so it doesn't disrupt the Sharingan. Obviously fusion of the Sharingan and Byakugan is impossible because that is not how biology works. Even in a world where Chakra exists. Yami then analyses his forehead planning to have another set of eyes put in there. But he will have to connect it with his brain for him to be able to truly see. But that is a very dangerous procedure that could even lead to memory loss. Yami will first learn a way to separate the soul from the body and that way he will be his true self and won't lose memories. He could just make a shadow clone and have him take all of his memories out, do the surgery and put the memories back. But Yami knows that after that it won't be him anymore, it will just be a clone of him with the same memories as him. Yami is someone who strives to be himself, never letting even a whole new world change him. Doing that would mean that it would be the same as having an identical clone. No one would notice but, he himself would cease to exist. After all he doesn't want his clone to be like him, he wants to be himself. While thinking of solutions about this he can't help but come to one conclusion. Living corpse reincarnation, obviously he isn't planning on leaving his powerful body that he has right now. His body is immortal now, so he will just use the living corpse reincarnation method to immortalize his mind. But that method is forbidden to all no matter what rank, he would have to go steal it, but, there is a high chance he would be caught. Better wait till I become Hokage, I can have any technique I want, and no one will question me. Thinks Yami with a slightly dark smile on his face. While on another place traveling towards Kanoha is Hachi, Tsunade and a 9-year-old Shizum. They are walking at a normal pace, Tsunade told them that there is no rush, and they can take it slow. Hachi had a smile on his face as he was happy. He had just mastered the tree walking exercise. Even Tsunade was a little surprised at this, after all the tree walking exercise needs good chakra control, but it also needs the strength of a genin to support the weight and all that. She was surprised that he was this strong physically. And even though she wasn't drunk at all, she felt happy, seeing Hachi jumping around and being so energetic was funny in its own way. She also couldn't help but compare Hachi to a younger Yami. Yami was 8 years old when he became her student. He always has a certain brilliance in him, and those eyes, that hunger for always wanting more. Back then he was like a second Arachimaru but nicer and actually cared for other people. She can't help but smile a little at those memories. Yami always was a good student and a hard worker, though he did have that mischievous side of him, he was serious most of the time. That might have been because she spent time with Yami when he was training. Even though Tsunade is nervous to meet Yami, she also can't help but feel a little melancholy when thinking about her only student who is alive. While Tsunade is thinking this, suddenly Hachi hugs her. Hey mom come on teach me something else I am already bored out of my mind. Said Hachi with puppy eyes. Tsune just sighs and takes out a small storage scroll from between her breasts. Then she opens it and puts a finger on it. Poof then a small paper appeared out of it. Then Tsune gave Hachi the paper. Run chakra through this. It will show your elemental affinity and which jutsu you should concentrate on learning. Hatch enthusiastically nods and takes the paper. Then he runs chakra through it. Tsune and Shizun look at it with a little curiosity. Though Tsune doesn't show hers outwardly, but, she still wanted to know. She had never really been a good mother to Hachi, she knows that. When she looked at him she always saw Yami's eyes staring back at her. When she noticed where her thoughts were going Tsune just frowned a little. While she thought. This is why I don't like being sober for long periods of time, well it hasn't even been a day since I was sober, but it's already a day too much. I know I am not a good mother, I know what I did to my student, I know that I am a horrible human being. But she looked at Hachi's paper that he was running chakra through. 
Tsunade was waiting to see her son's affinity. Would it be the same as his father's, after all he looks a lot like Yami, sometimes even acts like him during certain situations. But the paper just got a little wet, he had water affinity, Sun just looked at it, and thought. What am I doing, he isn't Yami, he's just a child, maybe I really should stop drinking and start acting like a mother, I hope it isn't too late, though Tsunade smiles at Hachi. Which surprised him a little since his mother rarely smiled at him. Your elemental affinity is water, just like the second Hokage your great grand uncle. When we return to Kanoha we can gain access to the water jutsu left by Taburama. The Senju library has a lot of them all the way up to the S rank ninjutsu. Though you might have it harder to learn fire ninjutsu, it doesn't really matter that much. Better be good at one thing than mediocre at a lot of things. When Hachi heard this he smiled. Yeah and I am going to make water dragons and all that. I will surpass even Taburama and become the greatest water style user that ever lived. Sune just smiled at him when she saw Hachi saying that. She just went towards him and hugged him. What they didn't see though was a mosquito just looking at them. As soon as it saw this it immediately sent the information to its queen. In another place on the blood swamp, the mosquito sage was just meditating inside the bloody swamp water. When it opened its eyes she processed the information that she got. Should I tell Yami about this, or not? She contemplated on her next action. But as soon as that thought came it immediately went away. She knew Yami pretty good, better than all of the other blood swamp creatures, since she was the one who taught him how to gather and train sage chakra. He would probably torture me to insanity while the other creatures watch, just so he can make an example out of it, yeah I better tell him then. Though the mosquito sage with a little fear on her heart. Yami was eating with his mother and soon when a mosquito flew in. And landed on his finger. Then he just saw what the mosquitoes saw, soon ate with Shizunant, a child, with black hair and black pupilous eyes. Why it? Thought Yami with his thoughts and confusion. Immediately when he saw that he understood what was happening. Quash in a dark flash Yami appeared outside of Kanoha. Then, his skin turned red, his black hair lengthened it became spiky, and it went up to his lower back. Under his eyes black markings had appeared. Sun was 8 kilometers north. He didn't have any Horatian markings there so he couldn't teleport. Bume Crater was created as he used all of his strength to kick off the ground. Running towards his destination, his speed created sonic booms, while doing this he couldn't help but think, that is my child. For the first time, Yami's mind was, in shock, General POV Yami was rushing towards the location without stopping, running at speeds that created sonic booms behind him. As if even sound was trying to catch up to him. He couldn't help but think. How stupid of me to not have some mosquitoes spy on Sunate. Damn it, I was so concentrated on infiltrating the five great ninja villages that I honestly didn't even think about Tsunade at all. Back then when I came inside her, I forgot to use a contraceptive jutsu, I was too excited to think about that. I just thought that Tsunade would use it once she noticed what we did, just how fucking stupid is she, damn it, boom in only 9 seconds he had arrived at his destination. It was a dirt road surrounded by green forests. Though the road did have some carriage tracks. Yami just turned off his sage mode and went back to normal. Both Hachi and Shizun have surprised looks on their faces, they were shocked that he appeared out of nowhere. Tsunade looked at him with white eyes filled with shock and surprise. After a split second her ninja training comes to play and he come down. Still though Tsunade had a conflicted and despairing feeling in her stomach, as she saw Yami just looking as Hachi with calm, but he had such a hard and concentrated look on his face that she has never seen him have. Yami then calmly looked at Tsunade. Hello there Tsunade. He didn't address her as sensei, but that wasn't what Sun concentrated on. What caught her attention was that even though he said that in a normal voice and with no expression on his face, Tsunade could tell by his demeanor that Yami was angry. The way that his eyes moved was in an instinctual way of expressing anger. Yami could always hide this little instinct, him expressing it like this meant that he was really angry. But Tsunade with a calm look on her face and an even calmer voice said. We should catch up when we go back to Kanoha. As she said that, Yami understood the true meaning of her words, it was, not here in front of them. We will talk back in Kanoha. Yami looked calm as always, then he just nodded and said. Right, he forced himself to calm down, and he did what he is good at, he just bottled up his emotions. Then he turned towards the kids and smiled. Hey there kids my name is Yami Inuzuka. Tsunade's ex-student, nice to meet you. Shizun seemed a little shy at this, but Hachi had no problem as he replied with a smile on his face. Hi my name is Hachi Senju. Do you know any water style jutsu? Yami still had a smile on his face. Of course I know quite a bit of them. If you need any help just come ask me. Why is your elemental affinity water? Or is it just because you like water ninjutsu? Or maybe you want to be like Taburama Senju? Also are you hungry, I usually keep food in storage scrolls. I cooked it myself. It's pretty good. I have anything you want from eggs to steak, just ask for any food, and I could go back to Kanoha and get it for you, as Yami continued rambling on. Tsunade just cleared her throat, and Yami immediately stopped. Tsunade was surprised seeing Yami like this, after all she has never seen him act like that. He always seems like he is in control. The six-year-old Hachi just looks at Yami questionably and asks. Wait, if I want some food from Kanoha you would be able to get it. How would you do that? Yami just smiled and took out a kunai from his kunai pouch. 
The kunai looked normal, except that it had an encryption with strange seals in the form of a flower or something like that. This is the Horatian seal, it allows the user to teleport to places he has marked. Hachi's face just brightened with stars in his eyes. That is so cool. You must be the fastest ninja then. So that means that we also don't have to travel. Also would you be able to take us to Konoha immediately? Yami just laughed a little. Ahahaha I am not actually good enough at it, to be able to teleport people together with me. Hachi just sighs. That must really be nice then. Not having to walk anywhere. Yami just smiled. Yeah it really is convenient. Yami POV I just looked at my own kid, Hachi, someone created by me. My soul created his, he was not supposed to exist. His existence is proof of how easy it is to mess with the canon timeline. I have been trying, well more like I have been guiding the events to have some general direction that I can predict. Knowing the future is my extreme advantage that I have. If I didn't have this future knowledge I would just open up a shop as a civilian and use an absurd amount of money to hire a Chunin or Jounin rank ninja to teach me chakra and things like that. While looking at Hachi I can't help but see the resemblance he has to me. The only things he really has from Tsunade's side is the feminine look. When I finally calm down my different emotions like panic, uncertainty, familiarity and think like that I can finally think clearly and analyze myself. Anyway Yami-sensei, what kind of cool techniques will you teach me? Mom doesn't teach me anything except some tree walking and leaf sticking exercises. Says Hachi, frowning while saying the last part. I just looked at him with a smile still on my face. You don't have to call me sensei, that just makes me sound old. Anyway you should definitely concentrate on your water ninjutsu at the start. You don't want to start expanding your jutsu repertoire at such an underdeveloped age. You need to grow your chakra first and then start learning ninjutsu. So your mother only teaching you those exercises is a very good start. Hachi just looked a little down when I said that. But it is also boring. I just laughed at him. Haha, <laughs> you need to start crawling before you can start running Hachi. But, I still have a more exciting technique that I can teach you. Anyway I know a lake close by that is, a good place as any to learn water ninjutsu. I noticed Tsunade frown a little and say. We are still going towards Kanoha, and at the pace we are going it will take at least another say to arrive at our destination. This bitch, does she have a death wish or something? I just turned towards her. Well you and Shizun could go at a faster pace like ninja, while me and Hachi separate from you, and we visit the lake. He could learn a lot there with the high amount of water, helping him use ninjutsu easier and learn them faster, even though I said that with a smile on my face. Tsunade saw the look in my eyes, Tsunade just looked at me with an unsure face, but she relented and just said. Okay, but don't waste too much time on the lake. I just nodded and Hachi jumped up in happiness while screaming. Y-E-A-H-H. Then after that we separated going towards our different destinations. Tsunade and Shizun went towards Kanoha, while me and Hachi went towards the lake nearby. While walking we talked about different things, mostly about ninjutsu and training. I noticed that Hachi was glad to have someone else to talk to now. He is family to me, I definitely don't know how to feel about that. It is true that my mother in this world, Miss Yoon, I never truly saw her as family or anyone important to me. Since she birthed me in this world I will let her think of me as her son, that is my gift to her, ignorance is truly a bliss. I never understood, being grateful to someone. If someone risked his life for me, that I should risk it for them, that just isn't logical to me. If someone risked his life for me, I would feel grateful, but I wouldn't do the same or necessarily, or even help him in any way if it doesn't benefit me. After all they chose to risk their life for me, I didn't ask for it. Anyway while I think about my son, I can't help but contemplate if I should kill him now or when he becomes a genin, I will just make it look like a mission gone wrong. But, whenever I think about killing Hachi and seeing his dead body I feel displeased. He might develop into my true weakness later, for the first time in quite a while I am unsure about the next step that I should take. He was truly an accident, I believe even Tsune didn't kill him in the womb, as soon as she noticed that she was pregnant, was because she thought that it might be Dan's baby. I never hold any naive thought that Tsune would do it just so she can keep our baby because she loves me or anything like that. She can't see past our age difference, and she met me when I was young, so she most likely sees me like a little brother, the lover candidate. I just look at Hachi with a smile on my face. Should I kill him or not, he is definitely someone who has a chance to develop into my true weakness, I will decide that later, a decision like that needs to be planned and contemplated before I decide if I want to do it. Hachi POV Yami really is cool, he knows so much about water jutsu, but at the end he said. But before that we will need to build a strong foundation of knowledge and strength, before you can start learning ninjutsu, because that will allow you to learn things of a higher level faster. That is why no one starts learning strong ninjutsu from the beginning. We will stay here for one week and during that time I will teach you to the best of my abilities. The first thing he taught me was the transformation jutsu. Yami showed me the hand signs slowly and told me how the chakra should flow through them. I was able to learn the transformation pretty easily. Even though I would like to say that I learned it all by myself, that isn't true Yami made it possible. He would tell me when I was moving my chakra wrong, it was as if he could see my chakra. When I asked him about this, he just said that he was a sensor and the close range allowed him to sense chakra in a very detailed manner. He really is a great teacher. After I learned it, Yami just said for me to continue practicing more with the technique, then he went away somewhere. 
When he did that, I practiced a technique for another 20 minutes, and I got bored of it. So I just lied down at the side of the lake. I already learned the technique, why would Yami say that I study it again when I already learned it? When it got dark he came back and saw that I wasn't practicing. He just frowned and said. I see, that is disappointing. I just looked at him with a questioning look. What do you mean by that? Yami's face just went back to normal. He made a big white camping tent with the Inuzuka symbol on the front. Then he just invited me inside. When I entered I saw that it had two beds and a wooden dinner table for two people. The floor was hardened earth, probably some jutsu. Then I look up and see some strange lamp structures with a seal inside of them that makes light. Then Yami pot his palm up and, poof a pot of soup appeared in his hand. I see that he even has forks and all that. This definitely isn't how camping is supposed to be. I didn't complain and just sat down on one of the chairs. Then Yami brought out the plates and he filled them with soup. Then in an uncomfortable silence as we ate. I couldn't wait anymore and asked Yami. Oh Yami, you seem angry did I do something wrong? Yami just looked at his plate with soup and said. Sai I don't think you should be a ninja Hachi. When he said this I got a little angry and narrowed my eyes. What is that supposed to mean, Yami? Who is he to decide what I should or shouldn't be? I mean I learned the transformation jutsu in just a day. I think that is pretty good. After all, Shizun always said that I would learn these techniques when I am in the academy. Yami just looked at me in the eye, and for the first time since I met him, he had a cold look in his eyes. When I said that I will go away for a little hunting, I was actually watching you. You gave up only after 20 minutes of practicing. You have potential to be a strong ninja, but that is it, you don't have the drive or the will to really put your money where your mouth is. I just looked at him with even more anger. What does this have to do with money, and what does the last part of what he said even mean, eating money, that is ridiculous. I just tried to keep down my anger and said. What do you know, you have only known me for one day, plus I already learned the stupid transformation jutsu. What am I even supposed to practice anymore? Yami's eyes again get that disappointed look in them when looking at me. Listen Hachi, you were born lucky by being a senju and having big chakra reserves with a pretty strong body. But if you don't have the will to train endlessly for hours, you will not become anything great, and most likely die a meaningless death, just like most of the senju clan did. When I heard that my anger exploded. What is the hell? The senju made the CRA happen. They made Konoha. They are the greatest clan to ever live. Then I angrily stormed out of the tent. Who does he think he is, insulting my clan like that in front of my face? He should be thankful to the Senju, everyone should, they created Kanoha. They all died for Kanoha and its people, they died an honorable death, forever remembered as heroes. Out of anger I just ran into the forest. The Senju sacrificed their lives for generations for Kanoha, and this is the thanks they get, Yummy POV. I just see Hachi, my son run out of the tent. As expected, he got offended way too quickly. But I guess it should be expected of a six-year-old. Though he will still learn his lessons, that is my job as a father after all. Then I just stealthily followed him as he was running. Well trauma is the best teacher in my opinion, that is how I learned most of the important lessons. Then as Hachi was running, when he ran quite far away and was a little out of breath, a big brown snake I had under a Jinjutsu, the snake was as thick as a tree, and as long as a two-story house. The big snake was hiding in the mud when Hachi ran past it, and didn't notice that it was there. The snake under my Jinjutsu immediately, fwash the snake prowled towards Hachi. Ah. Screamed Hachi as the snake slithered and wrapped its body around Hachi, and started using force on its grip that it had around his body. His bones started cracking a bit as Hachi just screamed even louder. Ahhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
True a water clone has 5-10% of my power, and it is mostly used as a distraction or trap by most ninja, due to the liquid properties of the water. When the clone it is stabbed, it has a sensation kind of like the same as stabbing a human. Use it with some Jinjutsu to make the water that flows from the clone red like blood, and then you have a pretty realistic distraction. Even though the water clone is pretty weak in a fight, your everyday Chunin would have a hard time fighting against my water clone. Then I look into the fight and analyze it. Hachi makes some water clones for himself using the water of the lake he is standing on. He makes 10 water clones, and I can sense his chakra levels plummet to around 20% left. He has Genin chakra mount, pretty good for a 6 year old. But I must say, wasting your chakra making water clones is quite dumb. Though I am a little pleased that he can do the water clone jutsu with just one hansing. But he still should have used all of the hand signs of the jutsu, so he can lessen the chakra needed for it. And then Hachi and his water clones run towards mine, and I notice one of his clones go underwater. My clone has a calm look on his face, and just kicked two of Hachi's clones obliterating them. Then Hachi together with all of his clones, jump toward my clone, trying to beat him with numbers. Then suddenly Hachi, Fwash replaced himself with a water clone that he had underwater, and tried to grab my clone by his ankles. But my clone dodged that by jumping up, but Hachi just smiled at this, and threw a kunai towards the clone. The clone just takes out his own kunai to deflect and, Ching he deflects it, but hidden, in the shadow of the first kunai was a second one, my clone's eyes widen a little, but still my clone had around 5% of my speed and perception, so that was enough for him to also deflect the other kunai too. And as the clone is about to fall back one to ground all of Hachi's water clones attacked my clone, but my clone landed back on water, and the other water clones tried to hit him, but he just dodged and, whoosh, with a slash of his kunai, he killed all of the clones. But suddenly from underwater, boom may water giant ball jumped from underwater and hit my clone, shredding him apart, dispelling it. Hachi just slowly came above water he didn't use water walking, but he just floated above water breathing heavily, I sensed that his chakra was almost all exhausted bordering on chakra exhaustion. He couldn't even use water walking anymore. I could see it now, the look that Hachi had when he fought. That cold calculating hidden in his eyes, as expected from my son. Though it is kind of disappointing that he is only like that during fighting, out of combat he is just goofy as hell. I guess he still is a senju and no matter how much he is my son, but being goofy isn't a problem, as long as it's not during combat. But he is my son, not my clone, so we being different is inevitable. But he would probably be terrible for Anbu or spy missions. I just sigh and then go towards Hachi, I walk on the lake, and when I arrive close to Hachi, and he is sleeping. I just smile a little and carry him piggyback. During this week I have taught him how to fight opponents stronger than him, and how to perfectly use the basic three techniques that are learned in the academy. He has a certain bullheadedness that allows him to train a lot to achieve his goals, and since the snake incident he has a goal to surpass all of the senju in history. That is honestly a good goal, but he doesn't have even the slightest comprehension on why Hashirama was called the god of shinobi. True that Hiruzen is also called that, but comparing Hiruzen with Hashirama is like comparing a mouse to a dragon. Most likely Hachi will try to surpass Hiruzen, since he will think that he is around the same strength as Hashirama, or maybe just a little below it, but still around somewhere there. I just sigh and, flush in a dark flash, the scenery in front of me changes as I am back to Kanoha. I just make a shadow clone without having the need to use hand signs, I overcame that hurdle a long time ago. The clone takes Hachi of me, and he, goes away, he will take Hachi to one of my clinics to rest. I have another problem to take care of. I just take a deep breath, and, my senses expanded, finally I locked in who I wanted to find, Tsunade, and since this is Kanoha I have Horatian markers all around the village. Fwash I just appeared at the Senju clan compound, more specifically I was at one of their hot springs. Well when in Rome, I just got rid of all my clothes, tied a towel around my midsection and went towards the hot spring where Tsunade was. It seemed like she was all alone in here. I entered the hot spring and watched Tsunade relaxing in there, all by herself. I just sigh at this, she looked toward me with a calm look, she already knew I was here, I didn't try to hide my presence at all. I also had a calm look on my face and just said. Well hello there Tsunade sensei. General POV Tsunade just looked at Yami as he entered the hot springs. She could see his body rippling with compact muscles, trained to 100%, she hadn't even thought that it was possible, but he has achieved the perfect muscle and fat ratio. Also with her experience in medical ninjutsu, the way his muscles twitched when Yami moved, she noticed the overwhelming amount of pink muscles. His medical knowledge and medical ninjutsu has already surpassed mine. Thought Tsunade with a feeling of shock blooming inside of her. After all, she has spent countless time and had the Senju library together with notes from her grandfather and grandmother, for Yami to surpass all of them at only the age of 18, that shocked Tsunade to the core. Yami just looked at her with a nonchalant look on his face. He just relaxed in the hot spring. You know Tsunade, I always like to keep things in control, I don't like not knowing things. I thought that you knew how to use a contraceptive jutsu or something like that. Tsunade have already prepared for questions like this from Yami, though she didn't expect him to be so calm about this. He is talking about this complicated situation as if he is talking about the weather, Yami even has the audacity to look bored while asking these things. Yami just looks at Tsunade with his nonchalant face, awaiting her answer. 
Sunade also just stared back at Yami thinking about the messed up situation that they are in right now. She even felt a certain nervousness raised inside of her as she just looked at those cold eyes of his and finally she got the courage to answer him. I didn't want to kill a baby, no matter how you put it, this would be like taking a baby's existence from them, who am I to decide that? Also the Senju clan needs an heir anyway, so I kept him. Yami for the first time since this meeting started just smiled at Tsunade. Truly a good story, but you can tell me the truth now. Tsunade felt shocked when she saw how Yami saw through her lie immediately. Is he just guessing? Thought Tsunade, while trying to keep herself from giving any information to Yami from her body language. Her body didn't give out anything, so she tried to keep to her story. I don't know what you are getting at Yami. But that is the truth, if you decide to believe it or not is up to you. The amused smirk on Yami's face unnerved Tsunade to no end. I suppose it is only to be expected. You have my pity. Said Yami with the smirk still on his face. While cold black eyes looked at Tsunade. She felt as if he already knew everything just by looking at her with his dark eyes as Yami continued saying. Do you know what classifies as truth or lies? Tsunade just frowned at this. Where are you trying to go with this Yami? Said Tsunade with an impatient tone in her voice. Just humor me, will you Tsunade? What does truth and lies mean to you? Asked Yami in a mysterious tone that creeped out Tsunade to no end. Even though she felt a little fear from Yami's words she didn't display it on the outside. They mean what they are supposed to mean. Answered Tsunade with a casual voice that she was faking. Yami still kept smiling at her. There is no such thing as truth or lies in this world, there never has been. There are only plain, hard facts. And. Said Tsunade as her mask started to slowly crack a little, and the fear started appearing on her face. And yet, all beings who exist in this world take only those facts that are convenient to them, and take them to be the truth. They do so because they know no other way to live. However, for those powerless beings that make up the majority of this world, it is those facts that are inconvenient for their own self-affirmation that make up the real truth. Said Yami with an amusing toned voice, and then suddenly his face turned back to his cold look. That is why when you say to me your reason, you say that it is the truth, even you yourself might believe this, but now, tell me the facts and how it is. Tsunade has to physically try to stop her body from shaking in fear, as she understands that Yami has already seen through her facade. Even while Tsunade was having this state of panic Yami simply said. You can start talking now. Tsunade had to forcefully calm herself down. This was an unpredictable situation to her. Yami was too knowledgeable about the situation. He most likely knows what happened already and what my thought process was back then when I noticed that I was pregnant. I was not even thinking of my clan or even Yami, I was thinking that it was my love given form, a physical representation of my love for Dan, but instead it was a child born of sin. Hachi and Yuzuka is truly the son of Yami and Yuzuka. At first I didn't want to believe it, but the blood tests that I did and everything else points towards Yami. Thinks Tsunade while diving into her memories. She just looks at Yami while saying. Hachi might have been a mistake but, he is still my son, and I plan to raise him like it. Well, I can't say you have been doing a good job at it can I, with your drinking and whoring yourself around. Said Yami with a mocking tone in his voice. But as soon as he says this Tsunade gets angry and rushes towards him, her towel falls off, and she is running naked, towards Yami. She punched him in the face. You think of me as some cheap whore you fucking bastard. Boom but to her surprise her fist with all of her power behind, is blocked by Yami's palm. Then she uses her other hand and, boom her punch this time, landed on his chin, fwash, and Yami's body was sent flying high in the air. Tsunade jumps high and appears above Yami. Then she clasped her hands together and, hit Yami on his stomach as he was sent barreling into the ground. Boom Yami landed on an empty building in the Senju clan compound, obliterating the building and creating a crater where the building used to be. Then Tsunade landed on the ground and started walking towards Yami. Ready to plummet him some more, she is sure that he can handle a little bit more, if he can she will just heal him and plummet him all over again. You shouldn't forget who taught you all of your tricks Yami. Said Tsunade with an angry tone. Then as she got close to the crater she saw Yami sprawled in there looking at the sky, it seemed like he had no injury on his body and no bleeding, that surprised Tsunade. Yami just looked at her. Weak. Was all Tsunade heard before. Burst the next thing she felt was something piercing her chest, she turned to look behind her and saw a naked Yami just smiling at her. Weaker than expected. Said Yami as he ripped out his arm that was going through Tsunade's chest. Tsunade's body fell to the ground like a puppet with its strings cut off. She immediately activated the seal in her forehead that covered her body in Fuinjutsu lines that started healing her injuries. Though this would take quite a while to heal since Yami deliberately obliterated a part of her spine to temporarily paralyze her. Now that we can talk normally again, I will start first by saying, you are and will be a horrible mother. Hachi will never achieve his full potential with you raising him. But don't worry, I am not like some other men who want a descendant to for their legacy to live under some dumb shit like that. You can keep what happened between us hidden forever, it will be our little secret. Hachi can learn of it when the time is appropriate, but he will train with me, and I will teach him how he should act and all that. You can continue your drinking and alcoholism. Don't worry though you can still meet Hachi whenever you want, but if you go to meet him you will need to be 100% sober. After all, my son doesn't need vices like drinking or gambling. Said Yami, as he started walking away. 
He used a storage seal to bring out a blanket that covered Tsunade's chest and lower body while she healed. He also pulled out some clothes for himself, put them on and he started walking away. But as Yami was still in hearing range he heard Tsunade, as she with some difficulty said, title. Shiro the Ninkan, Tsunade with difficulty said, he is still my kid, Yami halted on his step for a second, but he continued walking again. Maybe if you get completely sober, you can come and live at my house, where Hachi will be staying. It's not too late to stop acting like a weak woman and be yourself. The Tsunade I knew before, she is broken now. Maybe then, you would be a mother that Hachi can look up to. Said Yami. Couple of days later General POV Team 13, or also known as Team Yami, were in the Inuzuka training grounds, waiting for their Jounin teacher to show up. He had been absent for a week, but they still had his shadow clones to train them. Kurenai was leaning on a tree while reading a book, Guy was doing one-handed push-ups. Then there is Asuma, he is lying on the ground napping, but Yami's Ninkan Shiro kept nudging Asuma. Asuma just turned around, but Shiro who was transformed into his small white puppy form, just kept nudging him. Asuma finally just gave up trying to nap, and while still lying down he just turned around. He lazily opened one eye and said to Shiro. What do you want now Shiro? Shiro just straightened his body as his tail wiggles behind him, Shiro just opened his mouth and, go buy me some Raymond, human. A deep voice came from the small Ninkan. He had learned how to talk quite a while ago, when Yami is around he acts all cute and all that. But as soon as Yami looks away, Shiro overly abuses his power and orders people to do stuff for him, like buy him food, scratch his back and pick up his poop. Asuma's eyes fully opened, he was no longer sleepy. As if I will do that you stupid dog. Shiro just calmly looks at Asuma. Then he just turns around and, makes a shit and turned back towards Asuma. Pick up my poop. Asuma immediately got up and backed away from the poop. What the hell you stupid dog, that is gross why would you do that? Shiro just smirked and said. Pick up that poop. No way I am doing that you stupid dog. Angrily said Asuma, with a face full of anger. Shiro keeps humiliating them repeatedly like this. He is very demanding and thick-skinned, when Yami isn't around he even walks like he owns the land he is stepping on. You know how Yami-sensei is about cleanliness Asuma, he would probably ground you for a month. You know that Shiro also likes to exaggerate things when he reports to Yami, so you have to take that into consideration. Even while saying this, Kurenai had a calm look on her face. She and Shiro had made a deal that she would help him if he gave some of Yami's shirts to her. Kurenai knows this is kind of creepy, but as long as no one finds out, then that is okay. Guy didn't care about any of this as he started doing some thumb push-ups. When he heard all of this Asuma decided to give it up. With a resigned face he asked. So does anyone have a plastic bag or anything like that? Shiro just innocently looks at Asuma and he says. I have a thin napkin if you want. Asuma just sighed in resignation as he felt his pride being stepped on and strangled to death. Then came the final nail in the coffin as Shiro said in a haughty voice. Maybe if you do your job well, I might be generous enough to pay you for a dear ank mission, human bitch, unknown to them. The biggest thing Shiro and Yami have in common is, their pettiness, while this was all happening, Yami was hiding in the trees looking at them. His Ninkan Shiro truly is a source of entertainment for him, his personality is just too fun. He had just taken care of registering Hachi in the academy. He also just finished putting some explosion seals inside Hachi's scalp, it's true that Hachi was his kid, but why would that make any difference to him? Itachi was for Gaku's kid, look where that went. Anyway Hachi isn't that important at the moment, he should concentrate on the more immediate stuff. Yami POV. Even while looking at my gen and I couldn't help but think about my latest problem. My power has almost peaked again, I have 5 hearts that I have created by myself, for myself. I even replaced my original heart with a better wind affinity heart. My chakra will still continue to grow until I naturally have as much chakra as 5 strong cage level chakra. I even have wood style now, with just that alone I would easily classify as S rank, but wood style uses too much chakra, and it's nowhere near Hashirama's level. But I am still nowhere near satisfied, Kagaya, the other Atsutsuki, I want to be so strong that even the Shinigami himself would fear taking my soul. But if I reach that goal what would I do next, I want to be omnipotent and omnipresent, I want to be god, not some god just a name, like the god of death or so on, I want to be the god, the one who knows everything and has the power to do everything. Even after that I want more, there definitely exist other worlds out there, I want to conquer them all, I want everything that the multiverse has to offer and some more. I want to play with people like they are my toys. I want to be able to express my sins upon the world without fear of something happening. Is that so unfair to ask for, then a twisted smile forms on my face as my thoughts go into dark places. If I was born with the ability to choose and have free thought, why shouldn't I chase towards godhood? If from the very start, no one has stood upon the absolute throne of worlds. Not me, nor even the so-called gods. However, that intolerable vacuum has to come to an end. Henceforth I shall strive to stand upon the absolute throne heavens and rule over all. Okay that is enough time contemplating stuff like this, I haven't even achieved my current goals. Biting more than I can chew would be dangerous, I need to be extra careful if I want to reach my dreams. After Asuma cleans Shiro's feces, I just started normally walking towards my team. I had a look of complete disinterest as I just looked at them with a bored look in my eyes. Hello there my students, how was your training while I was away? 
Hope you didn't fuck around and waste your life away. I joke with them in a soft tone. Come on now sensei, you don't have to word it like that. It's just one week. Said Asuma as he tried to soften the talk a little. I just gave him one look and he just shrunk back. Then I noticed a look on his eyes as he then tried to change the subject. Also sensei Shiro is being cruel and petty again. Complained Asuma, all the while pointing at Shiro. I just looked at Shiro, he was on his back, showing his stomach to me as his tail was wriggling around. He acts innocent as he tries to play with me. Is what Asuma said true, Shiro? I asked. Shiro just turned back on his feet and with an innocent look in his eyes he said. Of course not Yami, you could even ask the others. I just looked towards Guy, who had stopped his training as soon as I arrived. I was training sensei, so I wasn't really paying attention. Answered Guy. Next was Koronai, she looked unsure of what to say. Then I noticed Shiro making strange expressions towards Koronai, but I simply acted like I didn't notice it. He is most likely threatening to expose the weird stuff that she does with my shirts, I really don't know how to confront her about that. It's like the fib agent can't comfort someone for watching weird PRN, since they would have to admit that they are spying on them. So I just let the situation be, I am sure that Koronai will grow out of her creepy phase, hopefully. Oh, I am not sure, I don't think Shiro said that. Answered Koronai with a guilty expression on her face. I just shrugged my shoulders. Well it doesn't matter anyway, as I just came to tell you all that I have registered you for the Chunin exams that are going to be held at Kusagakur. They all seem a little surprised at that. But I put on a serious expression and started explaining the situation to them. Well the truth is that, before this year is over, we will be having another ninja war, I am just drinking some good tea in the morning, like always. Yesterday I explained to my gen in the details about the Chunin exams. I myself never had one since I was promoted on the battlefield. Which was easier to me, at the time, because I was concentrated on power, than some survival tests that can be passed even by unskilled people if they were lucky enough. I mean during the canon timeline, none of the Kanoha 12 were really even qualified to become Chunin. I mean, give a battle heart in Junin, and it will wipe the floor with the likes of Naruto, Sakura and Sasuke. I mean the ones likely had enough power but lacked the leadership and intelligence to be a Chunin. But I guess those will be different times. Three hours later and I am a Kusagakur, of course I didn't teleport my genin here. They need to learn how to handle their own problems now, and since war is Klossabi they need to be especially careful. Kusagakur are also known as the village hidden in the grass isn't anywhere as impressive as Kanoha. It is a small ninja village and generally has a very gloomy atmosphere. I mean even the buildings are painted in darker colors. Anyway, I have a lot of Horatian seals around here too. This is my backup, in case I ever become a missing nin. In the next election of their cage, the guy who I control should become the next leader of the village. I have stacked the deck so much in my favor, it really does reassure me, somewhat, I am not as worried about the third war as I was about the second. I was a weakling back then. Only as strong as a chunin. But now, now it's different, general POV. While this was happening to Yami back in Kanoha, his ninja dog Shiro was having a whole different dilemma. Shiro was looking at the menu on a Raymond stand that he likes. Which one do I pick, Yami gave me 100,000 Ryo, and that is my salary while he is away, it's going to be hard to manage it. I mean that is what a normal family makes in a month. But I am not some normal family, I am used to a certain type of lifestyle. While picking Raymond I would say all of each dish, just taste them all, and then leave. Thought Shiro, while he is faced with one of the toughest decisions he has ever made. Then suddenly as he is contemplating this a red-haired female, who seems around 19 years old, she has a jounin outfit on, and her hair is tied like on a ponytail. Shiro just looked at her and felt a familiarity about her, like he had met her somewhere. Is she someone I have scammed before? Thought Shiro. He truly scammed and bullied a lot of people so he can't remember them all. Shiro was about to insult the tomato hair lady, but, his instinct stopped him from doing that, huh, I guess I shouldn't do that. She seems dangerous and unstable. Plus the negative emotions coming out of her are overwhelming, is she the nine tails jinchuriki that Yami sometimes talks about? Contemplated Shiro. Two months later it was your average sunny day here in Kanoha, the sun was bright, the birds were singing, and people seemed to enthusiastically talk to each other. But if you look underneath the underneath, you will find a lot of ninja, who are on edge. The skirmishes amongst borders of the countries are escalating. Soon enough Anbu will have to be sent out there, and then, all hell will break loose. The third Hokage was taking care of some paperwork. In such dire times each paper had to be looked over carefully, after all war times are very close. There must be some budget cuts that need to go towards the army. The Hokage was deciding if raising taxes would be a valid decision that would give the ninja better equipment, and because of that, it would raise the chances of victory dramatically. The Hokage, even though he has finished grieving for his friend Danzo. He still remembered when he would ask Danzo for counsel on decisions like this. He was always an extremist, if Danzo had his way, 80% of the budget would go towards our army. But even with such bad suggestions, Hiruzen still got a lot of insight from it. Danzo's peerless spy network would have to be replaced, Orochimaru has been working on taking over the job. Decided Hiruzen. At the gates of Kanoha, in a black flash Yami and his genin team appeared. Everyone was uninjured and looked the same, except the genin looked tired and had chunin vests on them, so they had all graduated and become chunin. Yami just looked at his team and said. 
Since I have teleported you here and now you are all Chunin, there is no need for you to go into Seer B rank missions with me anymore. You can do them by yourself. Yami just looked at them and smiled slightly. But remember, you will always be team number 3, and will always be my students. Now you can fly on your own, so go and spread your wings, make me proud, leave behind a legend that will be spoken for many generations. While Yami was saying this, Kurenai was blushing, Guy was crying, and Asuma just smiled a little. They had come so far in so little time because of Yami. Then Yami started walking away from his students. When Guy, Kurenai and Asuma see his back, all three of them bow down to their waists and loudly say. Thank you for everything Yami-sensei. Yami stops in his tracks, his face has a calm expression like always, a small smile appeared on his lips as he turned around and gave his students a thumbs up. I am proud of you guys, and just because you are tuning it isn't the end of the road. Read the books that I gave to you as presents after the exam. They have a step-by-step -step explanation on how to become an S-rank ninja. I made it for each of you, especially for your chakra natures and specialities. When they hear that, they are all surprised that Yami spent so much time writing a book for each of them. Even when he is not their teacher he will be guiding them on, after that whole fiasco with the kids. Yami went to his clan company and saw that everything was okay. As he is walking every Inuzuka, when they see Yami they bow a little and say. Yamasama. Yami just smiled at them warmly. Then while he was walking he sensed Shiro sleeping in one of the doghouses. That is where they raised their Ninkan, and he was a little curious at what Shiro has been up to when he has been away. When Yami enters the house, he sees a lot of dogs all around, everything seems normal, some dogs are playing, some sleeping and so on. He stops his chakra flow and dulls his emotional state to stop Shiro from sensing him. Since Shiro has had a fusion with some flesh of the Zero Tails, his sensing abilities are pretty good. Then Yami finally entered the last room. In there he saw, Shiro on his back, he is covered by dog food, while some other dogs are licking him. Whoa yeah yeah. Moans Shiro, while surrounded by dogs licking him. Yeah you bitches, lick me, you whores, says Shiro with his tongue out and a satisfied expression on his face. Yami just looks at Shiro, he obviously knows what his Ninkan is like when he is not around, but even he was surprised by this. Yami just sighs and with a calm voice he calls out. Shiro. Immediately, as soon as he heard this, Shiro's eyes widened, he looked around and spotted Yami. He rolls on his feet and even while covered by dog food he says. Yami this isn't what it looks like. Yami just raised a questioning eyebrow. I am pretty sure this is what it looks like. Didn't you always say that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover? If in the cover of the book it is written, dog covered in food and moaning while being licked by other dogs, I don't think I need to read the book to know what is written inside. After the whole fiasco was Shiro being gross. Yami went towards his house, he hadn't been back for two months since he was at the Chunin exams, they were boring as heck, and he spent most of his time looking for any good looking Kanoichi, female ninja, to manipulate to sleep with him. There weren't really many important foreign powers in Kusagakur during the exams, because of the times of almost conflict. When he arrived at his house Yami felt the four chakra signatures in his backyard. He enters the house and with his instinctual silent walking, he arrives at the backyard. In the backyard there is a sakura tree and a pond, there he also sees Tsunade, Tsun, Miss Yoon, his mother, and Hachi. His mother and Tsum were sitting on the porch, while Tsunade was instructing Hachi how to water walk while at the same time holding a leaf on his forehead. Tsunade was sober, which was Yami's condition, for her to meet up with Hachi. Yami just looked at this with analytic eyes, he determined that Tsunade must have been sober for some time, since she and Hachi showed such familiarity while she was instructing him. Hachi, concentrate, don't think about anything else. Instructed Tsunade, while she was also doing the same exercise as her son, so she can show him that it is possible, she even encourages Hachi. Which pushes him to try harder since, before he got to live in Kanoha, he never got any compliments from his mother. Yami just went forward and gave a casual greeting. Yo. What have you guys been up to? Immediately they all turned around, not having noticed that Yami was here at all. Even Tsunade was a little surprised, after all even she, an s rank ninja didn't notice him. She has already acknowledged that Yami is stronger than her. But noticing him shouldn't have been so hard. Maybe I have gotten a little rusty during these last few years. Thought Tsunade. Miss Yoon just smiles and her age truly shows with that. She is almost 40 years old, and during the time while her son, Yami, was in the front lines, the stress that she experienced during that time has made her seem a little older than her real age. She gets up and hugs Yami, with a loving smile on her face. Welcome back Yami. Yami also hugged her back, and a smile appeared on his face. And a true genuine looking loving expression appeared on his face. I am back mother, I hope you didn't miss me too much. Soon just has a calm expression on her face. Welcome back Yami. Hachi and Sunade also give their greetings, while the latter had a strange look in her eyes. Tsunade hasn't forgotten about the things Yami said to her, and him punching through her with his fist. She still remembers the pain of her spine being obliterated, and having to carefully and slowly heal that type of injury is very painful, but not overly so, Sun has had to heal from worse during the second ninja war. Yami sat down with Tsum and his mother, while Tsunade continued lecturing Hachi on how to control his chakra better. But still they weren't having any progress, and Hachi was still deep up to his knee on the pond, while trying to hold the leaf on his forehead. 
Then after a dozen of minutes of just watching Yami decided to take action by himself. How long has Hachi been training in this chakra exercise? Asked Yami with a curious tone to his voice. Sune just gave him a side glance, her eyes shining in the light as she answered. He has been at this for two weeks, but is doing very good progress for his age. I remember the Jiraiya couldn't do this exercise up to his 20s, it took him almost 5 years to do. Yami noticed how she didn't say anything about how quick she or Rajamari did the exercise. He could already guess that it didn't take too long for either of them, they probably mastered it in weeks. Sune just doesn't want to pressure Hachi. But she is being too soft of him, that would be detrimental to his growth and possibly make him arrogant. I have already trained him to be way above any of his classmates, so he might start having some dumb ideas or notions. He needs a strong male figure in his life. The one that will take him off the wrong drugs and put him in the right drugs, okay maybe not that last part. Thought Yami amusingly, while at the same time he was observing Hachi. Suddenly his eyes flash red for a split second, with no one noticing it. Then he got up and slowly walked towards the pond where Tsunade and Hachi were. True Jiraiya might have taken that long, but I learned this exercise under a week. I wasn't necessarily talented either. So the conclusion is that, you Hachi are not working hard enough. Scolded Yami, with a soft voice. Hachi was speechless at this, and Tsunade wanted to say something, but Yami stopped her by using sign language and telling her that he has everything under control. Then he walked on the water and went close to Hachi. He crouched down and acted like he was looking at Hachi's legs. He gets up and says. That won't do, your problem is not that you can't concentrate on two things at once, I know how we can solve this. Get off the pond. Mentions Yami. Hachi followed his instructions and did so. Sune just sighed and went to sit down next to Tsum and Yami's mother. Yami then took two sticks from a sakura tree and said. Take these and try to draw a circle and square on the ground at the same time. This sounded easy to Hachi, and he tried to do it, but he couldn't, he tried again he still didn't do it right. While Hachi was trying to get it right, Yami went and sat down next to Tsunade. When Miss Yoon, Yami's mother, saw how good Yami was at training Hachi, she couldn't help but say. You are good with kids Yami. You truly look like father and son. Tsunade flinched a little at this, while Yami only had a mysterious smile on his face when he heard this. Maybe I should become a father soon, who knows, I seem pretty good at it. Said Yami, while smiling at his mother. Soon immediately started having weird fantasies about having children with Yami, starting a happy family, while Miss Yoon spoiled her grandchildren, Yami, and she would be strict, but they wouldn't be the same. Yami would be the strict dad expecting nothing less than perfection, but she while being strict, would also be a little soft on her children. But while Tsun was thinking this Tsunade looked at Yami with her eyes hiding a certain feeling she had. Family, how well they were all talking about the family here, Yami had a melancholic look in his eyes, while thinking about another family altogether, one month later, general POV. During midday, in the Inuzuka training grounds, Yami was training. He was stretching and doing light exercises to warm his body up. He was shirtless and had even taken off his headband and put them to the side. His only clothes were his dark blue pants. As Yami finished the last warm-up, he took a deep breath, and slowly lightning rays started appearing over his skin, this is it. Thought Yami trying to motivate himself. Soon lighting encompasses his body, and, Fwash Yami blitzed two meters to the right, but as soon as he did so, he started smelling something burning. He looked at his hands and saw that his skin was slowly melting away. He tried to gain control of the lightning, but he couldn't so even half of his face melted away, showing a black skeleton beneath his flesh, as soon as Yami saw that he couldn't control the technique, he just stopped it. The lightning dispersed and everything went back to normal, his flesh knitted itself back together and in less than two seconds. His flesh was back to normal, I can't seem to have control over the lightning I generate from an ninjutsu, if only I had the jutsu scroll for the technique and how it is used. Contemplated Yami. He wasn't able to use the technique because he couldn't copy, even with the Sharingan, something at the level of the Rekage's lightning chakra cloak. But even at the failure Yami wasn't disappointed at all. He was at least making progress, and when he kills the third Rekage and experiments on his body and reads through his memories, Yami will figure out how the lightning armor works. I will not kill the Rekage for almost killing me during the second ninja war. Revenge is something that clouds the judgment of people and makes them act irrationally. I will kill the third Rekage because that is beneficial to me. Plus it wouldn't significantly change the future events that I know if I decide to kill him during the third ninja war. Though with my power rising to such levels lately, I have not even been that worried about such things like the timeline. I already have eyes everywhere in this world, even as far away as the land of demons. Calculated Yami with a strange glint in his eyes. After a couple minutes of resting while standing up, Yami suddenly looked towards some trees and with a cold face he said. You know for a san and you really aren't that good at stealth. Then a strange laughing tone comes from one of the trees, as it slowly morphed into a human figure, and that figure was, Arachimaru. He had his hands in his pockets as he calmly walked forward. As expected of you Yami. Your sensory abilities are extraordinary. I wonder how you got them. Said Arachimaru with a twisted gleam on his eyes. Yami had a bored look as his black eyes stared into Arachimaru's yellow eyes, which with the slit in them, they looked like the eyes of a snake. Yami wasn't scared of Arachimaru at all, but the gleam in his eyes definitely unnerved him. 
After all Orochimaru is someone dangerous and extremely intelligent, letting his guard down even slightly around him could be his end. When you talk, it almost feels like you are about to get to the point of something, but then you just babble on and on and on, says Yomi calmly while trying to discern Orochimaru's goal. Orochimaru doesn't take what Yami said as an insult, and he starts getting closer to Yami, his hands come out of his pockets as he says. Tell me Yami, what is the meaning of life? Yami still just had a bored look on his face as he said. Sai, life is what you make it out to be Orochimaru, now can you stop bothering me? Yami waved his hand to tell Orochimaru to go away. But Orochimaru's eyes had an even crazier glint on them. This slightly worried Yami and he clenched his muscles, ready for any sudden attack or anything like that. But Orochimaru asked again. What is your view on power then Yami? Yami just rubbed his eyes while acting annoyed. Sai you know, I was in the middle of something before you came here. And you coming here and asking these questions, not only does it seem suspicious, it also seems like the kind of thing that the T&I department might like to investigate. Yami said to Orochimaru while giving him a hidden threat. Hu hu hu, come on now Yami, me and you, we are the same, aren't we? I analyzed your behavior reports ever since you were young. You are a lot like me, and your dream isn't to be Hokage or anything like that, your dream is, immortality. Exclaimed Orochimaru as the grin on his face widened. You want to be perfect don't you? I have an idea, if you help me with something, I can give you a certain technique who would allow you to be perfect. As soon as Yami heard Orochimaru say that, his eyes became dull and the aura around him became colder. Even Orochimaru felt a small chill on his back, but he still had the crazy smile on his face. This reaction just confirmed my speculation. Analyzed Orochimaru. But suddenly as soon as it came Yami's cold aura calmed down, and he, smiled at Orochimaru as if mocking him. You know nothing Orochimaru, there is nothing in this world that is truly perfect. Though it may be a rather large cliche, it is still the truth. It is the ordinary people who look up to perfection as an ideal and seek after it. But in truth, what is this idea of perfection truly worth? Nothing? Not a single thing. I detest perfection. To be perfect is to be unable to improve any further. There would be no scope for creation, not a single gap in one's knowledge or one's ability. Do you see now? To true, scientists like you and I, perfection is tantamount to despair. We aspire to reach greater levels of brilliance than ever before, but never, never, to reach perfection. That is the paradox through which we scientists must struggle. Indeed, it is our duty to find pleasure in that struggle. In other words, the second you allowed yourself to spout a ridiculous word like perfect, in truth, you had already been defeated. That is, if you wish to be treated as a scientist. Arachimaru's eyes widened at the things that Yami said. The more Yami said the more Arachimaru was amazed. He had never heard something like this, in the end, Arachimaru's face calmed down, he turned away and started walking off without saying anything. Yami POV. I just looked at his back, should I kill him now, he got dangerously close to the truth, as expected of a true genius, even though I never underestimated him, neither did I ever let my guard down, he still figured me out. Truly terrifying, the geniuses in this world are scary. I mean someone like Kabuto was able to read the Ichiha tablet out of nothing. I don't even know how Orochimaru connected the dots to figure me out. Those expected, he tried to manipulate me by saying things like he will give me perfection and such things. When he wants to manipulate, Orochimaru is scarily good at it. But I already know how he is, so I would never accept anything from him. Still, I was able to amaze him, and this will lead him in a wild goose chase for at least a decade. Though I myself am nowhere near a genius, sometimes the smarter you are the easier you are to predict. Arachimaru will overthink the speech that I gave him, and will try to philosophically understand it. But the speech that I gave to him is complete and utter bullshit. Sai I better rest, tch, I hate people smarter than me, even though I will take absolute measures against Orochimaru, I am not necessarily too worried about what he can cook up, after all, not only do I know his secrets, I am also more powerful than him. Plus Orochimaru truly was impulsive with this. He probably came here to confront me as soon as he figured it out. Plus with that Kazi expression on his face as if he figured out the secrets to the world, and to me, he is simply, immature, Orochimaru POV Yami, 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 that has been the thing in my mind during the last week. Squish I look at the table and the human I was experimenting on, I accidentally squished its heart too hard, he is dead damn I really need to calm down. Anyway the thing the Yami said at the end brought chills to my body. I still can hear him say those words, ah, he is so perfect, his way of thinking is so refined, I was only able to realize how Yami truly was by torturing some people he knew, and getting what they remembered of him, I even read some memories from Yami's mother about when he was a kid. It was truly hard to get a Yamanaka to allow my mind access to Yami's mother's mind, even the Yamanaka who read her memories didn't notice it, but I did, as clear as day, Yami, even as a toddler was abnormally smart, just like me, ahhhh Yami, you are truly a magnificent specimen. Even though the Yamanaka cost me a lot, it was all worth it, it quenched my thirst for knowledge on Yami a bit, though trying to dodge his little mosquito spies is quite troublesome, some of them it's really hard to notice even for me. But it's nothing I can't overcome, I have already got the first half of the living corpse reincarnation, I am almost at the stage of fully immortalizing my mind. I was only able to get this part because of my old, dead, friend Danzo. Even he wasn't able to get the second part, since it is in the Forbidden Scroll, the one in the Hokage's office is obviously a fake. 
But I do know the location of the real one, now if only I could steal it. I was going to ask Yami for his cooperation, but he refused me so fast. I am so close to the immortality that I have dreamed of for so long. Finally I will achieve immortality, and then I can start working towards my dream of learning all of the jutsu in the world. Anyway, Yami when he acted angry and cold when I said what I had observed from him. He was faking it, but I didn't notice it at all until he just smiled a second later, with that he really told me that he can just fool me whenever he wants. But who else should I investigate to be able to get a clearer picture of Yami, while thinking this I decide to burn the body of the person I killed, since it might start to smell bad. Suddenly, I get an idea, a person who knows Yami since young, and saw his personality develop even while he was younger. Who better to ask than my good old teammate, Tsunade. Finding Tsunade wasn't that hard. Though it was a little surprising to see her, and her son. I heard that she had returned to the leaf months ago, but I didn't really care since I had research to do, but I found Tsunade and, her son, whatever his name, eating at an expensive sushi restaurant. While still in my gown and uniform, I made sure that I had no blood on my clothes, because of the recent experiment. Plus I heard some rumors from my spy network that Tsunade is now afraid of blood, how silly that is, she used to splatter on the ground, from ninja families, from children, to elderly, to mothers and fathers. She would splatter their organs around with only one punch, and now she is afraid of blood, anyway, after I enter the restaurant and see Tsunade wearing her grey upper body kimono shirt with blue pants and a thin coat around her shoulders, with the kanji for healer on the back of the coat. I get close to their table, which is in a pretty secluded corner of the restaurant, with a view of Kanoha. When he arrives at the table, he sees Tsunade who just looks at him and says. Hey Arachi, long time no see. I just smirk at her casual greeting. Yes, long time no see Tsunade, now you even have a child. Who would have guessed, Tsunade would become a mother. Tsunade just shrugs and says to her son. Come on now Hachi, introduce yourself to Arachimaru, he is an old teammate of mine, he is like, a weird uncle to you, I wouldn't recommend following him in a dark alley or eating the candy he gives to you. I just look at Tsunade, with a strange look on my face. Tsunade, I think you are not giving young Hachi any truthful information about me. Tsunade seemed to think a little more, and again she turned to her son. Oh yeah, actually it's not just a candy that he gives to you that you shouldn't eat, you really shouldn't consume anything Arachi gives to you. I just shake my head at this, it is ridiculous, and the poor child seems confused what Tsunade even means by what she said. My face becomes serious as I ask Tsunade. Tsunade, lately there has been a certain, individual of interest to me. Tsunade just has a confused look on her face. Then she looks at her child and says. Go back to the house Hachi. The kid nodded and started walking away as he said. It was nice to meet you, Uncle Arachi. I just smile at him and wave back. The little kid has had a good influence on Tsunade. It got her out of a phase where even I was unsure she would get out of. Then Tsunade takes a roll of sushi with her chopsticks and eats it, and with her mouth full she asks. So whomever is that person that you want to know about. Talking with her mouth full, that is as unladylike as you can go, but if I said that to her she would definitely punch me. I have known Tsunade for a long time, ever since back in the academy, and by the look in her eyes, she already knows what I am going to ask about. As I was deep in thought a waitress came and with a very obviously fake smile asked. What can I get you sir? Some fried eggs and possibly make them as hot as you can when bringing them here. I answered, eggs are my favorite food, and I generally like hot food. The waitress nodded and went away. I smirked towards Tsunade. I am sure you know that we are talking about Yami. Sigh, well as my teammate I can still only say to you, he is dangerous. Says Tsunade while pointing towards the waitress that just took my order. I looked at the waitress and noticed, nothing strange about her. Her chakra reserves are even lower than your average civilian, and there are no mosquitoes. I look at Tsunade with a little confusion evident in my eyes. Then she makes a hand sign that represents, spy what, oh shit, I have been concentrating on the mosquitoes, and forgot that he might actually have real human spies on this, damn, I got sidetracked. Even while thinking that I still have a calm look on my face. Well, now that I know that Yami is still spying on us, I can't really say anything. Tsunade still looked at me intently and said. I live with Yami and Yuzuka in his house together with my son, so don't mess around, he will not play around with you, with the war on the horizon, he will definitely go for the kill, and make it seem like it was done by enemies. I would suggest you also stop investigating him. Or you will be killed, when I see Tsunade's look in her eyes. I just nodded to express my understanding of the situation. She simply just told me that Yami will not be as soft as some other people. He will kill me whenever and wherever, he could strike while I am sleeping, eating, drinking or even while I am in the bathroom. Yami will immediately go for the kill, so that means that even I underestimated him a little, and thought that he wouldn't do that. Also, her saying that she lived with it meant that she would take Yami's side if a conflict took place. Damn, I mean Yami took out Danzo because he got in his way, but I am not doing any of that, I just want to understand him. With that being said, even during the rest of the meal I was restless, with what Tsunade had just said. We made some small talk during the meal, but I wasn't really even concentrated on it. Yami POV. While sitting on my couch inside my house. I look at the small contraption on my hands, a Rubik cube, easy and cheap to make. Now I just need to open a company where the labor is cheap for maximum profits, hmm, land of wind would be good. 
The people in the desert don't exactly have a rich economy, but Sand Village is a big problem. They would definitely sabotage my company if it's in their lands, so I need to find another place, oh I know, how about Land of Sand, that place is west of the Land of Wind, and it is a generally unknown place, which is often overlooked, and is not really in that many maps. It's decided then, I will open a company there for different small and easy to make things, maybe since the land is so poor, the officials should also be very corrupt. How do I use that, maybe bribe them to have some people who might be in labor camps to come and work there for me, that would definitely cut some expenses down, and more money for me. Hmm, I guess a shadow clone could go there and put some of their high officials under a Jinjutsu, that would put wage expenditure, to zero, not paying people for their work, okay then that is the plan, while I am contemplating different business ideas I can sense Tsunade walking towards the clan compound. Hachi had arrived earlier, but he went with Miss Yoon, my mother, to do some shopping. She truly adores Hachi, he is like the normal kid, as normal as a ninja kid can get, that she can finally spoil with gifts and all that. Even though she doesn't know that Hachi is literally her grandson, she does act towards him like she is his grandmother or, more like an aunt, I know that Orochimaru and Tsunade met, I also know that Orochimaru has noticed that I use mosquitoes to spy on people. Well it was bound to get out sooner or later anyway, and the summon lands do occasionally communicate amongst each other, and me taking over the blood swamp is a pretty big deal to them. So I had the waitresses spy on them, Tsunade noticed a waitress, and that was also a distraction since I actually had a spying seal under their table. That is one of the restaurants that I own, though to know that you would have to go through a special case of files in the civilians council's business room, which is a room full of copies leases for restaurants and other businesses, I know, the management in Kanoha sucks, I am definitely changing that when I become the Hokage, I am really good at this, anyway Tsunade comes inside the house. And then comes to the living room. Sadly TVs haven't been invented yet at this time, which kind of sucks. I remember from the Anime that during Naruto's generation, movies and TVs were already a thing. I kinda don't know how to create a TV, I never googled it as far as I can remember. If I had even a single memory of it, I would've gone through my memories and reread the memory and become the inventor of the TV, that would've made me so much money, a monopoly like that would be priceless, though I already have way more money than I might need, but there is never too much money. I bear the door open and Tsunade looks at me and with a complicated look on her face she says. As you predicted, Orochimaru did come to me, to ask questions about you, I could see her astonishment at how I was able to predict what Orochimaru would do next. Obviously I predicted that he would ask Tsunade, after all as her former teammate, Orochimaru trusts Tsunade quite a lot. After all he hasn't gone rogue ninja yet. But I just smiled at her, as I added more fuel to the fire. Yeah, he isn't as cunning as he thinks he is. Tsunade just sighs at that and said in an exhausted tone. Anyway, Hachi told me that he will be attempting an early graduation. God damn it, that kid, and I know Tsunade just dances around the problem like this, why can't she just get to the point and say that she wants you to convince Hachi to not do that? Then if he gets an early graduation he will also get an early death. Tell him that and I am pretty sure he would understand. I replied casually. Tsunade just frowned at that and got a little annoyed. That would discourage him from a ninja career. I shrugged. That is good then, he would live longer if he did that. But, Tsunade tries to say something, but she can see the logic to my words. It's true, it doesn't even matter if Hachi becomes a ninja or not. I mean sure people would judge him, but people who have the time to judge others aren't really worth even taking advice from. Also why would someone even care what people think of him, unless it has an advantage towards his goals. For example I acted all nice and good when I was younger because I was weak, and it benefited me. Now that I have power, politically and physically, why should I waste time thinking what other people think of me? I mean Hiruzen probably isn't that fond of me, and Tsunade too might not like me that much right now, since I am too dominant on everything I do. But they still don't have a choice but to put up with me. Anyway, Tsunade is saying useless things again. If Hachi wants to graduate early, let him do it, it doesn't matter if he dies or not, after all, death in this world isn't something permanent. I will just revive him when I get certain things in place. What is there to be worried about, I already have a bunch of cells from Hachi to be able to revive him with Ito Tensei. Three months later, General POV. All of the elite Jounin were assembled on the Hokage Tower, they were all inside a room with a map of the elemental nations in the table in the middle of the room. The Hokage was looking of all of the members present. Then he said. Arachimaru, Tsunade, Minato, Jiraiya, Yami and Fugaku. You are all the pillars of Kanoha. I need every one of you to go and lead the troops to guard the borders of each of the nations. Harrison mentioned all of the current S-ranked ninja in the village, except himself. The other Jounin who were here weren't offended, after all they knew it was the truth, the Hayuga were a little miffed about an Ichiha being called, but not a Hayuga, but they also knew that they didn't have any exceptionally strong members of the Hayuga clan. War is expected to erupt soon, and I don't want any of our borders unguarded. Today I have gathered you all here to decide which border each of you will be guarding. Explained Hiruzen with a grave expression on his face. Yami is the first to speak immediately, as soon as the Hokage finishes his speech. Yami decided to say, I will take the border against the Land of Lightning. I am fast and also a heavy hitter, I would be a perfect counter against a third Rakage. Said Yami with a casual tone. The Hokage thinks for a little, and then he nods. That sounds reasonable. Even though the third Hokage isn't fond of Yami. 
He still has a cordial relationship with him, after all he doesn't want anything like a civil war during these times. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Yami answered again. I would suggest Minato and Fugaku work together against a rock village, Minato could counter the Tsuchikage's atomic dismantling jutsu with his oration. And Fugaku could take care of any tailed beast that a rock village might decide to throw at us. He would probably be able to put them under a Jinjutsu to stop them. I can also lend him some paper seals that could suppress the Jinchuriki's chakra just in case. I would also suggest that Tsunade and Jiraiya handle the hidden sand village, Tsunade would be enough to hold Chiyo and her brother, since the Kazakiage died that would be enough, but their Jinchuriki of the One Tails would be a little hard to handle if they decided to use that one too. Then comes the real problem in there, since I have heard rumors form my spies that the most likely candidate for the next Kazakiage would also be able to control gold dust, with all that it would seem a little hard for only Tsunade alone to handle this. All of the people in the room looked at Yami with white eyes, a little amazed at what he an 18-year-old had said, and how he was able to make such an political plan so fast. Plus the spy network also seemed quite good considering the information that Yami just easily gave away, information like the next Kazakiage is supposed to be the highest level of S-rank secret information in the Sand Village. No spy network even caught wind of something like that. The Hokage just looked intently at Yami. He wasn't dumb enough to not see Yami's usefulness. He just came up with an amazing plan in case of war, so here is and decided to ask Yami again. Do you have any more ideas, Yami seemed to think for a little, but in the end he just said. No, not really, though I guess Arachimaru would go to the border in the land of water, against a hidden mist village, so no, I can't really add anything new. The Hokage nodded and after thinking for a couple of seconds he calmly said. Your plan is quite good Yami, but I see one flaw in it, the battle against a cloud village, where you will be guarding it. Can you handle the third rakage, I think that me coming and helping would be optimal. After listening to Hiruzen, Yami contemplates a little, but in the end he still says. There is no need, I can handle it. I think that you staying in Kanoha would be for the best, in case of an emergency in any battlefront, you could easily go and help thee within less than a day. But being with me, the travel time to the other borders would be significantly larger, and it could take up to 2-4 days of travel to reach the destinations from where I will be holding the front. And traveling long distances with Horatian is not worth it, since we could just teleport ourselves within a trap. Also, don't worry, I am confident on being able to handle the rakage. The Hokage still doesn't seem convinced yet and asks again. What if they bring their Jinchuriki in the fight, because even though the Eight Tails Jinchuriki is said to be young, and he probably can't control the tailed beast inside of him. He could still be dangerous, after all in a battle between equals even the smallest margin change could have an effect on battle results. As you all know, I am at my best against a Jinchuriki. With my Fuenjutsu to help me with it, the situation could be easily handled by a shadow clone of mine. Reassures Yami. Then Yami added. Also we should keep the Nine Tails Jinchuriki inside Kanoha, after all Kumo already tried to steal it once. What would be stopping them from doing it again? The Hokage nods, after all only Yami knows his abilities best, and he is an S-rank ninja. They know he won't overestimate himself needlessly, that is just a rookie mistake. The discussions on different battles start, they calculate the different scenarios that might happen, and how we will handle them. The Nara Jounin also try to change battle scenarios and make the best possible response for them. While they advise us on how we should handle the different situations that might arise. This is boring. Though Yami, as he was calculating which strings to pull to get some of the people he wants into his army. Yami just makes a hand seal towards Arachimaru, secretly signaling him to meet after this meeting. After the meeting we all had two days of break, before we needed to get to the front lines. As Yami was walking towards the exit and got ready to meet Arachimaru. He felt a hand on his shoulder, he turned around and saw Minato, who had a smile on his face. Hey Yami, long time no see, we should catch up, want to go to the Jounin bar close to the Anbu building. Yami POVI just looked at Minato and contemplated. We do usually meet at the Ichiraku Raymond stand, but even then we are always on a rush or something like that. So we didn't get to talk a lot, well I admit that it was mostly me not seeing a reason to talk to him, since I already got the Yuzumaki Fuenjutsu books from Kashina, she and Minato have become kind of useless to me, and I see no reason to even hang out with them. Kashina is too loud, and Minato is, kinda boring honestly. Yeah sure, I would like that. I will meet you there in 10 minutes. I have some. As my view changes, I see Arachimaru leaning on a tree, we are currently in the backyards and training grounds of the academy. Arachimaru has that intense gaze on his face as he looks at me. He still has that creepy obsession with me, that fucking pedo, anyway I just look at him calmly. What did you want to meet me for Yami? Asked Arachimaru, with a calm face. When I saw this I smirked. Well since you were so interested in me. I did a little investigation on you too. I must say that you have a lot of illegal stuff going on. Really? Human experimentation, kidnapping, torture, extortion and even had an underground lab built. Well that isn't illegal, but the money that you put in there, it wasn't in your researcher's tax, so you committed the worst of crimes, tax evasion. I can see that Arachimaru doesn't understand what I mean with the last part. But in my last world, when criminals were good at doing their crimes and not leaving any evidence, tax evasion was the crime that they mostly got caught with, I mean that is how some of the most infamous criminals were caught. 
Actually the law exists even in the Naruto world, though it is mostly overlooked, which won't happen once I become Hokage. I am definitely going to abuse that law, still I decided to clear things up for Orochimaru by saying. Don't worry about that made up law, I am just joking, but really though, immortality huh, I can't say I understand you. To me if life has no end there would be no meaning in life. I see Orochimaru immediately start to analyze every word I say, trying to understand my motives. Especially now that I know all of his dirty little deeds. Like always, it is so easy to make smart people overthinking bullshit that I say, meaning in life, what the hell is that, can you eat it? Why would anyone need a reason to live? People just live, with or without reason. People can make their own reasons to live, and they can make their own goals that they want to achieve. But I let Orochimaru contemplate the things I said for a couple of seconds as I said to him again. Okay now that you understand the situation you are in. I would like to make a deal with you. Orochimaru comes back to his senses, and a smirk appears on his face. And what would that deal entail exactly? My smirk matched his as I said. Well I am a curious man, just like you. So I would like for you to send to me certain types of people with certain types of bloodlines for me. It would also be preferable if the people were alive. Arachimaru with a smirk still on his face as he asks. And what about me, what benefits would I have? I just shrugged. Well when I went through your super secret lab, I saw how shitey the stuff was so I will offer you money, untraceable with no strings attached. You will get money so when the war ends you could build your super secret lab with the top equipment available. I know that even though ninjas generally make a lot of money. They don't make the type of money to be able to build labs worth around 100 million ryo. After all to build that you would have to hunt one or two S ranks. Probably more since the S rank battles don't leave a body behind. After all, an S rank body has a lot of secrets hidden inside it. But still without a body or head there is no bounty, so most likely an S rank ninja would have to locate an S rank, track him down, hope he isn't with friends, make sure that he doesn't escape and so much more. So in the end, Orochimaru's answer is, I will do it for 400 million Ryo, and I want 200 million beforehand. I smiled at his answer, he already knows that I will most likely go back on my word, he knows what I did with Danzo, so he asked me about a down payment because of that. Yeah sure, I take out two small scrolls as big as my little finger, my pockets and throw them towards Orochimaru. On there you have 200 million Ryo. He just nods, you will have your bodies when the war starts. Then he turned around and walked away, as I look at his back a sinister smirk appears on my face. Ah poor Orochimaru, he doesn't understand that he is already in my trap, even though he is a genius he doesn't know shit about things that aren't generally related to ninja things. For example, just because he has the money, that doesn't mean that he can just magically buy a lab, he needs to have certain connections and contracts to be able to buy scientifically advanced machines or parts for the machines. That money is just paper, it won't really do anything for him. I will block every channel legal or in the black market, he is not getting his little lab anytime soon. I have already bought the companies that create stuff for labs, and closed the other companies who did the same service as my company. I closed them by lowering the price of my product so much that I didn't win anything from the companies for some time, but it forced the other companies to shut down, so here I am, the only private producer of 99.99% of fabrically made machinery, damn I am good at this shit, then I also decided to Horatian towards the meeting place that I had with Minato. Flush and so I disappeared with the now iconic Dark Flash, Minato POV I look around me and see a bunch of Jounin just getting drunk. I don't really blame them, honestly any of them could die in the coming war, actually most of them might die. Even, I myself might die, during the second ninja war one didn't really participate in a lot of all out wars, usually Jiraiya sensei was around to help me and not let me die. War is so chaotic, one stray kunai and you could easily die, Kashina has been helping me lately sharpen my instincts even more, after all I don't want to teleport in front of a kunai and die. My shunshin and Horatian are my best moves right now. Since battles can last so long amongst a big number of ninja, I usually save chakra and use shunshin or Horatian. That is how I earned myself the moniker Yellow Flash, I even have a bounty of 64 million. Though amongst the Kanoha S rank I am quite new. Also I don't have a finishing move in my arsenal, I definitely need that. Plus I have Kakashi to take with me, I truly hope he survives this war, poor child, his father committed suicide, and he was the first to find the dead body. Anyway I look at the clock and see that Yami will come in 5 minutes, he is very punctual about things like this, and will always be on time, like exactly on time, as I am currently sitting on one of the tables as I wait for Yami, now that is an amazing person if I have ever seen one. Ever since I was young I was way better than all of my peers, I understood that, so I like to help my friends be as good as me, after all having another friend watching your back is never bad. I even wanted to graduate with my friends, which would have been when we were all 10, but then I saw him, Yami and Yuzuka. Everything I did good, he did it perfectly, he easily broke through all of the records I had set in the academy. Even while he did all that, I noticed that he didn't see any of these things worth his attention. He didn't even care that he was the best in his class. Since I am a long range sensor I was able to sense his chakra clearer when he was further away from me. He even had a higher chakra amount. That is when I understood, I will never be Hokage if I don't give it my all. So I decided to graduate at 8 years old, 2 years before the time I had decided previously. I decided to train with my Jonin teacher Jureya as hard as I could. 
I wanted to put as much distance as I could between Yami and Yuzuka and me. And I made great progress, and Jiraiya sensei even decided to make me the next Toad Summoner. I could confidently say that I had left Yami in the dust in just one year, but as soon as he became a genin, he caught up to me, and more, so you could say the rest was history. But Yami is also better with women, the girls loved him. I remember the way Kashina used to look at him. She always had those dreamy eyes and longing expressions on her face when she saw Yami. But then that faded day came, when Kashina was kidnapped, we saved her, and for the first time I understood, no deep down I had known that a long time ago, but I simply didn't want to accept it, Yami and Yuzuka never even saw me as competition, I was just a stepping stone for him. At the end it is true, I did end up dating the woman of my dreams, Kashina, and for that I am thankful to Yami. He truly did bring me and Kashina together, he is a true friend, also I finally thought that Horatian would give me an edge over Yami, and even wanted to ask him to spar when I learned it, but, I got news that he also had learned it, one week after me. I had the help of Kashina to learn and master the Horatian, but Yami still outdid me and learned it by himself. That guy really is super talented, I also noticed that while I was deep in thoughts I drank half a bottle of sake already, without Yami even coming here yet, I look at the clock and see that he has another 2 minutes until he will come, exactly on time like always. I wonder if Yami is dating anyone, if he isn't maybe I can return the favor and find him a girlfriend. I think that one of Kashina's friends, Makoto, would be nice for Yami. She is pretty and is from a great clan, the Achiha clan. But maybe Yami is dating someone in secret, but even then technically me and Kashina are dating in secret, but ask any Jounin, and even most Chunin will know that we are really dating. But now that I think about it, I have never even heard of any rumors about Yami's love life. Damn, I'm thinking about getting Yami a girlfriend at the brink of another ninja war, I must really be drunk, should I dispel the alcohol inside my system, nah, I came here to relax, so that is what I am going to do, then, as I was thinking that, I hear the front door open and saw, Yami in the flesh, I just wave towards him and say. Here, Yami. He looked towards me and smiled. When he got close to me, he sat down on the table and took the chair opposite to mine while asking a rhetorical question. So I guess you are already drunk right? Since you should remember that I am a sensor and can easily sense your chakra, you didn't need to call my name. As expected of him, sharp as always, Yami POV. You know seeing Minato drunk like this is amusing to me. He just keeps saying some dumb shit about his early life and that Anoichi's pubes are blonde. The whole bar can hear him because they are all down and level ninja and I can't stop myself from laughing. Then out of nowhere Minato asks. Why Yami Hiccup tell me the truth, why didn't you get together with Kashina when you had the chance? Hiccup well obviously because she is too annoying, needlessly aggressive, she isn't wise and can't really hold a decent conversation, she is very nosy, she would also try to help other people without thinking of the consequences. So overall, the only thing she has going for her is her looks, which isn't enough for me, there are way prettier women in the Naruto world, and in no way am I settling down without trying most of them. Plus Kashina is an alpha in a relationship it means that she would try to wear the pants in our relationships. Minato is a beta and could handle her, I wouldn't, we would have fights constantly about what we think is right and what we want, until one of us, most likely me, cheats on the other. I had experience with someone like this in my past life. But even while I think all of these negative opinions about Kashina, I keep a calm face and just shrug. Meh, we weren't really compatible with each other. You and her are a perfect couple, like you were made for each other. But me and Kashina, at best we would be friends, anything further, and our relationship would start crumbling. I saw how she looked at me, but that was just a crush on me, born from her need to be acknowledged, and, I did so, it was nothing special anyone else could have been that silly crush of hers. Minato looked at me, then suddenly tears appeared in his eyes, and as he tried to hug me. Yami you are such a good friend as he comes to hug me, I lean back on the chair to get out of his reach. Stop you are drunk, Minato. This is not Jonin behavior. You are not Jonin behavior. Said Minato. Sigh, he is really drunk. I just casually dodged all of his attempts to try and grab me into a hug. Then as his body goes over the table. I have a clear shot at his stomach. And I punch him in the stomach, while sending some of my chakra in his body. Minato just looked around confused. That was a weak punch. As soon as he said that, I can see Minato's eyes widen in pain as smoke comes from his ears and mouth. But as a Jounin and s rank ninja his pain tolerance is beyond just amazing. He didn't even flinch, and the only sign that he was in pain and was actually feeling a painful electric-like shock inside his body, was the widening of his eyes. I was using my chakra to forcefully flush the alcohol out of his system. Then after 10 seconds of Minato standing there frozen in place, he suddenly blushed, sat down on the chair, and his head hit the table. Damn, that was embarrassing yeah, and it was uncomfortable as hell for me too. Probably everyone in here will remember this for the rest of their lives, and even if you do become Hokage, they will always look and remember you as, that one drunk guy. I said to Minato with a nonchalant voice. They say that hitting a man when he is down is shameful, to me that is the best time to hit anyone, while they are down. Sai you are never going to let me live this down are you, said Minato with a tired voice. As he looked me in the eyes while his head was leaning on his arms, which were on the table. I just smirked at that. Never, but I decided that this is enough fooling around and asked Minato. So, how is your relationship with Kashina, you know, you being insecure as hell about it makes me worried. 
Minato makes a weird face as if he ate a lemon. Come on now that was just me talking while being drunk, me and Kishina were doing very good. But what about you Yami? I immediately noticed that he was trying to change the conversation, damn, I guess scheming against old foxes who are good at this type of stuff makes Minato's attempt at subtle manipulation seem bad, but he is still only 19 and not like me, only one year older than me, but technically I am already like 36 years old if I count my first life. Damn, I really am old, all of these thoughts were processed in a second by me as I looked at Minato, I got some green tea that I ordered and took a sip. What about me? Well, are you really single or do you have a secret girlfriend already? Asked Minato with a friendly smile on his face. I just shrug at his question. No not really, I am not dating anyone currently. Plus I am the Inuzuka clan head, so me dating someone publicly isn't quite appropriate. After all, I plan for my marriage to give me at least some benefits. Because if I want to just get my wick wet, I can seduce any girl and have my wish granted. Minato smirked mischievously at this. Well Kashina has a friend of hers, her name is Makoto Ija. I think you should go at least on a date before going to war. I think back on that name and scan through my memories about the name. She is Makoto Ichiha, the Ichiha clan head's daughter. She is also a Jounin of Kanoha and three years older than me. But any of that doesn't really matter. What really mattered is that she is also the mother of Sasuke and Adachi. My guess she is cute enough. Okay, sure, but when will me and her meet for our date? I asked Minato. He seems to think a little and says. How about you go on a date today? That surprised me a little, a couple hours after the conversation between Minato and Yami, Makoto POV. My name is Makoto Ichiha, the Ichiha clan head's daughter, well technically I am, but father always told me that the true leader would be whomever I marry. I look at my best friend in front of me. She's Kashina and she keeps telling me. Come on now, you have to smile, if you don't your face looks emotionless and might scare him away. I think back on how I got roped into this. Obviously tomorrow almost all of the Jounin will be deployed to the borders. Kanoha's geographical position is in the middle of all the other great ninja villages. So during times of peace it is a blessing, since we have trade routes, and merchants take their carriages along the land of fire. So it generally brings more money in. But in the times of war, it is a curse, every war we have fought we have always been so close to the collapse of our village and foreign invasion, that it isn't even funny. Oh I let my mind wander again, I really need to concentrate, this is my first real date, I am 21 years old, and this is my first real date, damn that sounds so lame, I am definitely not telling anyone that. Kashina is gushing over me like always about my hair and that, but I just look at myself in the mirror and see, I have tied my hair in a ponytail, and, my face seems passive like always. Kashina calls it emotionless and scary, but what does she know? She probably has Raymond juices running through her brains. Come on now Makoto, you need to smile and be more enthusiastic about this. Your date is Yami and Yuzuka, one of the best bachelors in Kanoha. Says Kashina trying to get me excited. I just turned and looked at her. Didn't you also have a crush on Yami and Yuzuka when you were younger? I asked Kashina with a nonchalant voice. Immediately she got nervous and started stuttering. W what, of course and not. She is a terrible liar, how someone like her even qualifies as a jonin still amazes me. I guess her strength qualifies, but her personality definitely doesn't, after some more of Kashina's unnecessary comments and useless advice. I finally was able to get out of her company, and I used body flicker to arrive at the meeting place. It was a restaurant on the outskirts of the always expanding Inuzuka clan compound. Kashina reassured me that Yami said that this restaurant is under his control, and no one would even see us here. That is good since I still have an arranged marriage with Fugaku, and me seeing another mad would be seen as scandalous. Plus an Ichiha marrying outside the clan is rare, and since I am the clan head's daughter, that becomes impossible. After all, no matter how much my father praises Yami and Yuzuka on his political exploits. I know that he wouldn't approve of me marrying anyone, but our clan's rising star, Fugaku Ichiha, he is also known to our enemies as Wicked Eye Fugaku, an S-ranked ninja, and he is still in his early 20s. I took a deep breath and opened the door to the lavishly looking restaurant. Inside I surprisingly saw no one, this restaurant is quite popular. As I walked deeper inside I saw lavish paintings and decorations. Then as soon as I entered the restaurant area two waitresses came towards me. Hello Lady Makoto, we have been expecting you. Follow us, we will show you to your pre-arranged table. They weirdly spoke in synchronization. Then they led me towards a balcony with the view of the Inuzuka clan compound. There was only one table for two on the balcony, and one of the seats was already occupied by my date, Yami Inuzuka. He was looking towards his clan compound and had a soft smile on his face. My interactions with him up till this moment had been minimal, I mostly only saw him in the clan head meetings when my father decided to take me too. I walked towards the table and sat down opposite of him. When he heard the sound of the chair being pulled back, Yami looked towards me. He had a soft smile on his face as he said. A pleasure to meet you Makoto. I hope you find my company fun. I also smiled back and tried to make my dark pupilless eyes seem happier. Then I responded in the most cordial way that I could. I am glad to be of your acquaintance Yami and Yuzuka. When Yami heard this I noticed that his smile widened a little as his eyes shined in amusement. So you must have the same problem right? I looked at him strangely and decided to ask. What do you mean by that? Haha. <laughs> he busted out laughing when he heard my question. 
Then he wiped out a small tear from his eyes. Well I used to have the same problem, the eyes, that they show no emotion. Me and you have the same eyes. Though I must admit, I am a little jealous of your eyes form and beauty. That is when I noticed that he really did have the same eye color as me. And if he didn't have that strange light of happiness in his eyes, they would look emotionless and empty, just like mine. After a couple of hours it does get dark, but I still decided to stay with him. Talking about life and different things. We truly had a lot in common, and at the end of it, we even developed a Jinjutsu together that allows the user to have a certain friendly look in their eyes, for the first time since I could remember I laughed, truly laughed with someone, I must say that, if only he was born as an Ichef. And as the curtain of darkness covered the stars, we drank expensive wine together. Not as the Inuzuka clan head and the daughter of the Ichiha clan head, but as Yami and Makoto, friends or maybe more, then, when it got quite late and I knew that my father would be worried if I stayed any longer, as I was about to get up. I felt a hand softly hold into my own. I look at Yami and see a look of uncertainty appear on his eyes as he says. Stay with me Makoto. Stay with me. When I heard those words, for a split second I thought about the possibility of abandoning my clan and running away with Yami. He is someone who understands me, and, embarrassingly enough, I spilled a lot of secret things about myself tonight, Yami has his way with sweet words, but that fantasy all washed away, as I just looked at him with my cold eyes cancelling the Jinjutsu that made my eyes look friendlier. I am sorry Yami, but I have my duties and you have yours. Yami looked a little sad at that, it broke my heart, unknowingly I had gotten close to the first person in my life. Then as I was about to walk away, my resistance almost crumbled when I saw Yami like that. But I had to, suddenly I am turned around by a hand on my shoulder, and feel a soft feeling on my lips, fuck the consequences, it's my life and I control it, next day yummy POV. I wake up inside a hotel with a soft bed below me, and remember what happened last night, we did it three times on the table, and then four other times in here until we got tired, by we I mean only Makoto, I am immortal, and have an almost infinite stamina since it regenerates so fast, I feel Makoto stir a little as the sun hits her eyes. I just turned around and looked at the naked body in the bed next to me, her skin was like a pearl, damn she is so hot, but sadly she won't be able to hold this beauty forever. Her tits will sag and her face will wrinkle. Unless she had immortality, which I won't give to her. After all if I do that, there would be a 100% chance of her betraying me and cheating on me in the future. After all, infinity is a long time and having someone be loyal for that long is simply impossible. Romantic love isn't some magical power, romantic love is something temporary that will fade away with time, or even more correctly, love is a chemical reaction that compels animals to breed, and then it slowly fades away, leaving you in a loveless stranded marriage. Surprisingly Makoto was a virgin, who would have guessed, doesn't she have an arranged marriage with Fugaku, and she is around 21 years old. Damn I guess Fugaku was waiting for her to get used to the idea of them together and accept it, such a nice guy, and a damn cuck, this is what happens when you wait too long. Another guy will bang your girl, also now I have learned my lesson, and every time I came inside of her, I used a jutsu that temporarily stops her from getting pregnant, I ain't getting no more kids to raise. One is already bothersome enough. I got up from the bed and went and took my clothes from the ground where they lay. I put on my jonin uniform, as I am doing so I hear the bed shift a little, and when I turn around I see that Makoto has woken up in all of her naked glory. She still seems a little sleepy and tired. While looking at her I can't help but think that she is quite intelligent, she made a clone and sent it to her father, saying that she will be at Kashina's place. I decided to take this opportunity and ask her. So on which border you will be during the war? Because if you are in the one where we will fight against a hidden cloud village, we could have some fun during this shitty war. Makoto just seemed to think a little and said with a voice that didn't express anything. I am deployed in the battlefield against a hidden sand village. Well that is disappointing, I guess this will be only a one night stand between us then. I want you to know Yami, that this was only a one time thing. I have a duty to my clan to fulfill. Said Makoto, I noticed that she is probably expecting some type of response from me. But I just shrugged my shoulders and casually said. Oh okay, sure thing. I saw her eye twitch for a split second. Heh, was she expecting some type of sadness or regret from me? No thank you, I almost broke my back last night, carrying the conversation. She is as unskilled at social skills as she is at sucking dick, which is bad, very bad, she almost scratched me with her teeth a couple of times. But still she is pretty enough so I overall had a good night. Then I went towards the door to go outside, but I turned around one last time. See you around Makoto. I saw her eyes narrow at me, with a little anger inside of them as I left the room. Sorry Makoto, but I am more of a one-hit wonder. I am not the type of guy who would fight too hard for a girl. If she doesn't give me head on the first date I am bolting out of there. I ain't ready to commit yet I am only like 18, 36 on the inside. Just like that I went towards my clan compound. I had my mind back in the game now. Already brewing new plans and schemes. Next day, I jump from tree to tree outside of Kanoha, with hundreds of other ninja following me. Finally, war begins again, I will be sure to milk it for all it's worth. Even though I have dozens of Jounin behind me, those who I really wanted were some other people, and they are here too, Guy, Asuma and Kuranai, they will start creating their own roads branching from me. 
When I become Hokage I need them to have the reputation of the Sanin, I made a shadow clone, and gave it one of my kunai with the Horatian seal, in case the group gets attacked, which is unlikely. Flash then in a black flash, the view in front of me changed into a green field in front of me with countless tents all around, I had directly teleported to the Kanoha camp, where I needed to be. Immediately when some of the people in here saw me, they recognized me. I just waved at them and ordered. Call all of the Jonin present in the camp, I will be discussing the defense strategy with them. They nodded and got the notifying the Jonin. I just went towards the big tent in the middle, it was the camp leader's tent, aka my tent, there was a round table with around 30 seats, and one of them being higher signifying higher authority, I went and sat on that seat. After 5 minutes Jonin just kept coming into the tent until almost all of the seats were occupied. They all looked at me with respect and admiration, while awaiting my orders. During the second ninja war one was just a simple kid, no matter how much authority I was given. People would instinctively think of me as a kid. But now I just interlock my hands in front of me while I lean them on the table. I see some Jonin being from different clans like Hyuga, Ichiha, Akamichi, Aburam etc. I even saw a couple of Inuzuka. When I saw that they were all here I started by saying. We will go into the counter-attack immediately, we will not give the chance for them to make the first move. Immediately they were all shocked by what I said. Hiruzen is a passive person who wouldn't attack without being provoked, but I am different, and in this camp I have almost absolute authority. And this will be the plan. I smirked towards them as I started explaining the plan. Looking at the people in front of me as I told them that we plan to be the ones to take the initiative and attack shocked them. After all, Hiruzen was very passive and wouldn't attack unless we were provoked. But if we attack right now, we could have the initiative and easily crush anything they throw at us, since it is so early in the war, well the war hasn't even officially started, but so the third rakage is in his village. Attacking now is the best time. We are in the land of hot springs, this would be the battlefield, since Kanoha almost never went to fight in the land of frost, which is the land between land of hot spring and land of lightning. Though our enemy's camp lies in the land of frost and the cold and snow around might give the cloud ninja an advantage, since it would allow them to have more water around them to use against Kanoha ninja, who are mostly fire style users. Though some of them still seem a little unsure. After all, while the camp leader has the authority to order an attack like this. Doing it at this scale without the order of the Hokage is strange. But I still continued saying. If we don't attack right now and allow the Rakage to come to the front lines with his full army, that would bring us in a huge disadvantage. The balance in our camp's power would shift tremendously. I reassured them with this, and some of them seemed to think it through and accept my logic. Though I don't need them to like me. It's better that they like me than hate me. Plus words and lies are free, so why not use them to my advantage? Without even allowing any possible spy in the camp to send messages or anything like that. I immediately gathered all of the troops to get ready for a counterattack. We won't be waiting for any reinforcement, me and the other thousand ninja will attack by ourselves the enemy who outnumbers us 1 to 3. They have 3000 ninja, but we have an S rank ninja like me to even out the field, though they also have their own S rank ninja as the leader of the camp most likely, but I doubt they have something up to my caliber. Also contrary to what I said to the other people, I want to lure out the third rakage. After all, he is ready to be my stepping stone now, General POV. While Yami was preparing the army and explaining the chain of command to the cannon fodder, the Genin and Chunin. Now if anyone knew the real Yami they would ask. Where is the corruption? Then the answer would be, that he put people of the clans whom he had an alliance with, higher on the chain of command. Though some of the people were only put up there as puppet commanders, since the one really giving orders were Yami's clones. A control freak like him would never allow anyone else but him to be in charge. Then the Kanoha ninjas started their journey to attack the enemy camp who was in the land of frost, the camp was surrounded by earth walls, and it had frost and snow all around the camp. In only two hours they arrived at the soon-to-be battlefield, it seemed that as 1000 ninja traveling, would tick off any ninja scout worth anything. But no matter how much they tried, the Kumo camp was still unprepared as, countless fire jutsu landed on them. Yami POV I smiled at the chaos that was caused by the fire jutsu. I smiled even more as I saw the snow and ice all around melt and turn into water. People might think that this would give an advantage to the enemy, but, they don't know that the strongest water style user in this battlefield is, me. I immediately did some hand signs and the water that was being melted from the ice and snow, slowly rose into the air, and flew towards the clouds over the cloud ninja camp, then up in the clouds, the water was pressurized and turned into a deadly weapon. Dropping down on the enemy force to cut through thin steel. Flash I could hear the screams of my enemies reverberating through the battlefield. I used my chakra control and sensory abilities to maximize the jutsu's killing efficiency. I truly haven't been on a battlefield in quite some time. So I just decided to use an S rank jutsu, I didn't even feel the strain, but I did hear the screams from the enemy camp, Ruhr, or I would have heard the screams until some kind of huge octopus creature, with the head seeming like a cow, and one of its horns cut off appeared out of nowhere. Covering the cloud shinobi to protect them from the attack. Then the creature just roared at my jutsu, and it destroyed it. While looking at its giant form I couldn't help but think that, tailed beasts really are something else aren't they? The beast just looks at me and opens its mouth and a dark chakra ball starting to form inside of his mouth. I immediately analyzed the attack and easily guessed that it was a tailed beast bomb. 
But contrary to my expectations the Eight Tails swallows the Tailed Beast Bomb, and then, boom he spits out an explosive beam with a wider range of attack, even while my hands were making hand seals, and I even already knew that Tailed Beasts could already do this from the Anime. I was still amazed by the raw chakra that it has, and the destructive power it displays, if I wasn't so uncomfortable with having another intelligent being inside of me, I would definitely get one for myself. As the ninja behind me panicked at the attack and thought that they were about to die. I just put my palms forward. A giant translucent invisible barrier appears in front of me, and then, boom I could see that when the attack made contact with the barrier, it was able to crack it a little, but the explosion wasn't able to get through and hurt anyone behind me. While the other Kanoha ninja were terrified by this. I just simply had a huge smile on my face. I must say, this is quite amazing, little octopus, the power was perfectly controlled. So Hidden Cloud Village now has something that has never been done before, a perfect Jinchuriki of the Eight Tails. When I said that the people behind me were terrified even more. After all tailed beasts were scary, and if someone with the intelligence and knowledge of a ninja was able to control one, that would make it terrifying. Then I create two shadow clones, and they nodded and went to command the army behind me. With the smile still on my face I just sighed a little as a certain seal on my stomach, where a certain leech who now has no memories is sealed, the seal opened a little and, fwash red chakra surrounded me, and my skin turned red, while my hair lengthened, even my pupils turned red, under my eyes also appeared dark red markings. I controlled my body with the help of the Jiangu, and formed a transparent barrier in front of my eyes, while I activated the Sharingan, but now it still looked like I had my normal eyes on, and it also protects my eyes from small projectiles. And then, boom the ground under me cracked as I threw myself towards the eight tails. When I got close to it, the eight tails swung one of its giant tentacles at me. Since I was mid-air usually I could only dodge if I used Horatian, but, suddenly on my back, Fwash made out of countless microscopic wires two wings like those of a fallen angel appeared behind me. This was done with the help of the Jiangu. So I flew sideways and dodged the attack and finally reached the eight tails. Then I fly below its chin, and before he can react I clench my hand into a fist, and, boom I punch the eight tails on the chin, and, something impossible that shocked all of the others happened, the eight tails was sent flying in the air. I immediately flew after and then touched it with my palm, and with a black flash me and the eight tails were teleported away from the battlefield. Killer BPOV. Just looking at the ninja in front of me taking care of me so easily. I couldn't even concentrate on my rapping, he is way too trapping. By his earlier appearance he is probably the red fang Yami and Yuzuka. When we were teleported away from the battlefield. I could still feel my head ringing from the punch he gave me before, I literally almost passed out and was gassed out. I need to take care of him right here, right now, I immediately formed a small tailed beast bomb, and threw it towards him at top speed. But somehow he just made three strange hand signs, and a seal formula appeared in the air, and my end beast bomb was sucked into the seal and disappeared, then, boom I heard an explosion in the distance, this guy is good, and his attack power is scary, I don't think I can stay conscious if I take another one of his punches, so I need to be a smaller target. Slowly my body morphs back into my human form, and then I immediately activate, and dark red chakra surrounds me, hiding my body, and a skeleton is formed around my body frame. I see Yami up there still flying with his strange wings. He has an amused smirk on his face as he looks towards me. You truly are a shinobi killer, who would have thought that Kumagakur could keep someone like you hidden. Then a deep voice made from the tailed chakra came out of my mouth as I just said with a rap. Let's quit talking, so I can show you my might, in this fight. Yami just smiled at me and, suddenly, Fuashi disappeared in a dark flash and appeared below me, then I felt an explosive force hit me on my chin. How? Was the last thing I thought as I went unconscious. Yami POV. I just simply used the Horatian marker I left under his chin when I first punched him to teleport back to it again. Then after I punch him and his brain hits the inside of his skull, Killer B falls down on the ground at my feet, unconscious. I must say that the fight was exceptionally easy, though it was mostly so because he made such a rookie mistake. But I would have easily defeated him either way. The only difference was that I didn't use as much force that I would have used if he was in his giant octopus form, or else his head would have either flown off like a baseball, or burst like a watermelon. I see that even though he was unconscious the Eight Tails chakra was being released even more, hmm, so it is trying to return back to its giant form, the Eight Tails is trying to take over his body when he is unconscious, and protect him from me, since he thinks that I will kill him. But I just simply touch his stomach and easily go through his chakra cloak, as my fingers sinked on the flesh of his midsection. A spiral fuinjutsu seal appears as the Eight Tails chakra forcefully recedes back into the teenager Killer Bee's body, and he seems to be around my age probably a couple years younger. Then I sense that the eight tails, still trying to forcefully break through the seal, I just sigh and I run chakra through the tips of my fingers, with a kanji for each element on them. Then I sink them back in his belly and, it destabilizes the eight tails chakra, and it doesn't allow it to be able to gather it again, damn, I really am the perfect counter against Jinchuriki. I think that while I put Killer B over my shoulder and, fwash I get back to the battlefield. With Killer B on my shoulders, I teleported back to the battlefield. There I see my shadow clones holding back unruly A the future fourth rakich. Though he seems kind of weak right now since, the lightning armor around him seems weak. 
Though I guess he is only in his 20s, I see that my clones keep him occupied, but the clones are also careful, after all even a small electric zap, and they are gone. But since the future fourth rakage is currently so slow, even the clones don't have a problem keeping him occupied. I just shunch into his side and, run a little wind chakra on my palm, hit his neck, knocking him out. His eyes dull as he slowly falls down. I can't believe Minato had a hard time against someone like this. But I guess I am way stronger than Minato already. Then as I see that the battle is going on I just take a deep breath and, for around 10 seconds, I charge a little sage chakra into my lungs. Whistle I whistle in a certain tune and slowly all of the ninjas on the battlefield whether friend or foe started, falling unconscious. I can sense all of their chakras on their first gates became stagnant. Sound Jinjutsu is what the bat sage techniques are best at, it can even easily affect an Acha. Ninjutsu, Tujutsu, Jinjutsu, Sage Jutsu, Fuinjutsu, Healing Jutsu, I can say that I am definitely not a jack of all trades, because I master everything I pick up. After all if you are going to do something, you must make sure that you are the best at it. Then without the need of any hand seals, I make 100 shadow clones. And have them go and wake up the thousand Konoha ninja, and tie up and imprison the 3000 Kumo ninja, this has been an absolute victory from Konoha, or more like an absolute victory for me. Hachi, MC's son, POV I am currently in the academy classroom. I am finally graduating, honestly I am glad about that. The fangirls coming after me were crazy, all they saw was the senju name, and they came towards me like headless chicken. But I guess even with all of the hassle, -so, anyway our teacher comes in and looks at all of us. His eyes stay on me for a second longer than they stay at the other kids, but it isn't anything special. I wonder if I fought him, would I be able to beat him, I am obviously only 6 years old, but Yami has taught me that, if I see a chunin in battle, I must run away. If running away is not an option, then I must fight them to the death. But he also said that never fight a Chunin head on, I am nowhere near being able to do that, so I must use my head and use strategies against him. Then around a dozen or so ninja wearing the Jonin uniform come and line up in front of the class. Team 1. The Chia Izuki, Myoko Kmui and Jaya, your Jonin sensei will be Tashinori. Says the teacher as a Jonin comes forward and mentions for them to follow him. This continues on until almost all of the students have gone with their teachers. Team 13 will consist of Hachi Senju, Momo Ichiha and Shoto. Continues the teacher with an unenthusiastic voice. Your Jonin teacher will be Ken in Yazuka. When he says that, a man in a Jonin uniform comes forward. He has dark spiky hair that extends to his lower back. He had dark eyes and the Inyazuka markings on his cheeks. He also seemed to be tired as his eyes were bloodshot and had dark circles under them, even his cheeks seemed a little sunken in. He just looked towards us. Then he opened his mouth and a raspy voice came out. Come with me. We went and followed him, and we walked together out of the academy. We didn't say anything as we were all nervous. We started walking on a road that was very familiar to me. We are going towards the Inuzuka clan compound. And it really is uncomfortable here, no one has said anything since we left the academy. Then we arrived at the outskirts of the Inuzuka compound. Ken took us to a fancy restaurant and as we sat down. He cleared his throat and started saying. Well honestly, I didn't really want to be your Jonin sensei. But a certain someone asked me to do it. I would rather be fighting on the front lines and at least being useful, in there. And see Yamasama fight one last time. I hope that you will become Chunin within 4-5 years, because I can feel that my body has started getting weaker. I will probably die within this decade by natural causes. We were all surprised when he said that. After all, he was talking about death like it was nothing. And he only seems to be in his 20s, so him not having a problem with his death is shocking, is this what it takes to be a ninja? Willing to sacrifice your life in the darkness and endure. Then this time the girl in our team. Her name is Momo Ichiha, and she has dark eyes, pale skin and a very beautiful but cold face. But even her eyes widened when our teacher said that. She couldn't help but ask. Isn't Yami Inuzuka the best medical ninja to ever live, surpassing even his teacher Tsunade Senju? Shouldn't he help you since you are in his clan? Ken just laughed loudly at this. Hahaha, <laughs> your name is Momo right? Momo just nods at this in confirmation. Well Momo, he is the reason that I am currently able to even walk. My body should have given up a long time ago. But Yami helped me move for at least a little while more. But enough about me about you tell me about yourself, while we wait for the cute, I mean the waitress to come here. Anyway, tell me your likes, dislikes, hobbies and dreams for the future. Said Ken as he smiled at us. The first to talk was my last teammate, the one who barely passed. He had red hair and black eyes. He also had a huge grin on his face. My name is Shoto, I am a civilian orphan, I Lee. He was about to continue, but someone barged into the restaurant and screamed, Shoto was about to continue, but someone barged into the restaurant and screamed, big news, Yami Inuzuka has captured the eight-tailed demon and the third Reikage's son. Everyone who heard that was in shock. There hadn't even been any real full-blown battles amongst the borders. The first one happened and it was an overwhelming victory for Kanoha. Then the guy went on explaining that the evil cloud ninja said that they wanted to meet for a treaty, but instead the Kanoha ninja were attacked and ambushed. And as expected almost everyone believed it. After all, this is the only source of information, so facts can be muddied up and work on Yami's favor. Hachi had a shocked look on his face, and so did his teammates. 
But Ken, his Jonin teacher, had a wide smile. Damn, wish I could have been there. Said Ken as he had a wild smile on his face. His body, which had a certain frailness to it, was revitalized and full of energy when he hears what Yami had done. I owe Yami everything, my life, fame and even power, someone like me never would have never even dreamed of being an elite Jonin of Kanoha. Thought Ken, as he just looked at his hand and clenched it into a fist. This body of mine will last for a little while more, I need to help him in any way I can. Ken looks towards his students, he doesn't know why Yami asked him to train this team. But he will do it to the best of his abilities. Hachi was unsure of what to think about this. He had understood that Yami was amazing, but he didn't think that he was so strong. His teammate Shoto, even though he was shocked he didn't understand the true effect that this event of Yami will have. It could possibly lead to at least a 50% reduction in the power of Hidden Cloud Village, and the Rakage's son was taken prisoner during the confrontation. Plus losing someone like Killer B isn't a small matter either, he is possibly even more important than the third Rakage's son. But in the Hokage's office, something else was happening. While the Hokage was a little glad that Asuma had now become a Chunin, because he wouldn't be 100% in Yami's control now. Those Saratobi clan elders, doing something dumb like this is unexpected of them. Did they somehow expect Asuma to spy on Yami, or did they send him to Yami as a peace offering, and let me and Yami tear on each other, while they disassociate themselves from me? Contemplated here is in while he tried to understand the double or triple meaning of different decisions. He wasn't a naturally born political genius, who is good at understanding people. He has only learned these things from his experience as Hokage. Suddenly he can easily sense an Anbu enter the room, even though nothing indicates so, since both the door and window are closed. The Anbu just puts a newspaper in front of him, the newspaper was also one of Yami's inventions, that is quite misinforming, he can easily read through the propaganda, but most people wouldn't be able to do the same, but there are some true facts in there sometimes. That is why the Anbu brought the newspaper to Hiruzen. There must be something seemingly true in this then. The Hokage opens the newspaper, his eyes immediately widened in shock at what he saw, how is this possible Hiruzen looked at the Anbu in the walls. Go and find out if this is true. Though I am not necessarily fond of Yami and Yuzuka as a person, if what he says is even half true, we could negotiate a peace between Hidden Cloud Village and Kanoha. His skill as a ninja truly is unparalleled. Thought Hiruzen as he looked at the newspaper which is its front page had a photo of a smiling Yami in his Jonin uniform. While on the Land of Lightning, inside the village hidden in the clouds, the Rakage has just learned what has happened on the battlefield. Although he is feeling unquenchable anger, he has a calm mask on his face, though he still can't help an angry growl coming out of him every now and then. He knows how cruel Yami can be, he still remembers when during the Second Ninja War, a 12-year-old Yami slaughtered his comrades. Even Dadai died when he took him to the closest hospital, which was close by Land of Water. But while he thought that would help the relationship with the Hidden Mist Village, Dadai's body exploded in the hospital where a lot of injured Mist Shinobi were recovering. A lot of them died and even though the Mizukage knew it wasn't him, he had to kick him out of the mist to keep his image of power. Since then the relationship with the general ninja of the mist has not been good at all, and all of that happened because of that cruel kid. Who now has his son, the Rakage keeps wondering if Yami is already torturing his son, even as he spends time like this uselessly thinking to himself. But he knows that the Hokage will sue for peace, in his eyes the Hokage was weak and indecisive like that. That is also why everyone wants to start another war, after all, the first and second weren't really that much of a decisive victory for Kanoha. Kanoha almost fell countless times. I will kill Yami and Yuzuka, as soon as I get my son, son's back, he will let his guard down during the small time gap after the treaty, that is when we will strike. Schemes the Rakage, while plotting to have Yami unguarded during the attack too. While they were all plotting different things, Yami was in his temporary underground laboratory with the unconscious Killer B, strapped to a table with tubes strapped all around his body. The tubes had some small fuinjutsu written on it, they were drawing red chakra form the eight tails inside Killer B, and were transporting it inside a pitch dark cube, with countless fuinjutsu written all over it. Yami suddenly smiled in a menacing way as he saw the process of his experiment going so smoothly. War really has a lot of opportunities. He thought while observing his sleeping test subject. Yami was just looking at this small cube, it could be said that this was his best creation. It had the soul of the zero tails inside. Obviously the soul was wiped out of all its memories, emotions and everything else that made it be special. Now Yami is using its soul as a way to try and create an artificial tailed beast. Yami did this to the zero tails, because when he studied and learned all of the abilities from his zero tails, from being able to generate dark chakra from negative emotions, sensing emotions, chakra stealing and all of its other minor abilities. The Zero Tails wasn't a tailed beast, no matter how much others called it the Zero Tails. All it is, is a strange leech that was naturally born with the ability to generate dark chakra from negative emotions, so simply it is an animal with a kekei genkai. Though rare on animals it is nothing that weird, the old toad sage had the ability to see the future in the form of prophecies, and the Zero Tails is also quite old, that is why Yami took its soul as the catalyst to make this cube. 
After experimenting with the Zero Tails, Yami discovers that it has a strong soul, able to hold tailed beast levels of chakra, and with the help of his Fuinjutsu, he has created an item that only he can use that is like an artificial tailed beast, and it works perfectly for Yami, since he would feel uncomfortable having another being inside of his soul or more correctly, inside his chakra system. Since that is why a Jinchuriki dies when their tailed beast is pulled out. Yami senses the soul of the Zero Tails thrashing around in the cube, since the chakra that the Eight Tails generates is too much for it, the soul started feeling burning pain. If it was a normal human they would be potentially crippled, but with Zero Tails' strong soul, it only felt unimaginable pain. Though the soul is like a clean slate, so to it pain is not comprehensible of what is happening. Yami just smiles even more. Finally, the experiment was an absolute success, I really love it when things go like planned. Just like this three days passed, Yami spent most of his time experimenting and let his clones manage the Kanoha camp. Though he saw that his test subject Killer B had thinned a little. This is nothing too big. The Eight Tails can regenerate back its chakra easily. Summarized Yami as he had a now red cube in his hand, it had changed colors, and the Zero Tails soul had already lost its sense of being, so it now is just a chakra storage and purifying machine. It also adapted to the Eight Tails chakra, and already started producing Tailed Beast chakra, but, as Yami was celebrating, about his recent success. The Hokage wasn't far away from his camp, he also had ten Anbu around him for protection. Kanoha and Kumo had made a secret arrangement of exchanging prisoners. The Hokage was also hoping to be able to sue for peace. When they were finally able to see the camp, they slowed down, and half of the Anbu went forward to confirm their identities. After that then they were told to go to Yami's giant personal tent. They went there and opened the tent flap. What they saw inside, it was normal, it looked like your average office, with a desk and a very uncomfortable looking wooden chair. Yami was also there sitting up and he had two unconscious people on the ground at his feet, they were Killer B and Unruly A, future fourth rakage, Yami POV. When I sensed a hokage from kilometers away. I simply got Killer B out of my underground laboratory, and with a single hand sign, a staircase that takes me to my tent is formed. Then I tie up Killer B and dispel the clone I had acting as me in the tent. I also have the future fourth rakage with me. I must say, this is quite nice. I can feel a sense of excitement hit me when I feel the power that I possess. As I am contemplating this, my tent flap opens up and Hiruzen comes in together with his 10 personal anbu, I can already easily sense where they are, damn these guys suck, you wouldn't have me protected by these weaklings, that's for sure. I also immediately notice the look in Hiruzen's eyes, he plans to make peace with Hidden Cloud. He is too easily pushed around, it makes him seem weak as a leader, well that is why in the canon timeline, he had to be replaced by Minato, after all, not a lot of people like such a weak leader. Yami, you have done an amazing job at this. When you return back to Kanoha, you can choose any jutsu that you want to learn. When I heard the Hokage say this, I immediately caught on what he was doing. He is trying to lure me. Plus I, as a border camp leader, it is very unlikely that I will return back to Kanoha before the war is over. I just smiled at him out of courtesy and said. No thank you Hokage-sama, I didn't do this out of anything like greed. I just did it to help Kanoha in these hard times. As I said that with a smile on my face, I could see that Hiruzen too had a perfect smile on his face. Though I knew that the smile is fake, after all, I have already spent 18 years amongst ninja. I can know even when a ninja is lying. Plus I have waited all this time for techniques, I am not going to ruin my plan to get them just because I was a little impatient. Oh, I am forever grateful to you Yami. You have helped Kanoha tremendously, you have saved so many lives, from both sides of the war, from what I heard. It was quite merciful of you to hold the 3000 cloud ninja prisoners. Thank Hiruzen, I again immediately caught on what he was playing at. Aren't you being a little hypocritical calling me soft for not killing the prisoners here isn't, I mean you literally let Danzo walk around, even when you definitely knew what he was doing. But I still had a smile on my face as I nonchalantly said to here isn't. Well, I was just waiting for your order, Hokage-sama. We can execute them right now if you want. I am ready whenever you are. When I suggested executing all 3000 of the Kumo Ninja. Harrison was shocked, and he said. When I suggested executing all 3000 of the Kumo Ninja. Harrison was shocked, and he said. No, there will be no need for that. We will be negotiating a deal with Hidden Cloud now, I would like Yami to be part of it. Come on now old man. When you say the talk, you must also walk the walk. This is why people view you as a weak Hokage. Of course Hokage-sama. I answered. After all, even while thinking all of this I had a calm look in my face. There is no need to aggravate the Hokage. I know that he is already mad at me for killing Danzo, so I don't need to give him another reason to try and undermine. Because unlike Danzo I can't just go to the Land of Fire's nobles and the Daimyo and suggest to them that I would like the Hokage killed. But it doesn't really matter anyway, Hiruzen is an old man, and in a few years he will step down as the Hokage. By then, not even his clan will have his back after the little stunt he pulled with Danzo's clan, by uniting both clans under the Saratobi banner. Horatian is truly useful, I have had my clones go back and manage the clan, so even though I am at the battlefield, the Inyazuka clan can continue advancing. Especially now that all the others are more concerned about the war, I can take advantage of this. Three days later and another 3000 ninja were sent from Kanoha. 
So now that everything was in place, we set off, with me and the Hokids leading our army. After some time we got all of our army to move to the borders of the land of frost and the land of hot water. There we were, meeting with another 1000 soldiers, all of them having the headbands of the hidden cloud village. Signifying their allegiance, and in the midst of them all, I saw it, the man who won made me so scared, that I had to literally use every trick in the book, to even be able to run away from him, the third rakage, third rakage POV. Seeing the face of that pushover hokage was a pleasant sight, since it means that at least my sons haven't been killed or tortured to insanity, yet that is, I have no doubt that if Yami and Yazuka was the hokage, Kanoha would be a really scary existence to all the other villages. Thankfully he isn't Hokage and he never will be, because Kanoha isn't rational enough to get leaders like Yami, the Hokage are mostly chosen by the nobles or the people of power, what do they even know of how a ninja village should be run or anything like that? They simply choose the one who seems nicest, and who can talk good enough to convince them, Kanoha has a lot of resources, but it can't use any of them well enough to make them something special. Currently the only thing they have going for them is their high population inside Kanoha. Also another reason why Yami and Yazuka won't be Hokage is because, I will kill him within one month. This time I will make sure to go all out and plaster his brains, and be done with the brat. I give the signal for my army to stop, and so does the Kanoha's army. They come for the meeting, and only I go forward. From the opposite side, comes the Hokage and the brat, Yami and Yizuka. We all intensely meet up in the middle, our armies ready to tear at each other's throats. We all looked at each other with serious looks on our faces. None of us said anything for a couple seconds, I was the one to break the silence as I asked. Where are my sons? General POV. If you are asking if they are safe. Then yes they are alright said Yami with a calm look on his face. The rakage frowned a little and asked. I didn't ask you that brat, I was asking the hokage. Yami just shrugged at what the rakage said. Sure whatever I don't care. I just thought that you would be worried that I might have tortured them to insanity while trying to get them to say Komodoka secrets. Or that I could have used a Yamanaka on your successor and learned your secret lightning armor jutsu. But sure, do go on, I guess you better talk to the hokage. When the third rakage heard Yami say this, he just clenched his fists and held his anger. After all, it would raise more problems that it would solve if he plummets the brat here. The Hokage didn't indicate his opinion on what Yami did. After all, to the enemy they must present a unified front. The Hokage and the Rakage continued their negotiations, while Yami just looked from the sidelines. At the end Kumo would pay 1.8 billion Ryo for the return of their 3000 ninja with Killer B and Unruly A, the third Rakage's son. It was also decided that every week the transaction of 100 Kumo ninja will be let free to return to Kumo. Because releasing all 3000 of them at once wasn't a good idea. After Killer B and Unruly A were returned, Kumo will pay up front, and the rest of the transaction will be overlooked by Yami, as the Hokage needs to return back to Kanoha. Also a two-year ceasefire was signed between the two parties. And that was the end of the deal. So they each separated and returned to their own camps. When he turned his back the Rakage got his sons and started walking back to his army. He had a dark smile on his face. Planning Yami's demise, he would surprise attack Yami with his full army within a month. True they signed a deal, and the Hokage was happy about the ceasefire, but, that is all just paper, they are ninja after all. Why wouldn't they attack them, just because they signed a piece of paper, no they are ninja, so why should they keep to their word? But that day, what no one noticed, was Yami's own hidden, dark smile, with everything about the ceasefire treaty already settled upon, including my assignment of overseeing that Kumadakar held their end of the bargain and Watnit, I was returned to full command of the camp and troops. Good all here is in decided he was no longer needed and, as per the general war strategy, mostly my general war strategy, he had already made his way back to Kanoha, along with his personal Anbu guard, perfect. All according to my calculations, I have been left to my own devices, which are the same as always. Doing whatever is necessary for me to obtain what I came here looking for, on the road to perfection, there's a lot of sacrifices, of other people, to be made. And I'm willing to do so, now, about my first true cash in in this war, taking advantage of the almost real-time intel I get from my spy network, mainly coming from my thousands of insidiously attentive mosquito spy summons, I have started to receive the most interesting reports, I have thus been able to determine, with almost 100% certainty, that the third rakage almighty A will go back on his word, and try to increase his chances of killing me by launching a surprise attack, he sees this situation as his best chance to try to get his oh so yearn for revenge against me, and maybe strike a decisive blow against Kanoha, all in one fell swoop, emphasis on the word try. And while it is indeed true that both the rakage and his kumagakar would lose quite a lot of credibility by pulling such a sneaky and dishonorable stunt, even to the point of hindering any future dealing with another hidden village, it nonetheless seems like the third rakage considers me a bigger threat, that whatever could come out of becoming unable to negotiate with the other great ninja powers. He's not stupid, I'll give him that, now, here's the thing. Allowing such a move from my enemy is certain to bring many risks to me, for a good example, there is the, very, latent risk of the third rakage leading a tandem formation, together with the Jinchuriki of the Hachibi, that could, become a problem, I might even have to draw upon my Manjikyu Sharingan if that happens. 
But that would also give me a good reason to use it again, since I haven't had the need to use its power as of late. On another note about the Sharingan though, I am still annoyed about the fact that I can't use the Susanoo. I've done some casual thinking while preparing my disgusting tea, and came up with an answer eventually. My theory regarding such an intriguing conundrum is that this is an exclusive power of the Acha themselves, and not the Sharingan per se, but what is the meaning of such profound words Yami? Some may be asking themselves, well, the just means that Susanu is an innate power residing inside the soul of an Acha, indicating that it exists at birth, and technically not through the unlocking of the Magic Sharingan, or any form of Dejutsu for that matter, but that doesn't suggest that the Magic Sharingan has nothing to do with the Susanu. I know about the strong emotions that trigger the Sharingan's evolution into the MS, but it goes without saying that they also shake the soul of the Acha to the core, with all kinds of emotional energies colliding the ones against the others, love, rage, sadness. This event, then, acts as the catalyst for the awakening of the cursed guardian of the Acha bloodline, the Susanoo is thus activated, and is unconsciously called upon by the Acha, at the same time that the MS provides to the Susanoo the conduit that links both body and soul, enabling it to manifest itself around a user and into this world, in a material expression of the soul, so. In moral terms, the MS is only the key for the Acha to be able to tap into the power of the Susanu for the first time, without the MS being the source of the power itself, my theory grows increasingly feasible, if judging by what happened in the Anime, during the fourth ninja war, Madara Acha was able to channel Susanu without even having his eyes on his sockets. Let alone having the MS activated. Then there is also Shisui Acha, who was able to use it, although in a weakened version, with only one eye, of course, if we take into account that they were both geniuses, that there may be differences with what was depicted in the Anime, and what is true for my world, and many other variables, the horizon turns foggy once more, my theory so far is just that. A theory, that's why it becomes clear as water that I will need to further study the souls of the Acha, in order to unravel the truth behind a Susanu. if I was reborn as an Acha, by now I would have already got my pair of flawless eternal Manjiku Sharingan, along with the full body Susanu. but no use crying over spilled milk I guess. Anyway, with the endless experiments I've run so far on my dead Acha comrades, bless them for keeping their eyes intact when dying, I have also learned how to determine what Manjekyo Sharingan skill one gets from their pair of Sharingan, with a certain degree of success of around 53.7% which is acceptable, for now, so. If the Manjekyo is obtained through extreme torture, the streamlined method, the person being tortured to insanity, would want to get away from these dire circumstances by whatever means available, so he would get teleportation-oriented skill, just like the first Manjekyo I had, now, just like I did with the Susanu, I have come to a conclusion by using the Anime for reference. When Rin died by the hands of Kakashi, Abito refused this reality where his friend killed the girl he was in love with. Hence, what did he get? His own pocket dimension. That Kamui, truly an amazing ability that one. Anyhow, moving on. Sasuke had great hatred towards Konoha, and the people who had made his brother go through all that pain and self-sacrifice, hence, he got the eternal black flame, Amaterasu. He had already been led astray by Orochimaru giving in to his anger. But most importantly, he used to look up to his brother, only to then hate him, only to later kill him. Therefore it was to be expected that his MS would replicate his brother's skill, reflecting the inevitable insecurities of Sasuke when he compared himself to Itachi. So, he got Amaterasu and the ability to control the Amaterasu, representing his desired and final victory against his anger. In overall conclusion, the Manjikyu Sharingan skill is the way the Acha unconsciously overcompensate for their own flaws, at least in battle, it is so, that with the help of the people who were so, kind as to donate their bodies to me tacitly, that I now possess the knowledge about these matters, and am ready to construct my very own customized pair of Manjikyu Sharingan. The ones I have on currently are simply not enough to reach the apex, I have already set my eyes on one distinct specimen for the base of my custom Manjikyu, yes, it seems like Abito's will have to do. Now that is an ability that allowed Kakashi for that small amount of time that he had Abito's Manjekyo to surpass both Sasuke and Naruto with the Sage of Six Paths power, which pretty much made them demigods, a smile appeared on my face, thankfully I was inside my tent and alone, so no one noticed it, I want Abito's power. Nonetheless, I have to be patient about this, luckily I'm good at playing the long game, I have to let some events play out first before acting, otherwise, Abito could get another Manjekyo and that would be an undesirable outcome for me. I, already, have DNA from Abito that was too easy to get. But I still need some more things before everything falls into place, but now, I have a bigger fish on my plate, the third Rakage, he has to die in this third ninja war, there is no other way around it. And he will definitely die, time skip. Two months later. I am at another dealing with the Rakage, for the weekly prisoner exchange. I am currently waiting for the Kumo ninja to arrive, I was here to stop them from setting some type of trap or something like that. Horation is difficult to counter, after all, I could literally be in Konoha and out of any danger in seconds, but give me a week, and I could create a barrier made especially for my Horation mark, obviously, though. I know that the rakage sometimes coming late to these meetings might seem like a power play by the bastard. But why should I care, I would easily beg for my life if it meant I would live, after all, what is dying with pride really worth? Let me tell you. 
Dog shit, that is what it's worth, no one will remember you, no one will even recognize you, after which you have become maggot shit, so, in reality, it's worth a shit's shit. I also have my army of 2000 ninja behind me, and another 100 prisoners from the batch that we have been exchanging every week, I have made sure that the prisoners were underfed. To maintain them in a malnourished and emaciated state, I have also been secretly inoculating a special parasite I concocted on their intestines by tampering with their limited food rations, after all, the thing I hate most is having an unnecessary enemy so they will all die within a year from some nasty infection or disease. Their bodies will weaken gradually so it won't be traced back to me, this prisoner killing parasite is particularly tough and most importantly, discreet. It becomes apparent that the victim is infected only when it's too late, and there's organ failure present, only the best medic nin could detect it on time, but even then, the antidote is one only I know how to make. I don't like leaving behind loose ends. And in the extreme event that they traced it back to me, they have no proof of me doing anything, plus this is war, no use crying over a couple of thousand shinobi dying, I see that, as usual, the rakage comes with his army flanking him from a distance. Another one of his meaningless power plays, trying to show me that he's enough to take me and my army alone, it isn't though, and I don't need power plays or something like that. I know because it is a fact, the Rakage's face is calm, his body shows nothing strange, but from the corner of my eye, I saw a Kumo ninja swallow nervously. I act like I didn't see anything like that, and just calmly walked forward and met with the Rakage in the middle of the battlefield. Our armies both facing each other, deathly still, the Kanoha Chunin level ninja are a little relaxed since they have already done this a dozen times and have built an instinctive reaction to drop their guard at something like this. I still have no reaction on my face as I extend my hand toward the rakage doing the unison sign to represent no harsh feelings after this. He nodded calmly and took my hand in a firm handshake, third person POV. As soon as the rakage shook hands with Yami, he immediately squeezed hard. He had done this before to express his resentment, but the real reason why he had done so was so Yami wouldn't be alarmed when he did this for real. He wanted Yami to instinctively drop his guard, even for one split second, that is all he needed, as his squeeze got even harder. The rakage then immediately swung Yami by the arm, entered in his lightning armor mode, and, boom. He slammed Yami on the rock-solid ground, headfirst. Yami saw what was happening, but had no time for his body to catch up with his Sharingan that he keeps activated during these meetings, thanks only to the Jiangu, he was able to manually control his body to an absolute level, and had created a one-way mirror-like membrane in front of his eyes, so when he had the Sharingan active it wouldn't show. Then the rakage swung Yami around again like an enraged gorilla, but then, boom Yami's skull hit the ground again, even harder this time, creating a crater of considerable size under it. As his head was stuck underground. His body on the outside had suddenly gone limp, the sounds of a certain spine cracking and breaking in terrible ways, still echoed all across the brumal valley that divided the land of frost and the land of hot water. Yami's body lay there limp lifeless, no response whatsoever, his pulverized head underground, while the rest of him leaned against a hard frosted rock, the hot blood had started to melt the thin ice sheet that covered the chilly ground, but the third rakage was a cunning old fox, he had most positively learned from his mistakes during the second ninja war, he had been too lenient towards the little boy, he would be absolutely ruthless this time, and make sure that nothing of the now grown Yami, remained, Almighty A immediately goes out of his way to completely annihilate the young shinobi's cadaver, foom 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 foom, without holding back one bit, he starts using his infamous technique in a relentless barrage of strikes. Leaving Yami's body full of bloody giant holes, his entire corpse had been cut, burned, and almost downright disintegrated, Yami had now become a mushy paste of blood, tissue, and powdered bone, with only small parchments of what once was his commander battle suit, as experienced in battle as he is smart, the rakage, while looking at this own brutal handiwork. Immediately felt that something didn't add up, there was definitely something wrong here, Yami and Yuzuka couldn't be taken down this easily, regardless of his surprise attack being successful, he literally hadn't even been able to react, let alone counterattack, had the boy that escaped him that one time with only 12 years of age, really fallen prey to his own arrogance and carelessness. Almighty A wasn't convinced of this at all, and he was proven right just seconds later, as Yami's remains shattered like mirrors simultaneously, Jinjutsu instantly deducted the third rakage. But when did he use it? I didn't perceive any signs at all. Then another Yami appeared, the rakage was right about to engage Yami again, when suddenly, the world around him had started to crack like a mirror, crash. As if a thick glass barrier was broken all around him, a new picture, completely different from the previous one, took place in front of his eyes that were now open in mild shock, he was being held by Killer B's Hachibi tentacle, as it kept transferring chakra, in order to break him out of the Jinjutsu he had been put under, in the real world. The Kanoha and Kumo ninja armies were already engaging in an intense battle, the chaos and strain jutsu blasts all around were killing countless shinobi left and right, the sky had been painted red and blue by the hundreds of fire and lightning bursts that constantly shook the earth as they dropped down like artillery shells on the firing lines of both armies. The smell of crispening flesh and blood, cries for help, desperate screams of pain, there was an all-out battle all around them. Their men were dying. But neither commander paid attention to them, Yami, Almighty A, and Killer B, naturally, they knew what was going on, that their people were falling by the hundreds without any of them to help them, yet they also didn't dare get distracted by it, not even for an instant. 
One small mistake in the Rekage's frightening speed would overwhelm Yami and Tanum with the fierce onslaught of the Hachibi's Jinchuriki, but the opposite was also true, one wrong move, and Yami's flying thunder god, Horatian, could easily overwhelm the Rekage and Killer B, the Rekage was the first one to make his move. As the ground under him fractured from the pressure that the Rekage was putting into it as he kicked forward in a shocking display of speed, he dashed forward faster than any lightning jutsu could. As Yami sensed a rakage coming towards him, as he looked like he had disappeared to the untrained eye, he had an absolutely calm face, his eyes move at unimaginable speed as they analyze the rakage's muscle movements and try to predict his next move and trajectory. His weren't just any pair of trained eyes, they were Sharingan trained to perfection, analyzed beyond the limits and surpassed them. Thought Yami, while trying to predict the rakage down to the movement of his eyebrows, however, that proved too hard of a feat for him to accomplish, even his thought process and training, coupled with his battle instinct. He simply couldn't keep up with the third rakage's speed, at least not at 100% accuracy, a testament of just how outrageous the rakage's speed and agility were. A monster in his own right, Almighty A, his was now ready to obliterate Yami's head with a fast and harsh piercing motion, if one could catch a glimpse of the rakage's expression, it's likely that it would be calm, and the only thing that would show what he might be feeling is his sadistic look in his eyes that would be present, nevertheless. Something weird had happened as Yami donned a slightly teasing smirk on his face. The moment the rakages was within arm's reach of his body, Yami's hand went to stop the hell stab. People would consider this the height of humanly possible stupidity, given that this technique could inflict considerable damage to even the Hachibi, what it could do to a mere human being is a completely different thing. One that had been previously been delivered to Yami's illusion not more than a few moments ago, by the time the crackling finger of the rakage is about to enter contact with the hand of the Inuzuka, Yami's hand also got filled with chakra in less than a split second, Yami was about to use that technique to contend against the rakages. But then, Flash in a black flash, before anyone including the rakage could notice, Yami was behind him. He teleported to a Horatian formula kunai that he had secretly buried in the ground. Yami then swings his wind chakra scalpel at the rakage's back. The rakage couldn't see behind his back, but Yami was already known for his use of the Horatian. Predicting a flanking attack, the rakage just jumped forward to dodge Yami's attack. Yami was about to chase after the rakage, but then he sensed an attack from Killer B, he too was careful, and jumped out of the attack range with relative ease, as it was just Hachibi Black Ink that he threw him, as he looks at the Jinchuriki, Yami clicks his tongue. Killer B is in his full Hachibi aspect transformation. The giant Hachibi had now opened his jaws, and while Yin and Yang Chakra were rapidly gathering there in a pulsating dark purplish sphere, Killer B had already taken aim at Yami, as he finished charging a small-sized Bijadama, and although it looked to be no bigger than 4.8 meters, 15.7 feet, in diameter. It was still more than enough to level half of the battlefield in an instant. Yami frowned at this scene and immediately started performing several hand signs at a fast pace, he was getting ready to create a barrier to contain that dreadful technique, however, the rakage wouldn't allow this, so he again moved in to engage Yami and provide support for the Hachibi-clad Killer B. He returned the favor by appearing behind Yami and Fuam Almighty A had landed a clean heavy punch on his back, making Yami stop performing his hand signs as his face grimaced in pain. He could feel the lightning chakra running through him, tearing through skin and muscle, paralyzing his body and scrambling his chakra, the pain not allowing him to even teleport away with Horatian, he didn't have enough time to turn off his pain receptors, and as the rakage blitzed away just as fast as he came with his punch, there was at that same moment fired by Killer B. The two goliaths of Kumagakar had established just how overwhelming an assault and perfect coordination by them can be. Boo I'm differing from an ordinary bomb type attack, the explosion wasn't like that of a ball of fire, and more like a blinding flash of pure chakra being set free in a violent rampage, destroying any matter that stood in its way. Everything around the zone of impact had seemingly ceased to exist, there were countless casualties from both sides of the conflict, the attack had, as expected, caused immense devastation all around, trees, water, rock, metal, flesh, no matter. Anything in range of the giant blast had succumbed before the terrifying power of the second strongest biju, Yami POV. I can feel it, everything burning right off, a catastrophic amount of pain hitting me like a train, this is simply too troublesome, I could have killed the rakage ever since the fight started, regardless of how fast he is, I would have taken one single attack, for me to end him and paint the ground red with his insides. Nonetheless I require his body to be as intact as possible for it to be useful to me, it is quite harder to win right out of the bat, when you need to take care to not obliterate your opponents in the process, abruptly, I look at my hands, trembling from the shock of pain, and by hands, I mean my calcined hand bones, I could feel that all of my hair and half of my face, had been burned off as well. Including half of my skull, thankfully I saved the Sharingan inside my eye socket, I could at least protect my vital organs, and my Jiangu hearts in that decisive moment, sigh it seems like, I will have to get serious. I get up and move my hands, not by the use of the nerves or anything like that. My dark bony hands move by the use of the dead bone pulse, Shikatsungaku, from the Kagaya clan, General POV. The Kumo Shinobi were happy that this attack had paid off. Their hefty sacrifice had been worth it. 
The Konoha ninja were now trying to scatter in despair, but then, whoosh the dust quickly cleared off, and in the pits of the crater, there it was, a true monster, the Kumo ninja, were absolutely frozen by the terror crawling up their bodies, even the Konoha ninja, on top of their morale being low, after looking at the scene in front of their eyes, they were scared senseless, what they saw, was, Yami, he had half of his face and body burned off. Most of him was now charred meat or blackened bone, with both of his arms as calcine skeletal limbs, but what had truly shocked and scared them, were the flesh and muscle on the young man's body, being restored out of nothing and at an alarming rate, as if it was the work of a jinjutsu of some kind, maybe it was. They couldn't know for sure, his face have also regenerated, even faster than the rest of his body, tattoos of different linear shapes, started spreading all over Yami's body like water rolling down a cascade, all of his body had regenerated in the blink of an eye. Yami's hair had also turned completely white. His body couldn't possibly keep up with the jutsu and produce enough pigments to dye his new hair roots. Yami had a cold demeanor that looked like you would be frozen if you got too close, he clasped his hands together, and a golden light radiated from where he Yami stood, no, more like from his entire physique, it was as if Yami himself had become a miniature sun. Emitting a blinding flash similar to that of the Bijadama, Yami just regenerated and looked towards the rakage. His body still shining like he was a miniature sun. It seems like I will have to start getting serious now. Said Yami with a creeping calm voice. The rakage frowned at what Yami said, but he didn't let his emotions take the better of him and attack Yami immediately. So Killer B in his eight tails form was the one to attack. It threw another giant tailed beast bomb. Yami just waved three hand signs, and the tailed beast bomb got absorbed by a giant Fuenjutsu seal that appeared mid-air, and far away an explosion was heard. This technique is very chakra consuming, if Yami was the average ninja that is, but he had the Tsunade seal that stored chakra together with five hearts, and each of them are at S-rank chakra amount. So truly Yami didn't even feel the drain. Plus his chakra was already regenerating at an alarming rate. He was sucking and purifying the huge amount of dark chakra that was produced by all of the negative emotions around the battlefield. Where dark emotions are overwhelming, suddenly as the rakage was about to attack again, Yami just dropkicks the ground. Boom creating a huge earthquake, destabilizing the rakage's footing. Obviously the rakage was only destabilized for a split second, but that was enough time as a giant golden fist that seemingly came out of nowhere punched him, pow, and threw him away, boom the rakage was punched very hard. Going through many trees and rocks before his body halted. On the outside the rakage didn't have a scratch on him, but he still had a frowning face as he touched his chest. That was shock wave damage. Father the rakage, as he analyzed what happened, he didn't see it, but, Fuashi went back at the sight of the eight tails bee, he looked at his opponent, and he saw Yami who now had white silver hair, with a smile on his face. Yami just clapped his hands again, and the rakage was able to see what had hit him, a transparent Buddha-like golden statue with a hundred arms. One hundred type Guanyin Bodhisattva. A monk technique that had been modified by Yami to suit his needs. The statue was gigantic, easily matching the eight tails in size. The eight tails got ready to shoot another tailed beast bomb, but before it even had time to gather the chakra to do that. The giant statue behind Yami opened its mouth, and, boom it fired a laser beam towards the eight tails. The speed of the attack was too fast for the eight tails giant body to dodge, but it still decided to bring his hand forward to defend itself. Boom as soon as the giant golden laser beams and the eight tails palm collide, a burning feeling fills the air, as the hand of the eight tails is clearly burning from the laser, who is spreading around and hitting people all over, when the beam made contact with the eight tails hand. Killer B just winced a little, and it held the beam back, and he was still able to form a tailed beast bomb of the smaller variety, and threw it towards Yami, simply waved another hand sign and, a giant flesh substance wraps all around Yami. Buam as the mini tailed beast bomb hit him and even the rakage went on top of the head of the eight tails and waved through hand signs as he dropped his lightning armor. Suddenly black lightning appeared on his hands, the lightning transformed into two panthers made out of electricity. So he sent the black lightning towards Yami's fleshy defense. Yami of course wasn't affected, even by the lightning shock. The meatball around Yami burned and got electrocuted, but it simply regenerated. Yami waved through another sequence of hand signs. All around Yami, the land turned into a swamp. He also put a full-on cage-level chakra into the jutsu, making a huge and deep sinkhole all around him. Even the eight tails got stuck into it, as the mud was infused with chakra to make it stick more to its opponents. The eight tails struggled, but it was only sinking deeper into the swamp. Then suddenly all around the eight tails' body, black ink was secreted from his body and into the swamp. Giving itself even more time for something. But it took this time to form a giant tailed beast bomb towards Yami and his fleshy shield. Buam completely obliterating it, but, Yami had already teleported out of there. That was a distraction all along. He had moved away from his meaty shield. Both Killer B and the rakage came to the same conclusion. Suddenly, Fuashe purple square barrier is formed all around the rakage and Killer B, and, the rakage used his lightning armor to help his perception and see if he could find any weakness in the barrier. Fuash the eight tails disappeared from under its feet. The rakage was worried for B for a split second as he was falling down. 
Yami took that opportunity as he appeared from underground. The rakage was mid-air so he couldn't dodge, so he used his attack again, to attack the technique Yami threw at him. The rakage frowned and it looked for any weak spots in my defense. But then, Fwash three normal looking kunai were thrown behind a rakage. He looked around to see who did that and saw, it was Yami's shadow clones. The kunai had his Horatian mark as he, appeared behind the rakage, and, Swish Yami used his super strength as he used, and, the rakage's body was pierced from his back, but due to the strong defensive properties of the lightning armor, the pierce wasn't too deep. But it definitely pierced a rakage on his back, giving Yami a chance. Then Yami does a slashing motion, and, Fwash, a large cut appears in the back of the rakage. While still mid-air dark wings appear on Yami's back with all of his strength, he grabs the arm of the rakage. Crack and due to using all of his strength on it the rakage's arm is completely broken. Yami tugs it away and rips the arm of the rakage's body. When the rakage sees this he immediately understands that Yami hasn't been going all out. This kid will kill us all, if I am injured, me, and B won't be able to hold him back. Fought the rakage, while clutching his stump and using the heat of the electricity in the wound, burning it which stopped the bleeding. As soon as he does so, he screams to the top of his lungs, retry it. And he finally touched the ground, in a split second the battlefield had changed. The Kumo ninja were the ones in peril now, Yami had a calm look all along as he looked at the rakage. With the eight tails teleported out of the way, he could easily handle the rakage, the rakage immediately ordered the retreat of his soldiers. He might not be a match anymore for the monster in front of him, but he can hold him back, he looks at his son, unruly A, and their eyes meet each other. His son wouldn't be useful in a battle against Yami, so he had gone to fight against the other Kanoha ninja. Whereas he is still an s rank ninja, he killed a lot of them. As the third rakages and his son's eyes meet the rakage, even with his arm ripped off of his torso, he smiles at his son. It would be shameful and sad for his last memory to be of me fearing for my life thought the rakage. I took a gamble and lost, now I will pay the price. He simply says something to his son, who is far away and can't hear him, but from reading his lips, he can tell what his father said. It's your turn next to Rakage's son, no, the new Rakage, tears came out of his eyes, but his face hardened as he screamed at his soldiers. Retreat ordering them, he followed his father's wishes. The third Rakage was a little relieved at this. This all happened in a split second, and he then turned towards Yami, who had a calm look on his face. To hold him back long enough I need to put some distance between us. Contemplated the Rakage, using all of his vast life experience to try and use the best possible move. The Rakage jumped back in blinking speeds. Yami just looked at this calmly and asked, why are you putting so much distance between us? If you want to make sure it hits me, then you should get up close and fire, or is it that you're afraid of letting even a part of me out of your field of vision by getting close? If that's the case, then it is a foolish thought. Distance only has meaning in a fight between equals, with you and me, distance holds no meaning at all. Watch. Flash in a black flash, Yami appeared in front of the rakage and placed his hand on the rakage's chest, right above his heart. If I do this, my hand is almost instantly at your heart said Yami with an absolute calmness to his voice. He wasn't bragging or anything, he was simply stating a fact, when he hit the rakage's back, he had already marked him with the Horatian formula. The rakage was already dead, he just didn't know it, Yami's hand easily went through the rakage's defenses, and with a simple wind scalpel, he touched his heart, cough. The rakage coughed blood, his eyes slowly got hollow as his body started falling on the ground, Yami as a medical ninja is terrifyingly powerful, even with him simply touching his victim as a death sentence to his enemies. The rakage, except for his missing arm, no other outward injuries were on his body during the time of its death. Immediately when the Kanoha ninja saw the rakage fall, they cheered, from the couple of thousands of ninja from before, there are now only around 500, that is with counting the injured too, today they lost comrades, friends, and family, they fell in the pit of despair earlier, when they saw Yami hit by the Bijudama, but now, they see Yami as their undefeated champion. Kumodakar didn't lose that many of its ninja members, due to their large numbers and the now de facto fourth rakage helping them, but they lost far more than Kanoha, they lost both their cage and strongest shinobi, Yami just simply raised his fist in victory and screamed. The battle is won. Even while saying this, he had a bright smile on his face, but what no one had noticed were the black tendrils going towards the rakage's heart, ripping it out and healing back the injury, so no one would notice that the still beating was heart gone. After the battle ended, Kurunai looked to be a little shaken as she saw all of the dead bodies around her, it smelled horrible. She watched some Kanoichi who had her eyes wide open in shock, as half of her face was gone, the whole place was covered in blood and mutilated body parts lying around, she would have thrown up if Yami hadn't taught his students techniques on how to handle situations like this. Plus, Team 13 already had their first kills a long time ago. Ah. Kurunai heard a scream in a bundle of different bodies that seemed to have fallen on top of each other. She went to help but suddenly she felt a hand on her shoulder, that is just a desperate Kumo ninja, said someone behind her, she turned around and said. 
Yami Sensei, immediately the vision of Yami almost dying by the Bijadama appeared in her mind. She almost cried from this as she went to hug Yami desperately. Why Yami, Sensei, I am glad you are okay. Sniffled Kurunai as she tugged on Yami's tattered shirt, she felt Yami hug her and say. I am only Yami's shadow clones, we were ordered by him to collect all of the bodies, he wants the soldiers to rest and relax, now that the fighting is over, he will take care of the rest, like healing the injured and cleaning up the battlefield, then after they separated, she just wiped her tears away with the sleeve of her shirt. A ninja or not, she is still only a 9 year old girl, Yami's clone crouched down to her level and pinched her cheeks into a forced smile. Shenshei stop please. Complained Kurunai in her childish voice. Hmm. A girl like you should smile more often, overcast skies blot out the sun, and that always brings people's spirits down. So why not let the sun shine, even if just a while longer, nah. Said shadow clone Yami, with a tender smile on his face while he lightly patted Kurunai's head. He looked like a gentle and caring older brother, looking out for his cute little sister, after some time it had gotten dark outside, as Yami, well more like his clones, buried the bodies. Coincidentally, a dozen Ichiha and Hyuga clan members' remains had been destroyed during the battle, it was actually very useful for Yami that Killer B had used the Hachibi's Bijadama so freely, the thought of something being wrong with the disappearance of so many clansmen with Dejutsu would never cross anyone's mind, two hours later. And Yami's thousands of clones had taken care of everything that he wanted. The remaining Jonin from Yami's army came into his tent. Now, there were only 20 Jonin alive. Two of them having to retire due to one losing his kidneys, and the other's eyes getting slashed with a kunai, leaving him blind, they all sat down, they looked a little nervously towards the head of the table, where Yami was sitting on his slightly decorated chair. His hair had turned back to cold black, since his body was back to producing black pigment. He looked fresh and vigorous as if nothing had happened in the last few hours, Yami smiled mildly to all of the jonin in the room. They were holding their breaths for what Yami would do next, would he give chase to the now weakened Kumo Shinobi? Would he order a full invasion into the Land of Lightning? Or would he rather let them lick their wounds while they waited for the reinforcements to arrive? Yami could see what they were all thinking. His smile was still on his face as he got up from his chair and went to the side of the table, where there was a floating teapot with weird seals all around it. Good evening Kanoha Jonan. Please, relax, we will talk about what happened and what comes next, but before addressing that, let us drink some tea, good evening Kanoha Jonan. Please, relax, we will talk about what happened and what comes next, but before addressing that, let us drink some tea, I said to them with a calm and serene voice, as if I already knew what would happen, and how I would deal with it, that is what a true leader must be. He must be a good liar to his people. Some leaders even tend to lie to themselves as well, not me though. Those who lie to themselves are only welcoming death, anyway, I am simply asserting my dominance when doing something like pouring tea for myself. Because they know how confident I am that they won't rush the debrief, I feel even better than yesterday, as if I had woken up from the most refreshing and deep sleep, I can feel a monstrous chakra more dense than anything I had felt before, right at the tip of every nerve in my body, all due to my discarding of my previous Jiangu lightning heart with a brand new one, the third rakages. I can feel that he truly wasn't your normal cage, his chakra levels were monstrous. No wonder he tied with a tailed beast in a battle of endurance, no rakage will ever be his equal, after pouring myself some tea I go back to my seat and look at all of them in the eyes, one by one. They might be Jonan, but my stare makes them a little nervous. After all, I did just take a point blank Bijadama two hours ago, and I am now comfortably drinking tea, without so much as a scratch on my face, I have the rakage's body, and have decided to sue for peace. I told them about my decision. I would like to refute this, commander said one of the jonin, as he stood up to make his voice reach every corner of the tent. By his looks, I can easily tell he is an Achiha, plus the Achiha clan symbol in one of his sleeves is a clear giveaway, well then, time to make an example out of this little shit I calmly looked at him. I am sorry, you must have misunderstood, I wasn't asking for your opinion, I was simply informing you of my decision. I stated calmly, leaving no room for discussion. The Achiha seemed like he wanted to say something, but he saw the look on my eyes. He just sat down with an unsatisfied face, folding his arms to express his displeasure. This is why no one likes the Acha, they think that they are all some geniuses just because of their Sharingan, but they are simply some pampered little men who are too slow on the uptake, I don't say anything and keep looking at the Acha. The others seem to get a little uncomfortable when they notice me staring at him intently, Acha, if you want to say something, then say it. Don't be a little cat now. At least stand by your own words, do not simply return to your seat as if nothing came out of your mouth, because something did come out, if you feel that you are in the right, then we can settle this in a swift duel, I stated as the Achiha just sweated a little and reluctantly said. And no, everything is okay see commander. I just got up and walked around the table until I stood behind the Achiha's seat. I then uttered to him in a cold voice. 
Listen now little man, dare to question me one more time, and I will have your head on a stake for insubordination, I'll even nail your head on it myself, do you understand me? I shouted the last part daring him to question my authority one more time. He just looked at me, at my cold back eyes, his bravado went away never to come back, and a look of fear appeared on his face. Not even a Sharingan could stare at my eyes if they belonged to a coward, I could easily guess what he was thinking, he is most likely remembering what happened to Danzo and his clan, almost drawn to extinction just because of one man's mistake, trying to fuck with me. He surely doesn't want to do the same, I said do you understand me you little shit, I repeated the question loudly, as my eyes widened with a psychotic look appearing on my face, more than one jonin recovered their posture in their seats, I don't want to be seen as a pushover like the third hokage, but fighting any more would truly be useless to me. I already have a higher reputation, I have the Reikage's body and the Hachibi's chakra, why yes Commander Yami. This will never happen again. Answered the Achiha truthfully with his tail between his legs. Hmm, I see, so even the Achiha aren't dumb enough to cross me. Good, or I would be forced to eliminate their clan, I would then have to keep Makoto alive, and since I would have killed her clan, she definitely wouldn't listen to me, so I would have my way with her until Sasuke was born, the reincarnation of one of Hagoromo's children of legend, Indra, he will prove an important tool for me in the future, I'm sure, General POV. While Yami was dominating the Jonin on his camp and showing the Achiha who is the one in charge, something else was happening in Kanahagakur. In the Inyazuka training grounds, Shiro was just laying down, unlike his usual sinful, erratic, and chaotic behavior. He had one eye open as he looked at Hachi and his team draining, even though Yami didn't say anything specifically, Shiro already knows who Hachi's father is, he couldn't help but judge these people in his mind. How do these dumb people not even understand the basic shit? It's just a 2 plus 2, I mean why would Yami even allow someone else in his house when he has those things right under? Suddenly, Shiro scratched his ear as he saw Hachi doing some moves and training the Senju to Jutsu style. Shiro POV. The style was modified a little by Yami to suit Hachi's more flexible joints. Hachi had a more thin than fat build, but even with all that I can't help but think if Hachi is adopted, I mean that kid is nothing like Yami. Yes, there are signs here and there, but nothing that truly defines Yami, like his alpha and domineering attitude, if Yami walks in a room, everyone will have to look at him, because his presence demands it. Hachi is nothing like Yami, he can't even come close to Yami's greatness. No one can comprehend Yami, no one can win against Yami, thinking about how his opponents try to outsmart him, you're not going to give him a chance to use his super strength? Not good. You've completely misunderstood Yami's power that's right, Yami isn't feared because he can use his super strength to punch mountains into dust, yes, his strength is terrifying, but that alone would not have been enough to subdue those Konoha clans and land of fire nobles who would rather die than obey. There was only one reason why those as powerful as the Achiha, and even the Daimyo, do what Yami wants them to do, despite their motives. Just because he's too powerful, all of Yami's abilities are far beyond anyone else's, you're going to take precautions against his jutsu and monstrous strength? Your plans aren't good enough. You're going to take precautions against everything else? Your plans still aren't good enough even if everyone that opposed him were to combine their minds and take precautions against unfortunate events like the sky falling or the earth splitting, it wouldn't matter. Yami's abilities would be far beyond any of their plans, anyway, I wonder if I could somehow get me some sake, Yami has ordered everyone to not sell me any sake, damn, I can even sense dozens of Yami's clones running around down by the sewers of the village, there's no escaping his eyes and ears, even while he is so far away, he still controls everything in Konoha, well. Guess I'll have to settle for that bitch Jume to come lick some yakisoba off my balls, general POV. In the land of lightning, inside the hidden cloud village, a funeral was being held. People from all over the Land of Lightning were gathered here for the funeral of the Third Rakage. Some people who didn't even know him directly were crying, the Third Rakage was greatly loved amongst his citizens, he was a pillar that seemed unbeatable, he was a cocoon of security, as long as he was alive, they knew that the enemy would never torment them, he put fear in his enemies' hearts and relief in hearts of the people of the Land of Lightning. Amongst the grieving people was the one called Unruly A, the Third Rakage's son, and the soon-to-be 4RTH Rakage. He didn't have any tears on his face, just a look of determination with his eyes holding a shed of sadness within them. People came and went, but he still just stayed like that, unmoving. But still greeting any important person that came to offer his condolences. No matter how fake they were he just accepted them, he knew that the Land of Lightning was only so successful because of the continuity of the good rakage being chosen. Their economy and military has always been the best amongst the hidden villages, they have always had the best ninja together with hidden stone, and the economy has always been strong due to the mountains of gold and trade within their land. After some time when everyone went away, a just looked down. He clenched his fist, he was angry at himself for being so weak. He just clenched his fist and unable to hold in his anger anymore, he walked towards one of the walls and, boom punched straight through it. But his anger and sadness wasn't appeased at all. So he continued punching walls. 
Boom boom he went through many walls like this. Until he was outside in one of the balconies, looking down at the hidden cloud village from the mountain. He couldn't hold it in anymore, and tears came out of his eyes, damn it old man. You weren't supposed to die like this. Thought A, as he kept thinking back on his father's death. His smiling father who had just gotten his arm ripped off, but he still smiled to reassure his son. In this private and emotional moment, A suddenly hears the steps of someone walking from behind him. Yo bro whatcha doing here alone, when you should be at, home? Said B, while still trying to chain his words together to form a rap, in a way B was trying to comfort his brother in his own strange way. He knew what was happening to his brother, he too was saddened by the death of his father in all but blood. But was sad at this, so he didn't turn around to look at B, because he didn't want his little brother to see him cry, he must be strong, B, I want you to go to the storm cloud ravine, and train your tailed beast bomb. You will not be engaging the enemy. If the enemy attacks the village, take them out with your long range tailed beast bomb. Order day, he said this because he didn't want B to fight in this war anymore, or he might lose his brother in this too. As the rakage. I will protect this village to the very end. That is what my old man wanted. Said A full of determination, on the other side of the war borders, many strange things were happening, bloodline limit users were disappearing with strange circumstances in the land of water, and there has been proof found that it was the Kiri village elders. So the situation heated up, and it was expected of a civil war to break out in Kiri. After all, the bloodline limit clans were given the most dangerous missions, and together with their children being taken like this. They couldn't take it anymore and things started heating up. Due to the situation Kanoha could finally take a breather. And the ordeal with Yami and Yazuga killing someone monstrous like the third Rakage spread all around the lands. His bingo book entry also changed with his bounty changing from 127 million to 200 million. The 73 million was all added to his bounty by the Land of Lightning. His name was spoken far and wide, and he was given the flea on side order. Anyone confronting him is allowed to immediately retreat. He is someone whom even armies with thousands of ninja are forbidden to confront, unless it is unavoidable. In the Hidden Stone Village, the Tsuchika Janoki and the Hidden Stone Village council members all sat around a table with Anoki at the head of it. So the fourth rakage is a green brat, huh? Said Anoki as he looked through some intelligence reports. It also seems like some new hotshot just jumped up two steps. Kanoha truly has some amazing talents sometimes. Then he showed to the other council members the report page he was holding. Yami and Yuzuka flee on sight order. Nicknames? Red Fang, Sky Slayer, Demon Child Yami, Dark Flash, Yami of the 10,000 Jutsu, Yami the Undead Ninja, Rank. Jounen, S Rank. Net Worth. Unknown, estimated in the billions of Ryo. Bounty. 200 mil. Missions Record. S68, A123, B63, C93, D86. Estimated Abilities. Dangerous in Long Range, Close Range and Medium Range. Be aware of his Jinjutsu, Tajutsu especially with the power he has displayed lately, Ninjutsu is very lethal. He is considered unkillable by known methods, it is assumed that the brain might be his weak point. If confronted, flee on sight, when the council members looked at this, they seemed nervous, but then one of them said. But Tsuchikaj sama I think that Yami and Yazuka isn't a threat, and wouldn't the atomic dismantling Jutsu directly counter Yami and Yazuka's regenerative power? Anoki nods at this. Good attention to detail Jama, but he also knows the same jutsu like that yellow-haired brat, so his speed would be very troublesome. The other council members nod at this. Then how should we handle him in case of an attack from him? Anoki just scratches his chin in while deep inside his thoughts, and in the end he just says. That is what we are here to figure out, after all, I believe that soon the hidden cloud village will either sue for peace, or they will get eliminated by either Kanoha or some other villages. Their losses have been enormous lately, and that might give the one who has lately been secretly taking control over the smaller hidden villages from the shadows, enough courage to go in an all-out attack against the land of lightning. The other elders all nodded in agreement at this. They could just send some Jinchuriki to deal with Minato and Fugaku, but Yami is a whole different type of monster. There is no definite weakness to Yami, he is way too versatile for anyone to be able to take advantage against him. Hachi POV I slowly open my eyes and look around me, hmm, I seem to have fallen asleep during training in the Inuzuka compound. So you are awake, sleepyhead. When I heard this sound I immediately turned around and looked at Yami standing upside down in a tree, but Yami is in the front lines, so this must be one of his clones. I rub my eyes a little and yawn as I say. I must have just lied down to take a nap. It seems I didn't notice it and slept a lot more than intended. Yami's clone suddenly smiles. So, do you remember anything before you fell asleep? I think back on it. Uh, no, not really, why did something happen? The clone just shrugged. No, nothing happened. I just was worried about you, and wanted to ask how it raining has been going lately. It's been good. I decided to just say that and not elaborate anymore. I mean, I have made such progress that seems to be at a snail's pace, compared to when Yomi taught me. 
I could beat a Chunin with just a week of training. Now, I haven't learned anything, I mean sure I learned about some new ninjutsu, but I don't have enough chakra to use any of them. The Senju library is a treasure trove, but I can't really use most of the things, so I give them to Yami's clones, then they modify techniques to perfectly fit me. Yami said that as I grow older he will continue to give me the modified techniques that I gave to him. I see that the shadow clone seemed a little unsure of something as he frowned and finally said. I think that you should be deployed where the original Yami is. He will help keep you alive and he can protect you. Lately, I have been understanding more and more of what Yami is trying to teach me. Even though he doesn't say it, well he will probably never say it, but I know that he does care about me in his way. He will never truly hurt me and will always protect me, he is like a dad, but he is way too young to be one. I consider the clone's offer, I know that I will be safe if I go there, but I also know that I will never grow if I will always be under Yami's wing. I decided to tell my decision to Yami's clone. I know that I will be safe if I do that, but I know that I wouldn't grow if I was under Yami's wing. While saying this, I was a little scared, I knew that I would have to go into a dangerous situation, and might die. But strangely, I have never felt calmer, I can think clearly, and my face is cold, with no emotion in it. Portraying nothing of what I am thinking. The clone just looked at me with a strange twinkle in his eyes, then out of nowhere, something that I have never heard Yami or any of his clones do happens. He laughed, ha 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 ha. His laughter was very strange, it was too trained. It also had a certain coldness to it. You are my, something else aren't you, Hachi. I didn't understand what he meant by that, but as the clone continued laughing, I noticed that during certain intervals, the smile would be a little whiter. As if he had heard the funniest inside joke ever. Two months later, Yami's age 19, land of water borders, two months, and there has been no battle, only small skirmishes against the mist village, I was currently on a patrol run. It also seemed that even with the Senju name I am still treated as a genin. Which is nice and all that, but my patrol team is my teammates, Shoto, Momo, and Kai-sensei. Suddenly something strange happened as Kai-sensei signaled us to stop as we were jumping trees. Did he maybe notice any mist ninja around here? Who knew, as we were thinking this, Fuash sensei disappeared from where he was, clink, another noise was heard, and then a thud, later the teacher came back with a 10-year-old girl under his arm, the Kanoichi seemed to be struggling, but she was already tied up by Kai. It was her and some other genin. No wonder the hidden mist keeps losing ninja like flies. They don't even have jonin teams for a talented kid like her. Said Kai sensei as he threw the girl on the ground. When I look at her closer, I see that she has a special tape on her mouth to stop her from talking. She has long auburn hair, she has green eyes and jade-like skin, she seems to be around 10 years old. She suddenly looks at me and my teammates with fire in her eyes. Then sensei rips off the tape of her mouth and says. Okay, start speaking kid. I want to know who you are. Someone with your chakra at your age wouldn't be a no-name ninja, so there is a high chance you are from a clan. Tell me which one and you will live. Immediately, when Kai says that, he releases killing intent towards her. She jumps a little back in fright, but she simply answers. M, my name is, Mei Terumi. Kai immediately just widely smiles at this, and stops his killing intent. Terumi, that is indeed a very good last name, you will be very useful to Yamasama. Kai sensei seemed to know something about the Terumi surname. I must say that even though I read a lot, I don't know about every clan in the elemental nations. The girl seems a little uncomfortable and seems to be looking around for an escape route. When she sees none she looks down in resignation. As we are walking back to the Kanoha camp, I notice the girl called Mei Terumi looking at me, and out of nowhere she just asked. Do you have any relation with Yami and Yuzuka, you sure look a lot like him. I just look at her face, for the first time since we have started walking. Sensei waved a hand sign, signaling me to try and befriend her for information. Every Achiha and half of the civilians in Kanoha look like Yami and Yuzuka, why, have you met him before or something? I decided to continue talking about Yami like this, since she genuinely seemed interested when we walked about Yami. No not really, but I did hear of him, he killed my father in the second ninja war. Said Mei Terumi with a hateful look in her eyes, though her face stayed calm. Hachi looks at the tied up Mei when she just told him that Yami killed her father. He was a little surprised, but he could understand that Yami has already probably killed hundreds or maybe even thousands of ninja. He, isn't necessarily fond of Yami, but he cares about him. He is like a big brother who in his way tries to teach him life lessons. But that still didn't stop him from sympathizing with Mei. At the oldest she should have been 5 years old at the time, when her father died, depending on the year he died. His father also died, before he was even born, so he can understand, having no father growing up can be hard. Mei noticed a pitying look Hachi had on his eyes. She frowned and said. I don't need your sympathy little boy, Hachi's eye twitches a little when he was being called a little boy. But he still calmly answers. Oh, is that so, and how old are you, little girl? Even while tied up and walking, Mei puffed her chest in pride and said. Heh, I am 9 years old. Well I am 7, so there isn't any big difference. 
answered Hachi, as he calmed himself, not allowing Mei to get inside his head and get a rise out of him. Then as they were walking slowly, night came and they set up camp. Kai, since he is a jonin and part of the Inuzuka clan, he has certain privileges. He waves some hand signs and slams his palm on the ground. Poof smoke appears as a giant bat, as big as a horse carriage comes out of the smoke. The bat looked towards Kai, and a smile appeared on the bat's face. Thought to the Genins and Mei, the smile looked terrifying on the giant bat's face. Hey Kai how have you been? Asks the bat in a strange old raspy voice. Kai just shrugs. I have been okay, thank you for asking. The bat nods, that question had more layers to it than your average greeting. Since the bat is his bat summon, it knows about Kai's body condition. He doesn't have a lot of time left, plus he has been with Kai for many years now, so they know each other pretty well. Kai then gives the bat a message to give to the Kanoha camp leader in the front line, against a hidden mist village, this camp leader is Orochimaru. They are notifying him that everything is okay, and that they will be a little late. Plus the message was filled with dozens of secret messages that identified that it was him. Then later as everyone was asleep, Hachi was the one on watch during that time. He was simply leaning on a tree. His eyes were closed since in the darkness they wouldn't be that useful. He concentrated on his sense of smell and hearing. He could smell different natural smells, no smells of humans around. His ear also slightly twitches now and then, listening to the small wires he had put around the camp perimeter. They would slightly shift if anything made contact with them. He was on full alert as he heard someone approach him. It wasn't anyone from outside the camp, it was from the inside. It was their prisoner mate Arumi, she had a cold look in her face and simply said. I think, no, I know, I really hate you Hachi, this coming out of nowhere from her surprised Hachi a little, and he looked confused. What is that supposed to mean? I know that we are enemies so there is no need for you to tell me that you hate me. I know that you already do. Then how about this, I loathe you Hachi send you repeated Mei, she was still tied up, and didn't dare try to escape, since she knew that her life is only hanging by a string, but she truly got annoyed by how Hachi acted. Why do you try to act so kind when you know what is going to happen to me? Hachi winced a little at this, he knows that she is probably going to get tortured for information. But what he didn't know was, that reality isn't that simple and nice. And Mei reminded him by saying with eyes full of despair. I can't handle it anymore. Then she took a deep breath and her eyes turned dull. She had forced her emotions to dull and not feel such despair. I will be raped, that is what will happen to me. As soon as I am of age I will continuously be raped. I will continue bearing children until I die, for the Kanoha clan that will be lucky to get me is their property, so stop acting like you are nice and all that. When Hachi heard this, he felt as if his whole world started shaking, his pupils dilated, due to his young age, he hadn't taken a possibility like this into account. His seven-year-old mind couldn't comprehend humanity's cruelty. He couldn't understand that even when humanity takes over the planet they have no one else to fight, and no other species to dominate, they will start fighting amongst themselves. But Mei didn't let him even comprehend what she said as she dropped another bomb on him. Judging by the actions so far, the Inuzuka clan will get me. So who will have their way with me when I grow up, will it be some unknown Inuzuka or maybe Yami Inuzuka himself will have his way with me. I heard that even when he was young he was always ruthless. Especially with the killing of the third rakage they call him Yami the Undying Ninja, then she gets close to Hachi, and while in shock he can't react as she whispers into his ear. But behind closed doors, they call him a monster in human skin. Yami the monster. The boogeyman, that mothers scare their children to make them obey, but he exists and is quite real. As she was about to continue saying more, Fwash suddenly something even more shocking happened as a hand came out of Hachi's stomach and grabbed Mei by the throat, Hachi immediately looked at the hand coming out of his stomach, the hand was completely covered in darkness, and he instinctively went for an attack towards the hand. But, as soon as he was about to, the hand and the rest of something made out of the darkness came from Hachi's stomach and, bomb Hachi fell on the ground unconscious, there was no attack whatsoever, even his team was also unconscious, as they didn't even wake up from the noise of Hachi's body hitting the ground. The creature with the human form was completely covered in darkness, and it just looked at Mei, who was terrified of the monster in front of her. She wanted to scream but couldn't, she wanted to say something but couldn't. Her throat was choked so hard, she could feel her neck was almost snapped like a twig. But the person covered in darkness didn't seem to care while he simply said, you shouldn't confuse little Hachi like this, he is so young, he isn't quite ready to handle the world yet, his mind is not mature enough to comprehend cruelty like this, then she felt her vision go dark too, as she heard that being said by a surprisingly young sounding voice. Hachi POV. As I wake up in the morning, I feel a slight headache, oh right, yesterday during the time it was my time to stay watch, I accidentally bumped my head, I really should be more careful these days, and shouldn't try to train during these times, or it could be fatal. I see that our Jonin teacher Kai was the last watch. He came back and just gave us all a casual greeting, then as Mei woke up I felt a strange sense of deja vu, well whatever it doesn't matter, everyone has this every now and then. 
I got up and started walking towards Mei. I noticed that when she looked at me she too had a strange look in her eyes, before it went away. Anyway time to go and escort her to the main camp, I wonder what will happen to her. I hope she talks and doesn't need to be tortured for information or something like that. General POV Arachimaru looked at the letter that Kai had sent to him, he couldn't help but frown a little. He was one of the people he had tried to bribe to get him to spy on Yami, those Inuzuka are like dogs around Yami. Even though the Inuzuka used to be generally weak and didn't have anything astonishing about them. Most likely producing one solid jonin per generation. But even since Yami became the clan head they have skyrocketed into the big leagues, recently pumping out jonin numbers at the same caliber as the Ache. Two, no, just one more year, and the Inuzuka will be the top clan in Kanoha. Analyzed Arachimaru, his yellow eyes shining with a dangerous light in them. Especially now, he has got a lava keke Genkai, and he can't even experiment on her. He knows that Yami wouldn't allow them, and no matter how big his curiosity was. He knew that Yami would kill him, he probably wouldn't even get a backlash from it. He knows that Yami would get rid of him like he did Danzo, carefully planned with no repercussions. Arachimaru hated to admit it, but Yami was better at handling people than him. He can see the darkness in people. Arachimaru had noticed the first time that he saw Yami as a kid, it was as if he had seen right through him and exposed all of his secrets. With those soulless and cold dark eyes of his, he has had his guard up against Arachimaru ever since he was a kid. Damn it screamed Arachimaru inside of his mind. He even accidentally ripped the paper in his hands. Yami had grown so fast that he didn't even have a chance to decide if maybe he should have killed him. No one could expect a 12-year-old to survive a confrontation with the Rakage who is considered a monster, and at 18 he killed that monster, which would need 2 3s rank ninja to even hold him back. Damn, that kid has grown to be monstrous but on the other hand, at Yami's camp, in the front lines against a hidden cloud village. Which was still technically in the war, but ever since the third Rakage has died an agreement was made. Because they went back on their word, it was decided that the third Rakage's body would be held by Yami and Yuzuka until the war is over. During that time, the Cloud Village won't attack, if they do, Yami will destroy the third Rakage's body, and he will go rampaging on the Land of Lightning. But there was also a monetary compensation, which Yami took and made them all sign complicated deals that if a lawyer from his first life didn't read them, no one in his world would notice the plot holes in the 137 contracts that were issued by Yami. Yami was meditating and his clones were guarding the tent, but in actuality, he was inside his tent with a dark-skinned Kanoichi. She is a slender and well-endowed woman of average height. She has dark skin, golden arises, and black hair. Her hair is waist-length and kept in a ponytail with chin-length bangs framing the sides of her face, and a cloud village headband on her forehead. She also had a dull look in her eyes as she continued telling Yami different confidential information as he was in his hot tub. Which he had created with the help of his Fuinjutsu. Suddenly as she was talking Yami looked at her, he had dozens of human spies in the land of lightning. Raining from male, female, elderly, and even some children. They also have different professions from, ninja, politician, the mayor, and so on, but usually, the one who delivers him messages is the woman in front of him. She had dull emotionless eyes because Yami had deleted all of her memories and emotions, just like he does with every one of his spies. He can't help and sneak a look into her voluptuous body. He feels himself get a little hard when he sees this, so he simply said. Take your clothes off and come here. The woman got up and took her clothes off. She continued talking with Yami and telling him certain information. But since Yami already knew this from the mosquitoes, he considered this information useless. Yami frowned a little when he saw the emotionless look on her face. So he simply said. Turn your emotions on. Suddenly her emotionless eyes got a certain light on them, and when she looked at Yami's body, she blushed a little and looked away. Yami just groaned in annoyance. Him being able to see right through her acting got him turned off. Truly being able to read people so good is annoying to Yami sometimes. He can't enjoy prostitutes and other lying bitches because he can see right through their acts. Just turn off your emotions and come here, ooh, what's your name again, Matilda, Maria, or something. The woman was not bothered at all by Yami not even remembering her name as she started answering. My name is M. Stop, I don't care. Ordered Yami with a certain annoyance in his voice. His son had disappointed him quite badly recently. He had to have the clone he had sealed inside of Hachi appear and delete Hachi's and Mai's memories due to Hachi going into a panic. The woman's eyes turned emotionless again. Anyway, my last child has been very disappointing, he is 7 and is barely even a chunin. So, with your strong lighting element and my genes, do you think we could make a better child? Says Yami, not even asking her if she is okay with it. He already knows that the woman in front of him is closer to a machine than a human. True it is a good machine since he programmed her brain, but still, she is just a tool. Sigh I like some emotions into the women I bed, at least I have to lie and manipulate them. So that makes it a little more exciting. This is boring as hell, well, I guess time to make the heir to the Inuzuka clan. 
This child shall be recognized as mine, and the child will be less disappointing than Hachi. Calculated Yami, as the woman entered his hot tub and impaled herself with his rod, no moan of pleasure or anything came out of her, the sucks Yami wakes up, unlike the normal person who would yawn or instinctively stretch themselves. He just suddenly opened his eyes, there was no trace of sleeplessness in them. It was as if he just blinked and wasn't asleep for 9 hours. I have started loathing the necessity of sleep. Like death, it puts even the powerful on their backs. Though Yami as he calmly got up. His immortal body does not feel any tiredness, fatigue, or anything like that. Even if he fights for a whole year against an army, he would still be able to fight them all, he saw that his little spy was still on his bed, and couldn't help but admire her voluptuous body. Yami POV. If it wasn't about her emotionless state, she would give me a nice night. I guess as expected, she didn't even moan once during the hours upon hours we had sex yesterday. I guess the brain wipe was successful, no pleasure or pain, she can't be manipulated by either, as I go and start putting on my clothes, I can't help but think about a good saying in my last life. Everything is about sex. But I always added something more in my head. Everything is about sex. Except for sex. SX is about power. Anyway, I stop my thoughts from going into deep philosophical places. I go outside of my tent and see my clones simply nod at me. I too nod back at them. Suddenly I see Tsum running towards me, she looks kinda crazy running like that, but whatever, as she gets closer she stops and looks at me with her eyebrows frowned in annoyance, as she said. Yami, tell me to do you, you know, do things, with some of the Kanoichi in the camp. My immediate answer would be yes. I have fucked almost every pretty girl in my camp, it gets boring around here, so I have to keep myself entertained, while my shadow clones take care of everything else. But of course, I keep these activities a secret, hope one of them invites me to her wedding, I want to see the face of the loser who will get my sloppy seconds. Of course, I tell none of this to Tsum. I just mention to her as I say. Walk with me Tsum. She seems confused, but she complies nonetheless. We walk a little away from everyone's hearing. We are at the very edges of the camp and there are no people around. So I took this moment to say to Tsum. Tell me, how do you think humanity evolved? Tsum immediately frowned when I said that. Listen Yami, I know what you are going to do. No matter what I say, I know that you will change the conversation without me even noticing, so I simply want a direct answer right now. I can't help but be amused by her reaction. Since she has let her hair down she is a bang able 7.510, but still she is a little too young to be able to escape my bullshit speech. What do you think of human intelligence Tsum? I asked her with a certain playfulness in my voice. Tsum just sighs when she heard this. Damn, you are so annoying Yami. Can't you be serious for once? I just smirked at her. I think that the human intellect is like peacock feathers. Immediately that gets her curiosity. Just an extravagant display intended to attract a mate. All of art, literature, a bit of the cage, greatest ninja, intellectuals, and even the Kanoha. They are all just an elaborate mating ritual. Maybe it doesn't matter that we have accomplished so much for the basest of reasons. But, of course, the peacock can barely fly. It lives in the dirt, pecking insects out of the muck, consoling itself with its great beauty. Just like humanity, consoling itself with its intelligence, never understanding the true meaning of intelligence and power. Tsum immediately had a conflicted look in her eyes. Yep, when saying that type of shit in front of someone, definitely confuses them. Maybe I should use this as a way to confuse my enemies, now that would be amusing, but enough amusement for now. I can't let Tsum get too jealous or she might decide that I don't appreciate her enough, so it's better to spy on me for someone else, than I would have to kill her. It would be a shame since she has been so useful to me. Hmm, if I am not mistaken, she will soon be 18 right, I run through my memories for a second, a quick read through them, and yep, her birthday was a week ago, I forgot and didn't give her anything, well I don't even celebrate my birthdays, but whatever, some people like to be sentimental like this. I mean to other people, it's like celebrating, for being one year closer to death, glad I won't have to worry about old age or that would kinda suck, I just smiled at Tsum, and put one of my hands behind my back and smiled towards her. Well now Tsum, I know that this might be a little late, but, I pulled a hand from my back, and there is a bouquet. Happy birthday Tsum, sorry I have been a little busy lately. Tsum seems happy at this, but then she suddenly frowns. Yami, are you changing the subject again? I just wink at her. Of course, yes, she immediately started screaming around and complaining. I just zoned her out and simply said. It isn't important why I do what I do, I was simply bored in the camp. I had urges and I satisfied them. I could see the look into her eyes, I could feel the decade of manipulation that I have done on Tsum take effect. Her face seems conflicted, her eyes a little dilated, her breathing has sped up a little, and she has a small blush on her face. I just smile a little, she was manipulated to fall in love, head over heels for me, w well, I, I can't, be your, Tsum whispers something under her breath. By her saying that I can already analyze that she doesn't know how to express her feelings and what to say. 
I noticed Soom has to use her Kanoichi training and the techniques Yami taught her so she can calm herself. Finally, with an even and calm voice, she asked. Yami, do you think we could be a family, as in a wife and husband? No, little Tsum, but I couldn't say that. So I just looked down at my hand and said, when I heard what Tsum said, I just looked at my hand and clenched it. Tsum, do you know what marriage means for people at my level? She looks at me with a strange look in her eyes. She has noticed that I am in one of my moods, where I will explain something to her that will rock her world. My marriage will have to be a useful tool for the Inuzuka clan to rise higher. We already have a very stable internal stability in the clan. Now we need external, sorry Tsum, but I can't, as I say this, I also noticed her eyes started tearing up. She was almost crying as she said to me in a low voice. You are always so smart aren't you Yami, but couldn't you find a way to let me down slowly could you? Well, that would be a waste of time little Tsum, but then again she is delusional enough to think that I would marry someone like her. She is a 7.510 and a soon to be fully fledged Jonan. But that doesn't mean anything, I have had certain plans recently and I have finally figured out whom I will marry. Plus I honestly don't give a shit about the Inuzuka, except that they are good pets and a good stepping stone. Still, even though I am thinking that what I say to her is a different thing. Manipulation is a subtle art, it needs care and attention, with that, my face has a difficult look on it, as I say. We could still, be together, though, it will have to be a secret. Tsum looks at me and tears up even more. You are horrible Yami. Even while she says that she still decides to hug me. I just hug her with one arm and pet her head. She truly is a pitiful human being, so attached to me, so clingy, she would die for me, she will be my side bitch, or as they say it here, she will be my concubine. She can't be with anyone else or it might ruin the internal structure the Inuzuka clan has. Then after some consulting and her talking to me about things. Soon decided to go and rest, she will think about this. I know what she will choose, but I still give her the false illusion of freedom of choice, which she doesn't have. After that, I went back to my tent and went back to work on my little project. I take the red cube out of my jacket, storage seal inside. The cube is around the size of my palm, and it has few injutsu seals all around it. The blank soul of the zero tails inside had stopped thrashing around. This little thing was something I didn't plan on creating at all in the beginning. But now that I have learned that it is possible, I am going to use it, I can't help but shake a little with excitement, I am gonna do it, now I am going to achieve unimaginable strength. I can barely control myself from using the cube. It isn't complete yet, but even now I can faintly sense the strange energy it produces. In this world there exist a lot of strange items, like the chakra fruit, samahata, kusanagi and so many more. I have thousands of clones all around the world currently, searching for items like them, currently, there aren't any items at the level of the chakra fruit or anything like that, but I look at my cube again, but this little thing will easily surpass the feats of the chakra fruit, suddenly I sense one of my clones dispelled, and I get its memories. I bite my thumb, just enough to draw a slight amount of blood as I slam my hand in the ground. Poof and a golden cane with a ring at the end appeared in front of me, this was the item that my clone that dispelled itself just got. It's called the Shugu, the Shugu is a special tool that, when wielded, it can produce a limitless amount of water. If the wielder has control of the Shugu, it creates water according to their wills, such as rain that falls across a region or a constant stream flowing from its tip, the water can take shape if the wielder desires. Truly a good tool, it was from the time of the Sage of the Six Paths. It was given to a family by the Sage personally as a gift. It can only be used by the bloodline of that family, but I wouldn't call myself the best Fuinjutsu user alive if I couldn't easily take care of something this small. I was able to get this staff while looking through my memories of my first life. There were some times where I searched about this thing on Google and I remembered about it. My other shadow clones are also on similar missions, finding things that I could remember about my first life memories, during the time I searched for Naruto, I slowly put the cane close to the red cube, and with my connection that I have with the cube, I activated another command in it. As soon as the cane touched the cube, strange markings went along the cane, as it slowly turned into liquid substance and went inside the cube, the zero tail soul was screeching inside the cube, it was in pain, but that was good too. Since it will create more dark chakra and slightly reinforce the cube even more, then suddenly I notice something underneath me. Flash in a flash my hand digs underground and catches what it was. It was a little mouse struggling to get away from my grasp. It was a normal mouse. I keep those in the lab below this tent. This little guy must have dug his way out. Nope, he is not one of my rats. Its chakra is also about average rat level chakra. Is this rat a spy? I use the Sharingan and look for anything indicating this rat is a spy. There is none, so I decided and then ripped out the little thing's memories. Then saw through them. Well, I guess he was just another rat. 
I have run 137 tests on it, and it truly was just your everyday rat, it is brain dead now, but it's still useful though, well I guess using the cube on the rat would wield some data, and see how potent the cube is, this is my creation, so I am expecting something amazing, I just use the strange energy produced by the cube, and throw it towards the rat, let's see what happens to you little guy. Yami looked at the mouse as the strange energy produced by the cube entered the little thing. As soon as it did so the mouse stopped struggling and a black cocoon surrounded the small mouse, it looked like a black egg that could easily fit on the palm of someone's hand. And as the minutes passed by, with only Yami's breathing as the only sound in the room. Suddenly the cocoon started expanding little by little until it went from being able to fit on someone's palm. To become as big as a chair, and that is when the cocoon started cracking open like an egg. The cocoon part slowly fell down, and as it did so it turned into smoke. But Yami didn't even look at it, what he looked at was the not so little rat anymore. It was a creature in the form of a rat, and it was so big that if he stood up, it would reach up to his knees. The rat was already brain dead from Yami's ceaseless examination on it, to try and see if he was some spy for someone else. So the rat just stood there, not moving at all. Yami noticed that not only was the rat bigger, but his brown fur from before had turned to black fur. His eyes also turned to completely red, and under that fur, he could see the muscles under that thing. He analyzed that this little creature went from a normal weak rat, to probably being able to rip apart the average ninja academy student to death, even his chakra was at that of the average human. Though your average genin would wipe the floor with this rat, Yami slowly took out a scalpel and went close to the rat, and made a little small cut on its skin. Immediately as he did so the rat tried to bite him. But as the rat's teeth but his hand, they couldn't even draw blood. Yami's skin has been modified like the rest of his body. It is as hard as a rock, and even though the rat might be stronger, he is still only a rat. No matter how it changes, it still couldn't bite through rock. As he saw this Yami also noted that the rat's teeth had become more jagged, like the fangs of a predatory animal. He noticed that even though the creature is brain dead, it still had the instinct to protect itself. Also, the small cut that he made, healed quite quickly. Hmm, this is interesting. Thought Yami as he kept, making small cuts on the rat. And as it tried to bite him, Yami simply sent a chakra shockwave to its brain. Immediately knocking him out. Then after a whole hour of Yami experimenting on the thing. He finally got what he wanted to know and killed it off, also burning its body. No one is getting anything from my research. Thought Yami as he walked out of his tent. He made a clone to act like him, and, Fuashi disappeared in a dark flash, going towards someone he wanted to meet. General POV Meitarumi wasn't someone cruel or anything like that, all she wanted in life was to have a normal family, a normal husband, a normal life. But as she got closer to the camp, she could feel like her own blood was lava, her stomach was churning in disgust. She knows that she will become something that she will hate, someone without power or familiar love, someone that when she births enough children she will simply be killed. The reality drowned on her like an ocean, her legs were noodles, her eyes felt like they had bleach in them, and her whole body was cold. She was feeling physically sick from this, and when they arrived at the Kanoha camp, her worries skyrocketed as she saw someone that she knew of to be waiting at the gates. It was Orochimaru, and he had a predatory look on his golden eyes. His hands were in his pockets as he leaned on a tree. His malicious smile made her feel chills down her spine as if the ice was poured on her back. Even the cold mask she had on started cracking, but suddenly out of nowhere. Fwash a dark flash appeared, and a person came out of it. He was wearing a Jonin uniform, his hair was black and slightly spiky. But what caught May's attention wasn't his smile or his friendly looking face. It was his eyes as he looked at Orochimaru. He had a strange cold look in his eyes. Orochimaru's face now had a frown on it, and his eyes had a certain gleam to them. When he noticed that Yami was here he didn't protest. But he was displeased, he wanted to experiment on Mei a little before Yami got her. Plus unlike the other people in here, he noticed that this wasn't just Yami's clone. It was Yami himself, so he can't go around messing with him. He knows how dangerous Yami can be. TCH that was unfortunate, if only he didn't have these little mosquitoes all over my camp, monitoring everything that happened in here. I would have had time to experiment with the girl before he came here. If those mosquitoes didn't exist, he wouldn't be this troublesome thought Orochimaru, as he went back inside the camp towards his tent, ready to experiment on some unlucky fellow. As Orochimaru was walking back to his camp, Yami just looked at Orochimaru's back, contemplating something, his brain brewing hundreds of different ideas, schemes, and plans. But even as he was thinking this he looked back towards Hachi, Kai, Shoto, Momo, and Mei. Kai, as an Inuzuka, obviously has a lot of respect for Yami. After all, he is the one who rose the Inuzuka clan to the powerhouse it is today. Yami simply looked at Mei and smiled. Well hello, their child. I hope you didn't have a hard journey. I know how hard it is for children to be dragged into war, away from their families. When Mei heard what Yami said, she somehow found the courage to speak in front of him. Whether it was Yami's friendly looking face or her desperation that gave her the courage to speak. Mei didn't know 
this, as she said. My father is dead, killed by you during the second ninja war. He was the pillar and protector of the Tarumi clan. My mother also died of sickness not long after that. My clan is in decline and will most likely die out because of you, Yami Inuzuka. When she said this, Mei predicted a lot of ways Yami would act. He could be angry, not care, or even surprised. But his reaction truly baffled her as Yami simply just laughed ha 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 ha. His voice melodious and his laughter loud, as if he had just heard the funniest joke ever told, as Yami laughed at Little May's speech. She couldn't help but be angry like this. The way she saw it, Yami seemed like he was mocking her father's death. Even Hachi and his genin teammates seemed a little perturbed by this. Though Kai and Yuzuka, their jonin teacher has a look of absolute certainty. He trusted Yami, and knew that he would make the right decision. Kai's and the other in Yuzuka's loyalties have been nurtured for a long time by Yami or what they assumed to be his shadow clone. Finally Mei couldn't take any more of Yami's ridicule, so she decided to angrily say, What are you laughing for, Yami in Yuzuka? When he heard this, Yami finally stopped laughing, but his face still had a smirk. Wait, so you are real about this ha 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 ha? Yami started laughing again, but this time as Mei was about to say something angrily again, Yami suddenly stopped laughing, his face morphed into a cold look as he said, We are ninja, we leave death and destruction behind each of our steps. How many people's lives do you think your father ruined? Hundreds or thousands. If you understand that, then don't start speaking stupid things little girl. Your father died as he lived just another nameless ninja. Mei's fists were shaking in anger, but this time when she wanted to say something and rebuke Yami, she saw the look in his eyes, unlike his smiley face and friendly look in his eyes that he had before. Now his face was stone cold and his eyes even colder. She knew that one more talk out of line, and the next thing she would feel would be her head flying off her body. So in the end, she kept her anger inside her and didn't say anything. When Yami saw this, he seemed strangely pleased. You may survive us yet, little May. Then he went forward and offered the girl his hand. She seemed unsure for a split second, thinking of the horrible things that will happen to her. But she pushed down all the fear and hesitation as she took his hand. When Hachi saw this, he felt a little weird, as if his stomach fell to the ground. He wanted to say something, but he couldn't flush. So just like that, in a black flash, Yami and Mei both disappeared. But not before Yami used a telepathic message that gave different orders to the mosquitoes close by. As Mei Tarumi falling in his clutches was a little bit of a surprise. But it was a good surprise, as he now can finally try and learn how the different KK Genkai-like lava release work. They are then teleported to Yami's tent, back in his Kanoha camp. Yami just looks at Mei, and suddenly, her eyes become hollow, indicating that she is in a Jinjutsu. Hum, if I am to use the lava and boil style, my strength would be raised by another 20% thought Yami as he prepared for another experiment. His lips morphed into a sinister smile back in Kanoha something else was happening. One of Yami's clones was in one of the Inuzuka orphanages. When he looked at one of the kids in there, and smiled towards them. Yamato, you seem nervous, is something going on? Asked the Yami's shadow clone, as he looked at Yamato. Yamato is an orphan that was randomly selected to be in the Inuzuka orphanage. All, according to plan. Thinks Yami's clone as it reviews the plan that the original came up with. Yamato with uncertainty nodded and gently touched the ground. Slowly out of the orphanage porcelain floor a small flower broke the plate and bloomed. The kids laughed at this since it seems fun to them, but the matron has a shocked look on her face. She truly understands what this means. This is the legendary wood release. Yami's clone has a mischievous smile on his face. Things were all according to his plan. When that happened, Kanoha had a shock. Finally, after many generations, another wood style user has appeared, and he is a member of the Inuzuka clan. Immediately as soon as it was announced, Yami was surprised, so he started negotiating certain things with the Kanoha village. Of course, Yamato would still be part of the Inuzuka clan. No one would even dare dispute someone like Yami on this. But he has now become more of a symbol now, of a new hope. To the civilians this was a miracle that could be attributed to fate. But the ninja were different, most of them already pieced together that this was a little too much of a coincidence. They immediately started suspecting Yami of some type of interference with Yamato's so-called natural wood release. No matter how things develop though, one thing could be agreed on by everyone. The Inuzuka clan just got another rising star. Also with the crystal release user Gurun. That didn't cause too much of an uproar, because even though Crystal Release Keke Jenkai is strong, it doesn't have any legendary feats like the wood style. Just like this, two more months passed, the third ninja war was still going on. But for Yami, it was no problem at all. He kept getting benefits from it. Also Meitarumi has somehow escaped from Kanoha during one of Yami's negotiations in Kanoha. Though no one said anything, the latent clan head meetings have become more of a playground for Yami, and every clan head has noticed this. Yami's political power kept raising and raising. No one could do anything. It was already too late, the other clans were occupied with the war going on. But the Inuzuka kept advancing forward, so it was a surprise when ninjas came back from the war and saw different Inuzuka banners around different shops and companies. Even though ninjas aren't very knowledgeable in economics, they could still understand what this meant. The Inuzuka clan know it is Yami Inuzuka who has taken over Kanoha. But this came as grave news to the people who even had thoughts of going against Yami. 
he has something like political immunity. He is untouchable by normal political means anymore, even the daimyo would have to listen to his suggestions. Yamato looked at Yami. Well more specifically, it was Yami's clone. But since a shadow clone will transfer its memories after being dispelled, it is still the same as talking to Yami himself. They are currently in Yami's backyard. Both of them are sitting on the grass. Yamato looks at him with uncertainty in his eyes. After all, he thinks that he has never met Yami personally. Ever since he was accepted in the orphanage, he has only seen Yami a handful of times. Yamato used to be just your everyday orphan before being picked by the Inuzuka's orphanage for the gifted. Which is considered amazing. It is known that the people picked by the Inuzuka orphanage are always amazingly talented children. Suddenly Yami's clone pulls out a scroll and unfolds it. Inside it there are strange fujutsu markings of different varieties. Yami put his palm on the scroll, and poof smoke appears around the scroll. But when it settles down, the only thing seen in it is a large stack of books. Yami's clone smiles and says to Yamato with a reassuring voice, These are the books we will be learning about during this week. Yamato immediately looked even more uncertain. But Yami's clone simply flashed an even wider reassuring smile towards him. Yami POV. This world truly is a place where wonders can happen. No matter the blood, betrayal, massacres, I think I love this world. It isn't something as simple as just because it has cool ninjutsu. It is more than that. Just like in my last world, people considered some countries as the land of dreams with a lot of opportunities. This world to me is my land of opportunities. I have achieved quite a bit during my stay on here. I am still only 19 and nowhere near my peak strength. But that doesn't mean anything I will go higher. My children, the Inuzuka clan, Hinoha. I will leave all of these things behind as they will all wither as cities turn to dust and the humans turn into maggot shit. But I will still be here, still living like nothing was even outside my expectations. Sitting on the heavenly throne while looking down at the people below me. Laughing at their heroic deeds and their sufferings, while I sit on my throne looking down on the whole world. But first I can't jump my steps to divinity. I look at this scenery around me, the trees and grass, while I lie down on the ground and stare at the sky. Lately there hasn't been a lot of stuff going on. Well my clones have been killing and stealing treasures around the world, but that is more like background noise to me. I am expecting two children this year, one by my little Kumo spy, and the other is by Tsum. Finally the manipulation during Tsum's life paid off. Since my little spy was so boring with her emotionless look, the threesomes made my sex life a lot more entertaining. Also I learned that Makoto is pregnant too. Obviously the kid is not mine, but I still want to look at Fugaku's face. If he knew that he got me sloppy seconds. Well I guess many Kinoichi will have to be sloppy seconds because of me. I can be really charming when I want to. As expected I have been spending my last couple of months just relaxing and having a lot of fun with a lot of young ladies. And some milfs thrown in there every now and then to spice things up sometimes. I must say though my immortal life has been treating me quite well. Plus lately things have been going quite good too. And everything has been going to plan. I have noticed that I have changed quite a bit since I came into this world. Especially with the whole thing of wanting to know everything and control everything. Truly a control freak all the way. I can easily recognize my different so-called mental distances. Well that is what they would be called by a modern world doctor. But those mental distances have helped me not only survive, but also thrive in this world. Most mental illnesses are categorized like that because they disrupt a normal and standard society. Honestly, now even if someone promised me divinity just as long as I stay in a normal society, my answer would be obviously no dumbass. Who the fuck accepts strength given to them by some random being? How insecure and a beta male do you have to be to even want something like a system? Or as I used to read in my last life. Some people even ask for a 12-inch dick I mean in my last life. I used to sometimes read stuff like this. But really though, how insecure do you need to be to ask some random being to increase your dick size? I can't stop laughing at the losers who think like that. Psy immortality really makes me think about stupid stuff. I guess now that I don't have the pressure of being a normal squishy human, I have the leisure time to let my mind wander like this. Though I never slack off, my body is already at its physical peak and unlike normal bodies. It doesn't need to keep training for its strength to not deteriorate. My body naturally doesn't deteriorate at all. I will never lose muscle strength or something like that just because I don't train. Suddenly as I am relaxing like this and just laying down in the grass with my hands behind my back, and even my eyes are closed, but I sense a presence that comes inside my forest. I notice that it is trying to disguise itself as the average animal, but it obviously isn't working too good while trying to hide from me. Mostly because I can also sense emotions, that is how I noticed, but of course no one needs to know that. To sense emotions is honestly easy once you know how. It is like a sixth sense, and most Jonin could learn it. I developed this technique by studying how the Zero Tails did it. Of course, I won't teach this technique to anyone else. Not even my children, or that would be beyond stupid. After all, if they somehow learn how to counteract this technique, my children might have a legitimate chance to successfully betray me. 
before I kill them. So no except me no one will learn this technique. Now let's see how this little animal got here. I just calmly walk up to the animal and see that it is a toad. I smirk at it, already figuring out who it is. You know, is it just me, or are you Sanin not very good at hiding? I say to the frog, who only looks at me normally like an animal would. I just raise an eyebrow at this. The toad opens its mouth, and slowly a man in a Jonin uniform comes out of it. He has long spiky hair, black eyes, and his face had an awkward smile on it. He is one of the three Sanin Jiraiya. When I see this all, I just have a normal look on my face. As if this didn't bother me at all. But really though, his hiding was impeccable. I couldn't sense his chakra at all. My jutsu that allows me to sense emotions just saved me from a lot of troubles. I decided to say something first as I asked Jiraiya. I hope you weren't sent here to spy on me. Or I would have to take certain precautions against it. Immediately Jiraiya started sweating cold sweat a little as his face became a little nervous. I noticed his muscles instinctively twitching. Even though he knows perfectly well that he stands no chance against me. No matter what he might try. We are alone in a forest with him spying on me. He knows that I know, that if I kill him here, no one would even find his body after I kill him. The Hokage could say different things, but if we are being truthful here, I rule Kanoha from the shadows. I could ruin it with just a snap of my fingers, so even the Hokage wouldn't dare do anything like that. Of course he could kill my mother, but he cares about that. Maybe she will finally be useful now. People say that when you have someone to protect, that will make you stronger. But that is all a lie. Only when you have no one to protect, and no one to worry about, only then can you become stronger. I have no true weakness, no one can threaten me with my mother's life or anything like that. So that is the reason I am daring enough to take risky moves. Plus when people think that I care about my mother makes it even easier for me. But still I can't just tolerate something like this, or other people might get some bright ideas. It seems like I will have to make an example out of Jiraiya so other people know what the consequences of opposing me are. After all, if people think that I will just release the people that I catch spying on me, then they will take that as a cue to do so. While thinking all of this, I smile at Jiraiya softly as he answers my question by simply saying, I was simply here for a message. I can see that he has already calmed down, and his ninja training has kicked in. He is no longer giving me a lot of information on what he is feeling. Well not being intimidated by isn't that rude of him. Well now you have put quite the hard decision on me. I said slowly as to emphasize that he wouldn't get out of this so easily. Jiraiya POV. Those cold eyes, that relaxed posture with his hands on his pockets. He doesn't see me as a danger to him at all. Well, he wouldn't be necessarily wrong about that. Yami has become someone very dangerous. The type of guy who could kill Danzo, a village elder inside the village, and face no persecution. Actually he even got some praise out of it. Saratobi sensei told me to just look for any suspicious activity around Yami. I didn't expect to be discovered so quickly. Especially here, in this forest where if he decided to kill me, no one would even notice. I can see it in his eyes, he will kill me if I step out of line. From what Tsunade says, Yami isn't someone to act without a plan where he gets the most benefits and the least losses. His intelligence might be at Orochimaru's level or possibly even higher, due to his ability to plan things so perfectly, and Yami has already surpassed Tsunade in medical ninjutsu. He will most likely kill me here after getting the information that he wants from me. Suddenly I hear Yami say with a nonchalant voice, So... Did the Hokage send you for an errand like spying on me or something like that? When I looked at his eyes, my instincts were screaming to tell him the truth. That yes, the Hokage did send me to spy on him due to some suspicion of Yami having a flight risk. He might become a missing ninja. No one ever thought of this strategy since he has the Inuzuka and his mother in Konoha. But due to some information that Orochimaru has revealed, it seems like Yami doesn't necessarily care about his mother. And a guy who doesn't care about his family, what is stopping him from simply running away? This was supposed to be a simple investigation, but it turned into much more. I keep my cool in this situation, my face and body language, not portraying anything about my thought process as I say to Yami. No, the Hokage didn't send me here. I was simply curious about Tsunade's student that she keeps bragging about. I smile a little as I say the last part, trying to lighten the mood. But somehow Yami still didn't seem amused by this. And he isn't even giving me an escape from questions like this. Yami releases a small sigh and rubs his eyes as he says, Well I guess I could forgive you for this time, since you are Tsunade's teammate. I didn't know how to feel about that, so I simply nodded and didn't say anything. I took that as my cue to leave. I turned around and am about to walk away. Suddenly I hear Yami say again, I don't think I gave you permission to leave. As soon as I heard that I couldn't help but be filled with abject despair, I now understood that Yami wanted to make an example out of me. So my body froze and couldn't walk anymore. Suddenly black markings started appearing around my body. The markings had square forms. I analyzed that it was the paralysis seal. 
and the person who most likely cast is Yami Inuzuka. I didn't even see him when he even put on the seal. I didn't sense him touch me at all. Don't tell me he has surpassed even Minato in Kishina and Fuenjutsu. But that shouldn't be possible. Kishina is a Nuzumaki and a Fuenjutsu specialist. Yami he also seems to know cursed seals like the paralysis seal. Damn what do I do now Dreya POV. Of course, I didn't know what to do when I was stuck in place and couldn't move at all. The only thing I can hear are Yami's footsteps as he calmly walks forward. Damn, am I really going to die like this? I guess Minato really is the child of prophecy. Sadly Yahiko, Conan and Nagato died. When they were ambushed by Hanzo the Salamander. If I die their memory will die with me too no. I can't give up easily like this I run chakra through all of my body, trying to force the paralysis seal to be undone. Yami seems to be so casual, so it means that he isn't taking me seriously. I can use this against him and escape I use my chakra to try and corrode the seal, but I can sense that the seal is only slightly weakened. But it's not enough, so I try to stay completely still, even though I haven't mastered this form completely. I can still enter it for a couple of seconds. I try to gather some sage chakra, but I immediately stop doing so as I look at my chakra reserves they are dropping. But how? I am not using any jutsu or anything like that. The next thing I hear is Yami's whispering in an amused tune in his voice. So, you must be thinking something like my chakra level is dropping, but I am not using any jutsu, how is that possible? Isn't that right? He figured me out immediately. Can Yami read minds? Does he have an ability like that? Now you must be thinking if I have read your mind, says Yami as he gets in front of me. That is when I see his mocking smirk. Even with him being so expressive, I still can't guess what he is thinking. Damn it I don't understand his intentions. Does he want to kill me or not? Or maybe he just wants to cut off one of my arms to make an example of me. But even these thoughts of mine are simply a speculation. Even while I think this, Yami simply has his hands in his pockets. His posture completely relaxed. He truly didn't see me as a threat at all. I can see it on his eyes. It's not that he underestimates me more like he understands me. He understands that no matter what I do, I will never be able to pose any real danger to him. How about this then, since killing you would be troublesome? How about you cut one of your fingers and never do something stupid like this again? Says Yami, as he sighs slightly at this. So, it seems like he has decided to let me live, huh? I immediately feel the Fuenjutsu crawling away and getting out of my body. But I will definitely check later if Yami has left anything inside my body. I didn't even see him put the paralysis curse seal on me. Who knows what else he might have done. Yami just looks at me calmly. I don't let him repeat what he said again. So I just took a kunai. Fwish plop, and my bloody pinky finger fell on the ground. Yami just nodded at this, and walked away, and started whistling like he has no care in the world. Damn he is really terrifying. I am definitely not spying on him ever again. Let Orochimaru do this shit. After all he suggested to Saratobi Sensei that we do this. I look at my pinky finger on the grass even as I see Yami walking away. I don't dare go and grab my finger. Or he might change his mind that monster is unpredictable. So I just started walking away too. Better lose a finger than my life. When I'm a safe distance away I can't help but think of the terrifying situation I was in. Damn I got off this easily. I honestly thought he would kill me when I saw the look in his eyes. I was really lucky this time. I had misunderstood and thought he was more like Saratobi Sensei. It seems like I was wrong. He is dominant, extremely dominant. I wonder how Tsune can even live with someone like that. Their personalities would clash constantly. I mean she even lets her kid around Yami. That isn't like Tsunade at all. Or maybe there is something I am not seeing here. I should ask Orochimaru more about this. He can figure out stuff like this way quicker and more accurately than me. I look at my now missing pinky finger. I guess I will stop the bleeding. It isn't that bad anyway. It doesn't even affect my fighting abilities too much. After 10 days, I return to Kanoha. I know that Tsune will be able to handle herself in the front lines against Sanagika for some time, even without my help. Immediately I go to the Hokage's office, where I find Hiruzen Sensei. When I ask him if Orochimaru is around, he simply says that he isn't here, but in a couple of days, he might return to Kanoha because of certain situations raising in the front lines against the Hidden Mist Village. I only sigh and explain the situation he thinks about it a little and says, Well, I have a certain theory why Tsune is doing what she is doing, but I am sure that Orochimaru could prove this. I just nod towards him and go towards the hospital to check if everything is alright with my body sigh. This situation seems to be way more complicated than it seems. Hope I don't regret what I will discover. Sometimes I know that ignorance is a bliss general POV Hachi and his team are in another patrol. Ever since the time when Mei got taken by Yami, Hachi couldn't help but contemplate that situation. Was that the right decision? Was it wrong of him and his team to let Mei go like that? But he is sure that Yami won't be cruel to Mei. I am sure that Yami won't be cruel to her. After all, even though Yami is a little harsh he isn't cruel. I can be sure of that. Thinks Hachi but he still can't get that feeling in his stomach. As if Yami isn't what he seems. Suddenly as he was thinking this, his instincts kicked in as he and his team, who were just jumping from tree to tree, 
Heard a sound as if something was burning. Explosion seals. Is the last thing Hachi thinks as Boom as the explosion envelops Hachi and his team. Boom as Hachi's team are enveloped in the explosion. Since Ken, the Jonin sensei was closest to Momo and Hachi, he grabbed them both to pull them out of the explosion. Because of this Shoto is enveloped by the flames of the explosion, and his lungs burn before he can scream anything. For Hachi it feels like time has slowed down as Shoto's face burned off and his eyes melt into his own skull. But he immediately comes to his senses as he sees the explosion coming towards them. He didn't even feel pity for his teammate who he bled and cried with Hachi is simply terrified. Tears start coming out of his eyes. Momo, his teammate is also terrified of this. But before the explosion reaches either of them, Kai's hair lengthens even more as it surrounds them all, in a cocoon protecting them. I didn't smell anything wrong. This is bad, I need to get the kids out of here. If they were able to hide this good, it means that they must be Miss Ninjas that specialize in assassination. They must also be very strong to be able to hide from an Inuzuka. Thinks Ken as he analyzes the situation, choosing the best outcome possible in this. Since it's a high level battle, Hachi and Momo would be useless in a fight like this. So he wants them to run away and not be a bother and get in the way. But if there are more than one ninja at his level, Ken will have a hard time making an opening for his genins to escape. Ken thought all of this. While he protected Hachi and Momo from the explosion, he can feel his head burning, even though he has reinforced it with chakra. Due to the force of the explosion, they are thrown away. As soon as the cocoon protecting them touches the ground, Ken dispels it. Looking at Momo and Hachi, he has a complicated look in his face as he says to them, Hachi, Momo, you guys need to run Run away. You will only be in the way if you stay here. Even though still in a little shock from watching Shodo die like that, they knew better than not to listen to Ken. So they immediately attempt to run away. But as they are about to to do so, Fwash seven figures appeared on the trees all around them. They all had swords on them as soon as Ken saw this, his eyes widened as he looked at them. The seven ninja swordsmen. Thinks Ken, he immediately goes to take a vial from his Jonin jacket. He takes out a vial of dark red bubbling liquid. This is a gift given to him by Yami. During the time he experimented on Ken as he goes to drink the red liquid, a lightning bolt is shot towards him. Ken dodges this by simply stepping to the side but then, Fwash one of his arms flies off as a thin string circles around his neck, and it is chopped off. Ken had a wide-eyed look on his face even during his last moments. He contemplated how he could have been taken out so easy. What he didn't know however, was that during the second ninja war, Yami had taken out almost all of the ninja swordsmen by himself, while he was only 12 years old. Ever since then, if a hidden mist ninja ever meets an Inuzuka, they must immediately take him out without Theatrix, and without underestimating him. Immediately they turn towards Hachi and Momo. The Genins obviously had no chance to escape them. Even though Momo had given up, Hachi, who was absolutely terrified, he still rose up. I will not die here today. Thinks Hachi as he waves through hand signs. Fwash, but before he could even do anything, he is decapitated by a giant sword, also knows as the executioner's blade. Hachi's head flew on the air, and he died as his headless body fell like a puppet that had its strings cut off. Plop his head too, landed on the ground. When Momo saw this, she wanted to scream, but a ninja wire was wrapped around her throat. Better not scream little girl or you will end up like your little boyfriend there, said the one with the giant executioner's blade. Yummy POV. I just looked at my new test subject on the medical table, when suddenly I get the memories of the shadow clone hidden inside Hachi. It seems like he is dead. Well it is war, and I am not hopeful enough to expect someone like Hachi to survive. Putting my faith in something like luck or fate, something that I can't control is stupid. Though I did advise Hachi to not graduate early, and even gave him a second chance for him to come to my camp. But he wanted to grow without me helping him, well look where that got you, you little shit. I can't help but be slightly emotional over my son's death. But that too is immediately settled down. After all, in this world, death is only a state of being. Plus even if it wasn't, I am prepared anyway. Sigh. But really though meeting the seven ninja swordsmen is as unlucky as it can get in there. My clone made the right decision to not appear and help Hachi. Because even if he did appear, he is still only a shadow clone. Him hoping to be able to take the seven ninja swordsmen is almost impossible even though I could easily do it. After all, he is still only a clone. Using the Horatian to get Hachi would also be almost impossible, since my clone can't use the Horatian to bring someone with them. Well, I guess I will have to deal with Tsunade's hysteria. That will be such a hassle I really don't want to do it. Guess my disappointment of a son couldn't keep himself from dying. He just kept making dumb decisions, thinking that he will be able to grow if he is away from me. In war there is no such thing as wanting to grow. There is only death or survival. And he, as the weaklings that he was he died my emotions are completely calm even as I let a single tear fall from my right eye. That is as far as I will mourn him. And he should be glad he was my son for his father will reach the heavens themselves. So goodbye my son who never knew I was his father. Yami POV. Since Hachi is dead, the situation isn't that bad. The plan can continue back into its tracks. My power will keep growing. 
No need to think about something like this anymore. He could have betrayed me anyway when he grew up, either voluntarily or involuntarily, due to a Jinjutsu like Kota Matsukami or something like that. Sai, I guess things will get a little complicated here. I will have to deal with Tsunade, plus the seven ninja swordsmen are going to attack the Kanoha camp, where Orochimaru should be residing. Sadly, he isn't there. He has been summoned by the Hokage, because Jiraiya became curious about mine and Tsunade's little secret. Now, obviously, to get this information wasn't through spies or mosquitoes. Not even spying Fuinjutsu seals. Since if something like that was in the Hokage's office, it would be obviously noticed. What did I use to spy on them? Well, obviously a technology, mini radio recorders all over the office of the Hokage. It is perfect. Since that technology isn't developed yet here, it's only in its early phases. But with my Google knowledge from my first life, I did search on how radios work for a school project one time. So that was useful for myself to develop these. Since no chakra check or anything like that would be able to notice the little guys. They are placed inside the walls and blended with the surrounding cement. So not even a Bayakigan would be able to notice that it was there. This technology should be developed around the time the third ninja war is over. But I can release it a little before that and get the patent. Which isn't worth much in this world. But if I am the one who owns it well, obviously no one would be dumb enough to challenge me just for some short range communication. Which is already available by some jutsu. Anyway, Orochimaru won't be at the camp, so it will be completely wrecked normally that would happen. But I have a certain trump card. After that is played, everything will fall into place just like according to plan general POV. While Yami was contemplating different scenarios, and adjusting his plans a little. In the Kanova camp that fights against the Hidden Mist Village. Countless corpses were piled up like a mountain. Hundreds of ninja were dead, with the seven ninja swordsmen working together. This camp stood no chance against them. Even though they did hold them back for some time. While they were fighting, a certain tall and well-built man with high cheekbones, a somewhat bulbous nose, dark hair, thick eyebrows and noticeable body hair on his wrists and forearms. His hair was cut in a bowl style that was combed to his right and left slightly. He also sported a bristling moustache with a small goatee and stubble, which made up the rest of his beard. He wore a green jumpsuit, orange striped leg warmers, and a yellow scarf around his neck. It was Dai while looking at all of this and the ninja dying around him. Already hundreds of them have been killed. It won't take much more for the others to be killed too. When he understood that, Dai built up his resolve. His eyes closed as his chakra started going directly for the eighth gate. Even while this was happening, he can't help but regret not seeing his son one last time. Guy, it seems like I won't be able to see you grow up. But don't worry, I know that you already have comrades that will protect you. And Yami will protect you too, even though he appears tough. I know that Yami has a soft spot for Guy, so please my son. Let your flames of youth shine so bright that IT can will be seen from the edge of the world. Even while thinking this, slowly, red mist-like chakra started surrounding his body. The Kanoha ninja who were close to him, were looking at Dai, the middle-aged genin, who started exerting so much pressure that even they didn't know what to do. Suddenly the seven ninja swordsmen noticed the strange phenomenon. The swordsman with the giant explosion sword started asking, Well it pro burst? But before he could even finish saying what he was going to say his head burst like a watermelon. The other swordsman immediately jumped back. But suddenly, the swordsman with the needle sword, his body was kicked in the chest by what to them seemed like a red blur. His chest caved in burst, and a giant hole appeared in his chest. The other ninja swordsmen immediately understood the situation. Thankfully they had prepared for this. It was called the Yami Inuzuka flee on sight strategy. They all split up in different directions and started running at full speed. This way, Dai would have to follow one of them. This strategy worked as Dai went after the one with the heavy hammer and sword. He kicked his head and the head flew off like a football was kicked. Dai wanted to go after the others. But suddenly crack his body gave out, and as he was mid-jump, his overheated body started falling to the ground, slowly turning to Dark Ash Guy. When you find someone to protect I hope that even Dai's last thoughts couldn't be finished as he died. But the ninja swordsmen all had already retreated, not daring to return to the scene, hoping that they can get out of this alive, not knowing that their attacker is already dead. They had been prepared to take on Orochimaru, in case he was here they were happy that he wasn't and thought that it was their lucky day. Not understanding that someone even stronger than Orochimaru was amongst their opponents. Though four of them escaped safely, they would never forget this day as the seven ninja swordsmen were easily defeated by a leaf genin. Yami, on the other hand, had already seen the situation with the help of his mosquitoes. He was sitting on his chair, inside his tent. He also had a strange smile on his face. Letting Jiraiya go was part of my plan. Me letting his suspicion develop even more, insinuating that I only let him go because of Tsunade. That aroused a suspicion in the relationship between Tsunade and me. Then predicting the way that the Hokage would react was easy. Hiruzen obviously wouldn't tell his suspicion to Jiraiya before he got some proof. The only people he knew that would know the truth would be Tsunade, me and Orochimaru. So he obviously chose Orochimaru to come and verify that all of this was according to my plan. Now with Dai dead the timeline will go back to normal. I apologize to you my son for 
for you were an uncertainty general POV. When Orochimaru arrived in Kanoha, he immediately went towards the Hokage's office. He had already been notified about what Jiraiya is curious about. Orochimaru could already guess how this conversation will go. He already knows that Hachi is Yami's son but Hachi is still boring and easy to understand. Unlike his father, who is like a complex Rubik Cube. Hachi is simply an open book. I can understand where he came from and why he is like he is. Contemplates Orochimaru. He truly wasn't interested in Hachi at all. Hachi was so boring compared to his father. Yami is always illogical and can't be understood. Hachi can be read so easily, and even though he has some of Yami's traits, they seem to be minimal at best. Though Orochimaru does use Hachi to get a better understanding of Yami, so that is the only thing that makes Hachi even remotely interested to him. When he goes to the Hokage Tower, he enters inside, and no one bothers him as he calmly walks to the office. Everyone just politely nods his way, not daring to stop him. He is an s rank ninja and a Sanin, plus being the Hokage's student holds some weight too. Orochimaru opens the door and inside the Hokage's office sees Jiraiya and Hiruzen. The latter was smoking a pipe. It seems like usually he is smoking most of the time lately. Hiruzen was sitting on his chair, with paperwork all around his desk. Jiraiya on the other hand was leaning in the window. He most likely came through the window, as expected of someone like Jiraiya. Analyze Orochimaru instinctively. As a ninja he was used to observing minuscule things like this to come to a conclusion. Hiruzen is the first to ask as he leaned back on his chair. Tell me do you have evidence of Tsunade and Yami having a more than student and teacher relationship? When Hiruzen says this, Jiraiya grimaces at that. After all, no matter how much time passes, Tsunade is someone whom he secretly loves ever since he used to be young. Plus hearing that a child, who at the time should have been around 12 years old, had sex with Tsunade, this was all bizarre to him. But during his stay here, Hiruzen has seemingly hinted to Jiraiya what was his theory. So if it's true it doesn't come as an immediate shock to Jiraiya, but Orochimaru, when he hears what Hiruzen has to say, his reaction is different from Jiraiya's, as he chuckles slightly in his own creepy way. Why Saratobi-sensei? Is your inclination that Tsunade and Yami in Yuzuka were more than student and teacher especially during his younger age? Though they were talking like this, none of them knew the reality. Hachi is already dead. Neither did they know of the situation in the front lines against the Hidden Mist Village. The news hasn't reached them yet due to the situation only happening not even an hour ago. No battles against the Hidden Mist Village happened during this war. Plus the rumors about some civil war that has started in the Hidden Mist. So they were in their right to assume that Hidden Mist would not do something stupid like this. After all, Hidden Mist would help the rebels in the Hidden Mist and the village will be easily overthrown by that. Jiraiya was the first to refute Orochimaru's idea. No, I know Tsunade wouldn't do something like that, said Jiraiya as he frowns at the thoughts in his head that keep bringing up his suspicion. Orochimaru's smile dampened a little when he saw Jiraiya refusing something like Yami and Tsunade having something going on between them. So he just sighed a little, and finally decided to drop the bomb on them. Hachi Senju, or should I say Hachi in Yazuka is truly Yami in Yazuka's son. I have conducted blood tests by using Yami's mother and Hachi. The connection is there and the evidence is undeniable. Hachi is Yami's son. As soon as this was said by Orochimaru, Jiraiya's face becomes heavy. His frown deepens and he simply jumps off the window. Going somewhere Orochimaru just shrugged his shoulders at this. He was absolutely calm at this. He didn't have feelings for Tsunade anyway. So he didn't care who she slept with. That was her business and it's her body. She can do whatever she wants with it. He wouldn't care which people his teammates slept with. He has better things to do. So Saratobi Sensei, how do you think we should act? Now that we have this information available to us. Questions Orochimaru as he thinks on how he might be able to use this information against Yami and get an advantage over him. But contrary to what Orochimaru is thinking, Hiruzen simply sighs and says, Yami is a Kanoha citizen and the head of the Inuzuka clan. Even with this information, how are we going to use it? If we release it to the public, Yami wouldn't care that much. It would only ruin Tsunade's reputation, since it would seem like she took advantage of a 12-year-old Yami. Plus, even if we have something bad against Yami, it wouldn't be smart to use it. After all, we don't want to push him away or something like that. When Orochimaru heard the last part of what Hiruzen said he smoked a little and sat down on one of the chairs in the Hokage's office. After he settled down on the chair, Hiruzen filled his pipe with tobacco and started smoking again. So tell me sensei, you seem to act as if Yami has a high risk of desertion. Would someone as smart as Yami give up the advantages that Kanoha has? Asks Orochimaru, contrary to his usual joking manner. When he was alone with his teacher, he acted more relaxed. After all, currently Orochimaru and Hiruzen had a good relationship. He was Hiruzen's favorite student after all. Hiruzen thought a little at the implications and the things his spies have conveyed lately. Well, I wonder if Yami will really be at a disadvantage, though? Orochimaru folded his arms as he leaned back on his chair. Ham and how would that be? Does he have some secret base or something like that? The Hokage sighs at this as he shakes his head. Nope, it's even worse he has a whole new village to fall back into. Possibly a village who is under his absolute control. When he heard this, Orochimaru Orochimaru's thoughts went into overdrive, and after a couple of seconds he showed his natural genius by guessing. Hum so the most likely village that will support Yami, and even when he leaves Kanoha, will most likely be Han. So the village that will support Yami, 
and even if he defects Kanoha, will most likely be one of the small ones, says Orochimaru as he rubs his chin, thinking about which village would accommodate Yami. Omegaka, hidden rain is out of the question, because that place is too unstable, and Hanzo wouldn't risk having someone like Yami in there. Tsukigika, hidden waterfall is also out due to its alliance with Kanoha, so it would be either Kusagika, hidden grass, or some other village. That would be too far away like Morigika, hidden woods, or something like that. Hiruzen's face morphed into a smirk when he heard Orochimaru say that. He can't help but praise Orochimaru's genius. It's something that many people fear. But Hiruzen only feels proud of his student. So Hiruzen just nods at this. You are correct. It is Kusagika. He has absolute control over it. My spies have proof that Yami has Kusagika's new leader under his thumb. Whether they have a partnership or Yami is subtly manipulating him, it is unknown. But what is known is that the connection between the Kusakij and Yami is undeniable. Orochimaru just shrugged his shoulders when he heard this. After all, they were stuck, they couldn't do anything to Yami, and neither could they intimidate him. So they could only treat him nicely and hope he stays in the village. But that option only exists for Yami. Because if anyone else who doesn't have the power would be simply killed, and the public would simply know that he was poisoned by our anemias. While this was happening, Yami on the other side was lying down on his bed, in his tent. He had his eyes closed as he had headphones on his ears. Listening to the conversation Orochimaru and Hiruzen were having, he smiles a little at this, things were going just as planned. Even though he didn't have high hopes of this working, he still tried expressing his strength and daring anyone to challenge him. Obviously, this is a little crude form of manipulation, but he also has the power to be able to pull that off, so he did it. Or maybe they already know that I'm spying on them. So Hiruzen and Orochimaru said that only to make me let down my guard, knowing that I was spying on them all along. Thanks Yami, his thought process calculating a counter plan in case something like that happens. After all, even with all of his power that he currently holds, he never underestimates anyone. He knows better than to do something stupid like that. Now if only he can find where Zetsu and Madara's cave is. That will allow him to take countermeasures in case his plan G fails in the future. Yami had seven plans on how to reach his goals. He is not following just one. In case one fails he has six others. And every now and then, he creates a new plan in case all seven of his plans fail. I also need to be careful of those underground white Zetsu. They are a great source of Hashirama cells. But I already have a lot of those. Plus I don't want to notify Madara and Black Zetsu that I know of anything about their existence. Contemplates Yami, as he shifts in bed slightly, trying to find a comfortable position. Soon another of his two children will be born. Contrary to Hachi, they will be useful and have the Inuzuka name also Guy, will soon come to know of his father's death truly. The eight inner gates in an amazing technique, allowing a mediocre genin like Dai to insta-kill some of the seven ninja swordsmen and make them flee. So many plants, so many wonderful things to learn about this world truly is amazing. It literally has no limit on how much someone can grow. When I understood that, I even had a revelation, and I now have a theory on how I came to this world. If what I assume is true then he 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 Yami laughed inwardly, satisfied with his recent progress. I must always seek to evolve. That is the only way I can reach my dream to omnipotence and omniscience. I can already imagine myself sitting on a throne laughing at the trivial things happening in the world contemplates Yami. Due to his plans lately going so good, he too is in a good mood. He brings his hand in front of his face, and he uses some chakra. Slowly a little lava started appearing in his hand. He had only let Meitarumi escape because she was no longer useful to him. Escaping Yami is truly impossible. Even if Kigaya magically descended from the moon to save Meitarumi, she wouldn't be able to do so due to the countermeasures Yami has in place against leaving loose ends. Plus, he even deleted the memories of the horrible tortures he inflicted on her, trying to figure out how to keep her alive while he obtained her Keke Genkai. So now Meitarumi is just one more of his pawns she just doesn't know it yet. Which is even better. Around another five years and the war should be over. I must get some more benefits from this war. My shadow clones are already plundering the world for me. But that isn't enough. I need some more hum. How did Itachi get something like the Yata Mirror and the Tatsuka Blade? Also, I need to start researching more on souls. I have hit a roadblock there, but I need more. After all, I too would like to have my own Susanoo. I know that the Susanoo is actually in the nose of the human soul, but unlike replacing a physical nose, I must learn and investigate more about how the soul works. Thinks Yami, as he remembers the strange research results that he got, he didn't even know that somehow a soul body form even existed. That shows how much in the unknown he is researching. Hum, I wonder how people will react when they learn of what happened in the hidden mist. Tsune will definitely be hysterical once she learns of Hachi's death. She will most likely leave the village again and drown in alcohol. But Hachi's death might influence her even more will she maybe become a hindrance to my plans. Or will she maybe even join Akatsuki in the future if they promise to revive her loved ones. This is honestly a real possibility but maybe not so much given that Nagato will not take to inviting her due to the risk of Tune recognizing him and figuring out his powers or maybe she will join hands with Orochimaru in the future. Both of those outcomes would be horrible thinks Yami as he plans out bad possible future outcomes and how he will handle them in case they happen. 
I also can't put something like an explosion seal on her, or she will definitely notice it. Plus my memory manipulation techniques are crude and unrefined. Truly, coming up with plans and schemes is a hurdle. Plus, I would like the timeline to continue as close to canon as possible. In that way I can somehow predict the future, and not just run around blindly. My future knowledge is an absolute tool of mine. If I have to kill Tsunade for it to keep it on track then, so be it calculates Yami, while contemplating which people he should kill, and which ones he should keep alive after a couple of hours. The Hokage is just sitting down in his chair. He just finished his current paperwork. He can let go a little and relax. But even though he is relaxing, his mind can't rest. Thinking of different things, people, and the situation in the war front. Even though Kanoha was somewhat holding up. It isn't really in a good situation. It is literally at war with all of the other great hidden villages. The situation was obviously horrible. Although Hiruzen is glad that Kanoha has been blessed with a strong generation of ninja from Yami, Minato, and Fugeka to even others who would normally be considered geniuses but have been overshadowed by these three. While he was contemplating this, a hawk flew in from the window and landed on his desk. The ambu that were around the room didn't react, since they knew that this was a messenger hawk. When it landed he immediately extended his hand forward in the hawk, which was of normal size. It opened its beak, and a small scroll came out of it. Hiruzen caught the scroll and read through it. As he kept reading, his face morphed into a frown, and when he finished it, he had wide eyes on his face. How could this happen? Thought Hiruzen, shocked at the hidden mist's actions but then became sad and terrified. When he heard of Hachi's death with a heavy face, he looked at one side of the office, where one of the Anbus is camouflaged. So with a weary voice, he told the Anbu, send a message to Tsunade Senju, who is currently in the front lines against Hidden Sand. Inform her that her son Hachi Senju is dead. The Anbu silently nodded. It made himself seen and vanished again in a body flicker. Shit, Tsunade will definitely leave Kanoha now also. Jiraiya is mentally unstable after the current news. I wanted to give him some time to blow off some steam but it seems like we don't have that luxury anymore. During this time, Tsunade is currently healing an injured person who had his leg crushed by the third Kezekiyaj, Rasa. If it was anyone else, they would immediately designate that the victim's ninja career is over, and he will never be able to walk again. But Tsunade is not your every other medical ninja. She is one of the best so she easily fixed the problem with only a two-hour surgery. After that, she goes outside of the medical tent and goes towards her own tent. As she arrives there, she sees a hawk flying circles above her tent. Her eyes immediately narrowed, in suspicion that some enemy ninja might have copied the Kanoha communications. But after a couple of seconds, she went towards the hawk. When it saw her, the hawk flew in front of her and opened its mouth spitting out a small scroll. Tsunade caught the scroll and sensed that it had the Hokage's Fuenjutsu seal and chakra, so after confirming that she opened the scroll, she had a casual look as she did so, she even had a bored look in her eyes. But when she opened it with a glimpse, she saw what it was Hachi Senju is dead, the funeral will be held in two days. Immediately her eyes became hollow. A blue what? Asked Tsunade in confusion, not referring to anyone specifically. She dropped on her knees and crouched down. As tears came out of her eyes, T this can't be happening. Said Tsunade in denial. She couldn't accept a reality where everyone she ever loved has died. She didn't even give Hachi her grandfather's necklace. Why? Just why? Asked Tsunade to no one in particular. Was she asking the gods? No, she didn't believe in any things like that no ninja really believed in gods after all. What type of god would allow the world to be so cruel? On the other side, Yami was just lying down on the grass, reading a book with his Sharingan activated. It was actually a book with the research materials of a certain ninja. Of course, the ninja doesn't know that Yami has these. So Yami is just memorizing this before he put it back suddenly he senses as a hawk approaches him. He just looks upwards, and as the hawk is about to land close to Yami, he immediately puts the bird under a Jinjutsu. It's just a precaution he takes the letter the hawk spits out. This form of communication really is gross. I know that we don't exactly want anyone to get out hands in the messages, but there are definitely easier ways thinks Yami. As he opens his letter him, it's about Hachi's death, they are holding an official funeral. Isn't that only for accomplished ninja? Wasn't Hachi just a mere genin? That really seems like a waste of time. Is it worth even showing up? But if I don't show up, Tsune will just come and bother me while saying stuff like why, didn't you come to your son's funeral it really is unavoidable, isn't it? Side Tsune will leave after this, it seems like. Man talk about heroism being a pussy cunt that guy just grow a pair and tell Tsune that if she leaves, she will be branded as a missing nin, and hunted down like a dog. Thought Yami, as he just threw the letter away. It burned into ashes me air. I mean I would get it if this was a democracy. After all, you have to please the people if you want to stay in power. But this is more medieval and people act like animals. So to me if someone acts like an animal, they will be treated like an animal. But really though, 
The Hokage has so much power, but Hiruza never uses it to its full potential that for sure, is something that I am not going to do criticizes Yami, as he can't help but understand why people don't really follow the Hokage. It's simply because he doesn't really rule he doesn't dominate, he doesn't show his power. Then he wonders why the Achiha will revolt in the future well obviously, Hiruzen gave them an opportunity and courage to challenge him. Why didn't they revolt when Toborama was Hokage, even though he banished the Achiha to the outskirts? and made them be guards by creating the Achiha police force. Well, it's simple the Achiha knew they would all be massacred if they did that. Two days later, it was a sad day, as the entire village came to mourn someone who was supposed to be their hope Hachi Senju. Everyone thought that he had a bright future ahead, but sadly, he couldn't realize his true potential. Yami had to stop himself from yawning, as he saw Tsunade, Shizun, Misun, Yami's mother, Tsum, and some other people he recognized. Thankfully, Jiraiya was not here since he had already been sent to fight against the Sand Ninja. Hachi's coffin was covered in white flowers all around it with a photo of a smiling Hachi doing a peace sign. Couldn't they find a better picture? That looks ridiculous thinks Yami as he looks at the picture of his son. Even though on the outside he seems sad and is barely holding himself from crying, on the inside Yami's mind was like a gossiping housewife, nitpicking at useless stuff. Black really suits Tsunade should I take advantage of her sadness and go another round with her. This time I would be careful so another heart she isn't born contemplates Yami, as he sadly looks towards Tsunade. Whoa, is that Eno's mom? Thinks Yami, immediately planning how to manipulate her. But when he saw the ring in her finger, he sighed sadly damn, she is already married. Guess I won't fuck her, since it would require too much effort I am exceptionally horny today news Jami. As he looks for any pretty girl nearby, who seems like she would be easy prey to get. Soom already has a baby bump now, and he doesn't want to hurt his child in any way. So he is looking to have a one night stand at his son's funeral, Yami POV honestly. I felt like crying tears of joy when the funeral was over. I was a little surprised that Karigake even gave Hachi's corpse back. I had used my mosquitoes to learn that, as expected, Tsune will leave Kanoha on a vacation well. It doesn't matter anyway. I have spies on her all day long now. I learned my lesson when I didn't even know I had a child, until he came to my front door sigh. I guess I should return to the battlefield now. I start to look around and search among the people wearing black. It doesn't take long for me to spot the person I am looking for. Soom, who now has her hair down and better makeup, aka not ugly like in canon. She seems a little sad. After all, Hachi had been living in my house for quite some time, and most people aren't like me, so they get attached to people easily. She looks like her usual 7 tenths self, but now she also has a slight bump in her belly, signifying that she is carrying my child. Although it is unnoticeable to most people, I can easily see it. I walk close to her and extend my arm towards her. She notices me and interlocks her arm with mine. I notice that some of the people around us started whispering, and they will probably start some rumors about mine and Soon's relationship. But, it doesn't matter what they think or say, and they aren't technically wrong anyhow. Foshmi and Soon disappeared in a dark flash arriving at my Kanoha camp in the front against Komogaka. We are inside my tent, where one of my shadow clones is doing my pepper work while sitting on my desk. While my bed to the side is all fixed and with neat white sheets. When we arrive there, I see Tsum's face changes from a little sad due to Hachi's death into a frowning one. Did that upset your womb, Tsum? I asked her, wanting to know if she is feeling any problems. After all, she has my child inside of her. She just shakes her head. No need to worry Yami everything is okay. I feel no pain, no numbness, and not even any pricking. I just nod at her. If you say so anyway if you ever feel even the slightest amount of pain, you must come to me for a checkup right away. Now go to bed, you need to get your rest. She sighs a little, but still accepts and goes towards my bed, going to sleep. As a ninja, she has trained so that she can go to half sleep in a split second. I just dispel my clone and take his place sitting down on my desk. I throw all of the paperwork on the ground and put my feet on the table as I lean back on my chair soon and my hot spy from Kumo have both gotten pregnant. Which is good, since I can mold these children to my exact liking. No more undesirable variables. They will be very serviceable to me, and I will love them very much I have finally made up my mind. I can't trust anyone in this world. They are all potential backstabbers and imposters yes. I will look after my kids and be a good father to them, but I will never trust them. I will always have countermeasures in place against them. And most importantly, they will never be allowed to grow anywhere near my power level. They will be my happy little birds. Happy to always be inside their birdcage. Happy to flap around their wings and sing whatever I tell them to sing all in order to please their loving father. In another note, the reason why Tsum reassured me that everything was alright is because of my mindless spy. She too is holding my child, and since we had a lot of threesomes together, they most likely got pregnant at the same time I just recently told Tsum that the spy had been having certain complications with her pregnancy. I also explained that I had placed her in my own ICU ward in one of my labs, in order to care for her and the baby. But that's obviously some bullshit since I don't want someone who doesn't have any emotions to be a bad influence to my kids, and that she wasn't even that great to fuck. I have decided to kill her off. 
And that is why her brain dead self is currently under my tent inside a life support capsule filled with green liquid that keeps sustaining her and the baby. I made all the necessary adjustments and my child will receive all the required nutrients for proper growth. It will be like breeding my child in an artificial womb. I made up that pregnancy complications excuse just so I could simply let her die when she gives birth. Soon will not doubt my intentions, not even in her wildest imaginations. And even if she did, I will be prepared. Eight months later, MCH still 19, witnessing Tsum on the bed, screaming as she gives birth, isn't quite the memory I want permanently inside my brain. So I deactivated my Sharingan. I just look at the baby's head coming out of her. It isn't difficult for her at all, and soon enough, a baby with dark hair is born. Tsum seemed tired as her eyes were a bit dull, and sweat was all over her tan body, making her skin seem glistering. Not that I care anyway. Uwawa, cries the baby who is now in my arms. I look at it trying to see any abnormal qualities or something like that. If her yin chakra is higher than the standard 50%, that implies stronger mental capacity in the future. Usually, no one checks for this on their kids. Most people can't even check for this. But I make sure to check everything for any sign of my child being born with any abnormality. I let out a sigh of relief, which I easily know that soon mistakes as me being relieved that my child didn't have any complications. He can I see my baby, says Tsum. I just nod at her. It's a girl I say to her while smiling. I know that she will be worried about the baby being a girl. But when she sees my reassuring smile she relaxes. So what do you think we should name her? Asks Tsum with a tired smile on her face. I just smirk at this as I go to her and hug them both warmly. Well you are the mother so do you have anything in mind? She just smiles as she gives me the baby. I see her eyes are closing. She is going to sleep. I think I think that her name should be Hanahana in Yazuka. I just smile at this and say, of course when Tsum falls asleep, I look at the baby in my arms. She too has fallen asleep. Her vitals are stable and everything seems okay. So this is my first daughter, huh? Hana in Yuzuko, I have plans for you. One week later, my second daughter was born. She has dark skin, dark purple hair, and yellow eyes. It seems like she takes after her dead mother. Her name shall be Yuruchi Yuruchi in Yuzuka. I have plans for you as well, General POV. With Yami's children Hana and Yuruchi in Yuzuka being born, that brought up quite the news to the people in Kanoha, who didn't have a lot to talk about. Since the war front had been silent recently, there were many rumors running around, from the so-called scandal that Yami and Tsum now have a child together, to the whole dark skin child business yes. It is speculated that Yami in Yuzuka has been having a relationship with an enemy of course. Since that sounded too crude, Yami used his connections to change the rumors, from Yami having sex with an enemy ninja to Yami and Akumo Kinochi falling prey of both naive and tragic love. That was not meant to be. During this time even a book called Romeo and Juliet started circulating around. It was a giant hit with the civilians. In just its first week it broke all of the existing selling records. It had also become a way to give light brainwashing to the masses, assisting them with believing the new version of the dark skin baby rumors. Since the book was launched for sale, it eased the people's feelings towards cases like this. Some people in high positions were the exception. Though this book came out very timely during this situation, before people even really started suspecting Yami of anything, and even before they even had the chance to form an opinion. This book had not only calmed the minds of the populace, but it also made Yami's reputation skyrocket among the demographic of middle-aged housewives and young women. Though most couldn't see it, the old foxes and most of the clan heads could see the terrifying charisma that Yami had. He used something like literature to calm down a raging public. They have read the book, and even though it was good it didn't change their opinion of Yami's danger level he a ninja who has never even had any books published in his name. Except some medical books, he is simply another type of charismatic monster. A monster in manipulating public opinion so as time flew and another month passed, Yami became 20 years old. He was in his office reading an experimental book on various kenjutsu forbidden techniques that he got from the land of demons. He didn't have a birthday party celebration or anything like that. What he did have nonetheless were two daughters his clones took care of. Yami still keeps his experiments going on. He has been trying to experiment with mixing Fuenjutsu and Kenjutsu recently. He wants to create some type of curse seal technique like the ones Orochimaru will use in the future. Though it seems like so far, all of the test subjects explode from the inside when he uses the unfinished version. Although it is only matter of time and inner explosions before he gets it right. He had also contemplated if he wanted to go and try and steal the Tsuchikage's dust release secrets. But in the end, Yami deemed that too risky after all. Just one wrong move, and he will be obliterated by the Tsuchikage's atomic dismantling jutsu. I guess it's better to wait until he gets older, thinks Yami, as he contemplates his next move. His power growth had begun to stagnate again. He has already researched almost all of the Kurigaka KK Genkai one year later. Yami's age is 21. We can see Yami in Kanoha. He is out in his yard. He had a small yellow ball in his hand, and he throws it towards his daughters. His daughters have also grown up. They are both wearing yellow pants and pink t-shirts. They run towards the ball well. They try to run, since they mostly wobble. 
Yami just laughs at this. His aging has been good for him. He has gotten taller, his shoulders have also gotten wider, and his good athletic figure can clearly be seen. His face hasn't had any dramatic changes. He is only slightly more handsome due to the minor surgeries that he has done to his face. After all, what people see first when they meet someone is their face. They get their first impression from that, so now he can be called quite handsome. Contrary to his average looks from before Yami sees, as Yoruchi pushes Hana down and gets the ball. She cutely tries to run towards Yami while saying, Papa, Papa, I got this. But as she is about to wobbly run, she saw her big sister, Hana, lying on the ground with tears in her eyes. So she felt guilty at this, she stopped wobbling towards Yami, and turned around to go towards her sister. When she arrives in front of her, she just looks at the ball and extends it towards Hana. Here you can have it Hana-chan. When Hana sees this, she smiles and gets up to hug Yoruchi. Love you, little sis. While seeing this interaction between them, Yami has a strange smirk on his face. He goes towards them and envelops both in a hug. Dad, asked Yoruchi and Hana at the same time. Yami just smiled at this. Yoruchi, Hana always remember that family comes above all. So no matter what happens promise me that you will always love and treasure each other. Yoruchi and Hana look at each other confused. But they still smiled and said, of course daddy. Ha ha ha, you even finish each other's sentences like twins now says Yami, with a sweet smile on his face. After spending some more time with his family, Yami finally decides to make a shadow clone to play with them as he stealthily slips out. When he is out of the sight of his children, Yami can't help but think of the war situation going on currently. Kumo has been quiet lately. I know that they have been trying to form alliances, but obviously... I can't allow that, so I have already killed all of the messengers they send around. The more things change the more they stay the same. Yami has heard about Zabuza's massacre in the Kiri Ninja Academy. Also, Zabuza has already graduated this year at the age of 9. From running through my memories, I remember that Rin and the Beto will become Chunin this year in a couple of months. The Chunin exams will happen in Kanoha. So I will have to make that happen. Rin has to die at the Kanabi Bridge. While Abito watches after all his Manjiku ability is something I absolutely need thinks Yami. Is an utterly cold look appears on his face. He needs to plan this carefully. And he knows that. He will need a perfect plan for Abito to reject this reality. One where Kakashi kills Rin. So that he can gain the coveted Kamu Yami POV. I go towards a restaurant that is close to my house. I should really maybe make a mansion or something like that for me. I mean I might not need it. But with the war going on and me kinder selling weapons and offering things like insurances to civilians. I am making so much money I don't even know what to do with it. As I walk towards the restaurant. I see that there are a lot of new shops around the Inuzuka compound. There are also kids running around. They are the hundreds of orphans that I have adopted into the Inuzuka clan. The war has been treating me nicely. I have a couple of new cool KK Genkai. I look at my hand as it slowly breaks down at a cellular level, and it reforms into a giant eagle's claw. I then easily just change my hand back to my normal human one. Though it was a little hard getting the right genetic structure and stopping my DNA from destroying itself, I had to reinforce every single one of my cells to be able to handle the power that is being produced by them. I mean it would normally be impossible even with my medical knowledge. But with the help of the Jongu, I was able to do it. But sadly my body wouldn't be able to handle any more bloodline limits. I tried to get the hearts of KK Genkai users and see if I can use it. Sadly biology doesn't work like that. I did get their natural elemental affinities though in Chakra. But I do have another way to get some more KK Genkai without problem. But it seems that I will need to wait for a while sadly. Also on the war front. I haven't really been going to my Kanoha camp too much. Kumo hasn't really been directly attacking me. Well there have been a couple assassinations and poison attempts. But they were kinda laughable. Well to be honest, with how careful I am, I don't blame them for failing plus no poison even works against me. My camp is currently being managed by my clone, and below him are 20 elite jonin from the Inuzuka clan. I have discovered how to make a curse seal due to one of my clones getting his hands on one of Jugo's clan members. Now every Inuzuka can use the first stage of the curse mark, and the second stage can be accessible if they fuse with their dogs, turning them into creatures who look like werewolves. Finally I arrive at the restaurant called, the Inuzuka Special. It is a restaurant that makes most of my meals. Well the menu only has the meals I like, and the restaurant is fully financed by me. So there is that too. I entered the restaurant from the outside it looked like your average fancy restaurant as I opened the door. I saw a fancy restaurant with big tables and red comfy looking couches. There were various traditional paintings on the walls, and different fancy looking plants on vases. I go and sit down at one of the couches, and then I lie down on them making myself comfortable. I hear the waitress turn the sign on the door to show that they are closed, after all. Now that I'm here they know that I mustn't be disturbed. When the waitress comes close I can easily hear, sense and smell her, and my eyes are closed relaxing, so I couldn't see her. But as expected of the restaurant made to my preferences, the waitress is also wearing the perfume that I like. Before she can even usher a word, I simply say, 10 T-bone steaks well done, and 3 buckets of chicken also bring me a barrel worth of fruit drinks. I want the drinks from peach, oranges, green apple ham. I am feeling adventurous for today. 
So maybe a lemon drink too. The waitress doesn't say anything as she just nods and walks away. Ah, this is how a mortal life should be. Just be lazy and do nothing. I mean my body doesn't really deteriorate even if I never train. And with my Sharingan photographic memory, neither will my skill with Jutsu become rusty. I mean I obviously work hard still. But I mostly work smarter now, since training harder will not yield results anymore. Now everything is in place, and my strength is unmatched. All I need to do now is wait. So why not have some fun while waiting? So I enjoy the best of foods and drinks all day long. Though I don't like the taste of alcoholic drinks, so I don't really drink them. But I do like fruit juice. Sure, some people might say it's childish, but who cares what other people say? Also, I am so rich that even if they had something to say, I would just stuff money down their throats and choke them to death. Also now that the Inuzuka clan is unofficially the strongest clan in Kanoha, no one really dares to make fun of us anymore. I mean people can literally point at any building in Kanoha, and there is an 80% chance that it is owned by the Inuzuka clan, aka me. Though I haven't economically ruined any clan, after all, that wouldn't be good for my political career. No need to breed hate unnecessarily. But I have made the clans on my side way richer than those that are on the other rides. Also Kanoha's economy has skyrocketed since I have made my business ventures. I mean it isn't publicity known. But even other elemental lands are business partners of mine. Sure I might not have any businesses in other hidden villages. But I do have economical contracts with their lands. So, when peacetime comes around, my business empire would be able to do some aggressive expansions. As I was thinking that, the food finally came. So I immediately started devouring it. I am eating as much as dozens of humans would need to. But I mean I don't really even need to shit anymore that is how far I have evolved from the normal human. Anyway, the Hyuga clan should be joining my Kanoha clan's alliance soon. When I become Hokage this will be important. But currently that is useless. I already have dozens of Byakugans. I just need to prepare some more before I implant them. Even though I can now laze around a little. I still have so many things to do Sai. No rest for the wicked I guess. After having the big meal I decided to go towards the orphanage district in the Inuzuka clan compound. It is a district where all of the orphans that are adopted by the Inuzuka clan, me, go. It is a place full of talented children that will be my main force when I become Hokage. So better start training them from now. And I can't deny the effectiveness of this. I mean only having Yamato, who is 10 years old now, be on the Inuzuka. It has given the Inuzuka a certain prestige, after all, we have a wood-style user in Kanoha again. Also people in high places have been trying to make me give Yamato the last name of Senju. But I didn't raise my political power for so long for nothing. So I easily rebuffed all of the efforts of that, and Yamato Inuzuka is the only wood-style user in Kanoha. Knowing the future truly does give me superior advantages. I mean it is the strongest weapon on my arsenal. When I arrived at the orphanage, I stealthily went into the backyard. The yard was big, and had dozens of slides, and other tools that a child might need to entertain himself. There were around 40 kids just running around and doing kids stuff, like playing ninja and so on. But the one kid I concentrated on was Yamato. It was quite amusing seeing him as a 10 year old. He had two younger kids hanging from each of his shoulders, and another toddler was on the top of his head, hanging on by clutching Yamato's hair. I also see another toddler come close to Yamato and nudge him on his leg. Yamato Nai, make a slide, says the small toddler. Yamato just sighs and grabs the toddler that was on his head. Bit he seemingly can't get him off. Come on little boy you have to let go, says Yamato, trying to reason with the toddler. But contrary to his expectations, the toddler on top of his head now known as Bai, just started tugging even harder. Oh 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 stop it Bai, complains Yamato. That is when I decided to intervene by walking out of the shadows, and good naturedly chuckled. It seems like you are having quite a difficult time Yamato. Immediately all of the kids stop what they are doing and look at me. I just smile sweetly at them. But nonetheless they all stop acting like little brats and settle down. Hello there Yami-sama. Say all of the children respectfully. I just smile back at them. Hey there kids. Yamato looks glad when he sees me. I just wave at him. Yo, Yamato how has your wood star training going so far? He scratches his face with a finger in embarrassment. Well, Yami-san, it's not advancing as quick as I hoped. I mean when I hear what the first Hokage could do with it, it kinda feels inadequate whatever I do. I just smile at him and get close. I put a hand on his shoulder and encourage him by saying, Well, the first Hokage couldn't do what you can do at the age of 10 that is for sure. You are still young, so don't try to compare yourself with Hashirama when he was at his strongest. He seems a little better when I say this to him. But really though, he should be glad he isn't getting too strong too fast, or I would kill him. I don't like people who are more talented than me, who can grow stronger faster than me. Honestly, I hate people who are better than me at anything. I usually kill them off. No need to take a chance if someone can compete with me better kill him now. Just try to be Yamato. 
Shato. Even if you never reach Hashirama's strength, it doesn't matter. Then I mention all around us with my hand. What matters is family. Those are the people who will love you and care for you even in health or even in sickness. So don't try to be someone you are not. You are Yamato Inuzuka, the self-proclaimed big brother of the Inuzuka clan. Yamato suddenly seems to feel better when I say that. He looks towards the courtyard and does some hand signs. Wood style. 20 wood slides jutsu suddenly wooden slides come out of the ground. When the other kids see this, they all cheer and immediately go to play. Yamato just falls back on the ground breathing heavily. His 10-year-old chakra reserves have gone lower than 10%. He looks at me and smiles slightly. You are right Yami-san. I look at his questionably as I ask. Right about what? You are right I really do need to be more like myself. Everyone expects me to be the next Hashirama. But I am not going to be that. I don't want to be Hokage or anything like that. I just want to be Yamato Inuzuka. I just smile at him. Silly you already are Yamato Inuzuka. Even while saying that on the inside. I was calculating on the inside. After all, what I said it is all to increase his belonging and build a familiar bond with him and the clan. Suddenly I hear the back door of the orphanage open. And when I turn around I see another protege of mine. She is 6 years old. She has a small and petite body. She also has light blue hair. And when she sees me her face lights up in happiness. Yami-sama Yami-sama. I have a new move. Says the little girl as she runs towards me. She shows me her right hand as a small palm sized crystal puppy is created from her hand. And it jumps on the ground. When I see this I smile at her too. Congratulations Gurin. You truly are smart coming up with moves like these. Yes she is Gurin. The subordinate Orochimaru would get if one of my clones didn't find her. She is a great talent added to the Inuzuka clan. She is now known as Gurin Inuzuka the girl with the crystal release. I can say for sure that the Inuzuka clan's future is very bright. General POV. While Yami was just relaxing and planning like all. Always. On the other side, where Yami's camp lies, in the Jonin meeting tent, there were 20 ninjas sitting down on a circular table. They all had Jonin uniforms on them, and they all have fist chakra and wild hair, each of them had the Inuzuka clan marking on their cheeks. But unlike your average meeting, there were also Ninkin sleeping around on the ground. Suddenly one of them, who had long wild hair up to his lower back, his name is Aki, one of the Inuzuka clan's elite Jonin. He says, what are Yami's orders? Another one who has his wild blown hair cut short. He had a serious look in his face as he said, Yami has ordered that we should send his students, Guy, Asuma and Koronai into the front lines. The others all nod at this, not questioning Yami's orders. After all, they know that Yami will never lead them astray. But suddenly one of them, who has a lazy look on his eyes, his name is Kat. He tries to suggest, but they are so young. Guy is 11 and Asuma and Koronai are both 12. Maybe we should let them grow a little more before we push them like that. After all, the war isn't going anywhere. Suddenly the atmosphere in the room gets colder. All of the other Inuzuka clan members look at the lazy cat. Their eyes cold and emotionless. Did you just question Yami's decisions? Says Aki. He looks at Kat depending on his answer he will be immediately killed. The number one rule in the Inuzuka clan is never I mean never dare to question Yami's decisions. Kat sees this and just waves his hands in front of his face while nervously saying, No, no nothing like that. I just thought that maybe we interpreted his orders wrong. Immediately Aki just gets up and bang. He bangs his fist on the table. He takes a deep breath to calm himself down. His long hair moving upwards as his chakra aggressively pours out of him. Are you saying that Yami isn't smart enough to make his orders clear? Says Aki as his anger almost poured out of him. But he must keep calm. He knows that he will bash Kat's head into a bloody pulp. If he lets his anger get the better of him. The Ninkin sense Aki's negative emotions rising. So they open their eyes. They look at Kat and his Ninkin. E -r 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 -r. Immediately the Ninkin started growling at Kat and his ninja dog. Kat is in cold sweat as he looks at the situation around him. Damn why did I have to say that? Thinks Kat as he tries to figure something out on how to get out of this. He knows that he will really be ripped apart by the Ninkin if he doesn't think of something. Of course the killing of comrades in Kanoha obviously isn't allowed. But there are very loose rules around that law. After all, if the ninja is working against Kanoha's interest, he could be killed on the spot with no repercussions. Now working against Kanoha's interest has a lot of loopholes. It was originally that way so some ninja can be killed if they are so incompetent that they literally hinder the mission. Or some Kanoha ninja is doing something treasonous. But the village can't find any proof. So they use this law. Obviously there would be an investigation by the clan head of the victim. Civilians are investigated by some ninja personnel. Most likely someone incompetent. So no one really cares about that. Of course there is also the death against enemies. So most deaths by comrades are not investigated. After all, in the eyes of the higher ups, it's simply a waste of manpower. Anyway, Kat knows that Yami will never punish Aki. He literally is a fanatic about Yami. Some even joke that if Yami told Aki to eat shit, he would do it. So Yami will most likely just do an investigation and claim the case closed. Kat knew that and was thinking of a way to get out, and he finally decided to say, No, no, it's just that I couldn't understand it. Aki immediately disappeared from his position, and with extreme speed he was in front of Kat, and grabbed him by the throat. Kat and Aki are in around the same level of strength, so he could have dodged that move. But if he did so, 
the next move would be Aki going for the kill. He definitely doesn't want to start a death battle with Aki, that is for sure. The other in Yuzuka let Aki handle this. After all, in their eyes, he was someone trusted by Yami. So you think that Yami is unintelligent enough that he can't explain things clearly for you to understand, says Aki as he chokes Kai. Cat uses some chakra to reinforce his throat exterior, so he can breathe a little, and he groans out. No, I was in the wrong. I just wasn't concentrating at the moment. Cat hopes that admitting that it was his mistake should help calm the situation a bit. But contrary to Cat's expectations, black curse marks start spreading around Aki's body. So you are not concentrating on Yami's orders, is that it? Well, then I guess that the Shinigami might forgive you. But I fucking won't. Who the fuck do you think you are to have the audacity to not listen to Yami's orders? Says Aki as his grip around Kat's neck increases in strength. Kat's eyes go bloodshot from the lack of oxygen. He tries to use his own Inuzuka curse mark, but he still can't get himself out of Aki's steel-like grip. He can feel his neck almost give out and crack, and his lungs burning from the lack of oxygen. Fuck is this how I am gonna die? Thinks Kat. But as he is almost about to pass out and his neck is almost about to break under Aki's grip, he couldn't believe that this is the way he will die, because couldn't keep his mouth shut. Fwash, but in a dark flash, a dark figure appears next to Aki, and immediately grabs his wrist. Crack easily breaking it and releasing Cat from the grip of death. Cat drops on the ground, and he starts coughing and taking in very deep breaths as if he is starved for air. Out of the black flash comes out Yami, with a smile on his face as he says, What is going on here? Aki is about to answer, but Yami just looks around and nods. No need to. I already got the gist of the situation, not giving Aki any time to even get his voice out, as expected of Yami, thinks Aki with a smile on his face. He then decided to say, what should we do with Cat, clan head Yami-sama? Cough cough cough, Cat coughs a little as he is finally able to get his breathing under control. When he looks up, he immediately sees Yami just smiling down at him. He can feel chills down his back when he sees Yami's cold eyes looking at him. Damn, I hate it when he looks at me like that. It is like he can read right through my flesh and blood, and look straight into my soul. Thinks Cat as he tries to keep calm under Yami's unnerving gaze. Unfortunately he fails, as his face morphs into a grimace when Yami says, Hum, tell me Cat, why do you think that my my students, who are now tuning, shouldn't be allowed to fight. Cat just looks at the ground nervously, not daring to look at Yami's eyes again. This is why Yami as a clan head has never been challenged for the position. No one dares even talk about challenging Yami or they might disappear. No no Yami-sama, it was just a stray thought of mine, says Cat. The nervousness in his voice has now become very apparent. Grrrr ah, the Ninkan started growling at Cat, but Yami just gave a side glance. Looking at the Ninkan, though his face didn't show anything. The look in his eyes showing, and they all weren't putting their ears down in submission. His dominating presence, helping him get the room completely under control. When Yami is inside a room no one would dare ignore him and his orders. Especially a barbaric like the Inuzuka clan. Yami looks back at Kat. His dark eyes were emotionless as Kat finally decided to look up, and he wished he hadn't. Yami's dark eyes, looking down on him. Kat could feel his scalp tingling from the overwhelming instinctive fear that he has for Yami. Kat has been in countless close to death situations but he had never felt like this before. Suddenly he, a grown man tears started coming out of his. Balm Kai immediately bows down, with his head banging on the floor. I am so sorry Yami-sama. I just thought that your students were too young, and might die if they encounter some jonin. I ask for your forgiveness. Yami just keeps his smile on his face, as he crouches down and puts a hand on Kat's shoulder. Come on now, there is no need for this. You are forgiven Kat. It wasn't just Kat that felt like that even though it was concentrated at Kat. The rest of the Inuzuka in the room felt nervous too. They all swallowed hard in nervousness. Yami just gets up and shrugs. Well this situation is solved, so see you later guys. Poof and a puff of smoke Yami disappeared, showing that he was a shadow clone all along. The real Yami was enjoying his time in Kanoha messing around. One month later, Guy, Asuma and Kura and I were jumping on trees. They are currently on a patrol just like usual. Though they are still young and they still have an entry in the bingo book, they all had only one page for the three of them, simply stating that they are Yami's students. They have also grown taller, especially Guy. He seems more like a teen than an 11-year-old kid. Due to the protein and certain types of steroids in the food, have given Guy the optimal body, with no side effects. The whole team is also wearing tuning uniforms, so their physiques can't be seen clearly. Also their walking method has evolved, a medic can no longer read their physical strength just by looking at them and the way they walk. Looking for any Kumo ninja who might be around. Though it's like your usual patrol, their assignments have been getting sent to more and more dangerous territories. Suddenly they all stop and Kurinai takes out a flute and plays it. She closes her eyes as soon as the sound comes from her flute. This is a technique that Yami taught her, to use sound to transfer her chakra and sense targets nearby. She also discovered that it can be used in Jinjutsu, just like her teacher, Yami, does. Suddenly she frowned and used hand signs to communicate with Guy and Asuma. 
Enemies nearby signals Kuran and points towards a thick tree. How many signals assume her as they continue tree jumping, like nothing was wrong? 5. 2 Jonin level and 3 Chunin, explains Kuran Immediately Asuma continue communicating with his team, signaling if they should retreat. After all, there were 2 Jonin. That is very dangerous for them. But contrary to his teammate's uncertainty, Guy is different. His bushy eyebrows form into a frown, and he immediately just nods towards his teammates. They immediately understood what he meant. But before they could ask Guy anything, white magma-like chakra came out of his body. Fwash immediately Guy disappeared from his place, with Kuren I and Asuma not even noticing that he was even gone. But Guy just walked towards the tree and boom. The tree explodes to bits as it is kicked by Guy. Two people carrying three others jumped out of it. Fwash Guy immediately goes after the one carrying two people, assuming that he must be a Jonin, since he was able to react to his speed, and even carry two people with him. As Guy gets close to him, Midair, the Jonin throws the two Chunin, who was still dazed aside to free his hands. He started waving hand signs, but Guy didn't allow him to do that as he immediately got in his personal space, due to his initial powerful jump. The Kumo Jonin goes for a block. This is when Guy remembers Yami's lessons. He adjusts his stance and tries to kick the Jonin in his balls. But the Kumo Jonin blocked even though he grimaces a little when cracking sounds came from his wrists due to Guy's fifth gate power. Go for the chin, thinks Guy, reciting Yami's words in his mind. The Jonin didn't have the speed to act anymore, even his wrists were broken. So Guy kicks the right side of Kumo Jonin's chin. How the Jonin's brain hits the inside of its skull, knocking him out. His eyes roll into the back of his head. Take initiative, always make sure that you take him out, says Yami from Guy's memories. So Guy decides to make sure and punches the Jonin's under his chin. Blood comes out of the Jonin's nose as he starts falling down on the ground. This exchange all happened in a split moment, and it was midair. Not even giving time to the other Kumo Jonin to intervene and help his comrade. But Guy as he is still midair, as he stopped using the fifth gate and closed it. As he started falling down, he catches a branch of one of the trees, and he swings himself to lower the impact as he lands on the ground. As Guy was looking at the other Jonin, he had a serious expression on his face. Even though it doesn't exactly suit him, he can be serious when the situation demands it. As the Jonin that he has knocked out started falling towards the ground head first, even though he knows that the Jonin will die. Guy didn't do anything to help him. After all, he is an enemy, Yami had taught him many things. One of them is to never show mercy to an enemy, or they could easily kill you. As the guy was falling, the other Jonin just let go of the Chunin that he is holding, letting it fall down. Since he was already in the ground he uses Chakra on his legs to reinforce his legs and Fwash. He jumps up and catches the Jonin that was knocked out by Guy, and was about to hit the ground head first. But at this moment Guy decides to attack. Since if he uses the gates anymore, he would most likely suffer muscle strain. That would lower his immediate combat potential. Suddenly he started spinning around in one leg, until heat started coming out of his leg. When the Jonin sees this, he is midair in cunt dodge. Plus he has his comrade in one of his arms. But suddenly, yes SST, he hears the sound of paper being burned. Immediately his eyes widen as he looks at his fellow Jonin who is unconscious. Paper bomb is the last thing he thinks as he is enveloped by the explosion. Boom as the dust is about to clear out someone jumps out of the explosion. It was the Jonin except he had half of his face burned off. And he smelled like burned flesh. His eye had melted into his socket. Surprisingly he didn't have any other outward injuries. But it wasn't for long as Guy used his flaming kick to hit the Jonin's throat. Before he could scream, his own windpipe had melted and he choked on his own blood, unable to breathe anymore. This whole confrontation happened in seconds, not giving the Chunin, nor Isuma and Kuranai any time to react. But when they saw this the Kumo Chunin was shocked, so Kuranai was the first to act as a melodic singing voice appeared and flop, all of the Chunin fell to the ground, unable to resist the Jinjutsu. Kuranai too fell on her knees due to her Yin Chakra being depleted too quickly. Isuma just goes to tie up the Chunin, and Guy falls on his back breathing heavily. That was so close, I am glad I listened to Yami-sensei, when he always told us of his fighting style when he was a genin, though I didn't expect it to be so effective and unyouthful. Kuranai just grabbed her head in pain, as she had a headache. Her yin chakra had truly gone low, as expected of one of Yami's Jinjutsu. They have such a heavy drawback, and can only be used as a trump card. Thinks Kurinai, as her hands are surrounded in a green-colored chakra, she immediately started nursing her headache, and even turned off some pain receptors, as they need to quickly get out of here, or more Kumo Jonin could come here. Kill them, we can't stay here anymore, says Kurinai to Asuma, who without hesitation nods and slices the throats of all of the sleeping Chunin. And due to the pain, they wake up from the Jinjutsu and die choking on their blood. Asuma then goes towards Guy and says, Can you run by yourself? Guy shakes his head. Yes, but I would slow you down. My body has some heavy muscle tears and burns on my right leg, where I used Diable Jam. Asuma just nods at this and picks Guy up piggyback style. And immediately they started running. After some time they were thankfully able to run away far enough and meet another patrol team, telling them of the possibility of more Jonin being around the area where they fought. Yami POV even though I am currently in Kanoha. I am using some of my mosquitoes to spy on my little students. Hum they did pretty good, it seems like my lessons to them weren't in vain. 
Guy will most likely get a bingo book entry of his own, once his deeds are made public. Also, it seems like opening the fifth gate even for a couple of seconds, it's still too much for his small body. Hmm, now I should just pull some strings and have him promoted to Jonin. After all, even though temporary, his ability surpasses a Jonin's. Plus with him using my tricks, he will most likely win against the average Jonin even without even opening any gates. Even though I am thinking about my students my mind still goes back to the only weakness I have left my brain. If it gets destroyed it's all game over, no matter how fast of a regeneration I have. My hand subconsciously twitched, and my mind went to the thought of stealing the forbidden immortality jutsu, and then I will use only half of the technique to immortalize my mind, just like Orochimaru did. So my brain will no longer be my weakness even when it is destroyed. But if I acted recklessly now, I would lose everything I have accomplished in Kanoa. Plus I most likely won't be able to get another forbidden technique after getting the first. How did Orochimaru get the technique without being noticed? Damn damn it why does someone smarter than me exist? He should just die. But no I can't get impatient. I am so close to my goal I can almost feel it. Omnipotent on the present the two words that are used to describe God. I I want that. I want to see how the God looks at humans. I am curious how it feels to know everything and be all powerful and be able to do anything. Sage of the Six Paths, Otsutsuki, Kagaya, Indra, Asura, Madara. Hashirama, Jashin, Naruto, Sasuke and even the Shinigami all of them will be my stepping stones. Just need to wait just two more years I will get what I want from this village. Soon so soon canon will come in two years the Nine Tails will attack Kanoha and that is when my plans for Godhood will truly begin. One year later, Yami's age 22, I am currently in the yard of my mansion. The mansion isn't too big and it only has 15 bedrooms. But it is still called a mansion, and I also expanded my yard now. Now it has a big pond in there, and a garden with different types of flowers. There are also different trees around. My two daughters are running around playing this world's version of tag. Well, I mean every game that has to do with tag, hide and seek, etc. It is just called playing ninja. They are three years old now. So they have grown a little about as much as the average three-year-old. I have already started Yoruchi's enhanced training. Well, I have been covering it to make it look like a game. I must say Yoruchi's talent is way better than Hana's. But as expected, after all Yoruchi's mother, uh, what was her name again? It was something that started with M anyway. Yoruchi's mother was a Jonin from Kumo. So she had good genes. That plus with my amazing genes. And we have little Yoruchi. I am sure that she will at least reach elite Jonin in levels of power. Though with me as her father, she will reach S rank as for Hanahum, she should reach around Jonin maybe elite Jonin. People say that hard work will always show results. But that is not true for most cases. After all, for example, right now even if I spent all day training for a whole year, I would get absolutely no results. My body has already grown to its maximum potential for my age. Plus with just training you will minimize the results, you also need to get the right training, and eat the right things to reinforce muscle growth. Thankfully Tsum hasn't acted bad towards Yoruchi, after all, that isn't her kid. So I wouldn't be surprised if she acted badly towards her, but maybe she hasn't noticed how much better Yoruchi is compared to Hana. Maybe when she notices that, she will start being jealous of how Yoruchi is better than her own daughter. Though maybe Tsum sees Yoruchi like her own daughter, after all, she was also most likely conceived while me. Yoruchi's mother and Soom were having a threesome. Anyway, Soom has been a little mad at me lately, and the reason for that is well I am finally getting married. And this marriage will bring huge benefits for me. I mean currently, the daimyo just listens to me. Obviously he isn't under some type of Jinjutsu, after all, he has his 12 guardians with him. Some of them are truly skilled, especially that old blind swordsman monk. He has very acute senses, so he might notice something. Plus not everyone is allowed to meet the daimyo whenever he wants. Even I have had the opportunity to talk with him once. So I never took the risk, plus the daimyo already listens to me out of his own volition. After all, I have bribed all of his advisors and his wife, and some of his concubines are very fond of me. So it wasn't that hard to convince them to whisper things in the daimyo's ear. So it was children's play getting the daimyo to approve certain policies and make decisions in my favor. But anyway my current arranged wife is Shiori, daimyo's daughter POV, I look at myself in the mirror for the up 10th time today. I am a tall and slender woman with long black hair that extends past her waist with locks of hair that frame my face down to my chin and with my dark blue eyes with long voluminous eyelashes and pale skin. I have a narrow waist and very large breasts. I am currently wearing a sleeveless top which emphasizes my breasts and also with a blue dress yes. I know that I am pretty, plus with being the daughter of the daimyo. I am the desire and dream of many men. But sadly I am to be married to a killer who already has two children of his own. What was father even thinking when he made this dumb decision? I hear the door to my room slowly open, and my personal maid enters the room. She is young. The same age as me, age 21, and pretty cute too. Though nowhere near as cute as I am. But she will be my personal maid for when I go to live in Kanoha. She just looked at me and said, So I heard that you will meet your fiancé today. I just give her a side glance. 
Yep, and you will be coming with me to meet him too. Who knows he might feel charmed by your meek looks and fall for you. I say to my maid, she has black hair, brown eyes and she is shorter than me. So compared to me she is pretty short, and with her meek personality, she would be the perfect little thing that men like to dominate. When she hears me say that, my little maid just fidgets and her face is in a full-blown blush, as she says with her usual meek voice. Shiori, don't say it like that, it's embarrassing. I just smile at her, she usually addresses me casually when we are alone after all we have known each other, since we were young, and I have kept her off the clutches of any noble or even my own father sometimes. So she is my closest confidant. Come on now, don't be so embarrassed or you will never find a man in Kanoha. After all, you do plan to be married and have a family, don't you? I simply rhetorically ask her. I know the answer already. But I just smile when her whole face goes red. She doesn't answer so I just walk towards the door and say, Come on now let's go and meet my future husband. As I walk towards the guest room, where my father and Yami in Yazuka are, I keep my back straight and express a completely confident mask. But in reality on the inside I am nervous and even a little terrified. Yami in Yazuka isn't just your simple killer he is the best killer Kanoha has. He most likely has already killed thousands, and I am not dumb enough to just listen to the news the Land of Fire has, since they describe Yami as some type of god, that will protect the Land of Fire with his life. But the things the other lands say about him is terrifying killing children, and even the extermination of multiple clans by him, up to the last hover. Destroyed the village hidden in the sky who had hundreds of thousands of people living there, and he was a child when he did that. Now he is 22, only one year older than me but still terrifying. I am to marry that man, will he be cruel to me? Will he rape me and use me as his sex toy until I am dead? Sai, when I was a young girl, I used to imagine that a prince from another land will come and take me from here, and make me his wife, then he will be my husband. Then we will live happily ever after. But I was young back then and didn't understand the world. But now I know how cruel the world is. But I will not give up to the world. I am not some submissive woman who will just stay by the sidelines. I will either have my freedom, or I will kill myself after all life without freedom to me is no life at all. I open the door to meet my new husband Shiori, MC's future wife POV. When I open the door the first thing my eyes land on is my future husband. I only recognize that it is him because his photo in the bingo book. He is sitting on a big dining table, next to my father. They seem to be eating breakfast already. He has spiky wild hair, and contrary to my expectations he wasn't in his ninja uniform. He is wearing black jeans and a black t-shirt, with the words wolf written on it. He seemed just like your normal handsome young man, except that he also had his Inuzuka clan tattoos on his cheeks, so that is another sign that it is him. Neither did he seem to even be carrying any weapon and, he had a genuinely happy smile on his face as he talked to my father. Ha 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 come on now father-in-law, if you say stuff like that, people might think that I will be Hokage only because of a friendship, says my future husband. Only then did did I notice that 8 of the 12 Daimyo Guardians were here. The others are most likely scouring the castle like always. So what? Let them assume whatever they want. Me and you are friends Yami. After all, I will be your father-in-law soon. Obviously you should be the Hokage, says my father with a smile on his face. But come on now father don't you know better than to not say things like that out loud. Wait is that sake father is drinking. As I close the door, father seemed to finally notice me as he turned around and looked at me. Ah uh, Shiori, you are here. Let me introduce you to someone. This is Yami in Yazuka, the future Hokage, said father as he started chuckling at the last part, as if it was an inside joke with Yami, who too just smiled a little. Come on father-in-law, you can't say stuff like that, says Yami who seemed genuinely a little embarrassed at this. That is surprising and embarrassed ninja. I just smiled slightly too. No need to make a bad impression on Yami. So better at least try and act nice words are free after all. Nice to meet you, Yami-san. I say greet him as I continue smiling. He just looks at me and smiles back at his genuine how is that possible. Whenever a new man meets me for the first, he will always have a surprised face. But Yami seems completely unfazed by me. He didn't even try undressing me with his eyes. It is impossible for him to deceive me. I can read people well. So he must be attracted to men then well I can work with that. I just sat down on the table, next to my father and as I did so, father immediately got up. Well I better leave you youngsters to your own conversations, said father as he walked outside the room with his guardians all following him. Now the only ones left in this room are me, my maid and Yami and Yazuka. How do I bring up the conversation of his sexuality? Then maybe we can work something out. He just has to let me be in charge of this. As soon as I was about to say something, Yami handed me a letter. We are being spied on I just nodded then I will speak normally and not say anything sensitive. I guess we can talk when we take the carriage to travel to Kanoha. In one hour it should be ready. I just put on a smile and ask. So tell me how being a ninja is. It must definitely be exciting. Suddenly he just smiles and says. Well it probably isn't as exciting as you expect it to be. It's mostly just killing and torturing some enemy ninja now and then. WTF did he really just say that no way I turn a little and give my trusty maid a side glance. 
Yet, she is pale in fear. So he must be the type of man who is very straightforward then. It's a little hard to keep the smile on my face when he says stuff like that, but I can endure this. Oh, is that so? Then tell me a little about your family, then Yami. I try to change the subject and keep the conversation going. His smile ever present on his face as he says again. Well, my father died before I was born and my mother is alive. She is a nice woman. But she too almost died during the last war. It was from the stress of me going to the battlefield. Okay. I don't know what to say to that and the situation is getting kinder awkward, so better say something. So I hear that you have two beautiful daughters, tell me a little about them. His face brightens. Oh Hana and Jiruchi. Hana was born due to me having sex with Tsum in Yuzuka, a girl who I see as my sister. When he says this his face is brutally honest, and it's getting painfully hard to keep a smile on my face. But he still continues saying. On the other hand, Iruchi was born with a Kumo ninja I regularly fucked. Since we are getting married, we gotta be honest. So I will just say I suspect that my daughters were born out of a threesome we had. What the hell is wrong with this man? I am half willing to marry a pig farmer than this guy. Contrary to his handsome looks he is not cool, nor charismatic, nor does he live up to his terrifying reputation. Also who says to their wife stuff like this? Just like this one hour passes and Yami still continues telling me some of his ninja stories with terrifying details. That would make any normal person throw up. So then my best friend and teammate Asyatori died in my hands. I went to look for his sister Asume, but she too was dead killed by the Chunin, says Yami with a smile still on his face. I am tired in just one hour talking to him, and I am already extremely tired. I will have to spend the rest of my life with him. I will probably throw myself off the Hokage Mountain within the first week I spend with him. As Yami finishes his recent depressing and awkward story, the door to the room is opened. I turn around and see that it is a servant who just bows his head and says, Your carriage is ready. After that, we all go outside, only me. My maid, Yami and someone that Yami trusts will be riding the carriage. But surprisingly when I go outside, instead of seeing the normal carriage, what I see is a giant crocodile, or maybe an alligator, with a small house on its back. I, I have never seen something like this. So for a split second, my face expresses the surprise I am feeling, but that is quickly squashed as my face goes back to the polite smile. Entering the carriage, mini house as it was quite high, Yami simply made a hand sign and stairs appeared in a puff of smoke. When we went inside, it was just like your average house. It even had running electricity somehow. It has a stove and all that. Then I just wave at my father as the door closes. I sit down on a couch, and my maid also sits next to me. When the creature, which we are technically sitting on top of, starts to move surprisingly there is almost no shaking. Well this is actually way better than traveling in a carriage. But as Yami looks at the window, waving towards whom I can only assume is my father, he closes the curtains on the windows and turns on the lights. When he turned around, he had his smile on his face still. But there was something wrong, I just couldn't quite put my finger on it. He sits next to me and pushes his body next to mine. The next thing I feel is a hand going around my shoulder in a friendly gesture. Suddenly, the next words I hear come out of Yami's mouth are, You aren't as smart as you think, little princess. Immediately as soon as he said that, I got chills running down my spine. Shiori POV. You aren't as smart as you think, little princess. Immediately as soon as he said that I got chills running down my spine. His hand that he has around my shoulder slowly goes towards my chin and forces me to look at him. I was shocked by what I saw. His eyes there were so terrifying. Like two dull pupils with no emotion in them. I have never seen something like this. Underestimating someone is the dumbest thing you can do my wife. I could see his smoke widen a little. I have already analyzed what kind of woman you are. Judging by your personality. I am sure that we will get along. If you feel unhappy in our marriage, it doesn't matter. You just give me a couple of kids, and then you can live a life of luxury, until your body slowly rots away due to old age. How I can't read what he is thinking at all. Even though my face is calm, when I look at his eyes and amused smirk, it feels as if he already knows everything about me. I see so then tell me dear husband is this the true you? Or is this another mask? Though I can't read him, I can loosely guess what he is thinking. After all, if he is someone like me who wears a mask then we might have the same thought process. Suddenly his whole demeanor changes and the hand that he had on my shoulder slowly goes towards my breast. I obviously was prepared for this, so there was no reaction out of me. I see that now Yami has a blush on his face, and his eyes now have a deep emotion in them. He just looks at me and says, Shiori I love you. For a split second I almost believed him even knowing what I know about him damn his acting is really good. How does he do it? Yami POV looking at my new wife. I have to say, she is quite a looker. I don't think I have even seen a woman as good looking as her. But then again, contrary to the ninja training female ninja do, she most likely spent that time taking care of herself. So her beauty isn't something that will make my heart skip a beat or something like that. That only happens in shitty romance stories. That has no place in real life. But with my hand around her neck, I cupped a feel of her big breasts. Hum that is nice. 
I don't mind spending the next 20 or so years with her who knows I might not even cheat on her okay, maybe sometimes with Sium, and that cute waitress maybe sometimes with that one nurse that works in the Inuzuka clinics too. But other than that I will not cheat on her, possibly. But she doesn't have to worry her pretty head about that, since I will do any extramarital activities behind her back. Anyway, I think that her thinking face as she tries to figure me out is cute. We will reach Kanoho in a day or two, then we can get the Hokage to officialize the marriage, yeah. I am not waiting that long to fuck her. I believe in my lying and manipulation enough to think that I can get someone like her to bed with me. Plus we are husband and wife to be. Not doing it at least 15 times before marriage is weird. Anyway, I truly already know everything there is about to know about my future wife. I just glance at the small maid that doesn't even have a noticeable presence. This is why I never trust no one in this world. That little girl right there has been living her whole life with Shiori, and has been treated pretty good by her. But that didn't matter at all she is a spy of mine I memory wiped and optimized. She is the perfect spy actually, she doesn't even know she is one. And even if a Yamanaka went through her memories they wouldn't find anything, because no memories of her ever being associated with me don't exist in her mind. People think that what makes them well them, it is their soul body, brain or something like that know what makes me, me is my memories. Even if I died and my soul reincarnated without memories, that isn't me anymore. So this is the secret to how I control her. She has some fake memories sealed inside her head at which during certain commands, they activate and she will remember how I saved her from being raped or something like that, when in reality none of that ever happened. Her whole life is just a fake play made up by me. She is really beneficial anyway. I just look at my pretty new wife and say, well since we are gonna be husband and wife, I think that we should be honest with each other. I will start first. I took a deep breath and stopped groping her firm breast. I was joking when I said those things to you. But you really need to be careful against ninjas. You are a good liar for a normal person. To a ninja though you aren't even mediocre, especially the ones who can see even minute changes in your expression. I can see her frown a little and say, so what then will I just be one of your fuck toys then? Just another plaything until you get bored. If that is so then no thank you. I will slit my own throat before I become something like that. Hum, she is fierce, but people who talk about death like this, they have most likely never experienced it. If I were to take out a kunai and put it against her throat, she will become terrified and won't say useless stuff like this. I just yawn a little and say with a bored voice, well, as interesting as the thing that you said sounds, I have more important things to say. She doesn't retaliate even though I just implied that what she spoke was bullshit. She stays calm as she tries to guess what I'm thinking. I just continued saying to her, you are calm, that is good. What I want to tell you is that you will never really be able to read what any ninja is thinking, but you can study their previous actions and determine the future ones by that. Everyone has a pattern, something that they follow, plans and goals. Her face is calm as she looks towards me. What are you trying to teach me? What is my duty as your wife? I just smile again. Well you are my wife, since you are not a ninja. I want you to manage my civilian business. And if we build some trust between each other, then maybe I will give you control of other things like my clinic's businesses and so on. I will make you the most powerful woman in the world. You will be my empress by my side. After some time we finally Shiori finally seems more comfortable with me. We talked till midnight and the maid even fell asleep. But me and Shiori were still talking about my countless business ventures and how she will manage them. Though I did notice her try to hint that she would be uncomfortable living in the same house as my daughters and my lover. She didn't say anything when I just smiled at her. She just nodded, understanding that I wouldn't listen to her on that one. She is truly a born manipulator. I have noticed on several different occasions where she instinctively tries to manipulate me. Growing up in a political slaughterhouse that is the capital city of the land of fire, has made her into quite the smart and politically inclined woman. Though she will have to learn a bit more before she can manage any business, after all, politics and business management are two different things. She should be glad that I am willing to even let her manage anything. I usually don't trust people who am I even kidding. I don't trust my future wife at all too. I just want to make her feel like she has control and choices in the marriage, when in reality she controls nothing. But I control her life. After all I don't want to appear as a control freak, so better give her the illusion that I am not one. So wanna consummate our marriage? I asked Shiori with a slightly teasing tone in my voice. But contrary to my expectations, Shiori just looked at me and said with a calm face. But we are not officially married yet. I just lie back on the couch, my arms spread wide and leaning on the top of the couch as I stare at the ceiling. Sigh, I know right. Why couldn't the daimyo do the coronation ceremony? That way we could be having fun right now, instead of talking about business all night. I just give Shiori a side glance, and she just blushes a little. But it goes away a second later. She is really good. Well, it doesn't mean that we couldn't have some fun before marriage. After all, every couple does it. Says Shiori as she looks at me with her deep blue eyes and her calm and pretty face. 
Immediately I just look at her, and with my hand I cusp her chin, bringing her face closer to mine. She doesn't resist as she closes her eyes, and I too extend my neck towards her and I kiss her. I can see that she is truly inexperienced as she just gave me a mediocre kiss. When I started using my tongue on the kiss her eyes winded, but I just clutch her by the ass and make her sit on my lap as we continue our makeout session. While we were making out, my hands didn't stay idle at all. As I used them to slowly pull down her skirt, I saw that she was wearing nice pink panties. Without hesitation, I used my agility to pull off my pants as Shiori sat down across my length and started rocking her hips. The arousal blooming on her face instantly, she no longer tries to keep her cold and indifferent look on her face. I pulled her closer, trapping her body in contact with mine. No argument rose from her lips, not that it was surprising. They were serving as my amusement following the lead of my lips in a merciless tango. I could feel her arousal rising unchained, especially as we had the maid asleep on the same couch as us. As Shiori took off my boxes, it was the time to start the main dish. I simply ripped her cute panties. I lifted her, my cock jumping upright immediately. Then, a negligent push later, her slit was free for an unbound push. I pressed my shaft on her entrance, but waited for her to realize what was going on. Our lips separate for a second, just enough for her to moan. Yes. Her moan was filled with arousal and a little panic, the confirmation that she was trying to project turning into a weak echo, drowning the pleasure. You can do whatever you want to me, Yami. So be it. I said to her as, with my shaft inside of her, I took her to the bedroom, and we separated as I pushed her on the bed, her arms pushing to bed in reflex, which had the added benefit of forcing her to the doggy position. And then, without waiting for her to answer, I pushed into her mercilessly, earning a cry that would be hit trending if I had any mercy. Yes, yes, yes. She repeated like a mantra with every time I slammed inside her, her tits trying to move freely, only to be prevented by her bra and white top. But interestingly, every time she repeated the confirmation, it sounded less like it, and more like a moan of pleasure. I slammed inside her again and again, and soon, the only sound that left her mouth was wordless cries filled with unbounded pleasure. Still, the quickness of her mood change was the best indicator of her love to her husband, me. Her hips swayed back and forth in the same pace as my beats, pushing my shaft deeper into her. Even her token attempts to keep her voice low didn't last long. Her voice loud enough to rattle the windows as I pushed inside her again and again. The maid was definitely awake by now. I decided it was time to catch a vision of her beautiful breasts. So I reached for the hooks of her bra, opening it with a soft touch. Her flimsy bra opened and fell on the bed as I ripped her white top too. I leaned and grabbed her breasts, sinking deep into her beautiful flesh. Her nipples hard against my palm. Struck with a desire to see her face, I pulled out. She let out a disappointed cry that tempted me to tease her with a session of denied orgasm. But after all the fruitless sessions, I was just as enthusiastic as her. So I just pushed her to her side. Not expecting, she tumbled finding herself lying on her back. Seeing her face, with such an erotic expression, my shaft got even harder before sliding inside her once more. How do you feel, princess? I asked even as I slid my full length inside her. I feel amazing Yami. I was nervous at first, but now this is amazing. She answered with a calm voice, but her face, contorted with pleasure, clued me that it was far from her actual feelings. The repeated gusts of pleasure escaping from her lips, uncaring about the presence of the person who was sleeping, was just a bonus. I pushed deeper into her even as I leaned forward, capturing her lips with a searing kiss. This time, there was no mediocre kiss as her lips counted mine. Her body was covered in sweat and other liquids from both of our bodies. Looking at her beautiful perfect body, enhanced my pleasure even further. I doubted that I would, nor wanted to be able to pull away from her. But it doesn't matter. I want this too. You love this, right? I asked. I do, with all my heart. She answered a statement that might be comfortable if it wasn't for an earth-shattering moan following it. I started using my medical knowledge to raise her pleasure and arousal at even higher levels. I finally let my cum fill her, triggering a mirroring climax in her. Her cries rose unbidden as her hands found my shoulders, her fingers digging deep. I stilled as my load filled her insides. That was nice, I said as I pulled out, my strong body already pushing for a second boner. It was amazing. She murmured, her fatigue finally set in as she was breathing heavily. I just raise a questioning eyebrow at this. What is this was stuff? I will let you rest for a couple of minutes, and we will be doing it again. I said to her with a smirk on my face. Oh Yami you are so bad, said Shiori, though her words took a different meaning once she cupped her breast and extended her finger towards Yami, mentioning him to come back. Yami POV. Two days later, after two days, me and Shiori reached Kanova. We definitely had a lot of fun along the way, and thanks to my medical jutsu she can walk straight again. And I learned something very important during this journey of mine, and that lesson is that it would take a lot of time for me to get bored of Shiori. So that means that she will be good for me for the next 20 years. Then her boobs will start sagging, her skin wrinkles, but that doesn't matter, since I will have fun with her as she is young. When we arrived in Kanoha, we had changed to a normal horse carriage when getting close to Kanoha, so we didn't draw attention with the giant lizard and house. That thing was my creation, after all as the leader of the blood swamp. I don't rule just over mosquitoes, bats and leeches. 
There are many more creatures that live in a swamp, and the strange lizard is one of them. Anyway, as the carriage got inside Kanoha, it immediately followed a separate road towards the Inuzuka compound. As we arrived at my mansion, I saw Tsum waiting at the front gates. She has a pissed off expression on her face. Oh right, I did kinda get married even after we have a daughter together. Oh well, maybe she should have tried harder to become stronger. So she didn't have to worry about stuff like this. I mean look at me I am all kinds of messed up. And no women in their right mind would marry me after being such a dick. And literally making it almost obviously clear. That I only valued her looks. But I know that Shiori will never cheat on me. And that is because I am powerful I am so powerful. That she wouldn't even dare look at another man. I am so powerful that I can destroy the daimyo's family whenever I want. Especially now that she knows a part of my political power. She is the only non-ninja who has the knowledge of how influential I truly am. I get out of the carriage and walk past Zoom with my hands in my pockets. While trying to whistle the Game of Thrones song sadly. I seem to be failing at trying to make the whistle sound anything like it. Hum well this will be a nice cat fight. But sadly. I don't have the time to watch it. They will resolve it by themselves. And I know Soom won't kill my wife, who is also the daimyo's daughter. I mean Soom isn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. But she isn't that dumb either, she is someone who grew up with me after all. Two days pass like this, and during that time I had my wedding, and all of the clan heads and a lot of people I know showed up. My wedding was horrendously boorish, so I sent a shadow clone to take my place. During that time I just spent my time following Shiro around, the little shit didn't show up at my wedding. So I thought I would look for him. Lo and behold I found him in a trash can alive and surprisingly drunk. How did he even get his hands on alcoholic drinks? Anyway it seems like there is only 6 months left until an event that I must interfere must happen. 6 months later, I am currently in a hot tub with a paper in my hand. I couldn't stop at the maniacal after coming out of me. Ha 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 this is IT this is amazing. Thankfully I was alone in my mansion, so no one could hear me laughing. My plans can finally move once again. I can start finally acting again, I just got out of the hot tub, and due to the very hot water my body was releasing steam. Still, I just walked out of the room, and walked amongst the hallways. Soon, Shiori, the maid and my daughters have gone outside to meet with the so-called Kanoha's Women's Association. It's something pretty silly. But apparently all women in Kanoha who have husbands who are all a ninja gathering together. I obviously spy on them. It is mostly talking about tea, gossip and bad mouthing each other behind their backs. The paper is still on my hand as I walk down the stairs and go all the way down to the basement. When I enter there, I see my laboratory. But in actuality it is just a cover up. I go towards one side of the room and release my chakra. That triggers the seals that appear all over the room. They start checking different things. And when it is all over and done with. I just jump down a hole that opens up in the ground. But as soon as I jump down. I hit a layer of liquid. It is just another secret check. And after that. I finally enter my real laboratory. During all of this time I notice that I still have the paper on my hand. I can't help but smile as I reread it once again. Mission of the Kanabi Bridge. Delivery slash investigation mission. Unexpected events. Rin Nahara was kidnapped by enemy ninja. It was illogical. And it is assumed that this happened due to the carnal desires of the enemy ninja. Or maybe an information leaker. Team members. Abito Uchiha, Rin Nahara, Kakashi Hattic. Deaths. Abito Uchiha, body not recovered. Results. Unexpectedly Kakashi Hattic has one of the Sharingan of Abito Uchiha. This matter will be investigated further by the Uchiha clan head, Fugaku Uchiha. Ha 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 ha, Abito Uchiha is dead finally. I was so worried that I had changed too much of the timeline. I even had to manipulate a little for Minato's team to take this mission. Plus I had to manipulate the events so Minato would be busy during this moment. Ha 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 it worked out as expected. Though I was worried a little during the execution of the events. In the end everything ended up okay. I use fire chakra to burn the paper to crisp as I look at my lab. There is not a lot of light in here. So I just flick a switch in the wall next to me and BZZT. As the lights came on what I saw was dozens of pods filled with Ichiha bodies. And not just any Achiha, it was a Beto Achiha, I look at the capsules filled with clones. I have been making people genetically the same, or as they are usually called clones. I have been making them for quite some time, especially Achiha clones. But sadly they don't have a soul, their brain is running, and they are perfectly healthy, only the soul is missing. Now how does someone make a soul? Well I don't. I have recently come to a conclusion, they are cones so they can't wake up because I can't create a soul yet. Which is sadly something that I haven't worked out yet. I have observed a lot of pregnancies, and learned that during the 6 week the soul is created. But how is IT done there is no definite answer. Something that I need to figure out, after all. The unknown is only something that we haven't discovered yet. So I have been trying to make them the clones of Abito. A combination of shadow clone and real clone. By using Abito's chakra. I have quite a bit of it that I have gotten, enough to activate around 10 clones. But I haven't done so yet. 
Because I need to wait for Madara to die first before I do something like that. After all, he is as dangerous as people can get, so it's better that I don't underestimate him. I go towards one of the bodies. In the capsule the clones are all naked, and have tubes all around their bodies, to give them the necessary supplements to keep them alive, also they have a breathing mask on, due to me having to use a machine to help them breathe. I also have clones of different Achiha in some other rooms. This is my Sharingan factory. So now I just need to learn eyes and army, and I can go around confidently and start being brave. Surprisingly, if someone has already awakened his Sharingan, the clone will have it too. I walk past dozens of Abido clones. I already have countermeasures against them if they somehow wake up and revolt. But there is no plan to wake them up by using Abido's chakra anytime soon. After walking past them I go into the other room. I go through some procedure Fujutsu identification. When I enter this one I see men with long dark hair in capsules. This is full of Hashirama Senju clones. I have already figured out how to replicate Hashirama cells. Just a little bit more and I can start truly creating human souls and bodies. Becoming God that will be the first step when I can do that. I will start truly climbing the stairway to divinity. Slowly but surely, I will understand and control chakra to its highest caliber. I will become omnipotent and omnipresent. After finishing the regular checkup on the clones, the other clones were unimportant, most of them were just Minato, Fugaku, Mikoto, Kishina, Hachi, Tsunade, Killer B, A, and some others. Not really as big of a collection as I plan to make it. I also didn't risk making any clone of me. Because if I did that, it might actually just be me creating my own downfall. After all, if I was a clone, I would definitely kill the original and take over everything he has worked to accomplish. That is why sadly I can't ever create a clone of mine, or they will take me over. I never underestimate my enemies especially someone like myself. They will be the most dangerous of enemies. After some time, I get out of my lab, and the first thing I actually did is put on some clothes. I decided to walk outside. I see that everything is normal. I take a deep breath and fosh. I activate my sensing abilities to my full potential him, so Guy is actually in the village. I haven't seen him lately ever since he became a Jonin. Well he became one at the same age of Kakashi, both holding the record of the second youngest Jonin promotion, the first youngest being held by me. Three months later I am currently eating at one of the restaurants, which I own, which has a view of the Kanoha gates. Like usual I am eating as much as 10 people, my modified metabolism in Jongu, working hard to turn this all into protein to build my muscles and support my growing body. I eat a whole T-bone steak in one bite as my teeth turn jagged like a shark to break down the bones. While still looking at the gate without even blinking, I just control my finger to molecularly transform into a bone fork as I start eating some broccoli too. Munch 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 finally. The one I have been waiting for comes in Kakashi. A smirk takes form on my face as Fosh in a black flash. Next to my table a shadow clone of mine appears. He also has a vial of blood in his hand as he throws it towards me. I easily catch it, and immediately my smile widens as I look at my clone. Come on now, be careful will you? What if this thing hit the ground? My shadow clone looks at me with a questioning look as if saying, Have you gone crazy or something? You know that you are technically talking to yourself right? The clone just shakes his head and dispels himself. That dick when I get his memories. I see that he took this vial of blood. After Abito gained his Manjekyo Sharingan. So when I make a clone it will have his Manjekyo too at least that is how it is supposed to work. Finally I can finally get the Manjekyo I always wanted. Also from the memories of my clone. I see that Abito still seems to have the same ability as he did during the canon timeline. After all, he did run through those Miss Ninja's attacks like they were nothing. I just look at Kakashi again he has a hollow and traumatized look in his eyes. But that doesn't matter. That is such a small sacrifice that I am willing to make so it doesn't matter. Ha 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 I am so happy, finally I get one of the Manjekyo abilities I have always wanted. Immediately walk back to my mansion, I go to my laboratory. I don't even talk to my daughters or Shiori. This is something way more important, after all, children and wives are replaceable, opportunities like this are not. In the lab I walk towards the lab room with only a coffin in it, and a Funjutsu array around it. Also all around the corners of the room are old looking computers. I just walk towards one of the computers and turn on all the machines. I have Kamui now only Kodamatsu Kami left 3 months later. I am currently in my backyard, getting a small tan. I just look at Shiro as he is rolling around in the grass playing with Hana and Jiruchi. Though I know that Shiro is generally very sinful, shitty and doesn't even have a lot of really nice character traits. He still knows better than acting any more than a normal dog in front of my daughters, will likely get him beat severely or even killed. He knows how dangerous I can be, and I don't tolerate behavior like that. After all, I kill humans without a second thought, what is just another dog added to it? Shiro knows that he is no longer useful to me, so he is on thin rope. Of course as long as he doesn't go against my interests, I will keep him around. He is after all, my Ninkin and as strong as an elite Jonin, or even possibly a weak S rank. Also I have noticed that the war is taking a toll on all the participating nations. Economy and income is falling down. Though cannon fodder ninja can be created almost endlessly to fight in the war, the economy and trade is a different thing. 
They will continue to drop, and then some hidden villages don't have the economy to support their ninja, so after that they are doomed. Money truly does make the world turn around I noticed, and have been notified by my spy network, that the war is going to stop soon, just because of the worsening economy. This is hilarious to me. After all, no matter how many ninja died to bravely sacrifice their lives, that didn't contribute at all. Their lives were worthless, and no one except their families will remember them. One month later, as I am walking down the road after another burial of the cannon fodder, Kanoha buried them all at once, so the Hokage didn't have to show at each of their funerals. Even death is cruel to the weak, thankfully I don't plan dying or ever being weak. Suddenly I sense the strong emotions from a certain direction. I activate one of my numerous spice seals that I have around Kanoha, and look at who that is oh. It's just Itachi. He seems to be looking down a cliff with a depressed face. Hum, is this the moment when he jumps from that one scene in the Arnie Mare, and he understands the meaning of life? Well then, General POV. While Itachi is looking down the cliff he contemplates. What is life, what is death, there is no meaning in life. Are we all meant to die anyway? So is killing not bad? But why? In the war, why were people dying? We are all going to die anyway, so why live at all? He looks down the cliff suddenly he hears footsteps, and immediately he turns around looking at where they are coming from. He sees a man with black slightly spiky hair and black pupilless eyes. He is wearing casual clothes, and he has a Kanoha headband on his forehead, but there was nothing else that even remotely expressed, that he is a ninja of Kanoha. His posture is relaxed, and he even walks like normal, no indication of being on guard at all. But he must obviously be. After all, even I know who Yami Inuzuka is. But why is he here? Analyses Atachi thinking of the different possibilities. Yami just gives a casual wave towards Atachi. Yo, Atachi sees this. But he decides that it is better if he acted polite. So he greeted back. Hello, Yami-sama. When Yami sees this he just joins in boredom. Why are you here kid? Asks Yami getting straight to the point though he already knew the reason. He still wants to see how Itachi's mind is working. And if he is any different from the canon timeline. When he hears Yami ask that Itachi just looks down a little and asks. Yami-sama you are a smart guy right? Yami just shrugs as he walks closer to Itachi. Well I would like to think that I am. Says Yami completely casually. He just arrived in front of Itachi and ruffled his hair. What is the meaning of life? Asks Itachi with a tone of urgency on his voice. Yami just shrugs for the fourth time since this meeting. I dunno. Everyone has a different interpretation of life. Why? Would you like to find out? Itachi nods. Yami just shrugs and suddenly he kicks Itachi lightly on the chest, just enough to push him away fwosh, and throw him over the cliff. Itachi immediately dropped down like a rock. Yami just comes to the edge of the cliff, seeing Itachi falling. As he tries to save his own life, Yami just puts his hands in his pockets. And fwosh, he jumps down too. Unlike Itachi, he didn't slow his fall at all. So he plummeted down, his body accelerating even more. Boom and before Itachi reaches the bottom, Yami is already there inside a giant crater. With no injuries on him whatsoever. He looks at Itachi uses kunai trying to slow down his fall. And he is successful as crows start to surround Itachi when he lands on the ground. There is absolute shock, fear and even a little final realization in his face. He looks towards Yami with a neutral look on his face, as if this wasn't the guy who just pushed him down a cliff. No one wants to die right? Asks Itachi as a crow lands on his shoulder. Yami just nods at this. Yep, you can be assured of that at least. And suddenly Yami's body starts turning to dust as he just says to Itachi. Don't worry about inevitable things like death, life or things like that. You are a kid, so stop thinking about stuff you don't understand. One month later, inside the Hokage's office there was a gathering of all the Kanoha Jonin. Of course Yami was there too, as the Hokage announced. The five great elemental nations have reached a peace treaty the third ninja war is over. Immediately, even though they were all Jonin there were celebrations all around. Some even hugged each other, no longer holding themselves presentable in front of the Hokage. But Hiruzen didn't mind this as even he himself couldn't help as a smile appeared on his face. Peace at last. Thinks Hiruzen as he looks at a certain Inuzuka Jonin, Yami, who has a smile on his face too. When Hiruzen notices this, he cannot help but think. Even he doesn't want the war to continue, and that says something about it. Yami POV lying has really become easy now. I can lie to anyone I want, and they wouldn't notice I am lying. Of course. I already had news of the war situation, so I predicted, correctly, that the war would be over soon and it was. Now there are just a couple more steps for my plan. That day I returned to my house, after giving Itachi a lesson. I owed it to him I did fuck his mom after all. But of course my real reason is because I need to see how he gets the Tetsuka blade and the Yata mirror. I need to see how it is possible to get those types of spiritual weapons. I haven't truly figured it out yet. I don't know where to even begin with something like this. So I need to at least see a close example of how this is. When I enter inside my small mansion, I open the door and enter the house. Currently, it seems like Tsum is with my daughters in the backyard. 
while my beautiful wife Shiori seems to be in the living room reading a book. I just casually walk through the corridor and go towards the living room where Shiori is. I see her sitting on the couch as she reads the book and Romeo and Juliet her, huh? she doesn't seem to notice me. Well then how about, I just walk behind her and hug her neck. How is my beautiful wife doing today? I whisper to Shiori sweetly. She gets startled a little. Oh, it's you Yami so is the war over. When I hear her say that my smile widens. I easily jump over the couch and grab Shiori and lie down on the couch with her on top of me. Hey don't do this Yami. What if the girls see us? Says Shiori slightly panicked at the prospect of my daughters or Tsun seeing us do something inappropriate. I just grab the book that she has in her hand and throw it away. And without even needing to look. I know that the book lands perfectly on the table and ask her. So tell me my smart wife how did you come to a conclusion like that? She smiles too, feeling a little pride in her ability to come to that conclusion. She lays her head on my chest. Well honey. I might not know how ninjas work, but I do know how management and economics work. It was just another as you usually say logical conversation. I just kiss her on the top of her head and relax my body, with Shiori on top of me. Hem you would make a good daimyo. Shiori just chuckles a little at this. My brothers are not going to just suddenly die, so I would conveniently be the next in line for succession. Nope, the next daimyo will be our child. But I obviously didn't say that to her, so I just reassured her. That would make you sad, so I obviously won't do that. Uh, uh, she just nods at this. She is a surprisingly tough nut to crack, I have tried everything except memory manipulation to make her fall in love with me. But even though we have a very active sex life, I am 100% sure that she doesn't really love me. Talk about a sociopath how huh? we have been together for quite a while, and I even treat her nice. But she has no feelings towards me. Of course, she isn't dumb enough to do something against me. She has learned about how harsh I can be to people who try to work against my interests. Actually, she generally works well with the businesses that I have given her to manage. The income of those has gone up by 30% since she has started managing them. Anyway, I just touch her throat slightly, giving her chills. She feels uncomfortable with people touching her neck. But I do it to sometimes remind her who is in charge. You know my dear wife, I think that we should start trying for a child soon. What do you think about that? She knows that I am not really asking, so she agrees. Of course. Do you think that we should begin tonight? I smirk at that. How about right now? She takes her head off my chest and looks at my eyes. She sees my eyes and nods. Though she hasn't noticed the changes. I have slowly been putting her dominant personality under control by showing my alpha actions and personality. After all, humans are just evolved animals, so they still have the instinct to follow someone who expresses a dominant personality and seems to be confident in their decisions. They also like people who seem perfect and never make slash admit to a mistake publicly. Shiori relaxes again and lies down on top of me. So do you plan to become Hokage now? I don't think that the third Hokage will be for much longer, his approval rating has plummeted, so I think that he will be replaced soon. You would be a perfect replacement for him. And there it is that instinctual manipulate. She doesn't even need to try, she does it subconsciously. I shake my head. Nope, this time I am not gonna compete. Ham, so the next election then? She asks as she coddles on my chest. Maybe. I answer her, not really giving her a clear answer. She just pouts at that. Come on, tell me. Whines Shiori. I just smoke at that. Well, I haven't decided yet. Ah, whines Shiori even more. That is a lie, even I can tell that. You are such a tease. If I know one thing about you is that you plan 100 steps ahead. I just mockingly frown at Shiori and even make a sad tear appear on my eye. Why must even my wife think so lowly of me after all I always plan at least 1000 steps ahead. One month later, General POV. During this time all of Konoha was in celebration. Not only did the third ninja war end, but the next Hokage will be chosen. Now contrary to the ninja, who think that the Hokage was too passive and not decisive enough during the war. Plus the deal that he struck with the Rakage only to be betrayed later didn't do too good to his reputation. But to the civilians who don't really know or care about stuff like that, they love the third Hokage. He is after all kind and has made a lot of decisions that better the life of a civilian ninja. After all, if he was bad at everything containing the job of a Hokage, he would have been booted from the position a long time ago. But recently, the ninja have been too unsatisfied with him recently, so instead of starting some infighting with his supporters and non-supporters, Hiruzen decided to step down. The last thing he wants is to see his own comrades fight against each other. That is why the daimyo has traveled all the way to Konoha. He has been staying with his son-in-law, Yami. Currently he is in a meeting with the village elders. Hiruzen, the village elders, some powerful nobles of the Land of Fire and some of his advisors. They are currently discussing who will be Hokage. They were all sitting in a rectangular shaped table, with the current Hokage on one head side and the Daimyo on the other, representing that they are the people with the most power in here, while the others all sat to the sides. As the meeting has started, Hiruzen is the first to speak as he announces. The ones viable to be the next Hokage are, Minato Namikas, Jiraiya, Orochimaru, Yami Inuzuka and Fugaku Uchiha. 
but Yami Inuzuka and Jiraiya have pulled out of the race immediately, saying that they don't want to be the next Hokage. Hiruzen breathed a sigh of relief inside himself, because Yami decided to not participate in the race. But there is also Orochimaru he knows that Orochimaru is also too cold to be Hokage too. Even though Orochimaru is his favorite student, Hiruzen knows that Orochimaru would be too risky to have as a Hokage too he could actually be even worse than Yami as a Hokage. Thinks Hiruzen, planning on how to drop Orochimaru out of the race too. General POV. After Hiruzen made that announcement, the meeting officially started. The daimyo is the first to speak after that. He has a paper fan in his hands, and he uses it to cover his mouth as he says, Hum, it seems like my son-in-law won't be participating in this. That truly makes me sad. I think he would make an amazing Hokage. But he told me that the main reason why he didn't accept was because if he did become Hokage, he wouldn't be able to spend time with his wife. So I am able to understand him he is a newlywed after all. Ho ha ho ho. The others just nod at this even though what the daimyo just said would be taken as offensive if anyone else in this room said it. But the daimyo isn't really part of those rules. Anyway, who would you like to suggest now? Asks the daimyo, talking about choosing the future cage of Kanoha like he is talking about the weather. One of the nobles suggests, how about Fugaku Achiha? The Achiha clan has been loyal to Kanoha in the land of fire for generations. Hum the daimyo just hums at this, as if he is thinking about it. When in reality he is thinking about whom Yami told him would be a good cage after many hours of discussion. They debated many options, advantages and disadvantages every candidate has. Finally there was a decision at 56% votes for Minato, 30% for Fugaku and 14% Orochimaru. But the daimyo still hadn't given his vote, so there is that. Plus some nobles might decide to change their votes. So they can please the daimyo who knows. Maybe they might even get rewarded by the daimyo. Due to their friendship, the daimyo seems to be thinking a little. Hum, but finally he just said, I decide to nominate Minato as the next Hokage. One week later, Minato is currently atop the Hokage Tower, addressing the crowd below him he still can't believe it. His dream is literally coming true in front of his eyes. He sees so many people gathered here for his coronation ceremony. He cannot help but feel a little nervous at this. Next to him was Kishina comforting him. She had a noticeable bump on her belly signifying that she is pregnant already. Come on now, Minato, be brave, go there and dominate, says Kishina patting Minato on the back. But Minato's face becomes even paler. What if I slip while walking up there or something like that? That will be all I will be remembered for, no matter how good of a hokage I am. Kishina just raises a questioning eyebrow at this. You do know that as an s rank ninja saying something like that is stupid. You have the best reflexes in Kanora. Don't be stupid by saying something like that. On the other hand, Yami had a whole different problem to deal with. He was currently in his house sitting on his dinner table. His daughters and Sume had gone to Minato's coronation ceremony. They also took Shiro with them. So it is only Yami and Shiori, his wife, in the mansion. They had food in front of them but neither of them touched it. Suddenly Shiori frowns a little and says, So I noticed that Sium has a baby bump you wouldn't know anything about that now would you? Yami just casually shrugs. Well I don't have any idea. He starts eating his meal after saying that. Shiori still doesn't do anything as she asks again. I see but isn't Hana yours and Sium's daughter? As you can see, that seems a little suspicious to me. Yami just looks completely calm at the subtle accusations his wife is sending him. Well that is true. But you know that ever since I married you, I haven't really done anything sexual with her. Shiori doesn't even hide her suspicion as she looks at Yami very intensely. Is that so yep, plus why would I care who Tsum sleeps with now? After all, me and her are done as far as I am concerned, says Yami as he takes another bite of his steak. Shiori's eyes drip with suspicion, she doesn't trust Yami at all on this. I married you even though you already have two kids, and I never treated them bad. I even let you live in the same house as one of your ex-lovers whom you already had a child with before. Now she is pregnant again. And you expect me to think that it had nothing to do with you you know that we are expecting a child together. So why do this to me when I have been only nice and accepting to you? Says Shiori even as tears started dripping from her eyes as she said the last part. So please I beg of you Yami please tell me the truth. Yami suddenly stops eating. He still has an absolutely calm face on him even while Shiori sobs in front of him. So you want to know the truth? Huh? Asks Yami. And contrary to her expectations, Shiori strangely feels an icy cold feeling crawl up her spine, as Yami continues saying. The truth is that I don't really love you. Shiori looks hurt by this, as she can't even look at Yami's face anymore. But Yami still continues. I married you because of the benefits that you have as the daimyo's daughter. You have nothing special, and you also aren't as smart as you think. Shiori just covered her face as tears flew down her face. Did I do it with Tsum? Absolutely yes I did. I fucked her in our bed, where we sleep. It isn't anything against you or your beauty. But I do know that you don't love me. I can confidently say that you will never love me. Me and you, we are the same. Just different sides of the same coin. So yes, I do know what I did, do I regret it? Nope, absolutely not. Suddenly Shiori stops crying as she looks at Yami. You never loved me. She was surprised at this, after all, Yami expresses a lot of physical love towards her. She gets angry at this, and Shiori gets an idea. And without thinking she asks Yami. Then tell me dear husband, 
How would you feel if I cheated on you with another man? Maybe then you will understand how I feel. Yami just shrugs. Well then, I would have to torture you and slowly rip my child out of you. While you continuously scream in agony. I will also have a couple of horses and other animals ready to rape you to death. I will also kill and torture everyone you have ever loved. That would make us a great example. Maybe my next wife wouldn't dare do something against me. After I make an example out of you. Says Yami casually. Shiori's eyes widened and her pupils dilated. She is absolutely terrified when Yami says that. She had almost forgotten that she is married to the best killer Kanoha has. But now. She is harshly reminded. Yami suddenly just smirks again at Shiori. Also. Yami smiles menacingly. Also there is something you must understand my dear Shiori. You belong to me. Your pussy, mouth, blood and flesh everything of yours is mine. Suddenly Yami's maniacal expression calms down as he leans back on his chair. And it isn't because you are a woman or because you are my wife I have you because I want you. It's because I'm strong. I am so strong that not even your father will be able to do anything against me. I can ruin the land of fire and sink it into poverty whenever I want. I hold the rabid dogs of the land of fire under a tight leash. I can also let them go whenever I want. Says Yami casually, he has a cold glint in his eyes, as he sees Shiori look at her hands terrified. She finally understands the situation she is in, so she can't help but feel abject despair, finally understanding what monster she has married. Yami on the other hand, just hides his smirk. He knows that Shiori has a dominant personality, so it is unlikely she will listen to Yami for a long time. But her fear of Yami will keep her in line. She is someone who Yami truly understands. After all, living with her for some time has helped him get a grasp on her personality. In a couple of years she will suppress her fear and start working against me. Well it doesn't matter. I already put failsafes on her. Just in case she decides to do something that is unfavorable for me. Think Yami, planning on how to manipulate her. Shiori isn't someone who is likely to be easily manipulated. Especially since they are together almost 24 sevenths. Hum. But I truly did cheat on her. Sadly for her she isn't strong enough so she has no right to complain. After all. I am not going to suppress my urges for my wife or something like that. I finally got power and have to restrict myself even when I have power then why the hell would I even need power if I won't use IT. Thinks Yami as he plans on cheating on Shiori again with another woman. This time though he will not have a child with them. His plan is to create Kiba and after that he will stop having so many children anymore due to them not being useful anymore. Yawn Yami gets up after yawning leaving a shocked Shiori alone well. He will obviously never let someone like his wife alone. If she did something stupid like cheat on him well he won't necessarily care. He will kill her and the perpetrator as well as his family. But unlike killing, if the rumors start spreading, it won't be easy to quell them so easily. Shiori should be glad that she is still useful to me if she wasn't while well, people always have accidents. Schemes Yami. Thinking of a way to kill Shiori, he knows that eventually he will have to kill her. She will obviously get older and less attractive, so he will then need a new wife. Divorces aren't exactly a thing in this world. People separate constantly, but after marriage, the woman can only run away and subsequently hunted down by her husband or clan. But Yami will never allow Shiori to run. That will cause too much political unrest and trouble for him. So it would be easier to have her killed and deem it as an accident. Three months later, Yami POV I just look at the surrounding room. My big living room actually. The pregnant Sume and Shiori are here, and so are my daughters, Yuruchi and Hana. We are currently all sitting in a half circle comfortable red couch, with a low rectangular table in the middle. We are all playing cards. I am currently intentionally losing. This will make me seem more normal and approachable to my family. They will see me as human and not some monster that does nothing wrong and they can't understand. After all, humans usually don't act nice when they encounter something they don't understand. Minato has been Hokage for three months already, and I can't really say that he has been doing a good job at it. I mean he is better than Hiruzen, so the ninja have a low standard which he passes with flying colors. He is also good with the civilians, so that is going good but Kanoha isn't experiencing some golden period or something like that. I remember that back in the anime, Minato was praised by everyone, but it seems that as I expected, he wasn't that good at leading Kanoha. I mean I have to admit that he has been trained his whole life to be a killer, so in comparison, he is doing a pretty good job if you take that into account. But if it was me the one sitting in that chair well I am about to create a miracle management by this world's standards. As I am thinking this suddenly a shaking sound is heard all around the table. Contrary to my family's, my expression hasn't really changed. I have been expecting this for this whole month. I would have to be a certain type of stupid to not prepare for this situation. Roya a very loud and terrifying roar is heard, and a malicious chakra with killing intent descends, making my family freeze in place even Sume who is a special Jonin. Though the killing intent doesn't really affect me, I still immediately disperse it with my own chakra and make four shadow clones that grab Shiori, Sume, Hana and Jiruchi to take them away. Sume is the first to ask Yami with a desperate look on her face. What is going on? My clone who is holding her just says, 
Most likely an enemy attack, judging by the chakra, it must be a tailed beast inside the village. Before Tsum can say any more my clones use the Horatian and disappear in a dark flash. Then I too am surrounded by a dark flash and fwosh, I appear at the top of the Hokage Tower. Hirazan is there too, together with Samanbu. He says, we need to take the nine tails out of the village. Before he can say anything anymore I say, I will take care of it and also, I make a hand sign and poof, I am covered in a large cloud of smoke which when it clears out, there are hundreds of my shadow clones. I just swish my arm sideways and say, save the people of Kanoha. Fwash they all disappear in a dark flash. Then I just bite my thumb and clasp my hand on the ground. Poof this time the whole Hokage Tower is surrounded in an even bigger cloud of smoke. Out of it come 10 giant bats as big as trucks, a mosquito lady and a giant red leech. That has wrapped itself around the Hokage Tower. I just look towards the nine tails. It suddenly also looks towards me. I just smirk at it mockingly. Wanna dance little fox? General POV Yami looks at the nine tails. His eyes shining with a dangerous light in them. He looks at his summons. Leech disperse yourself and heal the people of Kanoa. Orders Yami. The leech immediately splits itself into many smaller leeches and starts healing the injured. Yami plans to become the main player in this tragedy. He plans to turn it into his advantage and cover Minato's accomplishments in this. Mosquito Sage, use your mosquitoes to save as many people as you can. Try searching in obscure places like under buildings and such. Continues Yami. He looks at the female-looking Mosquito Sage, the Mosquito Sage, in the eyes. He knows that this is the most likely of his summons to try and plot against him. So he gives her a hidden warning by saying, Be careful. To the ninja around Yami, it seems like he is worried about her, but the Mosquito Sage knows better. Even though she has never done something against Yami's interests, Yami has already noticed her intentions and has made it pretty clear to her that he will kill her if she either steps out of line or stops being useful to him. The Mosquito Sage just smiles nervously at Yami. She has known Yami for a while now, and even with her rebellious thoughts that come out now and then, all she needs is just a look from Yami, and that will calm all of her crazy rebellious thoughts. She also doesn't want to end up like the Leech Sage, who is just a machine and tool for Yami. Finally she decides to fly away and spread most of her mosquitoes around Kanoha to try and save as many people as they can. The last, the Bat Sage just nods at Yami already understanding its duty of having to protect the Inyazuka clan compound. The other Inyazuka Jonin have already summoned the rest of his Bat clan, so he already knows the premise of what is going on. While that was happening the Nine Tails has already charged up a Tailed Beast Bomb and thrown it towards Yami. The Tailed Beast Bomb obliterated everything in its path, as if the world itself was making way for the Ball of Destruction. The ninjas and Ambu too are scared as they try to dodge the Ball of Destruction. Yami just narrows his eyes at this and does three hand signs, then he takes a Horatian Kunai in his hands, and does the Tiger Hand sign. The Tailed Beast Bomb has almost reached Yami. But that is when a strange Fuenjutsu mark appears in front of Yami. Fwashin the giant ball of chakra is immediately taken away. Not by the Horatian technique, but by a reverse summoning seal towards one of the Horatian seals in the ocean. Immediately the ninja behind Yami let out a sigh of relief, after all of that thing landed in the Hokage mountain behind them. Then the area of destruction from the Tail Beast Bomb would reach the whole Kanova. One Tail Beast Bomb is all that is needed to completely destroy Kanova. Roar the Nine Tails roars towards Yami. Sending a giant sound move about as strong as an S rank when Jutsu towards him. Yami does another couple of hand signs and slowly a barrier forms in front of him, sealing the wind wave in and locking it. That is when Hiruzen decides to take action and says, Yami, if I got you close to the Nine Tails would you be able to teleport it outside of Kanoha using the Horatian? Yami frowns for a split second, and after thinking about it he says, Yes, but teleporting something like the Nine Tails is bound to cost me almost all of my chakra, but I believe I can move it outside of Kanoha. The Shadow Clones and Summons took their toll on my chakra reserves too. Hiruzen has a grave look on his face as he nods. Maybe I judged him too early after all. It is said that only in a time of crisis, does someone show their true selves thinks Hiruzen, contemplating if he maybe has let Yami's killing of Danzo cloud his judgment, when it came to Yami. Hiruzen bites his finger and slams his hand on the ground poof summons Enma, and when the monkey sees the grave situation, before he even has time to think about his next action he hears Hiruzen say, Enma, adamantine staff. Poof Enma immediately transforms into it, and Hiruzen uses the staff by simply jumping high up and saying, maximum expand, the staff immediately expands too as thick as a bus. Hiruzen throws it towards the Nine Tails, who just swipes sideways and changes the direction of the giant staff. The Nine Tails then looks at Hiruzen, but suddenly as the staff's tip was pointing towards the Nine Tails wash, the staff extends bomb. The staff directly hits the Nine Tails. Hiruzen then does 20 hand signs. Hell swamps suddenly below the Nine Tails' feet, the earth turns into quicksand and tendrils of mud, slowly grasp the Nine Tails' legs holding them in place. Yami now, screams Hiruzen, telling Yami that is his chance. Yami just throws dozens of kunai towards the Nine Tails. Fwash he disappeared in a black flash next to his kunai, and he then appeared on top of the Nine Tails. Fwash and in a dark flash both Yami and the Nine Tails disappeared on the other hand around the village, Yami's clones are running around saving people all over, saving people from debris and other things. 
One of the clones even notices Makoto carrying what seems to be a baby he is Sasuke, Yami's useful tool Yami's clone, sees a big piece of debris falling towards Makoto, and is about to go save her, when, Foshe's small figure jumps towards the giant debris and Balm completely destroys it. The clone's eyes widen when he sees who the small figure is it is Itachi, using chakra to strengthen his muscles. Talk about monstrous talent, thinks the clone as he goes to help someone else. After all, Yami wants to be saving people, and then engraves himself and the citizens of Konoha as their savior, by the way he acts. On the other side, Yami, just transported the Nine Tails out of Konoha. Around 500 meters away, he also seems to be sweating and breathing heavily. Yami POV. This is all an act, though it takes around 20% of my natural chakra. I do easily have tailed beast levels chakra, due to my hearts that I have. I still haven't even used any of my chakra from the 100 strength seal. No wonder Minato gave his life to seal the nine tails during the canon timeline. He knew he couldn't outlast the monster. Anyway, I teleported the nine tails away but only 500 meters, so I still get the glory. But the plans also go along as they are supposed to. After teleporting the Nine Tails, and analyzing the situation, I immediately start to draw Sage Chakra from the seal on my belly. My hair extended into a spiky stupor. Under my eyes, dark red markings appear as my chakra levels spike up. I again immediately do a couple of more hand signs slowly. A blood-like swamp appears below the nine tails, and it starts getting Kurama stuck in. But the fox just uses its many tails to thrash around and blow away all the swampy biome that I create below him. Suddenly the nine tails head swings around kicking me off its head. And with surprisingly swift grace and agility for such a giant beast, the nine tails just easily slaps me while I am midair. Luom and crash me into the ground creating a crater all around me. I see its giant paw coming for me again. Flosh boom. But before the paw can hit me, I easily teleport on top of its head again. But the paw still created an even bigger crater in the ground. Suddenly, though unseen to the normal eye due to the small self-created natural lens. That doesn't allow others to see how his eyes changed into a three Tomo Sharingan, and then change again into a pinwheel-like form. This is Abito's Manjekyo. I noticed that the Nine Tails was already out of Abito's control. It has actually been so for quite a while. So I decide to take this chance and immediately the Nine Tails starts thrashing around. But in a bit it soon calms down. General POV. While this all was happening, Minato finally got the real attacker to escape. He knows what he has to do in a battle of endurance the Nine Tails will win, plus the battle mustn't last too long or the other countries might attack too. The Nine Tails has only been sealed once. That was when the first Hokage held it down, and weakened it for Mito to seal. Ever since then, there has only been seal transfers, and never really a change of the seal, only the Jinchuriki were changed. I can't seal the Nine Tails. I will contemplate Minato, as he was about to teleport close to where Yami was, even though he didn't express it on the outside. He is definitely scared on the inside. I will have to use the Reaper's Death Seal, and seal half of the Nine Tails into two different people, one of them will have to be me. But the other after a dozen seconds Minato finally reaches his destination, and he sees Yami fighting against the Nine Tails. He sees that Yami seems to be using S rank Fuenjutsu and Ninjutsu trying to restrict the Nine Tails. Minato immediately throws dozens of kunai around the battlefield. He knows that Yami is tired, and even seems to be breathing heavily, expressing his exhaustion, plus his chakra signature is very faint. Hang on a little more Yami, thinks Minato as he tries to spread even more Horatian kunai. He knows that if he doesn't prepare, he will only get in Yami's way if he doesn't have the Horatian markers around, so he can move easier. Then finally Minato decides to use his signature move as he disappears from his place in a yellow flash, and he appears next to Yami, who seems too distracted and concentrated on the Nine Tails. He simply says to Yami, we will need to seal it. Yami doesn't look surprised by his appearance, and Minato isn't necessarily surprised. After all, as Minato knows, Yami is a close-range sensor. Yami takes this time to answer as he and Minato dodge another one of the Nine Tails attacks by teleporting away but not before Yami touches Minato's shoulder. He lets Yami do that because he has already caught up to his plan. Yami's side teleports towards Minato and says, We will be finished if we keep going like this. We will eventually get tired, and most likely the village will be obliterated. Plus there are the other villagers to think about, with the war just finished, they might like to take a chance and try to attack one last time. We need to end this now. Hearing Yami say the real situation that they are in, helps Minato make up his mind. He just nods and says, I need my son to be brought here, says Minato as he teleports away. And a split second later, he appears back here with Kishina and baby Naruto in his arms. Yami, I wanna ask you something, says Minato, who is strangely calm, as he has baby Naruto in his arms, and as Kishina falls to the ground lifeless, unable to live any longer, due to the toll the pregnancy and tail beast extraction took out of her. Minato's eyes tear up at this as Yami just looks at him with a cold face, expressing no emotion at all. But Yami still understands what is about to happen as he says, Sure, ask me whatever you want, Minato. Minato finally hugs the blonde baby in front of him for one last time as he says, Take care of Naruto for me, will you Yami? Yami just nods and says, Don't worry about it. I promise you and give my word that Naruto will be treated nicely and like a hero. Minato just nods at this, 
Not knowing that Yami didn't even mean any of the words he said, he puts the baby Naruto on the ground and starts doing some hand signs. Slowly the Shinigami appears behind Minato, he has a dagger on his mouth and an accessory necklace on his hand. Yami just looks at the Shinigami in amazement, the Nine Tails tries to move. But due to being under Yami's Junjutsu, it can't really do anything. The Shinigami used his hand to grab into the Nine Tails, and use its knife to cut it in two, and sealing them, one half in Minato and the other in Naruto. Uaaa 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 who also started crying. But even after Minato's death and all of this, Yami is concentrated on something else the Shinigami was looking him dead in the eyes with a confused but also amused look on his eyes. Suddenly it opens its mouth. The Shinigami is a translucent, gaunt specter with a demonic visage. It is still behind Minato, whose eyes are slowly turning hollow, signifying his soon-to-be death. The Shinigami is still looking at Yami with its ghostly eyes as he opens his mouth, which shows that he has a mouthful of sharp, jagged teeth and a very long, almost serpentine tongue. Yami POV. The thing is looking at me. And the intimidating aura really is something else, isn't it? I actually feel fear, even though I know that he can't hurt me. Though I do not use, and will most likely never use the Reaper's Death Seal, I do know some of the details about it. Whenever I see this and other techniques like the Edo Tensei, it really humbles me. It reminds me that monstrous geniuses like them exist, those whom even something like death is an abstract concept that is understandable. I can easily admit to myself that I am extremely envious of them. I wonder who created the Reaper Death Seal. He was definitely a talented Fuenjutsu user, though I can easily claim that I am the best Fuenjutsu user alive when compared to geniuses at the art along its history. I am nothing special. I see that he moves its mouth, and suddenly a voice comes out of its mouth. You can see me. Ah, I understand now. The voice that comes out is hoarse and strange, as if it isn't supposed to exist. I see that it seems as if it noticed something. My body is already translucent as I have already used Kemui to become intangible. Also this thing seems to know something about me. I can easily guess that it must be my reincarnation. After all that is the only thing even remotely special for me. I just looked directly at the thing's empty eyes. My eyes locked into his as a malicious smile appeared on my face, and slowly a black hole opened in the middle of the Shinigami's chest. I simply say to him, Tell me now what do you know about me, or that hole will expand and kill you. The Shinigami just looks at his chest without even a look of worry on his face. I know that this is unlikely to work, since it is not a spiritual attack, but he doesn't need to know that I already know that. The Shinigami suddenly forks his snake-like tongue licking the air all around him. I can see his jagged teeth as his face morphs into a terrifying smile. Ha 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 ha. Laugh the Shinigami. I have to manually turn off a little of the reception from my ears to stop them from bleeding. The baby Naruto on the ground is also protected by me. Before the sound can reach him, a wood enactment appears all around him. After finishing his laughter it says, You are not from here. Slowly the Shinigami starts dissipating as Minato is already dead, and his soul sacrifice can no longer keep the Shinigami here. But I just look at the creature coldly and say to the Shinigami as I point my finger at it, Tick, top the clock is ticking. Just wait a little more, and I will come to torture you to insanity. I will come and kill you all up there. So be careful. But the only things I hear is his laughter as it gets dimmer and dimmer. His laughter sounding as if someone who just heard something that was the funniest thing in the world. ECH I was trying to guide him to get closer to me. But sadly, it seems like it didn't work. I guess all beings like him could easily see through stuff like this. Sadly I only have the dagger of soul valley which was absorbed by the red cube. Which can help me hit soul beings. I mean my cube can change forms into it and take its properties. But that is still useless. I am not dumb enough to approach him. Now I at least have a lead on my reincarnation. But... I need to be patient on this or else it will be a wreckage. I mustn't rush this. Or it will have devastating implications. I don't want to lose everything just due to recklessness. I move the wood which is protecting Naruto away. I see a baby Naruto with whiskers and all that. He is crying. So I pick him up and rock him a little to calm him down. And he soon stops crying even though his parents' corpses are only around 5 meters away. Obviously babies don't have something like a sixth sense that allows them to know if their parents died. I can already sense Naruto's chakra bubble up. And his chakra reserves slowly raise up. It seems like I will have to take action. General POV. It takes Hiruzen and his Anbu a little time before they arrive at the battle site. They see the wreckage all around. A whole forest has been leveled in the battle with the Nine Tails. Plus Kinoha has devastating damages too. So they will have to start rebuilding soon. Or they will not really be a great village anymore if they slack around. But since the Nine Tails seems to have been handled, at least they know that Kanoha will at least not be completely gone from the world. Today is one to remember since Kanoha was almost gone from the face of the world. Suddenly when they enter the place where the surge in Chakra was felt before the Nine Tails completely disappeared. When they arrive there, Hiruzen has to stop himself from exclaiming in shock. The fourth Hokage, Minato Namaka is on the ground dead, Kishina Yuzumaki on the ground dead too. There is only Yami sitting on a boulder that got taken out off the ground during the fight against the Nine Tails. Yami just looks at Hiruzen and the ninja behind him, 
Unlike his usual neutral look, Yami's eyes had a cold glint on his eyes. Dominating, stubborn, inflexible, makes himself seem like he does it all for the better of his organization. That is how a leader acts. Leaders don't necessarily need to even know anything as long as they act like they know things. The sheep will believe him. Think Yami. I need to dominate now finally. I don't need to wear any more masks. Yami just opened his mouth, his eyes cold, with the full moon behind his back. I am going to be the fifth Okage, says Yami simply, no matter if anyone wants to refuse this or not. Their instincts scream at them, and they all get chills, as Yami simply gets up and jumps down from the boulder. No one stopped him just walking away as he gave Hiraz and the baby Naruto. No one dared stop him. The dangerous atmosphere around Yami even stopped on his tracks someone like Hiruzen, who has been in hundreds of close death situations. Yami wasn't simply exclaiming or explaining anything, he is simply informing everyone of his decision as he walks back towards Kanoha. Yami POV I just walk away from the destruction behind me. Sai so finally I can stop wearing masks and can act like myself. I know that having a mask on for such a long time because the mask can become the real you. It's like someone acting like a clown in school. He will start acting like a clown even trying to make people laugh again even when he is outside of school. When that mask is useless, it is a change that won't be noticed by him. After all, the change is so subtle that it is almost unnoticed by the person. Back in the day I had to remind myself that I did not love my new mother. Or else my mask might have leaked in and changed my true personality. The best liars are the ones who can lie to themselves. And when that is taken to the extreme well now, you have a big problem in your hands. But that isn't a problem for me. I know just the right amount of lies to believe about myself. I immediately don't trust those lies when I am done with them being useful to me. I look at the Jonin uniform I am wearing and notice that it has some scratches. Immediately I use some wind chakra around my body. It immediately obliterates all of my clothes. After that, I use some chakra in an invisible seal on my body. And I am surrounded in a cloud of smoke and as I walk through the smoke which whiffs away as my body moves. I now have a brand new Jonin uniform. My control over Fuenjutsu has gotten pretty good. Now that Minato and Kishina are dead, I will become the fifth Hokage after a brief emergency voting process. Which I will obviously win. I didn't build up this political power. Just so I can wipe my ass with it. Except the Achiha, there are only other minor clans who aren't on my side. Even clans like the Yamanaka and even Saratobi clan. They are kind of neutral, but will still take my side. But who knows though, the Saratobi clan might betray me and vote for Hiruzen, since he is part of their clan. But that doesn't matter at all. I have way more than 51% of the votes needed to win. Obviously the civilians of Konoha only vote the civilian council members, who represent their interests. I have them all in the pocket, which is already 20% of the votes. But the civilians have only enough voting power to not bother the ninjas. The daimyo, nobles, current hokage, which is unavailable, and the Kanoha clan heads. General POV, 18 hours later, after the Nine Tails attack some villagers decided to try and prod how much Kanoha was weakened, their spies told them that the fourth hokage, Minato Namikas. Immediately other nations tried to send ninja to travel to Kanoha because of a mission. But they were all killed. No sign of who did it. But as soon as they entered the land of fire, not even their bodies were found. It is as if they disappear from existence when they enter it. But that is when they got the news not from their spies, but from the merchants who traveled to Kanoha. Two days later, a ceremony was being held in Kanoha, where the whole village is already rebuilt. The streets were packed up to full capacity. They wanted to see the new Hokage. It is all thanks to him why they were able to return back to their normal lives. Finally atop the Hokage Tower Hiruzen appears, with the daimyo right next to him. And that is when Hiruzen uses a Fuenjutsu seal to amplify his voice as he says, Let us welcome the fifth Hokage of Konoha Yami in Yazuka. That is when the crowd can finally see Yami as he is wearing his Hokage uniform, which consists of a white robe with plenty of red decorations on it, plus the hat also with the fire kanji on it. Woo, immediately the crowd started cheering for Yami. After all, he had rebuilt Konoha within a day, as soon as he became Hokage. As the crowd continues cheering, Yami simply puts a hand up and with a slight smile on his face he says, Everyone, can I please have a moment of silence to say something? As Yami says that with a calm voice, everyone stops cheering. But their excitement wasn't down at all. They simply listened to what Yami said. It is as if an invisible power of will settled upon them. They cannot help but look at Yami, who expressed absolute confidence in every movement that he made. Yami is a fresh air to them, who are used to a Hokage who is uncertain of his actions, and even asks for their forgiveness, as Hiruzen did when he showed them the demon fox baby. And telling them that Kanoha would need their help to survive, and everyone should work together as one big family. Yami POV. While looking at the people below me, I can't help but think of the different things and actions that I have taken to get here. I don't regret any of them. With the knowledge I had during the time, I have made the perfect decision in every one of them. I chose the perfect road to power. I took every opportunity that was given to me. Killing, slaughtering and torturing people. I regret none of them. I did all of those things to normal people. Ninja, children, parents, elderly and even some disabled people. I regret none of IT. I am 100% knowledgeable of what I did and how I did it. I am not someone who runs away from reality. 
I accept what I have done, and I will continue to do this and possibly even worse things along the way. I will not ask forgiveness to God or anything for my actions, because I don't regret any of them. Instead of looking at the past, I will look at the future and think what I will do next. I look at the people below me who have already stopped cheering. They think that they know what they want but people actually have no idea what they want in their leaders. But they really want what everyone wants it is in the nature of all living things to find some being greater than themselves and place their trust in that being, following it blindly. In order to escape from the pressure of that trust those beings seek a still greater entity in which to believe and those greater beings too seek still greater, still stronger beings to follow. This is how all kings come to be and this is how all gods are born. When someone knows that then they can be a good leader. Now that we have some quiet, I, Yami Inuzuka, would like to tell you all that Kanoha's people are good and amazing people. And I will make Kanoha the greatest. A lot of people might not like me being the leader, but to hell with weaklings like them who cannot handle power and responsibility. Make Kanoha the greatest. As I said that, I smiled and waved towards the people. My smile is casual, but not too casual either. But I did want to show that I am 100% sure of what I'm doing. As soon as I say that, I get a thunderous roar in response from the happy people. They obviously don't know shit of what I'm saying, but really, they don't need to. After all, most of the population is made out of dumbasses. I obviously stole some tactics from my first life politicians. After all, it has already been proven to work. Obviously the smart people won't buy into it. But who cares what they think after all? They are a minority now comes the next part of my plan. I look at the people below me, as I just wave towards them. I know that I am definitely not going to be the best leader. After all, I will only look after my shoulders. But no one needs to know that now do they? People are sheep, and I will simply be their shepherd. So they will follow me. I think of the different strategies on how to deal with this. Just like this I walk back to my office where I will stay as the hokage. It is a simple office with a lot of paperwork piled all around it. I just brush the paperwork aside and sit down on the comfy chair that I have personally made for myself. Sigh, this world really doesn't feel like home. I want to go home and tell my family this one last thing of everything that I have done to get it out of my shoulders. Then I can will myself to leave them behind too. Or else even if I reach godhood I know that I will keep thinking about them. I have decided I will go home. I know that unlike some other families, my family will easily accept me even when I tell them of this. I need to see them one more time. Or I will be addicted to keeping meeting them on my Jinjutsu. They are my last weakness. They are my chains holding me down. My family. When I think of them I can almost feel a chill go down my spine. My little brother. My mother. They are the only people who will never betray me. They are the ones who have always loved me. My little brother has always known how I truly am. He always knew that the only reason I didn't kill people for benefits was because that will be done due to the police being on my tail and me being afraid of my life every single day. My little brother the one who was never as smart, strong well he wasn't better than me at anything. He always has had a little insecure about himself due to me being better than him at everything. I was his shining light and unsurpassable wall. But instead of that jealousy being developed into hate, it developed into absolute trust in me. When he was afraid of a robber breaking in, he would think of me and then he would be sorry for the robber instead. Well he wasn't wrong either. But this is a decision that I will need to think about. Just like this one day passed, I contemplated my biggest decision for myself. I know that using Jinjutsu on myself to relive some memories will start being addictive. I am not someone who will not face their mental problems. I don't need a weakness like that so I will return home. I will look my family in the eyes and then I will leave them. I am sorry mother, brother I gave up my dream once for you in my first life. But this time, I will be selfish. I know that you will understand. As I decide to do this a small smile appears on my face. After all, becoming the almighty god doesn't come without giving up some things. But even knowing what I will have to do I can't wait to go back home. Currently I am still sitting on my new office chair. Also the paperwork isn't around here anymore. And there is a tea making pot and stove on the side and two chairs in front of me. My clones already took care of everything while I needed time to think in my decisions. I have everything prepared. And I can feel a heaviness on my heart settle down. I can finally think clearly again. As expected, when I have free time my mind always wanders on things like this. But I didn't even go to college in my first life even after all of that studying. Not that I really even wanted to go to that college. It was simply the major where most money is made. That is when the door to my office opens. There come the elders of Kanoha, whom he isn't as part of. I know that he isn't exactly fond of me, but I don't care. After all, if I try to please everyone, I will just end up as the most well-liked dead man in the world. The elders sit down, and Hiruzen simply summons a chair. They all sit down, and as they do so I simply say, We need Tsune back to Kanoha. 
Immediately the others react by their body language showing surprise. Hiruzen is the first to speak by saying, I don't think she will agree so easily. When I heard him say this, I just put my hand on the side as my Ambu delivered a stack of paper to me. I just throw them to another side of the room where my clone appears and takes them. While this all happens Hiruzen and the other two elders are a little surprised at this. Hiruzen was always surrounded by paperwork. Well my system is made for absolute efficiency. The documents have to be on the Hokage's hands before they are signed to make them official. I don't even do this when they are not here. They go straight to my shadow clones. But whatever it doesn't matter. Well Kanova needs her, if she doesn't come. Then she will be simply branded a missing nin. If she can't comprehend even that then she will be kidnapped, and we will breed the Senju clan out of her. I say that calmly as I interlock my hands and lean on the table. Hiruzen seems angry at this. Well I can understand that, after all, he has known Tsunade, since she was little and pretty much raised her. Also Hiruzen's teachers were the second and first Hokages, who were both Senju. You doing this will turn the whole Kanova against you, says Hiruzen clutching the armbands of the chair so hard that cracks started appearing on them as his chakra spiked. I just looked at him calmly. No trace of nervousness on my face. My eyes are cold and calm, as I am not affected by this at all. Well, we are ninja, so this will obviously be done in secret. If Tsunade agrees with this or not, it doesn't matter. Also, if anyone spreads village secrets like this, my eyes get cold as I look at Hiruzen. Who on my chakra flows out of me, easily taking down Hiruzen's. Never question my decisions, Hiruzen. Kanova will finally have a good hokage. What do you expect us to do then? Just let the Senju bloodline die off and dissolve to nothing just because of a woman's feelings. Never again let your feelings influence your decisions. As I say that my chakra flow settles down and returns back to me. Also if I see anything suspicious from either of you, I will put you all in a coffin. You are here to advise, not question my decisions. So you simply advise and listen to my decisions. A couple days after that, in a gambling town in the land of fire, Tsunade is in a bar drinking herself to sleep. Sleeping with alcohol is better than sleeping with nightmares. Thinks Tsunade as she looks at her 20th or maybe 40th cup of sake. She hasn't been sober ever since Hachi's death. She knows that this is not healthy, and not exactly good for someone young like Shizun. That is also one of the reasons why Shizun is currently sleeping in the hotel. Suddenly she senses someone approach her. She gives the person a side glance. What she sees is a below average looking middle aged man. He seems to be extremely balding, and had white hair with black eyes and a stubble for a beard. He is also wearing a suit. But it is disheveled, and he seems to be missing his tie. Tsunade notices that he seems like a normal person. She used a chakra sensing technique, and came to the conclusion that the chakra is also at civilian level, and he didn't have the turbulence that one has when he uses the transformation jutsu. The old man notices Tsunade, and he comes drunkenly wobbling towards her. When he is close he goes to cup a feel of her breast, thinking that he is being sneaky, but obviously Tsunade noticed this and without even needing to look, she grabbed the man's hand by the wrist. A broken wrist should be enough to teach him a lesson. Thinks Tsunade as she exerts a little force on her grasp, but she is surprised. As that doesn't work at all, and the man seems to smile at her. Immediately her ninja training kicks in as she dispels the alcohol in her system. A cloud of alcoholic fog comes out of her mouth as she looks at the man in front of her. Next she uses all of her power to crush the man's wrist, but to her shock, the man doesn't even budge. She looks at the man in the eyes as a frown forms on her face, and she releases her grip on the old man. After that, she just sits down on the table and grabs another cup of sake. Her mood seems sour. She also notices that no one even seems to have noticed the exchange. She takes another sip of her sake cup. Aren't you supposed to be a cage now? Do you really have so much free time? Asks Tsunade sarcastically as the old man sits down in front of her, on the same table. Slowly the old man's white hair turns black, and it starts to grow back into a full head of slightly spiky back hair, and the old, pudgy and below average face slowly reconstructed into a handsome one, with the Inuzuka tattoos on both cheeks. Tsunade just sighs and drinks her sake cup in one go. Don't you have something better to do than stalking me Yami? Didn't you get over your whole crush phase by now? You are like 24 now, says Tsunade casually. Yami just shrugs as he calls over the waitress. As she gets close she gets a blush on her face and says, Hello, what can I get your order Yami-sama? Yami smiles back at her. Well hello there sweetie, well you could get me some more of you that is for sure, says Yami in a flirtatious way. The waitress just giggles at Yami, she clasps her cheek with her hand, and she fidgets a little. Come on now Yami-sama if you say things like that. Tsunade looks at this and quickly gets annoyed, and bam she bangs her fist on the table, looking at Yami and the waitress with an annoyed look. Go and get a room, you two. The waitress immediately walks away, scared of the aura Tsune was releasing. Sorry, I'll get you the usual T-bone steak Yami-sama. As the waitress walks away, Tsune looks at Yami questionably. For a busy hokage you for sure seem to come here often. As Tsune says that she is about to take another sip of her refilled steak cup. 
Quash, but Yami takes it away from her and drinks it for himself. Tsunade just sighs at this in annoyance. Actually, I own this place. Smugly says Yami. Why am I not surprised at this? Sighs Tsunade, filling another cup of sake for herself. She already knows how Yami is, so she isn't that surprised by Yami owning a lot of businesses. She knows how greedy Yami can be. Also, I am actually 23. But I guess as you get in the years you start forgetting things, says Yami, while casually pointing towards her age, which contrary to her looks, she is in her early 40s. Tsunade's eyebrow twitches slightly at this. Sigh, you really are always blunt with harsh words Yami, says Tsunade, not really in the mood to even talk to him. When she looks at him it always reminds her of Hachi. Yami stops his jokes and looks at Tsunade, Kanoha needs you back. Tsunade's hand stops mid-swing as she is about to drink. I am on vacation. Yami's eyes turn cold immediately, and his friendly aura changes, turning cold. That is when Tsunade starts laughing. Ha 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 ha, I knew it. Yami suddenly stops and chuckles. You got me there. I guess I have been on edge lately. He understands that Tsunade just acted a certain way to make him act like she wanted. Tsunade chuckles at this too. She knows Yami better than anyone and can know her even better than Orochimaru. Yami literally obliterated part of her spine on some petty agreement when Hachi was alive. She can definitely guess what Yami will do if she refuses him. She isn't that dumb. I knew that it was only a matter of time. Thinks Tsunade. She knows that as soon as she leaves Kanoha, she knew that Yami will again ask her back. Once he becomes Hokage. Yami just smiles at this result. He was ready to wreck Tsunade and force her to come back to the village. She is an unstable factor on the outside of Kanoha. Her mind is fragile, and she could be easily manipulated. Yami isn't someone who you want to say no to. So Tsunade just raises her small cup with sake in it and says, Congratulations on becoming the Hokage Yami clinks glasses with Tsunade. Long may I reign, says Yami with a glint in his eyes, as if this was an inside joke that no one else but him could understand. While Yami was teasing Tsunade and joking around. In Kanoha, inside a dark room here is an Orochimaru, Jiraiya and some other people who were all people of different political positions, were all around. Around, sitting down and talking. Yami will ruin the spirit of Kanoha if he continues like this. Kanoha isn't a place that treats his ninja like some tools that can simply be given away. The one who says this is Hiruzen addressing the situation around him. Some people in the meeting look unsure of this. They know that if they do something that is against Kanoha's, Yami's, interests, then they know that they will suffer accidents. They know how dangerous Yami is, he won't tolerate anything that is against him. The only reason he hasn't already killed Hiruzen, Orochimaru and Jiraiya is simply because they are useful to him. Everyone here knows that, but they still have the courage to meet here. So they all have the bravery to even stand against Yami, which is a feat in itself. Yami is like the booty man, someone who can have them killed at any time. That is when Orochimaru decides to lean back on his chair. Yami's influence is terrifying. I have been careful to not even buy the chairs that we are sitting on, or the chances are he would have investigated why I would buy something like this. They were all made by some craftsmen that are part of the Yami No Caution Act, our organization which aims to lower Yami's influence on the world. As Orochimaru says this, the other members and even Jiraiya are a little nervous about this. After all, they have noticed how much of an influence Yami has on the world. It is simply terrifying. There used to be some Anbu that used to give them information about Yami. But they all had accidents the second day after Yami became Hokage. When Hiruzen sees this, he just gets up and with a voice full of confidence says, We don't want you to fight Yami head on, or directly oppose him. We simply need to lower his influence. Also if any of you feel unsure about this, you can leave easily. All that we ask of you is to not speak of our organization. Some immediately get up and walk away. They have families, and don't want to risk them by going against Yami. They know how the Shimura clan ended just by association with Danzo. They were still butchered even after Danzo's death. Though it seems like war casualties there is no need to look too hard to notice something strange going on in here. The Shimura clan is also out of any history books now. Every single Shimura clan child who graduated from the academy has died during the third ninja war. Everyone needs to think twice before deciding to oppose Yami. After all, their families will be put in danger too. After 10 minutes, more than half of the members in the room left. Even some nobles who were stripped of their positions just because Yami needed their lands. Thus they lost everything to him. But they still left, their faces filled with nervousness. They lost everything to Yami. But they still don't want to lose their lives too. Hiruzen looks at the people leaving and can't help but slightly admire the effectiveness of Yami's way of handling things. Contrary to him, Yami dominates and isn't above using his power to keep someone in line even by threatening their families. Even while he does this, there aren't a lot of people who hate Yami, and even less who have the courage to stand up to him. As he looks around Hiruzen notices that there were some people who were unsure. There are less than 20 in here. This is worse than expected. Grimaces Hiruzen. On the other hand Orochimaru looks at this with a calm look on his face. But on the inside he is jovial. He can see how truly effective the method Yami uses to rule is very effective. As expected, just like everything else he does, Yami is perfect at ruling too. That man makes me think about becoming his subordinate. 
But sadly I am not someone who follows others, thinks Orochimaru as he has to hold himself back from smirking. He doesn't even necessarily care about this so-called organization, but he has decided that ever since Yami became Hokage, he will become Missing Ninja. Soon Yami will start exerting control dominance towards me, not allowing me to do anything anymore. He will most likely have me become one of his researchers, but I wouldn't be able to do anything for myself without Yami breathing down my neck. Contemplates Orochimaru, trying to predict what Yami's reaction would be if he stays in Kanoha. Jiraiya on the other hand has a nervous look on his face. Yami already took his pinky finger. He knows that he will never give him another chance, but he still decided to work against Yami. He has seen his true colors. But he is also nervous, after all, amongst Kanoha's S-rank ninja, Yami's mosquitoes and other methods of spying are scary, especially with the newly released radio device by the Inuzuka Corporation. Has he used it before to somehow spy on us? No. That is a stupid question he most likely used a radio, which is undetectable back at the time. Damn IT. Fuck that kid is damn controlling to the extreme. Angrily thinks Jiraiya. The radio not only gave Yami much more economical control, it also brought up some scary possibilities. Of course, now that he is Hokage, Sium Inuzuka is in charge of the Inuzuka clan, and his wife, the Daimyo's daughter, is in charge of the company. Yeah, like Yami would let someone other than him be in control of anything, thinks Jiraiya as he comes up with different outcomes. They had taken every countermeasure against spying, mosquitoes, people, and even sending an electronic pulse of chakra that disables radios, and many many more precautions. But even after all that, even though Hiruzen, Orochimaru and Jiraiya reassured the others that there is no way Yami can spy on this. They can only hope that it is true. After all, underestimating Yami is something that none of them will ever do. Yami, on the other hand, was just casually walking around Kanoha with Tsunade at his side. He had teleported her and Shizun right back to Kanoha. Now he is taking Tsunade to his office to assign her a new position. As they walk, Yami just extends his arm towards Tsunade. She looks at his arm and sighs. You know people will start talking if I do something like that plus aren't you married now? What would your wife say about it? Yami just stops at this and looks towards Tsunade and looks at her as if looking at a stupid person, which kinda ticked off Tsunade. But before she could say anything, what? Are you some Academy fan girl? That feels nervous just by holding hands with a boy, says Yami with a joking tone to his voice. Sai Tsunade sighs annoyingly and grudgingly. She grabs Yami's arm a little harshly and interlocks it with hers. Yami just smiles at this slightly and Tsunade frowns in fake annoyance. Both remembering the past that is when Yami says. Tsunade Yami just looks at Tsunade remembering the past. The way he used to be so weak and powerless. He no longer is like that, he has no rivals or true enemies, just like he likes it. He will never let anyone or anything evolve to anywhere close to his strength. He can't say that he is loved by everyone, but even the best leader is hated by some of his people. No one can be loved by everyone Tsunade just looks at Yami, his handsome face, and can't help but sigh in sadness. Yami has always had an average looking face when he was young, but Yami's face now looks closer like Hachi. They are both thinking of the past, Yami is thinking of his past self who was weak, while Tsunade is thinking of Hachi. Finally she looks at Yami, someone who she knows is likely to know things. She has been thinking about something lately she has never been a bad drunk who rapes or fights. Yami murmurs Tsunade quietly as they walk along. Hum. Yami just looks at her, when he hears her call his name. Tell me something says Tsunade as she looks at Yami's eyes. Her brown eyes with confusion on them, locking into Yami's eyes who are always full of confidence, and have a certain dark coldness into them. Sure, answers Yami simply as he turns to look in front of him. The people around him are just simply looking at him, some bowing their heads, not even expressing anything about Yami and Tsunade interlocking their arms. Suddenly Tsunade comes to a realization and looks at Yami. So it is some Jinjutsu, but to be able to cover me without me even noticing not anyone in the Achiha clan alive can do that, thinks Tsunade. Not really surprised that Yami has gotten even stronger. His hunger is still there. He will hunt for more power. Yami you truly are pitiful. As Tsunade thinks that, she looks at Yami. She already knows how his life has been up till now. Always alone and the people close to him dying. She also wants to be like him, having his son die. But even after that to just keep walking forward and move on that is inspiring of Yami. Still even while she thinks that, she still gathers the courage to ask Yami. Yami tell me what happened that night. Yami suddenly stops and turns to look at Tsunade. Tsunade can't figure out at all what he is thinking. His ever-present cold and nonchalant eyes look at Tsunade. Sigh Yami just sighs a little, and he starts walking again, his eyes staring in front of him. Do you want the truth or just plain facts? As Yami says this, Tsunade remembers Yami saying about the truth. So she simply answers. I want the fact. For a split second a flash of amusement flashes past Yami's eyes as he is about to answer, but two familiar people are walking towards them. One of them seems to be flustered and angry. They are Orochimaru and Jiraiya. Orochimaru seems to be holding Jiraiya's back. Let me go, Orochimaru. I want to ask Tsune to her face if she is fucking Yami. You fool, you want to ask right now. This is the worst time possible. I don't care. Next time instead of losing your pinky, 
you will lose your head. I don't care. As this argument continues, Yami just looks at Orochimaru and Jiraiya who are approaching while arguing with each other. Orochimaru is wearing his Jonin uniform, while Jiraiya is wearing his usual attire, which consists of a green short shirt kimono and matching pants, under which he wore mesh armor that is visible at his wrists and ankles. He also wore hang guards, a black belt traditional Japanese wooden sandals, and a red hayori with two yellow circles on each side. He is also carrying a large scroll on his back, and he wore a horn forehead protector with the kanji for oil, which denoted his affiliation with Mount Lomboku. Orochimaru just sighs at Jiraiya's foolishness. They all know how dangerous Yami can be, and he still went to confront him. He could even expose Arim California Alliance. Yami is someone monstrous, we can't underestimate him at all. Thinks Orochimaru while contemplating on how to get out of this. Finally he made his decision and as Jiraiya was about to scream at Tsunade, that being the first thing that he would say to her in the last years, that he hasn't seen her. But contrary to anyone's expectations, Tsunade just says, Yes, me and Yami were in a relationship, but not anymore. Immediately Jiraiya is frozen in shock, unable to move, and his mouth is wide open. Tsunade then is about to nudge Yami to come along as they walk hand in hand, but Yami doesn't wait for other people to do the leading he is the leader. So he controls the situation as he and Tsunade walk forward. That was unexpected, says Yami, as he has to regularly regulate the Jinjutsu around them again. It was a Jinjutsu that is activated with the sound of his feet hitting the ground. It also only affects people with a chakra amount below Genin level. Tsune just sighs. I already shut him down dozens of times years ago. Plus there are more important things to talk about tell me the facts about the night Hachi was conceived. Yami looks at the sky when he hears Tsune ask him again. Quash they both discover in a pack flash and appear in Yami's office. What is it with all of the Theatrix? So there was something wrong with that night? Or is Yami just doing this? because he is bored with the Hokage duties, thinks Tsunade trying to figure out the truth. But Yami on the other hand, just walks towards the Hokage's chair, and sits down in there while lying back. And he puts his lugs on his empty desk, his office is not filled with any paperwork, contrary to the time Hiruzen was the Hokage. Though Tsunade says that, Yami was still thinking, why were the Orochimaru and Jureya that we met Shadow Clones I didn't know of that what is going on. But he decides to put that thought for later as he just looks at Tsunade and says, Well, the fact is that Yami POV I just look at Tsunade as I lie back on my comfortable chair. I can sense my clones all around the Hokage Tower. They are finishing some paperwork and renegotiating contracts from the previous administration and the previous Hokage maid. Honestly I never thought of it, but I am actually getting better with contracts and economics as my shadow clones negotiate things like this. My net worth is around 440 billion Ryo now. Kinoha is getting better and better, and of course cheap labor is being done in other lands, where it is cheaper ah I love capitalism. Anyway, as Sunade is waiting for an answer from me, I think back on the night I had with her. That used to be the best night of my life, but I already have had better. I mean even my wife is better than Tsunade. Even though our relationship is a little stranded lately, especially with Kiba's birth and yep, he wasn't a reincarnated person either. I have had my mosquitoes keep an eye on every newborn in Kanoha, and if they sense any abnormalities with them, it will be immediately reported to me. I even have some in the other villages, but sadly, I can't follow every birth so far away. After all, I still have to be careful. So tell me, why the long silence? As Tsunade says that, I finally decide what to say. Obviously it's not the truth. I did after all predict that Tsunade might feel that something was fishy that night. I just look down regretfully when Tsunade asks that. The day Hachi was conceived that was that is the day where I regret the most. My control over my lust slipped, and it wasn't only you who was drunk and pushing for something more to happen. So no you didn't do anything like rape me. As I say that, I just sigh heavily. I get up and walk towards Tsunade, who hasn't sat down at all. As I am next to her, she has to look up at me, due to my height. Hachi our son is already dead, so get over it Tsunade. I said to her, as I put my hand on her shoulder. But her eyes, who are now locked into mine, they narrow. And a frown appears on her face. Her eyes have anger behind them. So do what then forget about him. Criticizes Tsunade, unwilling to do something like that. I just smile at this, and cup her cheek and wipe a tear that was about to slip out of her eye. No, but I am not someone to dwell on things that I don't like. Do you know what I do to things that I don't like? I kill and obliterate them. I obviously don't say that. But what I just decide to say I change them. Tsunade looks confused at this, so I decide to further explain it to her. While studying medical ninjutsu, I have come to a very shocking revolution that death is only a state of being. Not something gone forever I shall revive Hachi, and then we can live together like a true family. I say to her as I envelop her in a deep hug, acting as if I didn't notice her shocked look. So I would like you to smile some more Tsunade. So come on now Tsunade, fall in love with me. Become my ally so I don't have to kill you Tsunade I am a liar. A thief, a lover and a cheater so. So I am not going to spare you Tsunade, you have grown into an uncertainty. This is your decision, you are either with me or against me Tsunade decides to hug me back slightly. I smile at this. I see so you get to live Tsunade unless you decide to act against me that is. After that whole ordeal, Tsunade decided that she will live with me, and she will take Shizun with her too. I know that Shiori, 
My wife will be a bitch about me bringing two other women into our home. I have noticed that even though she is pregnant with my child, she has been planning to somehow leave me after giving me a child. Damn why can't women just be as simple like in some fanfics in my first life? Just accept and be in my harem. Don't cause so many unnecessary problems. Soom and Shiori already are at each other's throats. Add Tsune to that, and we have a three-way battle. But I don't really care for any of that, after all they are just my pretty little dolls. Their lives have zero importance to me, but my children are different, after all. I don't want them to feel like it's okay to treat women like I do. That will make my daughters think that it's okay to be worthless. So I usually treat my lovers nice and with love when they are around. Though Tsum still loves me unconditionally, she was raised for that after all. But Shiori is a whole different deal. She can't wait to go away from me, as soon as she sees a part of my real self. Here, I guess I will have to kill her. Hum, it seems like I will need a new second wife, which woman will give me some advantage. Anyway, better deal with a new problem that has been rising up. The Jureo and Orochimaru that me and Tsune met were both shadow clones. Why would something like that happen? I can easily spot shadow clones due to their emotions, not feeling real and their soul being non-existent. It would be difficult for anyone else to notice, but quite easy for me. Also no people know about this, so that is a boon for me. They could have just been busy and sent shadow clones around but, why take the chance? I am not arrogant enough to think that I am omnipotent and can know her. Also the mosquitoes following the shadow clones were following them like they were the main bodies. I bite my thumb and as a drop of blood appears. I just do three hand signs and slam my hand in the ground. Poof immediately I can feel my position change. And I am in a tree. With a strange house building like in front of me. Well it isn't a tree house actually. I can hear the music coming from it. And the sign which displays a mosquito with a beer in its hand shows that it is actually a bar. This was an idea suggested by Shiro. On how to keep the summons relatively happy. Plus. I already have so much money so buying the materials for the buildings isn't really a problem for me. I only allow that because even though Shiro is a drunk, degenerate, scumbag, sinful, druggy, bastard dog, he will still have good ideas like this now and then. I just casually go forward and open the door. Immediately loud music hits my ears. My eye just twitches a little. As I enter the club I see a lot of different creatures from flies, fireflies and even some strange bird-like creatures. As they see me, their faces immediately morph into one of absolute terror. Even though most of them are bugs, and some frogs, not toads, now and then, I can still see the terrified look that they have on their non-human faces. After all, as the ruler of the blood swamp, I am not known to be tolerating some stuff, especially to someone who manages my spy network. They immediately bow their head Yami-sama. I just nod towards them. But I keep walking forward, not paying any second thought to them. Finally when I reach the room, where the music seems to be booming, I see the gross mosquito lady dancing in a stripper's pole. But everyone else immediately stops when they see me. I see that the mosquito sage seems drunk. As when she sees me, she just jumps off the stripper pole and comes close to me, and she hugs me with her gross arms. Immediately she says, Yami-sama. I love you. When I hear that, the way that she is talking irritates me. She thinks that her gross mosquito-like body can entice me. Boom, so I just punch off the lower part of her body before she even notices. Plop, she falls on the ground. Ha! Huh, says the mosquito girl, confused by what just happened. Suddenly her eyes widen as she looks at her lower body. I just narrow my eyes at this. Why didn't your mosquitoes report to me that Jureya and Orochimaru were up to something? General POVI, I don't know Yami-sama. I swear that I know nothing, says the mosquito girl in full-on panic. Her mind already instinctively flushed the alcohol out of her system. She can see that Yami might decide to kill her. On the other hand, Yami just looks at her with a cold look in his eyes. Ussie, so you, is my main source of information, don't know what is going on well now, I wonder how useful of an informant you are now. Immediately the mosquito sage feels chills all over her body as soon as she hears the word useful said by Yami. She knows that Yami will kill her if she is no longer useful to him. Fwash Yami immediately disappeared from her field of vision and that is when Banshee felt a powerful pressure behind her head. As her head is bashed on the floor creating a small crater in the floor as the whole building shakes. Maybe if you weren't messing around here you would have known that something was wrong. Do you really want to die that bad? Says Yami as his eyes have no emotion on them as he looks at the mosquito girl. He pushes his leg with some more power and crack. The skull of the mosquito under his foot starts making cracking sounds. And it is almost about to cave in and crush the mosquito sage's skull. I see that you need a replacement then you have one month to find a replacement. Or you will be tortured to death. After this month you can commit self-suicide or be tortured to death. Says Yami, as if it is a fact, no room for discussion. He then takes his foot off her head as soon as he does so the other summon animals just look at this with faces full of fear. This shows them that Yami can kill someone like the Mosquito Sage, who is very important to him and his general information network. The Mosquito Sage pushes her head off the ground. Her eyes are dull, not believing her current situation. She just went from happily parting with her friends to being dead within the month. She knows that there is no escaping Yami. 
It will be useless, she knows that Yami has most likely put so many countermeasures against something like her betrayal. This can't be happening. Is this how I will die thinks the mosquito sage as she tries to get up. But she is reminded that she doesn't have her legs, and that Yami just blasted them off. As Yami was walking away he just says, The blood swamp isn't a place where I allow things like free choice. Here you are either useful to me or you are dead. He then looks at one of the giant human sized flies around and says, You notify your flyer sage that the flyers are now in charge of spying. As Yami says that the mosquito sage feels abject despair, Yami knows that her spy system can run by itself. But if mosquitoes can still be distracted by things like shadow clones, due to them having almost the same signature as the original. But if the mosquito sage was observing, this wouldn't have happened, and she would get to live a lot longer. Fuashiyami then immediately disappeared in a black flash. But even then no one dared speak out of absolute fear for Yami. Yami POV making an example out of the mosquito sage was a calculated decision. Even though I seemed angry, I wasn't really. After all, anger clouds your judgment, but mine wasn't at all. I showed dominance there, because I don't want my summons treating me like the Toad summons treat Jiraiya, and in the future Naruto. They are my servants and pets not the other way around. They do what I want and follow my orders. They are like my employees, they work for me, and I let them keep their lives. And that is quite a high paying job. After all, not a lot of things are worth more than life to most people at least. Sigh, why can't people work at 100% efficiency without being threatened? I mean I would treat them good and with love if they worked harder. But that is just a lie. Treat your employees softly and they will walk all over you TCH. I guess that I will have to investigate myself on this case, at what Orochimaru and Jiraiya are up to. Just like this four years past, Yami is now at the age of 27. Kanoha is a whole different place from it looked more like a modern city, with all of the high buildings and dozens of skyscrapers. The Hokage was one of those skyscrapers with 130 floors. Kanoha has already become something of a powerhouse on its own even without the Land of Fire. Its economic power has become terrifying. Its Hokage, Yami Inuzuka has been credited to it. The Hokage now has as much power as the Daimyo has. Thankfully there seems to be no conflict between the two, or the people might be worried well they do know who will win. It will be Yami and Yuzuka. He has a 91% approval rating. He has put so many nobles out of power, and put smart people in there, that have risen the local economy by over 900% in just 4 years. Kanoda's army has also never been stronger. Many new talents have come out, though most of them are from the Inuzuka clan. But no one questions that, and if they do they usually suffer fatal accidents. As the son-in-law of the daimyo, Yami has had one child with his wife. Though there are rumors of him sleeping around, in the eyes of the public they are just that rumors. On inside the skyscraper Hokage Tower, Yami is currently drinking something that looks like wine. Grape juice. He just looks at Kanoa below him. Who even though it is still called a village, Kanoha is not one, it is a city with decades above its peers. It is the no point one village in economy, army, population, growth, and anything else anyone can think of. Finally finally I have everything under control. Thinks Yami as a smile appears on his face. The five great ninja villages are only so in name, Kanoha is above them all. His plan's gone perfectly, no one here is to oppose him. No hidden enemy, he has hundreds of plans for the future. Everyone is dancing at the palm of his hand, everything under control. The people love Yami, as he has improved Kanoha in such a major way that some people call him the perfect Tokage, and no scandals have ever been revealed. Also his power, political, has grown to something unrivaled. Secret organizations like in California have been taken care of from Yami, having the organization infiltrated from the inside. He didn't wipe it out, after all he would have an organization against him that he can control than one he can't. Hiruzen and Jiraiya are running the organization, Arachimaru having pulled out in order to concentrate on his experiments. The in California organization never accomplished anything and didn't limit Yami's power at all. When Orochimaru saw that, he immediately figured out that these technical difficulties and delays he immediately left. He already figured that Yami already is under the control of it. Orochimaru is currently in one of his labs. He is actually outside the Land of Fire, on a mission, knowing that anywhere in the Land of Fire, he will be under Yami's eyes and control. TCH I should run away from Kanoha soon, and become a missing ninja. No other choice left, I am already pressured to go into the new research department. Thinks Orochimaru is his brows frown, he needs to hype himself to get the courage to run away from Kanoha. He knows that Yami will immediately start hunting him down. If he starts hunting me, I am not even 10% sure I can escape him. Yami will become like a madman, he will chase me to the ends of the world. But if I keep down my head for 4 years after escape, he should let his hunt dissipate. I can only hope that he will get bored by chasing me, or I will have to run for the rest of my immortality. Contemplates Orochimaru trying to predict if he will be able to outrun Yami. On the other hand, even with all of this scheming going around, in the slums of the city, where usually the lower income families live, there is a surprisingly high quality strip club called Shiro's Fur Smells Nice. There is someone who is living his life leisurely, not worrying about plots, plans or assassinations. He is just a simple white fur dog, he is just standing on a cushy couch. 
There were a couple of dog and cat girls all around him. Shiro just seems to be drooling. They are actually all cats or dogs who can use the transformation jutsu. So people with furry taste cone here. Shiro already made a deal with the cat summons. When he wants to he can be surprisingly convincing. When you live with Yami all of your life, you pick up a couple of things. Wait, I can think straight again, I need some more alcohol in my system then. Thinks Shiro, as he is slightly sobering up. He hasn't been sober in two years. The last time he was sober was at the time he had to ask Yami for a small loan of 50 million Ryo to open up his dream strip club. Of course he spent 40 million in a one year spree of hookers and cocaine. But after that he was ready to leave behind his wandering ways and settle down. He was getting quite up on his years. So he settled down by opening a strip club. So he doesn't have to be sober anymore when he has to ask for Yami's monthly check. He is self-sufficient now. Ah, this is the life I am living the dream. Thinks Shiro. Hey, Shikuba come and lick some honey off my tits. Calls out Shiro to some cat girl. But on the other elemental lands. In the hidden rock village. The Tsuchikij and the elders have all gathered here to discuss the topic of Yami in Yuzuka and Kanoha's recent rise in power. Anoki just looks at the elders and takes out a scroll throwing it towards them to read it. This is the latest information our Kanoha spies sent us, says Anoki as he has an extremely annoyed look on his face. When they open the message the elders immediately frown as they read the letter. Hey Yami here anyway, this spy was killed and tortured for information too. This one lasted three days. Okay who am I joking? He lasted like two minutes. We had a Yamanaka on the scene. P.S. Still open for a trade deal. I am that's for sure. Just imagine Kanoha having Iowa under its foot. I mean we as equal allies. The letter continues with half as written messages. There are even some food stains in it. Showing that Yami was writing this while he was eating most likely. They immediately think of attacking Kanoha and starting another war. But that thought is quenched as soon as it comes. Kanoha is way more powerful now that Yami is in charge. And attacking it would he done. As unlike Hiruzen, if Kanoha wins the war, Yami will be ripping apart the other lands like he was cutting a cake, he definitely wouldn't be polite about it. This is the fear that keeps them from starting another war. They know that with Hiruzen, they just need to act angry and Hiruzen will give in, because he doesn't want to continue the war. But Yami is a whole different story. Yami POV. It truly is amazing seeing the results of my actions. Kanova is stronger than ever, mostly due to my knowledge of economics and technology. I just sigh and go away from the window and back to my desk. I surprisingly have a lot more free time as Hokage than when I was your average s rank ninja. My office has a one-seat couch with my desk being wide and well-refined, and then there is the Forbidden Scroll that honestly surprised me a little. In the story when Naruto gets the Forbidden Scroll he learns the Shadow Clone Jutsu. It is made seem like there is only one Forbidden Scroll. But actually every Forbidden Technique in Kanoha has its own scroll. So even if someone was somehow able to steal one, it would only be one technique. They are all in way fakes. It is said that Orochimaru read the Forbidden Scroll. But he only knew Ido Tensei. He most likely assumed that the one in the Hokage's office is a fake, and thought that he found the location of the real one, which actually had the Ido Tensei. I knew it, no one is really dumb enough to put all of their techniques on one forbidden scroll. And only the Hokage knows all the secure locations of the Forbidden Scrolls. The second was really smart coming up with such a clever illusion of hiding scrolls. I finally go and sit down on my comfortable couch. I smirk a little as I see the shadow my hand casts. I didn't want to be Hokage to make Kanoha better or something like that. I could care less about Kanoha. But the place is my base of operations where I have absolute power so I will keep it. Even with the Nine Tails attack everything was planned. Minato and Kushina dying was also all according to plan. If either of them somehow survived I would have killed them. I don't hate either of them. But I need to keep at least a semblance of what the future will be. After all, future knowledge is my ultimate weapon. And I am not going to give it up just for Minato or Kushina. I mean sure Naruto will not have any parents and I should care. It seems more like someone else's problem than mine. Also I did let the Nine Tails attack destroy quite a bit of the businesses I own in Kanoha. After all it would seem suspicious. If I somehow saved my businesses. Or I sold out successful businesses. Before the Nine Tails attacked. I mean I know that I have changed some things. But that doesn't mean that the future will change so drastically like the Otsutsuki attacking right now. It is simply illogical, though I do have plans in case that happens. After all, it doesn't hurt to be prepared for things like this. While everyone else is playing chess and being concerned about me gaining more power over the political side, I don't really care about political power. In this world violence is the ultimate power. I look at the shadow that my hand casts on the ground. As I wave it around slowly the shadow moves by itself as if it has a physical form. The Nara technique I have already learned it. I have also learned the Yamanaka mind techniques. And even the Akamichi Yang techniques like the body expansion jutsu really any techniques in Kanoha I have already learned it. I have already learned Ido Tensei and I have also learned the immortality technique that Orochimaru uses. I use a shadow tendril to come close to my face and then Fwashpuchi. I piss my brain. I then use the shadow tendril to scramble my brain around. Ah, this pain is so amazing I can't die ha 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 this pain of feeling my brain scrambling. I am no masochistic, 
But this is amazing. I used Arachimaru's technique to immortalize my mind. The only way I really know how it is even possible to kill me now is to use the Reaper's Death Seal. I have already learned so many S-rank ninjutsu forbidden techniques. And I did this the smart way. I became Hokage. So no one can tell me that I can't learn these techniques. Nor will anyone make me a missing nin because of it. Ha 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 ha. This was my plan all along, with 100% benefits for me, and with almost no downside for me. Knock knock suddenly I hear a knock on the door. I immediately withdraw the shadow tendril from my brain, and let it regenerate as it does so in a split second it completely heals, and even my brain gets back to perfect shape. Come soon I will implement the Byakugan, since no matter what I can't have any brain damage now. Come on in. I say as I pull out some paperwork and act like I am working. That is when my hot blonde secretary, she wears a business suit she is a Yamanaka on um, millimeters. I have already fucked her. I could go another round with her. But now is not the time to do so again as I see a child around 4 years old hiding behind her embarrassingly. I just smile sweetly at this and say, Who is the little guy that you brought with you in Ami-chan? She just raises a questioning eyebrow at this. I just narrow my eyes at her. What bit H? You were literally choking on my dick 2 hours ago. So don't act like such an annoying whore. She just sighs at this. Yes, I have had her keep an eye on some things around here. And the kid behind her, yay, the kid behind her is a 4 year old Naruto. Yeah, since Hiruzen already announced that he was the Nine Tails Jinchuriki, he hasn't had an easy road. But the Inuzuka are always nice with him, so it doesn't affect him as much as it did in canon. Also Kiba and my other son who are the same age as him, they are friends. Plus some other of the orphans are good friends with Naruto. So there is that also a bunch of propaganda that I regularly shove down people's throats. After all, I do control every news channel in Kanoha. That is when Inami understands what I mean, and she gently nudges Naruto forward. Naruto-chan, say hello to Yami-sama. He is the Hokage. Naruto still seems nervous, so Inami decides to continue saying. He is also Narizan Kiba's dad. When she says that, Naruto seems to lose some of his nervousness and says, Chai Sir Yami. I just smile at him. His blonde hair and whisker making him look like a pet reincarnation of Asura. You will be very useful to me. General POV. Yami just looks at Naruto, a sweet smile on his face. Well hello there Naruto, Inami told me that you want to be Hokage in the future. That is quite a brave dream. As Yami says that Naruto's face brightens up and he answers. Sir, yes sir, I want to be the Hokage. Yami just laughs at this. Ha 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 ha. I know that your road will be hard little Naruto, but be assured that you can come and ask me for help anytime. After all, no one becomes Hokage with no friends and allies, even I have people who are dear to me and trust. The four year old Naruto immediately feels inspired by this. People that you can trust her thinks Naruto, immediately coming to the conclusion. I want to have that too. So anyway, what has been worrying you Naruto? Asks Yami, acting as if he isn't already fully aware of the situation, and as if he doesn't spy on Naruto 24 hours a day. When Yami says that Naruto seems nervous for a little while, but in the end he still decides to say, Uh, no, it's nothing. Naruto looks to the side, embarrassed. Inami just smiles gently at this. He just wanted to meet you Hokage-sama. It is nothing so drastic. So thank you for your time Yami. As she says that, she notices that she accidentally called Yami so casually. But they both play it off cool. Like they didn't notice, so Naruto wouldn't pay any attention to it. Naruto nods at this and goes back to hiding behind Inami. Yami just smiles at this as Inami and Naruto both go outside of his office. Yami POV. After they leave, I immediately just make a shadow clone to take my place, and fosh, I teleport back to my house where no one is currently inside. I just walk casually towards my laboratory in the basement entrance, and like usual after many security checks to confirm that it was really me, I finally got inside. I see the bodies of different clone peoples. I have finally figured out how to create life in a way. I just cloned a person, and use the chakra of another person to create a soul. Or more like create a shadow clone, that inhibits the physical bodies. So even if they are hit or even if the original dies they won't dispel. Honestly this was only possible due to the new understanding and perspective in life and death that the Forbidden S rank techniques have given me. So I can now already create life well more like clones, but whatever. Almost the same. After all I can adjust the age of the clone that I want to make while creating him. Though I have some countermeasures against betrayal, I will never make a clone of myself. Because I know that it will immediately try to kill me or scheme against me behind my back. Anyway as I walk along here I pass the Achiha clone room. I finally arrive at the Hayuga clone room. I see a dozen or so individuals floating in capsules filled with green liquid. I have a couple of smaller capsules with Byakigans in them. So that is when I go and get a pair of them. I make three shadow clones and lie down on the operation table. My clones know what to do, as I feel them slowly opening my forehead and making two holes on the skill for them to fit in there. But before they put in the Byakigan, they first connect the brain with the eyes. 
After that, with my regeneration, in 20 seconds I am ready to use my new Byakugan. As I used it I felt weird x-ray and almost 360 degrees vision. Though it seems like it only extends 500 meters. Well that can easily be fixed. But damn I can actually see the movements of the people all around. Though sadly due to my Fuenjutsu around the room, it makes it fuzzy to look on the inside with a Byakugan. Because I already have countermeasures against it and blurring anything but I can still see clearly outside the underground room, which is kinda weird. It is after 2 months, and that is when my Byakugan's range is at around 1.5 kilometers. That something interesting happens, the delegates from Kumo come. I already know that they might try to kidnap Hinata, but who knows. My power isn't for nothing after all. People are afraid to take certain actions just because of me. Currently, here I am, sitting with the Kumo delegates, there are three of them. They all seem like the average middle-aged ninja. Hokage Sama I am Kayan. I shall overlook the signing of the contract and confirm with Rakage Sama, says the thin and smart seeming middle-aged man. I just nod at this. I already know what the contract is about. Five days pass and there is no problem. Kumo didn't dare act anything else but civil. Wow Hiruzen's leadership must have really sucked. I mean in canon, Kumo came here to sign a deal. They broke the deal by trying to kidnap Hinata. Then their kidnapper is killed. Instead of refusing to associate themselves with the kidnapper they owned it up. And even made Hiruzen give them the one who killed the delegate. That is as much of a bitch as you can be. No wonder he had to step down as Hokage. He is weak and not a strong dealer. Sai as expected, I am changing things without even meaning to. Since I am not weak like Hiruzen, people don't dare do something against Kanoha when I am the leader. I mean Hiruzen allowed Danzo to orchestrate an assassination against him, and even though it failed he didn't do anything to Danzo, and let him get away scot-free. As another month passes, Atachi seems to graduate from the academy. That was about as interesting as this month had been. But still I have to complete another procedure today it will allow me to change from a simple human man into something more. Now that the red cube is complete, now I just need to be delicate with it. I just walk towards my lab and lie down as five of my shadow clones start the procedure, which will make me at least two X's strong. As it starts I can feel them start shaving my head first and digging out the skull slowly. I could feel different visions appear around my head yes. I have already put in their Kamui and different Sharingan all over my skull, with different Manjekyo abilities, and connected them all to the brain, allowing me to use multiple Manjekyo abilities. As I get up, I look at a mirror and see a pale-skinned man with a bald head, and twitching eyes all around his head that was me. That honestly looks grotesque so poof one transformation jutsu later. I look just like my normal self. Well that is that that is when I undo the transformation and am back to my grotesque self. And I pull out the red cube time to use this thing on me now. I look at my monstrous appearance with my Byakugan. All over my head there are Sharingans. And my hair has all fallen due to the stress my body is due to the mass of bloodline limits inside it. There are even some strands of hair around where there are no eyes on the top of my head. Damn, I look hideous as expected my body is already reaching the limit. No one can grow infinitely not even Kagaya or anyone there is a limit. And your own cells start to die out, unable to handle your own power. But since this has been already predicted, I have made countermeasures against this. After all I don't plan to stop growing stronger like ever, omnipotence isn't something that one can just get without any work. Anyway, my ugly appearance can easily be altered. Plus even if it wouldn't be fixed, if it gave me a significant power boost I wouldn't necessarily care. After all, what is appearance worth if you have the power to do whatever you want? You want a beautiful woman just take her. No need to ask or care what her thoughts are. Someone despises you because of your appearance that is easy. Just kill them. Why would I care about what others think of them? If it doesn't give me an advantage sigh. But still as I lie down on the medical and my clones look over me. I can't help but think about the harsh road that I had to walk to get here. Thankfully, I had the will to never falter on my goals. Now I am powerful I can confidently say that at least. I obviously not always made the best decisions, but I always took the best possible decision with the knowledge I had at the time. So now I am the most powerful person in all of the elemental nations. Soon I will kill the daimyo and all of his sons, putting my son with Shuri in there. I put my hand in my chest. Hoochie my fingers sink inside my flesh easily, as they sink further inside my flesh. My hand sinks deep up to my wrist. I pull out the red cube and throw it towards one of my clones, and I nod at him. My pain tolerance really has gotten monstrous. I can handle so much pain, and don't even flinch now. In comparison to my first life, the clones start putting tubes on me, filling my body with nutrients, giving it the necessary proteins for growth and healing. My monstrous body does the rest as it immediately started releasing steam, already in a state of pre-healing. Slowly one of my shadow clones controls the cube, as the Fuenjutsu starts rotating around it. Slowly a strange energy is created by the cube and... Wash like a blast the energy flows into me I can immediately feel the changes in my body. I wince a little, but the pain isn't that bad. All of my body hair starts falling, and my skin starts cracking. 
black oily sweat comes out of my skin. My body starts getting thinner and thinner, until it seems just like skin and bones, even the hard build muscles deteriorate. This cube has many abilities of the countless treasures that it has absorbed, but its main ability is evolution IT forces the cells of the body to evolve with the soul of the zero tails as a conductor. It is in a way something that forces the body to evolve to its perfect form available to it. Slowly my muscles start building up, at a speed that is visible to the normal eye. Like worms crawling below my skin, my body starts healing and repairing it black blood flows from my eyes, nose and mouth. One of the clones nudges another and says, This is gross. The other just gives him a side glance while more like a glare as he says, Shut up. The other clone looks a little down and nods, just trying to lighten up the mood. Well you are doing a shitty job at it. What if we die? Don't detract us anymore. Either shut up or get out, you are an eyesore. General POV. It takes two hours for the procedure to be finished. At the end of it, Yami is surrounded by shed skin. He smiles at this. He has an extremely pale skin as if it is painted with white. He also has no hair at all on his body. Shit, I don't even look human anymore. He then mentions one of his clones to stab him. They oblige and fwosh, the kunai is stuck on the strong skin. The clone pushes a little more, and is finally able to draw a little blood. Yami smirks at the results the evolution cube, seems to be as useful as expected. This is the current limit of my current body, contemplates Yami. He just dispels all of his clones. He gets up and senses that his chakra has grown exponentially. His natural body is beyond what is imaginable for a normal human. Chakra is miraculous and has many different jutsu that can be used with it. That you can say that the techniques are endless. Evolution is something that is possible, especially with the Zero Tails soul, who can create Dark Chakra which forces change in one's body. Yami simply closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Slowly his bald head is filled with black hair, and the eyes are all dragged on the inside of his skull. Slowly under his skin he creates a type of exoskeleton. His skin color changes and his face returns back to normal. He can manipulate every single cell on his body. Can I even be physically called a human anymore? Contemplates Yami. His body already works so differently from a different human, that scientists would love to dissect him. Especially his cells, they have an even stronger vitality than Hashirama cells. So the newly called Yami cells are even harder to integrate with someone else. Of course his body is even better now. His cells can handle his own energy now. Though he won't be getting any new bloodlines, he doesn't want a cellular breakdown yet. I just need to get myself some Otsutsuki body, and I will be golden. Thinks Yami, wondering how their bodies will react with the evolution cube. Just like this, two months pass and Yami is currently on his office, in Army. The Yamanaka secretary of his is under his table, with his dick in her mouth. Slurp Yami has his eyes closed, and is watching his first life's memories like a movie. He is watching the Avengers movie well more like re-watching. Suddenly the door to his office is opened, and he can immediately determine who it is by using his Bayakigan. It is a young Enko Mitarashi. She seems sad as she finally says, Yami Sama Orochimaru has deserted. Yami just nods at this, Enko was his spy against Orochimaru. So she isn't really badly affected as she was during canon when Orochimaru left. Inami stopped sucking him off once she noticed that someone else was in the room feeling nervous. But Yami just mentions toward her to continue, and she is unsure, but still follows Yami's orders. I see, just send a squad to hunt him down, says Yami casually, not really caring about Orochimaru. He already had dozens of spies amongst Orochimaru's ranks. Orochimaru is a genius, but Yami is so far along in his own game, that to him someone like Orochimaru is just another pawn that moves accordingly to him. Two weeks later in a certain unidentified cave, corpses of Kanoha Ambu are all around the place. Orochimaru is covered in blood and is breathing a little heavily, though there seems no visible injury on his body. Still he grimaces a little. They used acidic poison. If I wasn't so knowledgeable about poisons I would have actually died. I really need to develop the curse mark faster, so I will no longer be worried about things like this. He then frowns as he looks at the surrounding carnage. TCH I hate Yummy. That arrogant bastard. By sending just these five down and level Ambu, he pretty much told me that I am free to go that fucker. Orochimaru rages more as he punches the wall next to him. But suddenly he hears an almost quiet sound that if it wasn't so quiet, he wouldn't have heard FSSSST explosion tanks boom. That is when the cave immediately caves in on itself. Yami POV. While in my office. I just smile as I look through the eyes of one of the flies outside the cave. Orochimaru obviously survived this. But not without a scratch, he lost one of his legs. Obviously I know that he can make a new one, but he will need time too. Also he doesn't have the healing methods that he will have in the future. He still hasn't perfected his experimental jutsus. He is my pawn he just doesn't know it yet. Sigh really though it seems like I may need to step things up a little. I am already 100% prepared for when the fourth ninja war comes around, but some more preparations don't hurt. Also I have a certain seedling that I have been helping to grow. I sense the horation I have close to that person and wish I disappear in a dark flash. When my view changes, I see that I'm in a dark room, with a man sleeping on his desk. He has different books about chakra and chakra theories all around him. I immediately activate the Bayakigan and as a side effect, veins appear on my forehead. I know that even if I slap the person sleeping in front of me too hard he will be killed by me. 
But that doesn't mean that I have to be careless this man's name is Haruko. He is a white haired man with red eyes, he is wearing a beige robe with red undergarments, and his hair's length has reached his hips. I just reach him and grab the back of his head. He immediately wakes up, but before he can even do anything, his eyes go dull, and he starts drooling like a vegetable. I have a ball made out of light in my hand. This is all the memories of Haruko. Plop Haruko slips out of his chair and drops to the ground, but I am not interested in it. I just put the ball of light and use the Yamanaka techniques, and watch Haruko's life like a movie. But I skip the boring parts. Like the part where he didn't have funds for his research, but he coincidentally won the Inuzuka lottery. Under a minute I read through it completely, and when I do so I clutch the ball of light, shattering it into a million pieces as the memories disappear. I look at Haruko drooling on the floor. I just get close to him and put my foot on his head. Burst bursting it open like a watermelon, and killing Haruko. Well, I got the chimera technique that I wanted from him. I am thankful to him, he did spend his life working for something, and I got the results of his hard work. Though I will need to modify the technique for myself. I thank you for all of your hard work Harumo. You will be remembered for it by me. Since that day one year has passed and here I am, at the age of 28. I am currently in my office, looking at the young ninja in front of me. He has just recently graduated to tune in it as Itachi Ichiha, Itachi POV. Though I keep a calm exterior look, I can't help but feel as if I am being read like an open book. Being in front of the Hokage really is something else. Even though I have already met the third Hokage, here is in Saratobi. The old man gives a friendly vibe, contrary to the fifth Hokage, Yami Inuzuka. He has a whole different feel about him. I feel myself as if suffocating on air. His presence is overwhelming. No wonder he is known as the best Hokage Kanoa has ever had. I still remember when we first met I asked him about the meaning of life, and he kicked me off a cliff. A very drastic way to teach someone, but at the same time it is very efficient. It helped me understand that life is precious, and no one wants to die not even me. So, Itachi says the Hokage pulling me out of my thoughts. You seem to be a tuner now. At this rank there are a lot of options that you can choose to go through. As an Ichiha you could join the Ichiha police. Or you could just go through missions with a couple of squads, till you are ready to be given the Jonin rank. But there are also options like the T&I division, or the border patrol teams. As he says that the Hokage has a serious look on his face, as he gives me all of the possible options that I have for the future. I think through all of this, but I already have chosen, though the Hokage didn't say it. I know that there is one more choice to join the secret division of Kanoha, the Anbu Black Ops. Hokage-sama I am grateful for your guidance, but I would like to join the Anbu. As I say this I bow my head slightly to show respect to the Hokage, and that I don't mean bad, nor do I think of his advice as useless. When I look at him, I see that the Hokage has a strange smile on his face. He doesn't seem surprised at all by what I said. I guess you have made up your mind haven't you? Says the Hokage as he takes out a paper and signs it, handing it over to me. I just nod at him and go over to take the paper. When I read it, my eyes widen as I read the last part of the paper. Name. Atachi Ichiharank. Tune in division. And the role. Hokage's personal guard I look at the Hokage and see a mischievous smile on his face. I must say that you will make a good addition to the team isn't that right guys? Suddenly out of the shadows dozens of Amber come out. They just nod without saying anything. There are no defining characteristics for any of them. They even wear the same blank mask with the Inuzuka tattoos on the mask. General POV. During this time on another place in Kanoha, in the Jounin restaurant, there are three people sitting together in their own booth. One of them is a female with black slightly spiky hair. She is a fair-skinned woman of slender build. She has long black untamed hair reaching her upper back and unique eyes that are red with an additional ring in them. She wears makeup consisting of red lipstick and purple eyeshadow. Her outfit consists of a red mesh armor blouse with only the right sleeve visible. Overall, this is very broad material which resembles bandages with a pattern on it, similar to those of rose thorns. Her hands and upper thighs are also wrapped in bandages, and she wears the Kanoha forehead protector and regular shinobi sandals. She is Kuronayuri. She is currently 19 years old, and is a well-known journal of Kanoha. Ah, I hate it. Yami Sensei hasn't called me at all, not to even talk for the last month. That is so annoying, says Kuronai, and it is apparent that she has had a little too much to drink, shown so by the way she talks about Yami. Next is Guy who is just wearing his usual green jumpsuit, and his usual bowl cut hairstyle. Hum, didn't you go to Yuruchi's birthday? Says Guy, since Yami always invites his students to any party as they are like his protege and his pride. They have, after all, made quite a name for themselves as elite Jounin of Kanoha and as Yami's students. When Koronai hears Guy ask her that she grimaces. Yeah, I was invited. But Shiori, Yami's wife, was staring daggers at me the whole time. Asuma, on the other hand, has his head on the table. Yami goes to each of his children's birthdays and spends time with them. My dad, Hiruzen, didn't even come home most of the time. Guy just shrugs at what they say. You guys are weird. Yami invites me to his daily youthful training, and we even discuss tajutsu techniques together. Kor and I immediately looks at Guy with a fire lit in her eyes. 
Can I join? When are the meeting times? Says Koronai, even though it seemed like she was asking. In reality she was just stating her decision. Guy just shrugs again and eats some beef that is brought over by a waiter. It's usually in the morning, on top of the Hokage Mountain. Though I can't promise you anything. Sometimes he is there and sometimes he is not. Koronai nods at this. But there must be a rhythm to his meeting times. And if I can only figure it out. I can meet up with Yami-sensei whenever I want. Asuma's head is still on the table as a river of tears flows from his eyes. Ah, today really sucks. Guy just takes another plate of food that he ordered and starts eating it. And he gives the way to the plate that he already finished. Wouldn't it be easier to just go to the Hokage Tower and ask to meet him? Says Guy, wondering why Kurunai even goes to all of this trouble. Yami is truly free most of the time, and he knows it since he is regularly invited by Yami to teach Kiba to Jutsu. No, you don't understand. If I do that I will seem too desperate, says Kurunai, trying to think of a way on how to meet Yami regularly, while at the same time away from his wife Shuri, who is like a bloodhound against any woman that approaches Yami. Snore that is when Asuma starts snoring, signifying that he is asleep. Guy just orders another plate and Kurunai gets annoyed at this. Don't you ever stop eating. This wakes Asuma up. Ha! Huh. What's going on he says while still half asleep and with a lot of alcohol on his system. But when he sees that nothing is going on he just goes back to sleep. Snow Kurunai notices that people from the other booths are looking over. So she settles down and says quietly. Can't you listen to my problems seriously for once? Guy shrugs again for the dozenth time today. I don't know what you want me to do. I just told you. Go and meet Yami. Why are you so stressed about it? You were his student and he taught you countless Jinjutsu. Why are you acting so awkward about it now? You are like an academy fangirl. Kurunai grabs her head in frustration at this. Ah, you don't understand anything. As Kurunai hangs her head down on the table, another female voice comes and says, Hey, watch are all going. When she hears this, Kurunai looks up and sees that it is just Enko. Oh, hey, Enko. It's just that Kurunai doesn't know how to get in contact with Yami, says Guy, explaining to her the situation as Anko just sits down next to Kurunai. Ham, can't she just go and ask to meet him, suggests Anko. That is what I said, inputs Guy. But that will make me seem desperate, explains Kurunai in a sad mood. But you are desperate, says Anko, as she too orders some food for herself. Hey, I am not desperate, whines Kurunai. Anko just shrugs at this. Whatever makes you sleep at night, but doesn't Hokage-sama have like the daimyo's daughter as a wife and Tsuma's his lover? Or is she his concubine? Side chick. What even is she? Kurunai's mood immediately flops down when she hears that. Ugh, don't remind me of that. Yeah, you are delusional. You can't see reality. I work in the T and I division, and I must say that Hokage-sama might also have something going on with that hot secretary of his. Informs Anko with a devilish smile on her face. Also, one time I heard strange moans when I was outside of the Hokage's office, and when I opened it, the secretary had disheveled hair and was breathing heavily. They were definitely you know. Ah, don't tell me that. I don't want to know it, says Kurunai, getting more anxious and annoyed the more Anko talks. Anko decides to add fuel to the fire by saying, also going after a married man. Never took you for that kind of girl, Kurunai. Kurunai just looks sad at this, she seems genuinely sad. That makes Anko cringe a little. She didn't want it to go this far, she just wanted to tease Kurunai a little. Yami always treats me like a kid. I am 19 now, but whenever we meet he still treats me like I am half my age. Whines Kurunai as a certain sadness is apparent in her eyes. On the other hand Yami, who is still in his office, is thinking of something else. Yami POV, the Achiha clan, they don't really act against me, but they are dangerous. I absolutely fear their power. Any Achiha with a Manjakyo Sharingan is one Achiha too much. After all, when the next person gets Kodamatsukami, he might not be as stupid as Shisui to tell other people his ability. That would be too dangerous for me. It could ruin my plans. I already have Sharingan farm with the Achiha that are clone. Well, that is simple then I just massacre them all. But at the same time it is not that simple. Manipulating Itachi to do it is simple. But I will need someone to take the blame when the truth eventually comes out. After all, I mean sure I can easily handle an angry Sasuke or Itachi. Why take the risk? Danzo is dead so I will need someone else. Hum I will also need to discreetly manipulate Kanoa's population to have a more negative opinion on the Achiha. That will push the Achiha over the edge, and then they will most likely plan a coup de rate and try to overthrow me. But at the same time my reputation will work against me. The Achiha wouldn't dare go against me. They know that I can single-handedly crush the whole clan with low difficulty. Hum I will need to plan around many things. But one thing is for sure, an unstable factor like the Achiha has to go. Two months pass after Yami comes to the conclusion that the Achiha should be eliminated. During this time the only noteworthy event that happened was that Zabuza failed the coup in Kiri. He tried to make changes. 
but he failed, that is when people who are weak try to do something big. So he became a missing nin to be hunted for the rest of his life, inside of the Achiha clan compound, in the clan head's home. With Fugaku doing his work on the police force, Makoto looks at her son, Itachi, as he is sleeping on the porch, with Sasuke also sleeping next to him. Even though Itachi was tired from his work he still helped his little brother train. Seems like being Yami's bodyguard is quite tiring it seems. Thinks Makoto, as her mind wanders, she can't help but think about Yami. More specifically, she is remembering something that they did when they were younger. To this day that is something that she extremely regrets. She remembers how embarrassing it was to have Yami at her wedding. Him having a polite smile on his face during the wedding. But when she looked at his eyes once, she could see the endless amusement that Yami was feeling at that moment. Just like this, a couple of months pass. And in one of the training grounds, Guy is sparring with Yami. Koronai is there too, she is just watching them. But she can't follow either of them clearly. Yami was in his base form, and his strong body is easily able to keep up with a six-gate guy. As they are engaging in close quarters combat, in a split second guy jumps back and he starts punching the air, until heat is produced by the speed and slowly fireballs are created from it, and start going towards Yami. The sky is covered in hundreds of little fireballs. Koronai sees this and decides to make an earth wall around her, just in case any fireballs jump through to her. But she still keeps an open part in her defenses, so she can see Yami. Yami on the other hand is completely calm, as he sees the sea of fire coming towards him. His leg muscles just swell twice their normal size, and he does a strong wide kick towards the fire, creating a giant gust of wind. Fwash the wind hits the fire, and due to the strong wind, the fire changes direction. Yami has an amused smirk on his face as he loudly says, Let's see how you handle this guy. Guy on the other hand also has a calm look on his face. After all, Yami has always taught him that he must act calm during battle. Other things become secondary he must have 100% concentration on the battle. I am currently midair, how do I solve this? Thinks Guy as he tries to come up with something, but he can't come up with anything. That is when he remembers that Yami always told him that if you can't come up with something, then brute forcing your way out of the situation is better than doing nothing. Seventh gate. Gate of wonder open. Frush chakra starts rummaging through his body. Guy can feel the mass of pain, but he doesn't let it distract him. His sweat immediately evaporates, creating a blue aura around him. He knows that punching air in this gate is possible, so he gets ready to obliterate the fire. But he suddenly stops and thinks, if punching air is possible, the leg is 3x stronger than the arms, so what about kicking? As Guy thinks this he kicks once he didn't feel anything. But as he does so again he can feel a resistance, and as the fire gets closer to him, instead of fear, a smile appears on his face, his teeth shining in the light. The third time he kicks the air, how he disappeared at this as the fire covered his previous place. Yami still has his smirk on his face. I see that is interesting, Guy. So now you can maneuver through air. Guy who is now upside down he adjusts his body and pow. It sounds like a gunshot as he kicks the air. This time he just hovers by constantly kicking the air. He looks excited as he looks towards Yami. Sensei look this is my new technique. What do you think I should name it? Asks Guy as he looks at his sensei with amazement. He still can't believe that he is flying while kinder flying. Yami thinks for a little and says. How about Skywalk? Guy smiles at this. Sensei, you are superb at naming things sometimes. Yami narrowed his eyes at that. What is sometimes supposed to mean? Guy just looks around nervously. He sees Kurunai and gives her a look telling her to say something. She just shakes her head saying this is your problem. Deal with it on your own. Guy looks at Yami uncomfortably. Ah, uh, Yami just cracks his knuckles as he looks at Guy. One year passes fast like this. Yami continues to manipulate things behind the scenes. The Achiha clan's reputation plummeted during this time, and different rumors started floating around, raising the suspicion that the Achiha controlled the Nine Tails. Obviously the smart people know that is unlikely, but the people with the mob mentality followed the rumors, and the village started to shun the Achiha clan. Atachi POV. I contemplate the events happening as of late as I walk down the dark hallway of the Amber building. I go towards a section where the Hokage's guards have their meetings. As the Hokage's personal guard I have a general idea of what is happening. Yami-sama has ordered Shisui to use his coat Matsukami on the Achiha clan. Shisui is willing to do so. I know that should be the end of it but... There is another unstable factor in this. I arrive at a metal door at the end of the hallway. I open the door and inside there is dim lighting on the inside. In the room there is just a man sitting in the middle of the room with a table in front of him. Even though I know he is a ninja, one would never assume that the man is wearing a fedora and normal civilian clothing. The weirdest thing though is the sunglasses he is wearing even indoors, and in such a poor lighted room. He is the absolutely loyal subordinate and one of Yami's closest advisors. He is also who is rumored to have abounded his family to be a full-time Anbu. He does Yami's dirty work, he is also suggesting that the Achiha be killed. But even though Yami disagreed with that, the man said that he will take care of the Achiha as soon as they show signs of a coup. He is someone extremely dangerous his name is Heisenberg the man willing to give his life to Yami. When he looks at me I notice that like always. I can't figure out what he is thinking with those sunglasses on him. General POV Atachi looks at Heisenberg. He can't help but be a little intimidated by him. There are no public files on him. 
So that means that Heisenberg is most likely not his real name. But one thing is for sure he has most likely killed so many people that the whole Achir clan wouldn't even make that much of a difference on his body count. Analyses Atachi as he looks at the man in front of him. In case that Shisui's plan doesn't work, I think that poisoning is the best idea. Of course we will save your brother as long as you agree to take the blame, says Heisenberg. His body language is absolutely cold, not expressing anything. And he is terrifyingly smart. There are rumors of him killing people with poisons and chemical weapons. How Yami can have someone like him under his thumb just shows to the people who know of Heisenberg's existence that Yami is a strong Hokage. He doesn't allow any of his subordinates to stray away like the third Hokage did. At least that is in Itachi's view. The third Hokage, Hiruzen, has approached him to join some type of secret organization. But he obviously refused. Yami isn't someone you want to cause trouble for. His clan is already so close to being exterminated. And he doesn't want to take the risk of angering Yami. Because he knows that Yami will exterminate the Ichiha clan. If even one of them steps out of line, look at what happened with Danzo and the Shimura clan. Just like this two months pass. And during this time Shisui is getting ready to use his coat Matsukami. In gathering his chakra, after all, to put such a huge number of ninja under the effect of a Manjekyo ability isn't that easy. So today Shisui has been called by Heisenberg to meet up with him. So that is where he is going, to the meeting place outside of Kanoha. As Shisui is walking at the meeting place, he notices that there are a lot of ninja hiding around him. Heisenberg isn't stupid enough to assassinate me. That could spell civil war within Kanoha, he knows we can't have that contemplates Shisui, but still he gets ready just in case Heisenberg does something. After all, Kanoha is in a tense situation, really the only thing stopping the Achiha from attacking is the Hokujami and Yuzuka. Some of the Achiha clan members are absolutely terrified of him, so they are thinking if they should really go with the coup. Most of the elders are against it, but a dozen reckless people and everything is over. As he gets closer to the meeting destination, the more nervous Shisui feels nervous. He knows that people who know of his Manjekia's ability look at him differently, but he still hopes that doesn't cloud Heisenberg's judgment. He finally arrives at the old shrine on the side of the Hokage Mountain. There was no one there until suddenly out of the shadows comes Heisenberg, with his signature sunglasses and fedora hat. He is also wearing civilian clothes like usual. Shisui Heisenberg fosh before Shisui could even say anything Heisenberg rushed towards him. He was about to react when bam, he felt an electrical current behind his back Yami POV. I am currently in the trees as I see my shadow clone go behind Shisui and knock him out, pretty easily. But I still had to be careful because of Kota Matsukami. After that, I have my clone pull out both of Shisui's eyes as I get closer, doing dozens of checks to make sure I am not under a Jinjutsu. As I get close my clone named Heisenberg dispels himself. I will make another one soon. I do need someone to take the blame for bad things happening. In a way I need a scapegoat that won't resist or anything like that. And that is who Heisenberg is my little pet Danzo who actually listens to me. Anyway I modify Shisui's memory, making it seem like Heisenberg only took one of his eyes, and he was able to escape Heisenberg and his Anbu, pretty much making it like it was in the canon timeline. But instead of the dead Danzo, I make it Heisenberg. This way I can predict his actions, and I also take some of his blood, to make me some Kotomatsukami clones he 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 general POV. One week later this night the moon is red. Mikoto is there with her husband, Sasuke is at the academy. So she should find relief in that. She and her husband know what is going to happen more specifically they know what is already happening. As she thinks of this she can't help but cry at this. Why why is this happening to us? Fugaku on the other hand is calm. He looks at his wife with a pitiful look on his eyes. We know I took a gamble. And it seems like it didn't work. But who would have thought that Yami would do something like this put our own child against us? Even more tears swell in Mikoto's eyes. Fugaku sees this. He can't help but sigh inside his heart. Mikoto, we will need to be strong in front of Itachi. We don't want us being in despair. The last image Itachi sees of us. Mikoto takes a deep breath and uses her ninja training to stop herself from crying. Yami was what we had nothing important to you. I guess it was just me then, waiting for you to come and save me. I guess I was just your plaything. Then wasn't I how could I be so stupid and naive? On the other hand, Yami is in his house. Tonight they are having a celebration, every one of his family is there from his mother, Kibakoma, Hana, Sum, Yuruchi, Shiori and his last child with Shiori Nari in Yuzuka. He is the same age as Kiba. Nari has straight black hair and blue eyes, he also looks very girly which is weird. But whatever, Kiba is running around with his puppy Akimaru. Nari on the other hand is reading a medical book. He wants to be a medical ninja just like his father Yami. Yami POV I drink a little sweet orange juice with my kids. The Achiha massacre is at the back of my mind. I have clones all over that place, so it isn't a problem if the massacre will succeed or not. Abito also made contact with Itachi, so Itachi will be my spy against the Akatsuki. I really don't respect Itachi at all. The guy who betrayed his family, someone like that is beyond trash to me. Hum, I really am hypocritical. But if someone asked me to kill my family in my first world, the first thing I'm doing to that guy is raping his daughter, wife, mother and sister in front of him. Then I would brutally torture them all in front of him. 
But that wouldn't be the end as I would dig into his balls with a rusty spoon. But I guess Atachi didn't really love his family as much as he thinks. He loves a village who shuns him more than his family. What a dumbass no wonder people use him as a tool. Because he is one, I just take another sip out of my orange juice. Then again, I am glad that not a lot of people are like me, or I would have to kill them. So in the end I am thankful to Atachi for sacrificing his family, so I can feel safe. I take another sip of my orange juice. This is some good juice. Next day, after having a very nice breakfast with my family, I just go towards my office for my hokage duties. Well honestly I am just going there so I can have some nice time with my lover. Ah, cheating on my wife has a certain thrill to it. My clones already took care of everything after the Ichiha massacre. I people will most likely think that I was up all night taking care of everything. But in actuality my shadow clones took care of everything. And I had a nice sleep and even fucked my wife with no problem. While the Ichiha clan was being massacred. Thankfully Shiori is still beautiful enough. As soon as her physical appearance starts deteriorating. I will kill her and find me a new wife. Honestly we have a very good sex life. And she is a moderately happy wife. Most of the unhappiness comes from me cheating on her repeatedly. But her looks are the only reason I didn't kill her. After I got a son. She finished her job. I got the son who will replace the current daimyo and be the leader of the land of fire. With me pulling the strings, obviously. I walk into the hospital alone. I was surrounded by my amber guards. Who are around me most of the time. I honestly don't need them. I could kill them all in less than a second. But whatever, they are mostly here as an aesthetic. I arrive in front of the hospital rooms. I open the door and see the kid Sasuke with dull eyes looking in front of him. Yet, yeah, soon the emo will develop. I mean, fans of the anime in my first world used to say that Sasuke was just emo. But I mean he had his whole family killed in front of him by his brother. Anyway, gotta say something comforting. Sasuke I call out to him. He doesn't seem to listen. But I know that he is listening. Me being the best medical ninja isn't just a title. I can easily tell something like when a patient is listening or not. What Atachi did was unforgivable. I can't say that I understand your pain or something like that. But I can promise you that Atachi will be hunted like a dog. Though I can't predict his motive or if he had someone to help him. As I say that I notice that Sasuke comes out of it. He looks at me. He had no definite motive. Says Sasuke with a broken voice. He just said that he wanted to test himself. He also let me live. Because he wants to see if I will be a challenge in the future. And then he oh wow. He just starts to tell me his whole life story. And how what Itachi did all along was just an act. Oh this is gonna be a long story isn't it? I guess I will just make a shadow clone and have it listen to him. No way am I listening to this shit. I don't care about his life story or his relationship with Itachi. So two years passed since the Acheha massacre. And here I am. In my office relaxing. Time passes really fast when you are relaxing. Being hokage isn't that hard really. It's just that somehow ninjas forget to use the shadow clone to do their paperwork. Honestly that is like most of them have high intelligence but no wisdom. Suddenly as I reminiscing about this, out of the shadows, one of my shadow clones comes out and gives me a document. I read it, and it's just Kakashi leaving Anbu. Not that big of a deal really. Anyway, I better be at my daughter's academy graduation. I didn't let either of them graduate before being 12 years old. I trained them as good as I could, so at the age of 12, Hana is about Chunin level, Yuruchi is at low level Jounin. Kiba is still in the academy, and my other son Nari is studying in the fire capital. Though I use Horatian to bring him back home every day. Nari is gonna be the daimyo soon. So that is why he isn't in the ninja academy. I look at my daughters after their graduation. I just wave at them when I see them with their headbands. Yo, dad, says Yuruchi casually and points towards her headband. Looks cool right? Except the whole shining which pretty much says come kill me. I don't even know why they make them like this. I just smile at this and pat her head. Come on now Yuruchi don't be so mean. But this is like another test to see that when they become Genin if they dull their headbands. That is actually why most Genin don't make it to Chunin. It's like the secret criteria. Hana just walks with her three puppy wolves like Ninkin. Dad isn't that kinda mean. I just smile and put my hands on their shoulders. And using Horatian, we all teleport away in a dark flash. When we arrive at home Yuruchi just shrugs and says. Well you have to be smart to be a ninja. If they die because of that then they die. As long as it isn't family. Why should we care for anyone else? I smirk when she says that. But Hana seems a little angry. Hey, don't say things like that. What about our Ninkin and the nice people of Kanoha? Yuruchi yawns at this. Yeah, Ninkin are just dogs. And the other Kanoha citizens are simply strangers. I could care less about any of them. When I hear that I burst into a full out laughter. Ha 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 Yuruchi you truly are my daughter. Then I look at Hana and pat her head. Hana, never forget. Family is everything. These people will turn your back on you as soon as it suits them. General POV. Two months later, the news of the daimyo and almost all of his successors died. It was a family gathering dinner. But an accident happened with some explosion tags being transported, and everyone on the daimyo's castle was killed. It was a tragedy of the highest caliber. When news reached Konoha, it was big news, and it was published by the Inuzuka newspaper. Shiori Inuzuka is just having an average day, watering the flowers in her garden as wondering how much her husband has cheated today. 
and that is when the newspaper kid drops the newspaper. Shiori decides to open and read the paper like usual, but her eyes widen once she sees the front page. E this she looks at the first headline. Daimyo and his family are dead due to an explosion accident. Her mind is going through countless memories of her family, her father, mother, sisters and brothers. Though she and her family didn't always have the best relationship, to her they were still family. Suddenly she stops who will be the next Daimyo though. Finally like a lightning bolt it hits her, Yami did this. Madly thinks Shiori immediately she turns around and goes towards the mansion, her face filled with rage. Immediately Shiori goes inside the house. No one is inside, Soon was on a mission, and Jiruchi and Hana have taken their brothers to the park. But Yami was inside, Shiori due to her rage didn't notice how conveniently the house is empty during this time. As she enters the luxurious living room she sees Yami, just putting some fruits in a blender to make a smoothie. When Shiori saw the carefree way he was acting, she immediately shouted at Yami. You juice drinking piece of shit. Yami suddenly stopped and looked at Shiori with wide eyes. Whoa, you kiss your mother with that mouth. At the mention of her family, Shiroi gets even angrier as her eyes become bloodshot and tears flow out of it. You killed them. Yami seems confused at this. What? Killed? Whom? Shiori for a split second almost thinks that Yami truly doesn't know what is going on. But then she remembers how good of an actor he is, so she blows upon him again. You killed my family, didn't you? Just so you can put her son on the throne. You fuck her. I will have the whole land of fire hunting you down. Yami looked truly bewildered by this. Wait, what? Killed your family. What the hell are you talking about? Shiori just throws the newspaper in her hand at Yami. She throws it with full force, intending to hit him in the head. But Yami casually catches it. You bastard. Screams Shiori in rage as she rushes towards Yami in anger. Due to her rage forgetting that she can easily be killed by an academy student, not to mention someone like Yami. Dear. Don't you know that I have been in the house all day long? Says Yami, seemingly trying to justify himself, as he easily dodges Shiori's pathetic attacks. She even goes to take a kitchen knife and attack him. I know that you did IT. Screams Shiori as she suddenly falls to her knees in despair. I know how you are. You kill anyone who isn't useful to you or is in your way. You are a monster, never thinking of other people, as if the whole world is your plaything. You kill fathers, sons, daughters, and mothers. Finally, she looks up and sees Yami with a shocked face. She gets a smile of victory and points a finger towards him. You never think about who you kill or how you might ruin someone's life. You never love anyone the world could burn for all you care. As she says that she looks at Yami who has wide eyes and is breathing hard. She saw no flaw in his act. She herself almost believed it. Can you stop it for once, Yami, and be yourself? As she says that, she looks at Yami intensely with her eyes filled with hatred. Suddenly Yami's hands and body stop shaking. His face from one of panic and uncertainty turned into a cold face, and then a malicious smile as he looks at Shiori. You really are too smart for your own good, aren't you, says Yami, as an amused look settles upon his face. Well, maybe not that smart. You did after all come here to confront me with that information. Shiori is filled with despair as she hears Yami's playful voice. I really married a monster, didn't I? Ha 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 Yami laughs when he hears what Shiori says. After the laugh, he gets close to Shiori and cusps her chin. No dear, you are married to someone worse than a monster you married a human. His smile widens even more. Do you know why monsters don't come out? It is because they are afraid of humans. Do you know why the devils stay in hell? Because they are afraid of humans do you know why God stays in heaven? Because even he is afraid of his own creation, don't you think so dear? Shiori has a dull look on her face as she looks at the ground. Are you finished? Hum. Yami seems confused by what she is saying. Don't say shit that not even you believe in says Shiori. Her voice null of any emotion. You don't even believe in God. And why are you even acting like some madman? Is this all a game to you? Yami's malicious smile settles down into a calm calculated smirk. Honestly I am just bored. Nothing interesting has been going on lately. Shiori just sighs at this. Yami suddenly looks serious as he decides to ask. Anyway, how did you even figure me out? What am I even doing? Talking with my family's killer. Thinks Shuri as a chuckle escapes her as she suddenly says. Woman's intuition. Yami chuckles at this too. Ha ha ha. Smart. But really though. I will torture you to insanity if you don't talk. Shiori's whole body shivers and she immediately starts talking. As you said look at someone's past. And you can determine who they are no matter how good at acting they are. Hum Yami just hums at this. Okay, I believe you. But just to be sure. Yami's hand goes towards Shiori's head and suddenly Shiori's eyes dull. And she starts drooling. Yet, she was telling the truth. Think Yami as he looks at his now brain dead wife. Go and slip down the stairs and break your neck. Says Yami casually as he gets up and goes to finishing his smoothie. While his wife accidentally dies. She could have lived a little longer if she didn't confront me. After all, her beauty hasn't deteriorated at all. Thinks Yami as he yawns a little and pours his smoothie in a glass. Balm as he hears his wife fall down the stairs. He still has a nonchalant look on his face. Guess I now get to have my son as the daimyo. Hum now I can implement some policies that allow 
allow me for some forceful expansion. Yami then takes a sip of his smoothie. Yogurt and garlic is a nice combination. I wonder if Tsum and my cute secretary Anami might agree to a threesome just to cheer up the Hokage after his wife's death. It was later announced that while Yami was in the Hokage Tower, the news reached him that his wife had an accident. For the first time, some people saw that their perfect Hokage shed a tear at her funeral with his children all around him crying. But the next day, he was back to work and as powerful as ever. And so just like this, five years pass. Yami is still Hokage and the Land of Fire is more prosperous than ever before. He was currently in his office with his real body and not a shadow clone. He also had Guy in his office doing push-ups. Yami POV I look at my green jumpsuit wearing student. He is doing push-ups in my office, which I allow while we are talking. He is getting older, and he is afraid that his body will deteriorate if he doesn't work out. So he is mostly always working out. After all, the s rank ninja with the name of Kenova's Green Beast is not gonna be weak. He is also known as the strongest Tejutsu specialist in the world, and even has a statue in a village he once saved. He is really moving up in the world. Anyway, Yami-sensei, you should have seen his youthfulness. He is training so hard, he reminds me of a young me. Says Guy, now starting to do some sit-ups. I know Guy, you already told me about your new student. What about the others? Do you plan to have them take a C-rank mission soon? I ask him, already knowing the answer. Guy does a thumb up towards me as he smiles. Yep, yeah, that will be so youthful. I just smile in amusement at his antics, he is quite entertaining. Yami POV, as Guy goes away. I think back on the changes I have made in this world. I mean they aren't anything major, but they are still pretty big. For example, Guy is an S-rank ninja. Kor and I and Asuma are elite ninja, with the power of around low S-rank level. My power has been rising considerably, and my son is the daimyo now. Usually child daimyo are manipulated by their advisors, but they obviously didn't dare to do that with my son. They don't want to piss off the best killer Kanoha has. That would be extremely dumb of them. Also in the land of rice, it seems like Orochimaru has started building the hidden sound village. And I also passed a new legislation during these last years. It is that everyone in the Hayuga clan must get the modified caged bird seal that I made. So their eyes can't be stolen by the enemy, no matter if it's a branch or main family member. Of course the Hayuga clan tried to refuse. I didn't even need to use Kodamatsu Kami on them. I went for the diplomatic approach and a voting process attended by all the Hayuga clan. Of course the branch family outnumbers the main. So now the latter gets the caged bird seal too. I mean if someone outside the Hayuga is gonna have a Byakugan it's got to be me and only me. I like Monopoly over magical eyes like the Sharingan and Byakugan. These little eyeballs are too precious and dangerous to let out into the world. Suddenly as I am deep into my thoughts, the door to my office opens and a girl with purple hair and dark skin pops her head in. Dad, you busy? I just smile at her, she has grown up now. She is 17 years old and has grown. Her busty womanly figure has started showing, and her beauty has become famous all over the land. She is the daughter of the Hokage and the sister of the current daimyo. Some people have sent marriage proposals, and some arrogant ones even tried to pressure me to marry off my daughters. But my reaction was calm, and collected I just burned their letters, and usually burnt their noble houses to the ground too. Arrogant nobles have been living for too long, so the land of fire is purged of them, and the money has started flowing back to the people, and going to those that deserve it, those with innovative ideas and such. I have no need for money anymore. I have a whole country's economy behind my back, so there is no need to even manage my companies anymore. So Heisenberg manages them now. Anyway, I look at my daughter and nod towards her. No, no, I am free. Why? Did some boar come to bother you? I can kill him and make it seem like an accident if you want. Yuruchi pouts when I say that to her. Come on now, dad. I am your daughter. You don't need to assume that I want someone killed just from visiting you. I smiled at her. She actually asked me to kill one someone who used to undermine her due to her suspected Kumo heritage. It was just your usual civilian bully kid, and I easily killed him. I don't like people messing with my kids. Anyway, Dad, why is Hana so moody lately? And I mean more than her usual self. Like she is actually mad. Did some boy reject her because they like the prettier sister aka me? Says Yuruchi smugly. She is wearing her Jonin uniform, which wasn't made to show the feminine form. But Yuruchi still does poses to show off. She became a Jonin pretty early, at the age of 14, while her sister, Hana, is still a Chunin. Come on now Yoru, don't insult your sister like that. She is beautiful in her own right. Also, didn't you just finish an A-rank mission? You should go and rest. I advise her with an undertone of actually ordering her. Yoruchi just sits on the chair in front of me and asks as if she didn't listen to my suggestion. Anyway, Dad, did you do anything fun lately? I heard some rumors that you might find a new wife soon. Is that true? I just shrugged. Yeah. Also try to have a better spy next time. Horror is a nice lady and an amazing intern. She also makes some good tea. But I will fire her if she acts so obvious when trying to spy. Yuruchi seems embarrassed at this as she blushes a little. Ooh ah she is new to her job. I just rise an eyebrow at this. 
She went through no training process at all. Then no wonder sucked so much. Yoruchi just looks a little uncomfortable when I say that. By sucking you don't mean my face morphs from an amused look to a serious one. When I hear her say that. No, Oo says Yoruchi uncomfortable. Uh, I don't have the conversational skills to continue this conversation anymore. Hey, but by saying that she just diffused the situation, and she actually does have the skills to get out of a conversation like that. But that is unimportant as I suggest to Yoruchi. You know, if you are so desperate you can use my spy network. She pouts again at this. But they will report to you. A spy network managed by you isn't gonna look for my interests. Well your current spy network also reports to me. But I won't say that to her. Better let her figure it out by herself. Well to manage a spy network, you need a building and training equipment. Plus the food for the spies and their daily needs while training will have to be managed by you. So it's not just having people loyal to you. It's harder than that to create a spy organization or any organization for that matter. I say as out of the shadows without Yoruchi noticing a hot cup of tea comes and I start drinking it. Yoruchi seems to contemplate what I said and she finally says, Suu, Dad I know that you have a lot of money. Sue, maybe you can give me a small loan of let's say a hundred million Ryo. I look at her bewildered. You have no sense for money, do you? And no, I won't give you money. Make it yourself. She seems a little disappointed at that, but she perks up and asks again. How about I marry some rich guy of your choosing? Well, she is my daughter, that is for sure. But I still shake my head. No, I know that you will kill the man and most likely create a shadow clone transformed as him to take his place while he uses his money to fuel your fledgling spy network. She goes back to being disappointed again. Ugh, this sucks. You make it seem so easy having so many spy networks. Well, because it is. I say to her smugly. Slurp. As I drink tea loudly. She seems a little confused at where the tea came from and seems like she wants to ask me, but stops herself. So anyway, dad, who is your new wife? Asks Yuruchi trying to change the subject. When she asks me who my new wife will be, I just smile at her. Well, she is currently a runaway working as an actress. She is the rightful ruler of the land of snow. Yuruchi laughs out loudly at this. Haha, ha, dad, you really make it sound like some type of fairy tale. So will you be her knight in shining armor? I just laugh at her joke and insinuation. She knows that I manipulate people, she does it too. Out of all of my children, Hachi, Hana, Kiba and Nari, none of them really act like me. Even Nari, who seems like a planner, doesn't have my coldness. But Yuruchi, she is like a mini-me running around. And I know best how to manipulate me. I can be easily manipulated from birth, just like I develop feelings for my first family, and hold them to this day. Yoruchi also has the same feelings about me. The world could turn to ashes, and she wouldn't care as long as me and the rest of her siblings were okay. Though she doesn't have my greed, which is okay. But after a couple of decades I will leave everything to her as I will try to figure out how to get out of this world. I have already learned tens of thousands of jutsu from all over the world. I have no need for the ninja world anymore. So it should just go away as soon as I get the most benefits out of it of course. Me and Yoruchi talk about an hour and her clone even brings us some vanilla ice cream. After eating the ice cream she goes away, and as she walks away, I look at her back she has gotten stronger. Once she masters the technique I especially made for her, she will reach S rank two days later. Guy comes in with his team looking for a C rank mission. I of course oblige. I also notice the admiring look on his face that Niji has while looking at me. Well he still has his father, and there isn't really any distinction between the branch and main family. They all have an invisible seal on them that I created. It will seal the Byakugan of the user when he dies. Anyway, I have been observing him a lot, due to him being a change in the canon story. But everything has been within expectations. Canon has definitely changed, and I can easily accept that. Especially now that my spy network spans all over the world. I literally know everything that everyone does. With the help of thousands of my shadow clones, and the mosquitoes slash flies I have worked a type of minor surface omnipresence. Knowing everything that everyone does, though my brain usually exploded in the beginning. But as I have already immortalized my mind it doesn't matter as it heals back, and I suck the information out of it. Sai I also have my eyes on Abito and what he has been too. I have to say though, Abito really isn't as smart as he acts like. He is just following Madara's already pre-prepared plans, and following them religiously as he should. Surprisingly, getting access to the plans wasn't hard. I just stealthily mind raped a white setsu underground, and looked if there was anything that I didn't know about. There was a little bit I didn't know, and that wasn't shown in the Arnie Mare, or something that I didn't already know from my spy network. But really though I know that white setsu acts like a good spy network, and Madara had confidence in him well look we're letting his guard down, and allowing a being like white setsu get information like that. General POV. So like this one year past, Kinoha had already reached its peak for growth at its current time. Skyscrapers are all over the village. It looks more like a modern city than a ninja village. The other hidden villages haven't been able to keep up with Kinoha's growth at all. Kinoha alone have stronger economical strength than the whole land of wind. Not just the hidden sand village. 
but the whole land of Win was overtaken by a village, city, like Kanoha. A ninja village usually gets its economical income from missions, but Kanoha it's different. Even though ninja missions are bountiful in Kanoha, it still doesn't make even 1% of the overall income. Even when the daimyo of the land of Win decided to send missions to Kanoha, the mission income didn't surpass 1% of the overall income. Though later on a deal between the 5th Hokage and the 4th Kezuki Rasa was worked out, the contents of the deal are confidential even to the S-rank ninjas of the village. But it is rumored that both Yami and Rasa came out of it satisfied. Currently on the Hokage mountain where all of the Hokage's faces were carved, a certain yellow-haired child was painting over the faces of the four Hokage. Strangely the fifth face was left clean, and no paint was applied upon the structure. Suddenly the yellow-haired child was painting some snot on the third Hokage's face, when some Chunin yelled out loudly at him. Hey you there what are you doing? Immediately the child looked at the one who yelled at him. He saw that it was a Chunin with another one just came as he looked. He immediately jumped off the mountain and climbed down as the Chunin chased after him. Don't think that you will be escaping this time Naruto. He was chased through the roofs of the houses and skyscrapers. But he was able to escape as he went down amongst the dense population and transformed into a trash can at the side of the road. The Chunin walked straight past Naruto, without even noticing that he was there. But suddenly as Naruto transformed back, another Chunin with a scar above his nose was right behind him. Naruto, what did you do this time? Said the Chunin a little annoyed. But then a tick mark appeared on his forehead as he yelled. But most importantly why aren't you at class? Naruto seems unsure of what to say so in the end he just blurs out. Aruka sensei I wasn't the one who painted on the Hokage's faces. Oh I see says Aruka with a pissed off look on his face. In the end Naruto is brought back to his class and tells them to do the transformation jutsu. All the students do it. Everyone transformed into Aruka except Kiba in Yazuka who transformed into his father, the Hokage Yami in Yazuka. After class, Aruka has Naruto clean up the mess up in the Hokage mountain. As Aruka looks at Naruto, he sees his past self, trying to act outrageously in front of others until they pay attention to him. He even remembers his crush back in the academy, Gurin in Yazuka the now-famed Crystal Flower of Kanoha, an elite Shounen forever out of his reach. Aruka sighs as such depressing thoughts come to his head, so he decides to call out to Naruto. Naruto, when you finish this, I will treat you to some Raymond at Ichiraku. When Naruto hears this he cheers loudly. Hell yeah! I am gonna finish this in no time. After Naruto cleans the four Hokage faces, he and Aruka go to Ichiraku Raymon and sit down. Aruka decides to ask. So, not that I'm complaining, but why didn't you vandalize the fifth Hokage's face on the mountain? Aruka is truly curious about this. Due to Naruto ever vandalizing the fifth Hokage's face on the Hokage mountain, Naruto has a look on his face that is full of conviction. I know that the Hokage earned their names, says Naruto calmly, while stirring his Raymon bowl. Then he looks at Aruka with a confident smile on his face. But I will surpass them all. Aruka just raises an eyebrow at this. How will you do that? Plus why didn't you still didn't tell me the reason you don't vandalize the fifth Hokage's face? Naruto looks annoyed at this. Well, if I did something like that Yoruchini would hunt me down and beat me up. And she always finds me super easily, unlike the other Chunin. Aruka looks confused at this. So she stops you from vandalizing the fifth second's face, but doesn't care about the others. As Aruka says that Naruto just shrugs his shoulders. I am not really sure of that, but she only appears when I am close to Uncle Yami's monument. Aruka smiles at this as if already knowing something that Naruto has no idea about. It is most likely a Jinjutsu that is cast when one is in the proximity of the statue, contemplates Aruka as he comes to his conclusion. Though that sounds like something impossible, Yoruchi is the daughter of the debated strongest Jinjutsu user Kanoha has ever had. Even Koronai is only recognized as strong before she uses Yami and Yuzuka's signature Jinjutsu. The next day comes around and this time it is the Genin exam. Naruto is waiting outside the class for his final examination. One by one, the students enter. When they come outside, they either have happy or sad faces, initiating if they passed or if they failed the exam. When others asked the kids, they all gave different answers about what the exam was about. Some said that it was one of the three basic jutsus learned in the academy. Some others said that their test consisted of throwing kunai or shuriken or so. Naruto immediately gets nervous at this. If it's the transformation jutsu, he can easily do it. But if it's the clone or substitution jutsu, if it's the latter he might probably pass. But if it's the clone jutsu, he knows that the chances of passing are slim to none. Naruto Yuzumaki, come in. Comes the voice from the inside of the room. The voice belongs to Mizuki. He is Aruka's colleague in teaching the young academy students. Naruto nervously goes in, and immediately Aruka asks. Okay now, Naruto, do the clone jutsu. Immediately an unknown heaviness settles over Naruto's heart. Come on now. I can do this I just gotta believe in myself. Thinks Naruto as he tries to encourage himself. He gathers his chakra and does the tiger hand sign, trying to summon a clone. Poof and in a cloud of smoke appears next to him. Naruto still is nervous as he looks at his creation and sees the clone who looks more like a blow up doll. Aruka just shakes his head at this. Sorry Naruto, but it seems like you will have to wait for one more year. Naruto looks down and walks away from the classroom, dejected by the answer that he got. 
This is his third failure, as tried two previous times for early graduation. He took the test, but he still failed. In the afternoon as Naruto was walking around dejected, he hears someone call out to him. Hey, Naruto. When he turns back to look, he sees that it is one of his teachers, it is Mizuki. He smiles at Naruto, and as he gets close to him he says, I know of a way that you can become a gen and it is called the secret exam. Naruto's face immediately brightens up when he hears this. Really? So that means that I didn't fail and won't have to repeat another year right? Mizuki nods at this. Yet, yeah, this is like a ninja mission. After all, a ninja has to look underneath the underneath. You must look at things from an outside perspective and think outside the box. Naruto's face brightens at this. Tell me the super secret test. I promise that I will complete it. That day, in the evening inside the Hokage's office. It was dark and there seems to be no one. Suddenly the window opens and a figure wearing all yellow comes inside. It is Naruto. He has come inside the office and is looking around. He finally saw the giant scroll that Mizuki told him to get in order to pass the secret exam. Yes, I found it. Now I can become a genin for real. Thinks Naruto, as he has a wide smile on his face. He immediately runs away from the scene jumping out of the window. But suddenly, back in the Hokage's office, two figures appear out of the darkness. It was Yami and Jiruchi. They both had malicious smiles on their faces. Yami just whispers to his daughter. You know what to do now. Yuruchi nods and answers with a simple. Yet, yeah. as lightning curses through her skin, forming a cat tail and is made out of lightning. Fwash she immediately disappears from her location, going towards a certain location that she can sense a certain dumb tune in. Dad really knows how to amuse himself, as expected of the person with the most free time in Kanoha. Thinks Yuruchi as she blitzes from building to building, traveling at breakneck speeds. On the other side of the village, Naruto just looks at Aruka, who has a giant shuriken lodged into his back, while he still says, Naruto isn't the nine-tailed fox. He is Naruto of Kanoha. Naruto cries at this, and as Aruka falls down on the ground, he looks at Mizuki with a furious look on his face. His whiskers become more pronounced and his eyes red and turning into slits. A growl comes out of his throat as he says, You dare hurt Aruka-sensei, I will kill you. When Mizuki sees this, he isn't intimidated at all. After all, he knows that no matter how much chakra he has, Naruto is useless at being a ninja and can't even throw a shuriken straight. He has been teaching him for years, so he is specially inclined to know of Naruto's progress. But suddenly Naruto makes his fingers in a cross sign and says, Shadow Clone Jutsu. Pull off immediately a huge gust of smoke appears on the surroundings as hundreds of clones appear. This is when Mizuki looks a little afraid at this bit then like a lightning strike from the sky. A being surrounded in blue lightning in a split second appears above Mizuki and Ban bashes a kick on his head and out of the lighting a female voice comes out saying, Hello there shitty spy it is Yuruchi, clad in a skin tight dark full body suit, kicking Mizuki in the face with just enough power to knock him out. But even while he was being electrocuted, Mizuki couldn't help but admire the person kicking him. Chow beautiful, says Mizuki as he falls into unconsciousness, plop, and falls on the ground. Yuruchi on the other hand, has a sadistic smile on her face as she kicks an unconscious Mizuki. You masochistic creep. You are too ugly, weak and insecure for you to even think about me that way. When Naruto sees Yuruchi one-shot Mizuki, he can't help but look at Yuruchi in a different light. She is always messing around and listens only to her father. She is strong and pretty. Thinks Naruto as a blush appears on his face. When Yuruchi sees this she just narrows her eyes. What are you looking at whiskers brat? Naruto immediately looks away. Yuruchi just sighs at this. Brat, the Ambu will soon be here. So calm yourself down and when they come, clearly explain to them what happened. So as the Ambu came Naruto and Yuruchi explained to them what happened and how it went along. Yuruchi just sighs once more at this. Well, I will inform my father of the happenings here. That is when Aruka, who is being healed by an Ambu who knows medical ninjutsu, as he opens his eyes, he looks around and sees some of the Naruto clones who are just running around. Naruto, you are officially a genin now, since you can use clone jutsu. As Aruka says that Naruto turns around and says, Aruka sensei, you are awake, says Naruto, overjoyed as he goes in for a hug. Later on Yuruchi just goes away getting out of the forest and back into the lights of the city, Kanoha, as she jumps atop the high buildings from one to another. Suddenly she stops atop one of the skyscrapers and looks around suspiciously. Dad, are you around? Asks Yuruchi, a little confused. Suddenly out of the shadows Yami comes out, wearing his casual clothes, which consists of white pants and a black t-shirt, with the word wolf written on it in white. Yami looks at Yuruchi bemusedly. I see that you have gotten better at sensing someone's presence. Yuruchi feels uncomfortable when her father says that to her. She didn't actually feel anything and just called out random and as expected her father was around. Yami looks at Yuruchi, and suddenly his eyes widen in realization. Oh, that is silly. Yuruchi smiles at this. Yeah, I always know that you are around so I just thought that if I just call you out, you would show up. You are like the boogeyman, but you only need to be called once. Ha ha ha. Yami laughs along with her too. Ha ha ha. That truly was ridiculous. Suddenly this time Yuruchi's eyes widened in realization. Wait dad did you just manipulate me? So you wouldn't have to tell me how you predicted perfectly. 
What would happen with Naruto? Yami just looks to the side and sarcastically says, No, of course not. That would make me seem like a manipulative person. And I am not like that at all. Yoruchi smiles sarcastically. Yeah, very funny dad. Yami smirks at this. Do you know why you don't see elephants hiding in trees? As Yami says that Yoruchi notices that her father is going into one of his psychological moods. So she listens. Because they are good at it. Says Yami snickering as if it was an inside joke. Yoruchi looks at her father in confusion. What was with that lame joke dad? Yami's snickers turn into a full blown laugh. Ha 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 yeah you could call it a dad joke. Yoruchi seems more confused than ever by this. What is that even supposed to mean? Yami laughs even louder. Come on Yoruchi, it's getting late, you should be asleep. He then starts jumping from building to building, and Yoruchi follows him. They look at the amazing views of Kanoha, looking down from the height of the skyscrapers. As Yoruchi catches up to Yami, she looks at her father and says, I am an adult, dad in quote, but before she can continue Yami interrupts her by saying, Hey there adult, I am dad. Yoruchi, still confused by Yami's behavior, frowns. Suddenly she feels a hand on her head as they are midair. She sees that it is her father petting her. He has a sad look on his eyes, something that Yoruchi never truly saw, and she knows that this time he isn't acting. Yoruchi, if one day I were to disappear out of nowhere, I want you to continue your life like nothing happened. I don't want you to grieve for me or look for me, says Yami with an unusually serious voice, making Yoruchi surprised at this. But she dismisses the notion. Dad is a good actor, he can easily trick me. This might be one of his jokes. But still Yoruchi still seriously answers. Don't worry dad, I am likely to die before you so I don't need to be worried about something like this. Suddenly Yami looks at her with a wide-eyed look on his face. Hum, I would be sad if that were to happen. So I would like you to not die too young Yoruchi. Suddenly Yami's eyes turn cold shadowed by his hair, even Yoruchi feels a certain chill on her spine when she sees that. But Yami says in an unusually cold voice, No I won't allow you to die too young Yoruchi, I will never allow something like that. If I have all of this power and can't protect my own daughter then suddenly Yami comes out of his trace and looks at Yoruchi, his face back to normal, and his eyes have that warm energy in them. Sorry daughter, it seems like the older I get the more my mind wanders. I will be going home first. Flush and in a dark flash Yami disappeared, leaving Yoruchi confused beyond matter. What is going on inside your head father you have everything? You say that family is everything, but why do you yourself seem so confused? Haven't you already figured out everything? The way you usually speak, walk and eat, is of someone who has everything figured out. Why do you seem so unsure father? As Yoruchi thinks that, she is left contemplating what her father is thinking. Ever since young, she has never been able to figure out what her father is thinking. She only knew that her father is terrifyingly smart, and always had an answer to any question. Father why do you seem so lonely? While she was thinking this, she completely forgot about asking her father how he predicted something like this on the other hand, at Yami's mansion in the Inuzuka clan compound. Inside the mansion is his luxurious living room. A woman is sitting in one of the couches while reading the book Romeo and Juliet. She has long black hair with bangs that swept on each side of her face, and violet blue eyes. Her name is Koyuki Kazahana, and the current leader of the Land of Snow and Yami Inuzuka's current wife. She used to be a novice actress. That is before her current husband found her and completely destroyed her uncle. He had taken over the Land of Snow. She can't help it that every time she thinks about her homeland, she thinks about her husband or more specifically his power. What she saw that day terrified her while at the same time made her fall in love. She used to always be worried that her uncle would find her and kill her. But in less than one hour after finding her, her husband obliterated her uncle. She used to think that physical power is limited in comparison to political power. And it falls short to the second. After all, ninjas still listen to the daimyo. But then she met Yami. He conjured what can only be something godly. A giant humanoid figure with a dark hue to it. And simply obliterated the castle that her uncle used to live together with him and his whole army. With only one swing of its sword. That made the people think that the gods are mad. So they appointed her to leadership position again. That day she understood something simple, but critical about the world violence is the ultimate power, and everything can be solved by it. Suddenly in a dark flash, her husband appears, and when he looks at her, it makes her heart flutter as if they met up for the first time. When his cold black eyes meet her violet blue ones, it makes her shudder. Ah Yami you are back. She asks him nervously with a blush on her face. Yami just smiles at her softly. He already knows that even though they have been married for quite a bit, and have had sex hundreds of times, she still acts like a high school girl after her senpai though I am 16 years older than her. I am 37 years old and she is 21, but really though, my power shocked her so hard that she has withdrawal and a little Stockholm Syndrome symptoms. Spending her life running away in fear of her uncle and I just come around obliterating him, has broken her a little mentally. She sees me as someone undefeatable, and my power is infinite, contemplates Yami, while looking at his wife. He now has control of the Land of Snow, so he uses that place as a place of technological development before they come to Kanoha. Yami then just walks towards his wife and picks her up in a princess carry. Come on now, let's go and have some fun my beautiful wife. Koyuki blushes at this, 
Of course my husband. Yami smiles at this and fwosh, he teleports to his bedroom tomorrow Yami is back to the Hokage Tower, inside his office. Looking at Naruto in front of him, and the photo he has for his ninja document, the latter has Naruto full of paint all around him. He picks up the photo and shows it to Naruto. Suo what is this? Asks Yami with a completely serious look on his face. Naruto just gives Yami a thumbs up. That is me looking cool on my photo. Yami just nods at this. Okay then go and retake the photo under one hour and bring it here. The photo needs a clear image of your face. So no paint, masks or anything like that. Naruto's mood goes down when he hears this. Oh come on I look so cool on that. Complains Naruto. Yami just nods again and says. If you don't bring the photo back here in under an hour, you will have to repeat another year in the academy. Naruto's eyes widen, and a shocked look appears on his face. Nuo. He screams as he immediately jumps out of the window. I will bring IT back immediately Hokage-sama. Yami doesn't react to this at all, he just pushes the document and calls the next in line. Kiba and Yazuka. The door is opened, and Kiba comes inside. Yo, dad what you doing? Yami just narrows his eyes at Kiba. Don't yo. Me. Did you look at your graduation grades? They were horrible. He looks uncomfortable at this. Hey come on now dad don't be like that. I did pretty good. Yami just sighs at that. By pretty good you mean only better than Naruto. And that makes you the second last. In my opinion I think you should go back to the academy. Kiba's eyes widen at this. And he immediately bows down to his waist. Please dad, come on don't do that. I am your son. I promise to study harder when I become a genin. Yami then decides to deploy his best tactic by saying. Your sisters both had top grades in the academy. And look at them now. They have such successful careers now. And after Yami bully teaching his son the lessons of life. He reviews the other graduates. And Naruto finally brings another photo. After that Yami gets up and poof Yami dispels himself. Showing that it was a clone all along. The real Yami is in his office drawing a DBZ character from his last life. With him having so much free time, he has got different hobbies now. When he gets the memories of his clones he just smiles. It seems like the plan continues along. The next day that is when the new batch of Jenning graduate. Classroom A was filled to the max. Everyone was sitting down and waiting for Aruka to arrive. There was one in here who was nervous in this room, instead of being excited. It is Kiba and Yuzuka. He has a nervousness in his heart. His whole life he has been compared with his father or his sisters. His father is the legendary Yami in Yuzuka. Some consider him the strongest ninja Konoha has ever produced. Though some fans of the other Hokage argue that. But still, everyone knows him as only the Hokage's son. His sisters were talented and graduated at the top of their class. But he was almost the last of his class. Kiba clenches his hand into a fist. I will make father proud. Once I become a genin I will show him that I am worthy of being his son. Suddenly he is brought off his stupor when he hears Aruka call out. Team 8 will be Kiba and Yuzuka, Hinata Hayuga and Shino Aburam. Yujon and teacher will be Kurin Ayuhi. Immediately Kiba is happy at being in the same team as his crush. But when he is also put with the Shino, someone who plays with bugs and ugh, it will Kurin Anichin too. She will try and talk to me about dad that will be annoying, complains Kiba. On the other hand, Yami who is currently inside his office is just drawing something when Yoruchi comes in from the window. Yo, dad today we will throw a party for Kiba's team assignment. She notices that her father is doing something and she gets curious. She gets close and sees what her father is drawing. What is that? Yami stops and looks at Yoruchi with a smile on his face. This is my new creation. I call it a manga. Manga, says Yoruchi, trying to say the weird saying word. Dad has way too much free time on his hands. In the end she just shrugs. Anyway dad. What do you plan to get Kiba? Yami stops drawing and looks at Yoruchi. Hum when you graduated I created an S rank technique just for you dot dot when Yoruchi hears the name she cringes a little. Dad. Don't call it like that I told you. The name is. Yami looks at Yoruchi with a calm look. I created it I name it. Plus the lightning takes the form of cat tails and cat is. That is why I call it furry armor. I mean it is logical. No. It sounds weird and lame. Whines Yoruchi. Yami just shrugs as if he doesn't care about it. Well. You can call it whatever you want. But it is registered as lightning furry armor. Yoruchi pouts. Come on dad. I never ask for anything. So please just do this for me. I don't want to go down in history books as the S rank ninja who used something like furry armor. Sigh. It took quite some time to think of this name. I put real work into this technique. And I don't even get to name it. Sure whatever I will change the official name. Says Yami. A little saddened on the outside. But on the inside he doesn't plan to change the official name at all. This will be his little joke on Yoruchi. But Yoruchi Kiba won't be able to use an S rank technique. So what do you think I should give him? Yoruchi thinks for a little. Ah. Uh, Kibo is kinder weak in the chakra category. Maybe something that will help him in a critical situation. Yami nods at this. He thinks of the thousands of the possible techniques that could be useful to Kiba. He closes his eyes and thinks using his vast knowledge of Jutsu and his physical brain. 
who now is like a supercomputer. A second later Yami opens his eyes and looks at Yoruchi. I have just the technique for him. It will be perfect for him. One month passes and so Team 7 is just going toward another location to do a D-rank mission. Kakashi is just walking with one hand in his pocket. While Naruto, Sakura and Sasuke were talking about something. So Kakashi Sensei, will this mission be at least interesting or will it be just another fence painting mission? Asks Naruto, sighing out loudly in boredom. Kakashi stops for a second. He then looks at them putting his book down. Well, this person is associated with the fifth Hokage. Back in the day they used to be as close as brothers, and people say that he has saved the Hokage's life on multiple occasions. That immediately gets their attention even Sasuke seems interested in this. He knows that Yami is regarded as the greatest Hokage. Even back in the academy there are countless books on Yami and his early life. Kakashi takes the lead, mentioning them to follow him as he walks into an alley. Ten minutes later, and they arrive at a surprisingly luxurious strip club. Naruto, Sasuke and Sakura, give Kakashi a nasty side glance. Naruto is the one to address the elephant in the situation. Kakashi Sensei, you didn't bring here just so you can go and mess around, did you? Kakashi just sighs at this. You kids are really newbies. He then points toward the sign in front of the strip club. It reads Shiro's Strip Club. This is the best strip club in Konoha and also the leader is the best informant in Konoha, says Kakashi, surprising his students making them think that they truly shouldn't judge a book by its cover. As they walk inside they see two Chunin ninja acting as guards. When they see Kakashi they immediately let him through, asking no questions. As soon as they enter the loud music beats on their ears, and the strange sights shock the genin. They see females with cat ears and tails, then there are muscular women wearing tight leather suits, and one of them looks at Sasuke while licking her lips. When Sasuke notices this he feels a chill go down his spine. Suddenly a cat girl waitress wearing a skimpy bikini comes over with a couple of drinks comes in front of them and asks. Oh hey there Naya. Business or pleasure Naya Kakashi has a blush on his face, looking at the breasts of the cat girls. Until Naruto wakes him up by scolding. Hey, pervy sensei, stop acting so shameless. Kakashi finally comes of his trace and says. Oh, yeah. I mean business is my pleasure. The cat girl's smile doesn't move an inch from her face, but she still mentions towards a hallway outside the public. This way please Naya. Kakashi and the rest of Team 7 follow the cat girl. As they walk away from the loud music, the cat girl leads them to a private booth where the music isn't so loud. That is when the cat girl says, By the way, Master Shiro is busy at the moment. Don't worry, in a couple of minutes he should be gone. Can I get you anything during that time Naya? Can you get us some chicken fingers in KFC? Asks Kakashi. Sasuke, Naruto and Sakura immediately look at him with a strange look on their faces. Kakashi sees this, but he just shrugs and says, Hey, it's good food. You will be surprised how good they make it. Then he turns towards the waitress and pulls something out of his pocket. I have a regular customer card. Does that extend to friends and family too? The can girl just looks at the card for a split second before she nods. Of course Naya. And then she walks off closing the door. Kakashi pulls out his book again and starts reading it. Not paying attention to the looks his genin sent him. It doesn't take long for the food to come. Only Kakashi was eating. And his students didn't touch the food made in the strip club. Kakashi was eating it. But it seems like as his students tried to get a look at his face. They couldn't see anything every time. For a split second, they looked away. And he had already eaten it all. Suddenly the door opens. They look towards the door and see a dog. It looked more like a short human covered in fur. While walking on two legs, it also had a dog's head. This is Shiro, the owner of the strip club. But strangely he has a dangerous presence about him. Sasuke is the first one to be affected by it. Kakashi didn't care, and Naruto nor Sakura were skilled enough to notice the dangerous presence the weird looking dog released. Shiro just casually closed the door behind him, and he waves at them. Yo, shitty humans. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.